Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 41 For the following week after the program had aired, SAE Jean was overwhelmed with requests to join the society. The moment he approached the monster field, people stuck onto him like glue. And the identities of each and every one of these folks were just incredible. All of them were some kind of big shots in their chosen field of profession mid-tier knights, upper mid-tiers, B-rank wizards, etc., etc. When he refused, there were one or two high-nosed snobs glaring at him with eyes that said, How dare a lowly you refuse me? But well, that was understandable as they all had status out in the society. However, Kim Sae Jean refused them all. He didn't want to admit those folks with intentions all too clear to see, and muddy the waters of his own society like that. USAE Young was the same in this regard. But she had her bodyguards to prevent any trouble approaching her beforehand, so she had encountered far less trouble compared to what SAE Jean had to go through. Oh, and also, totally out of the blue, he received a lot of requests for investments. Not only from the Knights' Orders, but wizard towers and private corporations, as well as even from certain politicians. Some of them strangely went as far as to threaten him with if you don't take this money, things will become very difficult for you down the line, capiche? TL, no, the author didn't use that word. I just wrangled it in there, cuz, you know, sounds about right. Of course, SAE Jean still refused all of them. However there was this one thing that he could not refuse outright as his instinct stopped him from doing so. And that was making an appearance on TV. The idea came from the producer of the program, The Qualities of a Knight, who packaged the scenes of the real knights hunting monsters as entertainment and created a huge hit show in the process. SAE Jean was unable to cleanly refuse the guy, as not only the program itself had been a big ratings draw, but as a child watching TV with his mother, he did hold a secret yearning to appear on it. So, he just told the producer guy that he'd think about it and left it there like that. And now, it was a late afternoon as the sun began to slowly set in the west. Today was also the promised day for the dinner with Kim Yurin, too. SAE Jean was waiting for USAE Young in front of his house after she said she'd come and fetch him. He was feeling a bit nervous as the memories of the day he had rescued Kim Yurin continued to drift in and out of his head. So, he tried to distract himself by playing with his phone when, from the distance, a shiny and very black limo glided towards his position. Could that be hers? SAE Jean fell into a slight dilemma. If he was being escorted to a high-class party, sure, but since it was just a nice little dinner, such a lengthy limo seemed a bit overkill to him. Wouldn't such a thing become cumbersome, instead? Unfortunately, the limo did stop in front of SAE Jean. As SAE Jean stood there and blankly stared at the car, the window for the back seat slid down and the face of USAE Young peeped out from the opening. What are you doing? Appa. Get in. Oh. Yeah, sure. With a reluctant reply, he opened the back door and climbed inside. The interior was even more spectacular. The size in here felt like it would not lose out to his old one-room apartment. Even the seats were soft and fluffy, as if he was parking his BT over a cloud or something. This is all really amazing. Is this all thanks to the magic engineering thing? SAE Jean spoke as he poked at the seat cushions. Yes, probably. She replied in a relaxed manner and leaned against the backrest. But SAE Jean couldn't do that. So, he just twisted his body around like a slightly uncomfortable shrimp. By the way, what's that? Pretending to not know, he pointed at a box laying securely on SAE Young's lap. She carried a very proud expression as she opened the box. It's the growing broadsword, you see. It will serve as my main weapon from now on. And Mr. Ork the blacksmith even wrote me a letter as well. He did. He did write a letter for USA Young. He asked her to use the sword well. He also added that, when his skills improved, he'd also take care of maintaining the weapon in the future as well. She had a very satisfied expression, so he decided to feel satisfied as well. The venue was a high-class restaurant located near the Raven Knight's Order. SAE Jean had never ever set foot in an eatery where one could not enter without an invitation before in his life. 
he felt a little, no, make that a lot, pressured by this. Such a luxurious atmosphere didn't suit him one bit. He saw a guy wearing a formal attire that could easily have cost more than a few thousand bucks, and a woman wearing a super fancy dress. Among all the diners here, he spotted famous politicians, knights, as well as celebrities he could recognize just by looking at their faces. From the tops of their heads to the tips of their toes, from the clothes they wore and their mannerisms him and this whole space was at perfect odds with one another. Of course S.A.E. Jean would feel depressed. Lady U.S.A.E. Young and Sir Kim S.A.E. Jean, your reservations have been confirmed. Two of them followed the professional guidance of the waiter and sat down in front of a huge table. Appa, why do you keep looking around like that? U.S.A.E. Young stopped browsing the menu and asked him, looking somewhat puzzled. They are staring at us. He was already feeling uncomfortable, and now all these famous people were looking over here. He so wanted to rip off the cheap checkered shirt he was wearing right this instant. Mmm, you're right. It's probably because of the society, I think. Since even the orc blacksmith has joined us well, I guess it can't be helped, really. On another side note, USAE Young seemed very much moved by the letter Kim SAE Jean sent along with the broadsword, and had become a die-hard fan of the orc blacksmith. Of course, it was somewhat pitiable that she had no idea the very blacksmith was sitting right in front of her at this moment. By the way, will Sir Blacksmith really join our society? And before he knew it, the way she called the society had changed to a more agreeable our society. S.A.E. Jean smiled slightly. Not sure yet. But I think I can get in touch with him. He answered her in a nonchalant manner. Of course he could get in touch with himself. Wasn't that the most obvious thing in the world? Maybe it was just too obvious and that could be a problem, but still. What can I, can I get in touch with him too? Well, that's, uh, oh, by the way, surely you can find out the identity if you wanted to, can't you? S.A.E. Jean asked her as if there was some doubt there. If it was the Dawn's Information Network, they should be able to uncover the identities of both the Goblin Alchemist as well as the Orc Blacksmith. After all, there would inevitably be a paper trail left somewhere. No, for the people of Dawn, it would be far more harder to accept the truth that all three individuals happen to be a single person Kim S.A.E. Jean. That's true, but I think that's no different from slicing the belly of the goose that lays the golden eggs. It'd be our loss if the potential relationship sours because we ignored his wishes to remain anonymous. That was a wonderful answer. He quickly nodded his head. But then, all of a sudden, USAE Young seemed to have remembered something she opened her eyes real wide and pushed her upper body real close. Ah, right. When you get to speak to the blacksmith, you must pass on this message. Us at dawn are deliberately protecting the identity of the blacksmith as we speak. There are other night orders and corporations that don't think the same as us out there. Uh, sure thing. Got it. After finishing her business, she slowly leaned back against her chair. S.A.E. Jean dumbly stared at her. As they became more friendly, she felt like a different person from the initial impressions. There was still that side of being more mature than her age, but without a doubt, there also existed the side that was cheerful and overflowing with emotions, just like any other girls her age. It was a refreshingly charming side, for sure. However, she was still underage, though. Ah. She's here. USAE Young pointed behind his back and whispered loudly. Kim SAE Jean also turned his head to look. There she was, Kim Yurin wearing a coat style armor. Just like how SAE Jean had acted earlier, she too seemed flustered as she went past the focus stairs to arrive at the table. H, hello there. USAE Young abruptly stood up first. Oh, hello there. Ah, the thing is I came here straight after finishing up work so I couldn't find the chance to change my clothes. Kim Yurin spoke apologetically as she sat down next to USAE Young. How do you do, I'm Kim SAE Young. Hello. I've heard many good things about you. It's a pleasure. After sharing a light greeting with SAE Jean, Kim Yurin browsed the menu before her jaw magnificently hit the floor. Ah. They are all quite expensive, aren't they? That was totally unexpected from the point of view for the other two present here. After all, 
Kim Yurin was a highest tier knight employed by the country, so her annual salary must have been at least 900 grand. Ah, uh, actually, I moved house recently, and I spent a bit of money buying an equipment, so. I, it's totally fine. My grandfather owns this restaurant, so it's all free. USA Young proudly pounded her chest as she spoke, and that made Kim Yurin smile brightly as well. And then, the three of them conversed in a slightly awkward atmosphere until their food arrived. The topics of the conversation were varied. The goblin alchemist, the orc blacksmith, the large-scale incidents in China and the USA involving the continuous fissure eruptions, the future and what it had in store for them and finally. Ah, uh, right. Will the two monsters really join your society, the monster? Two monsters. Yes. Nowadays people are calling the two by that term. Well, I believe it's actually a term of reverence as both of them demonstrated absolutely overwhelming skills in their chosen fields. After hearing her serious voice, anyone could tell that this was the topic she wanted to discuss from the very beginning. Well, really I'm not too sure. The goblin did say he was on friendly terms with the orc. S.A.E. Jean vaguely answered and quickly assumed a smile as he tried to speak in a sly, somewhat shameless tone. You seem to have a lot of interest in this matter, though. If that's so, would you like to join our society as well? Then, it should be more than possible to bridge the two connections. Wah, wow, that is an excellent idea. Suddenly, USA Young shouted out at the top of her lungs. And it was way too dn loud. Loud enough to pull all the attention of the surroundings to hear. What's the heck is she doing? He became embarrassed slightly and glared at USA Young. Indeed, her current state was a mess. Her face was completely flustered, there were numerous large sweat drops dotting her forehead, and her entire demeanor seemed like as if she'd faint at any given moment. Sighing out grandly, SAE Jean fished out a handkerchief and dabbed all the sweat off her forehead. Ah, uh, oh, thanks. Finally calming down, she took several deep breaths and thanked him. Kim Yurin blankly watched this scene with an unreadable expression before opening her mouth once more. That I'm grateful for the invitation. To be offered an opportunity to join the hottest society right now but my situation is a little bit complicated at the moment. However, I'll definitely think about it. Yurin really wanted to join, of course but she couldn't as she was now. As a matter of principle, an order master of a government-run knight's order could not join any societies and she was a person who'd be following in her father's footsteps and become the next master. There might be three years left until that, but still, she figured it would instead only inconvenience the society's members if she joined for that limited amount of time. I understand. Please, give it a careful concy. It was then. SFX for things vibrating. Out of the blue, the floor vibrated. What the? SAE Jean was wondering if there was an earthquake but soon, he could see that was not the case from the view through windows of the restaurant. He could view down to the Han River from this restaurant and he saw it a huge shape rising slowly from the middle of the river's surface. With a deeply astonished expression, Kim Yurin shot up from her seat. It was a leviathan. A gigantic sea monster that made the Han River seem cramped its body like that of a snake and possessing a head similar to that of a dragon. It was sometimes referred to as the Amugi of Oceans and more importantly, it was a monster that should not have existed in this river. Chapter, 42 With a deeply astonished expression, Kim Yurin shot up from her seat. It was a leviathan. A gigantic sea monster that made the Han River seem cramped its body like that of a snake and possessing a head similar to that of a dragon. It was sometimes referred to as the Amugi of Oceans and more importantly, it was a monster that should not have existed in this river. As implied, it was an oceanic monster not only that, a monster dwelling in the deep seas. There could only be two reasons why such a monster made an appearance here. It's either a summon or there's a fissure nearby. However, with the latter option, there would be a lot of accompanying monsters, so it seemed the former was the most likely scenario here. Regrettably, though there was no time to debate on things like possibilities and whatnots right now. I apologize, but I must go ahead. I'll compensate for it later. Kim Yurin wrapped her body in mana and dashed like a beam of light towards the window. 
SFX for glass shattering. Leaving the broken glass pieces behind, she rolled her body in the air and descended towards the Han River below. The magical beast of the deep seas, a leviathan. As all the countless tales and folklores have told, a leviathan was a monster possessing incalculable strength. So much so, instead of calling it a monster, it'd be far more correct to label it as a natural disaster. However, that only applied when the creature was out at sea. Right now, it was confined to a river with limited amount of room for movement. Kim Yurin, with her sword drawn, headed towards the leviathan that was raising its head out of the water. However, her aim wasn't to kill the creature. No, it was about cancelling the summon. She had to destroy either the summoning magic circle engraved somewhere, or the summoning talisman. But before all that, though the priority laid with minimizing the confusion and harm to the city itself. That's why she set the purpose of her first attack to Leviathan, faint for five minutes. This was only possible due to one of the special powers from the very unique trait she possessed, also known as the Desideratum. Within the allowance of her mana's capacity, Kim Yurin could imbue her sword strikes with special conditions. And that condition would, even if it's only for a moment, become the reality that had to be carried out no matter what. My mana. She bit down on her teeth at the sensation of energy deserting her body. She wasn't even aiming to kill the dang creature, nor to knock it out for an hour it was just for a measly five minutes. Yet, the mana expenditure proved to be incredibly severe. With its head already breaking out of the water's surface, the leviathan let out a huge wail that sounded like a ship's horn. Thankfully, that unbearable low-frequency noise didn't continue for long. Kwang. An explosion shook the surroundings. Her entire body covered in blue mana, Kim Yurin's sword strike descended from the sky and properly struck the middle of the creature's forehead. The leviathan that was already quite irritated from the sudden summoning, crumbled back down to the water's surface with whites showing on its eyes. Splash! And as that giant body fell violently, water spray as vicious as a hailstorm spread out to everywhere. Yuk! Kim Yurin landed gently on the walkways on the side of the river, but stumbled a little before finally kneeling down on one knee. She was experiencing a bout of dizziness thanks to the depletion of mana. She still had around half of her total strength left, but it was her first time spending that much mana in a single strike ever since her rookie days back when she still hadn't got the proper control of her own trait down yet. But there was no time to rest. She quickly wielded an artifact made out of a crystal, and right away, the voice belonging to a knight in the Raven Order hurriedly leaked out from it. There is a Leviath, what did you say? However, it wasn't because they had already found out about the Leviathan situation in the Han River. Miss. There are chaos developing in the areas of Nam Mountain in Seoul, the monster field in Kanwan Province, as well as in the city of Busan. The situation in Busan is the most critical, as a fissure is about to erupt there as we speak. So many incidents, all of them breaking out simultaneously. Miss Yurin. This was an unprecedented situation in her career as a knight. And as she stood there, maintaining as much composure as possible while trying to come up with a countermeasure, there was a voice calling out to her. It was USAE Young and Kim Yurin. Do not come here. It's dangerous. Yurin shouted out, but they showed no concern and came towards her. Are you alright? And what the heck is that thing? Kim Sae Jin asked as he helped Kim Yurin to stand up with the aid of USAE Young. Yurin replied in a complicated expression. It's a leviathan. Huh. At the words containing a mixture of emotions, USAE Young became speechless for the moment. A leviathan. That mythical monster shouldn't even be here. But fortunately for us, it's only a summon. I just need to find the summoning medium which I'm sure is nearby. However, chaos is breaking out not only here and because of that, the available manpower is. Can you guys lend me your help? A temporarily summoned monster would be sent back to where it came from if the creature's powers were exhausted to a certain degree, or when the summoning medium disappeared, or when the summoning time expired. So, if the summoning medium were to be destroyed, then this disaster would easily be put under control. And it was not too difficult to figure out where the medium could potentially be hiding at the bottom of the river, of course. The real issue was the time. 
With only 5 minutes, or 10 with one more attack from Kim Yurin, it was just not enough to scour the entire riverbed. But waiting for the summoning time to expire would cause too much harm to the city. We will help. Usae Young and Kim Sae Young replied in sync. Yurin gave them some simple instructions and then dived into the river. Usae Young too, followed her right after. However, only Sae Jean took a step back. He had no idea what this medium thing might be, but he figured that there would be some form of aura coming off of it. As Sae Jean took in the panoramic view of the river from a distance, his eyes changed to a golden color. The world brightened, and everything became much clearer. From the Leviathan, a green aura signifying the fainted state rose up. But seeing that the richness of the color was becoming less vibrant, there didn't seem to be much time left. He hurriedly searched the surface of the river for any signs of nearly imperceptible aura. He couldn't see anything on the surface. That only left the possibility of the underwater. He continuously lowered the level of his gaze until he finally found it. On the opposite side to where he was, a thick, wavering bluish aura a fair distance away from him. That's it. He ran towards the spot without a moment's delay, and then, jumped into the river. As expected, the whirlwind dash was an incredibly useful skill that could be activated even while in water. He created powerful waves as he swam forward. He needed three minutes to get to the spot where he detected the aura. As soon as arriving here, he quickly dived underwater. The wolf's eyesight was incomparably bright even while below the water's surface. Sae Jean could see without trouble, the mysterious magic circle drawn on the bottom of the river, and a strange scale rooted in the middle of it. He swam down and downwards, and when he got to the bottom, he first activated the wolf's claws. Since the magic circle was drawn with mana, he thought that in order to destroy it he had to slice it up real good. But before Sae Jean could swing the extended nails, the river water violently churned and vibrated. Wuong. The leviathan was waking up. That horrid wail mimicking the ship's horn resounded again. However, that wail was cut short with a puck, a sound of powerful impact, and soon after, another set of rough waves traveled across the river's surface. What the hell was that all about? Sae Jean was slightly surprised by this sudden and strange development, but returned his focus back on the magic circle. Because he was underwater, his movement was rather slow. SFX for swinging one's arms around underwater. Sae Jean swung his nails around several times, but there was no change. My skill level is too low to do this in the human's appearance. Reluctantly, he transformed both of his arms into that of the wolf beasts. Almost instantly, his arms grew bigger and black fur sprouted out. The wolf's brutal attacks were vicious enough to cut through water. He swung the claws as hard as he could. And like that, the water was really cut apart. In that brief instance, the water in contact with his claws evaporated. Wow. But again, there wasn't enough time to blankly admire the power of his claws. He swung his claws towards the magic circle like a madman. Every time he swung the claws, the aura became weaker until eventually, it disappeared completely without a trace. When he took a glance at the bottom, even the magic circle had disintegrated. And at the same time, the gigantic monster threatening to cause an untold amount of damage had also vanished. Sae Jean reverted back to his human appearance and tried to get back to the surface. However, that small scale at the center of the magic circle entered his eyes. A sort of curiosity took hold over him. So, he reached out, grabbed it and swam back up to the surface. 4. As he broke the surface of the water after completing his mission, the chaotic scene on the river banks assaulted his eyes and ears. The sounds of sirens pierced the heavens the soldiers in their green camel gear and their tanks were positioned above the bridges and there were numerous knights clad in mana getting ready to jump into the battle littering the riverside. Even though their attire and their roles were different, their reactions were remarkably similar to one another. All of them were in the middle of absent-mindedly searching the surroundings. That was because the cause of this emergency situation, the Leviathan, had just vanished into the thin air. Foo. Sae Jean watched them for a bit, before heading towards the shore. But something else caught his attention again. This time, though, 
it wasn't some random stuff. It was Kim Yurin, who was wearily swimming near the spot where the Leviathan used to be. He swam out towards her position. His speed was really fast so it didn't take him long to get to where she was. Are you alright? Even though she nodded yes without saying a word, her pale face was saying otherwise. Hold on tight. At his prompt, she grabbed his clothes tightly and asked. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, did you, do it? Eh. The summon cancel. Ah, that. Yes. I got lucky and found the magic circle. Kim Yurin couldn't say anything anymore she simply leaned her head against his chest and closed her eyes. It seemed that the price she paid to knock out the giant leviathan twice was not a joke. It was quite an obvious thing, if one thought about it. The leviathan was the king of the oceans, the legendary creature that even something like a kraken would avoid getting into a tussle within the confines of the sea. She knocked out such a legendary magical beast not once, but twice so, it'd be even more weird if she was perfectly normal afterwards. Hurry! Stepping back on the solid ground, S.A.E. Jean handed Yurin over to the rescue party. The emergency personnel quickly surrounded her and took her to a waiting ambulance. Miss Knight. Are you okay? Her pulse is normal. And just like that, all attention was focused on Kim Yurin only, and he became completely forgotten all of a sudden. S.A.E. Jean carefully surveyed his surroundings for a bit, before taking a closer look at the thing clenched securely within his grasp. A single, brilliantly shining scale. So glossy and soft, yet stronger than any metal known to man, thus no blade could even think about leaving a blemish on it. Without a doubt, it was a scale from the Leviathan. And the main reason why the magic beast of the oceans could be brought here with nothing but a summoning magic. He then promptly swallowed it. He didn't even know why he did that. Just that, his instincts made him do it. And right in that moment, a strange change occurred inside his body. Chapter, 43 Condition complete. When one more condition is fulfilled, the wolf form will evolve into lycanthrope. 23. After ingesting a divine material, an unknown ability has been unlocked. A new monster form, Feeble Sea Monster, is now available. The host can now move and breathe underwater as if he's on land. A passive skill, Ruler of the Water, level F, has been acquired. A passive skill, Leviathan Scales Level F has been acquired. It felt like his innards were boiling. He didn't even have enough leeway to read all the rising alert windows. He could only think about returning home right now. Somehow, he had enough power of reasoning left to ask a favor from USA Young. She panicked somewhat and called for a car when he told her that he needed to get home right away. He couldn't remember what else transpired after climbing into the car. As he tried very hard to control his burning insides and the unstable consciousness, he found himself back inside his house already. Having changed into the wolf form after exhausting the time limit for being human, which happened while he was blacking out intermittently. He breathed out a sigh of relief and made a solemn promise to himself never to eat anything that looked even a wee bit suspicious from now on. Kim Yurin opened her eyes. The first thing she saw was an unfamiliar white ceiling. I must have fainted. It was an obvious result since she had used up the very last scrap of mana inside her. She relaxed her aching body with a gentle stretching of her muscles and slowly raised her upper body. There didn't seem like anything was amiss, only that her back felt a little stiff. So. Where am I? She looked around the room and tilted her head. To call this place a hospital her room was just too big and luxurious for that. But it did seem like a hospital, as there was a needle in her arm connected to an four drip, as well as the strong stench of medicines wafting in the air. Well, the definite proof was the patient gown she had on at the moment. Kim Yurin stood up from the bed and slowly walked towards the door to the side. When she grabbed the doorknob and pushed it, the door opened incredibly smoothly. And there was yet another room. Ah, you've woken up. A young girl lying on a comfy couch in this living room? Quickly bolted up. It was USA Young. Ah, uh, Miss S.A. Young. Where am I? How did I end up here? This is a hospital. The Dawn Hospital's VVIP room, to be exact. That's that, 
but is your body all right? Oh, I'm feely. Please, feel free to talk to me without honorifics. TL, yes, Kim Yurin has been using honorifics when talking to either USAE Young or to RMC. USAE Young's eyes were sparkling brightly. As that appearance was adorable like that of a puppy, Kim Yurin ended up giggling as well. If you're okay with it, then I understand. I'm feeling fine. By the way, what happened to other situations? As expected of her, what she wanted to know the most was the current status of the situations the news regarding the monsters rampaging around in the Nam Mountain in Seoul. In the city of Busan as well as in the monster field of Kanwan province. Thanks to the timely mobilization and perfect prior preparations, they have all been suppressed successfully. And because of your intervention, we were able to prevent the Leviathan from causing lots of harm, too. Mm -hmm. Yurin tilted her head. Indeed, she was responsible for knocking out the Leviathan, but the real decisive contributor to ending the threat early was the hunter Kim Sae Jean. But, why hasn't this girl mentioned his name, too? What do you mean by that? And also, where's Mr. Sae Jean right now? Sae Jean Appa went home as soon as the incident ended, saying there was something he needed to attend to urgently. But what's wrong? When USAE Young asked with a delicate gaze, Yurin scratched the back of her neck while replying to her. Well, that actually, Mr. Sae Jean played the biggest role wait, are the media also saying I did it alone? Eh. Sae Jean Appa did what? Behind the surprised Sae Young, a news broadcast from the TV could be heard. The knight responsible for ending the Leviathan incident has now been identified as the 41st highest tier knight in Korea, Miss Kim Yurin. Knight Kim Yurin continuously demonstrated her overwhelming martial skills to beat down and knock out the Leviathan twice before the creature could start causing harm to the city. Hawu. Yurin let out an odd sigh. Being omitted from the results of a battle it was one of the mistakes she intensely disliked while serving as the country's highest tier knight. If one looked at it in a different way, then it was also akin to stealing one's achievements from the battle, which was an act she abhorred with passion. We need to correct this. A press conference sh. You want to hold a press conference? Yurin nodded her head. It's because the hunter Kim Sae Jean's role was crucial, you see. It was him who cancelled the summoning, after all. Usae Young's eyes went totally round at the revelation of something she had no idea of. Then, as if she remembered something in this instance, she quickly spoke out. Ah, I think there is. No need to do a press conference, actually. Mm -hmm. Why not? When Yurin showed a puzzled expression, the smiling Usae Young took a couple of steps to reach and grab the curtains covering the windows. Well, we've got a plenty of reporters camping outside. SFX for opening a curtain. Then, she pulled the curtains wide open. Almost at the same time, countless small explosions of lights went off, as if to embroider the night sky. They were from the flashing cameras of the reporters who seemed to supernaturally realize that the curtains were about to be pulled. Yurin dumbfoundedly stared at those fireworks of lights. It was the hunter Kim Sae Jean who braved the dangers to dive deep beneath the river to erase the summoning magic circle of the Leviathan. I was only there to provide support. While watching Kim Yurin's interview on TV, Sae Jean was talking to someone on his mobile phone. I'm truly sorry. I also didn't expect things to devolve this way oh, did you have to buy a new phone? Yes. But it's quite alright. I was planning to buy a new one anyway. The person on the other side of the line was the one doing the interview, Kim Yurin. After finding out about Sae Jean's condition, she procured his numbers for the new mobile phone from USAE Young and gave him a call. And that. Well, it's not something to feel bad about, I guess. Actually, it worked out better for me. The impact from Kim Yurin's interview was huge. He had become the no. One real-time search topic, and requests for interviews flooded in and the officials from the city of Seoul asked him if he could make some time to come and receive an award of commendation. Also, Several knights' orders called him. They were not the famed orders ranked 56th position or higher, but almost all the orders below them did contact him. They all asked him if he ever thought about becoming a knight, instead. Kim Sae Jean refused them all and bought another phone. 
This phone was registered under his own name. The previous one was actually registered under Hazeline's name, as that device was kind of like a gift she gave to him. Is that so? But, still. Kim Yurin blurred the end of her sentence, her tone still apologetic. No, I'm really alright. But if you insist well, you can buy me another meal later on, then. Will that be really alright with you? Of course. Well then, in Seoul. No, for me, Seoul is a bit. Oh, is that so? Then, I'll go to Kangwon province next week. Sae Jean ended the call with Kim Yurin here and got up from the couch. Today, there was still one more thing left to do. It was a decision he had arrived at after a lengthy deliberation. He went to the Yozian Alchemy House. The building in front of ours? Yes. Outwardly, the purpose of his visit was to rent the building in front of the Alchemy House. Hazeline had even resorted to getting a loan in order to buy buildings in front and next to her Alchemy House and now, Sae Jean was requesting to rent the one in front. Ah. Uh. But why? I'd like to listen to the reason first. She originally planned to set up a special exhibit for the Goblin Alchemist in the front building, so she was asking him in a slightly reluctant tone. That I was thinking of opening up an armory. Sae Jean was getting tensed up for some reason. Sure enough, Sae Jean was planning to confess the truth of him being the orc blacksmith to Hazeline here today. Aha! So, it's for your friend the blacksmith, right? Then, of course, I welcome it. A free air. What do you mean? When Hazeline reacted positively while clapping her hands, Sae Jean's expression became momentarily dumbfounded. Ah, uh, I've got pretty keen senses, you know. I thought that voice in the grand finale of the blacksmith's tournament sounded really similar to your own voice, but since there are people with similar type of voices, I didn't think much of it, until. Until? Some weird people started showing here those morons ahem, I mean, slightly lacking individuals. Saying stuff like the orc blacksmith was a woman and such. At her words, Sae Jean scratched the back of his neck. It was a blunder on his part. It couldn't be helped since he had to somehow communicate with the judges in the blacksmith's tournament, but it was him who trusted wholesale the words of the TV station people when they said they would keep the secret. That's when it clicked for me. Your friend is the orc blacksmith, and you acted as the orc for your friend who, for personal reasons, could not appear in public. Speaking up to here, Hazeline let out a triumphant snort. However, she was utterly mistaken. And he had to correct her right this instant. Even if it was just one person, he wanted to tell the truth about him to someone he could trust. He just could not live while hiding his f***ing situation forever, nor did he plan on doing that. Miss Hazeline. What I'm about to tell you, until I'm ready, you must keep it as a secret between us. Out of all the connections he had built up with his two hands like building a sand castle, didn't the one with Hazeline run the deepest? Although it had only been half a year, Sae Jean hadn't known anyone for a longer period of time than he did with Hazeline and also. Even if it was actually just her investing for the future, she still lent him a large sum of money without hesitation. Even if this trust was only a one-way street and she only thought of him as a product. The current him needed Hazeline's connections, her talents, and most importantly, her friendship where he would be able to discuss things without reservations. Yes. Hazeline's eyes went round, her head tilting slightly at the sudden seriousness of Sae Jean's atmosphere. Sae Jean breathed in deeply, before continuing on. And on that day, Sae Jean was able to clearly witness with his own two eyes, what would happen when a talented dark elf wizard was utterly shocked to the ends of this universe and beyond. Really, seriously, he got to experience the phenomenon of the poltergeist. Hazeline delayed the alchemy house's extension plan for now, and converted the top floor of the building in front to the orc's armory. She figured that even without advertisement, potential punters would queue up and so, instead of opening the armory on the ground floor and having a swarm of riffraff there. It'd be a lot smarter for marketing purposes to operate on the customer's reserve their product's basis. Nice. On one of the walls of this yet-to-be-decorated interior, Sae Jean hung the golden plaque that read, The ORK Blacksmith, affiliated with the The Monster, dot. For now, it was gold-plated, but soon, it'd be in real gold. Are you almost done? 
As he stood there thinking, Hazeline approached and asked him. Yes. All that's left to do, is to find someone to work here. You don't have to worry about that one. I've already got a dark elf with heavy lips ready in the wings. Before that, though, have you received orders already? Of course. I've received word from the Dawn Knight's order that, as long as the product is better than a mid-quality, then they'd pay a minimum of two. Seven million US. I hear that, since there are a lot of people trying to place orders, they are handing out numbered tickets as well. Chapter, 44 Oh, my gosh. Currently in the Orc's Forge. Even though it was named as a smithy, it was no different than an armory. It was decided that the ground floor of the building with the shop located on the top floor would be converted into a cafe. It was suspected that the customers for either the alchemy house or the armory that were waiting around with nothing better to do, might utilize the cafe's facilities. Hazeline's ideas were right on the money. Right now, the time was noon, when the knights would be beyond busy in the middle of hunting monsters. However, there was a huge crowd of knights populating the cafe at this very moment. Although there weren't any instantly recognizable knights ranked upper mid-tier or higher present, too many of the people here were who you'd call the true combat forces for the orders such as low mid-tier and mid-tier knights. At a rough head count, there seemed to be well over 80 here. Indeed, it was still in the early days, but Hazeline had a feeling that this business will become more successful than the initial estimates. She closed her eyes and tuned her ears to the surrounding conversations for a minute or two. Wow lots of knights are here. And check their emblems out. Oh, are they from the Raven? Every knight's order had an unique emblem emblazoned with the symbol of each organization. These emblems served as an identification to show which knight belonged to which order. You're right. The competition is fiercer than I thought. Hey man, I couldn't have imagined that I needed to go through an interview first before I'm allowed to buy a weapon, you know? A female knight uttered out a complaint that didn't sound like a complaint while sipping on her coffee. But isn't it fine? I mean, I can get a day off from work by saying, if I want to become an owner of the orc's weapon, I need to do an interview. Foo hut. You're right. I also didn't imagine I'd get the afternoon off, just like that. Right. By the way, uh, of course this blacksmith is pretty darn skilled, but this does mean that our weapons are also pretty rubbish, no? They were both waiting for the interview on the top floor, the orc's blacksmith. It was a bit odd to do an interview first if one wanted to buy a product, but it couldn't be helped. The demand far outstripped the supply, after all. So the employees had to persuade the knights by saying think of it as an interview to become the owner of the weapon. That's how much fame the orc blacksmith had gained among the knights thanks to the recent blacksmithing tournament. They believed that, right now he might be a rookie that had appeared like a meteor, but in the future, he'd surely become the biggest star that would brighten up the heavens. Mid-tier night, Mr. Ju Ji Hyuk. An employee emerged from the cafe's back door and called out a knight's name. Yes, that's me. A male knight promptly stood up and shouted out loudly. His emblem showed that he was from the Dawn Knight's order. It's your turn now, sir. Yes. The guy named Ju Ji Hyuk followed the female employee. Wong. The posture of Ju Ji Hyuk riding on the elevator looked rather uncomfortable. Even though he sensed nothing special or anything like that in the elevator, the slight vibration he felt made it seem high rent to him. His heart was palpitating greatly as well. To a knight, a weapon was similar to a lover he or she could spend the rest of their lives together. It was difficult finding a weapon that matched perfectly to the user to the point of wanting to use it for the rest of one's life. And if found, securing it also required a lot of sacrifices. That was why it was normal for him to be quite tense like this. Thinking this way, Ju Ji Hyuk worked hard to pull himself together. Ting. Before he knew it, the elevator arrived on the top floor and opened its doors. Gulp. He reflexively swallowed his saliva. It was after seeing the interior. There wasn't anything I catching here. Instead, only the chilly and grey wallpapers were plastered all over the place. However, they imparted a strange feeling of intense pressure on him, making his shoulders shrivel a little. 
The knight, totally unaware that Kim Sae Jin had imbued a special attribute to these wallpapers, couldn't help but admire the scale of difference the orc blacksmith seemed to have and started to move his legs. And Ju Ji Hyuk, while looking around, found a certain plaque. And his eyes nearly popped out from their sockets with surprise. The gleaming golden letters carved on the plaque said. The orc's forge, affiliated with the society, the monster. Please follow me. Ju Ji Hyuk woke up from the stupefied state with his mouth agape while staring at the plaque, when the female employee spoke to him. Ah yes. He followed the employee in soon, before realizing it, he was in front of the door to the manager's office. No doubt, the famous blacksmith would be waiting for him there. Please note, the interview will be conducted not by the blacksmith, but the chairperson of the society. Oh. Of course. The chairperson of the society would mean the mid-tier hunter, Kim Sae Jin. Even though he was merely a hunter, Ju Ji Hyuk heard that this man was nowadays becoming someone who shouldn't be ignored. That guy couldn't be underestimated at all. Please, you can enter right ahead. Ju Ji Hyuk nodded his head, and grasped the doorknob to the manager's office. If I am to become the new owner of a weapon crafted by Sir Ork the blacksmith, I am deeply confident of treating it better than anyone. I will perform careful maintenance at least three times a day. The Dawn Knight's Order affiliated knight, Ju Ji Hyuk, sounded like as if he was doing an interview with his life on the line. His face was terribly tense, his posture very upright, as he looked at the person in front. Is that right? Well then can you please tell me the type of weapon you mainly use? In here, the manager's office, an unexpected interview was happening right now. The interviewer was, of course, Kim Sae Jin and the interviewees that had already passed through prior were many mid to low mid tier knights. Those supposedly busy upper mid tier knights with some social status and a face to keep, only sent in a single request form per person. But ones with sincere needs ended up sending a multiple but the knights with lower ranks actually came to visit the armory personally. Well I mainly use dual handed swords, among them the Zwinger, Dot. I don't know if it's difficult to craft this type of a weapon, or the skills of the weaponsmiths who made it for me are lacking but. Most of the time, after I go on a hunt five times, or participate once in the fisher exploration, the swords end up breaking. Those were to the words that clearly demonstrated the reality of the current weapon drought. When a person possessed some modicum of ability, he or she would rather choose a profession such as knights or wizards that were cool looking and made lots of money, rather than bravely venture down the perilous path of blacksmithing. Even then, knights treated blacksmiths with disdain up until around five years ago, which made several existing smiths to quit the trade altogether. Though, they have begun showing some humility nowadays after realizing the urgency of the current situation. There was this one time, when the sword broke in the middle of the fisher exploration and caused me a great deal of trouble. Oh, is that so? By the way, if it's a swainder, it might cost a lot of money. A swainder was a great sword wielded by both hands, featuring a vicious outer appearance. If this guy was selected as the new owner for the weapon, then it would surely be a tough challenge for Sae Jean who had just about enough amount of mana for the job. Ah, uh, no, it's fine. I was aware of the cost when I chose it. I don't mean to brag, but our knight's order has a lending system which happens to be well organized and quite reasonable, so. Ha ha ha. Even the laughter coming from this young man, who resembled a simple and honest youth from a rural farmstead, sounded sincere and pure. Sae Jean chuckled lightly as well, and told the knight that he understood so he should return and wait for a good news. Oh, and please, don't lose heart even if you fail the evaluation. As you may have guessed already, there have been just too many knights requesting for weapons, so it's simply impossible to satisfy them all. I understand. Since I'm looking for a weapon to use for the rest of my life, of course I should try again even if I don't make it the first time. As a mid-tier ranked knight, he would have achieved so much and kicked many asses, but this guy remained humble right until the end as he made his exit. And as the one night left, without the time for a break, the female employee came into the office and confirmed the next reservation. Sae Jean did a quick check on the amount of time he could spend as a human. Around two hours. Figuring that he could do another twenty interviews or so, he told her to let the next person in. Even though he was busy, 
strangely enough he felt rather great at the moment. Currently, a new rumor was spreading around in various knights' orders. It was about the orc blacksmith joining the society, the monster. Although the name of the orc blacksmith had not been added to the members' list for the society yet. The rumor began from those utterly shocked knights who had personally went and visited the orc's forge and saw the plaque there and started telling other knights about it. But it's a relief, isn't it? Since our Miss Kim Yurin has a connection with that society's chairperson. Uh. Currently, they were in the conference room of the Raven Knights Orders Team 1, which Kim Yurin was a key member of and it was a rest period after a hour-long intense meeting had taken place. Knights were yapping on about this and that to relieve the stress when, out of the blue, the arrows of attention were directed towards Kim Yurin's way. You're so right. We have that, right? What a relief the heads of other orders are supposedly agonizing over on how to make a nice and smooth contact, or so I hear. Oh, right, Miss Yurin. My weapon is a bit. A female knight, while making an intentionally pitiful expression, unsheathed a longsword with nicks here and there on the blade. She sheathed back her weapon after Kim Yurin stared at her with an expression of disbelief, but her expectations still burned true. I'm going to have dinner with the person later, so I'll ask, okay. Wah, really? Oi. Kim Sujayam. While other knights were chatting away in a lively fashion, Kim Sujayam was the sole exception. His expression remained sour as if there was something he wasn't satisfied about. Fop. Miss Yurin, I think this guy is jealous that you're going out on a dinner with another man. How dare a greenhorn mid-tier, and a wet behind the ears brat like you eye up our highest tier knight. No, no, that's not true. The female knight spoke teasingly after accurately deciphering his mood Kim Sujayam then denied everything by waving both of his hands this and that, all the while his face was dyed totally in red. That's enough with the teasing. Any more of that, and Sujayam's face might just burst wide open, you know. Plus, don't just rely on me and you guys go there first yourselves. It's not like a weapon can be made overnight or something. EII how can I go and visit a rookie blacksmith when my rank is upper mid-tier? Of course, if he can make me a high-quality product that will withstand my mana output, then sure, I'd go there and get down on my knees but, it's not just related to me, the pride of the entire Raven Knight's order is at stake here. The female knight briefly stopped talking and narrowed her brows. It seemed she was irritated by just thinking about the matter. It can't be done, unless it's like Miss Yurin meeting up socially with the boss of the smithy or whatever I mean, if somehow the story gets leaked out onto SNS, then the assholes at Dawn and Goryeo might start disparaging us. Like, the upper mid-tier knight E. Hyrin, running out to meet the debutante blacksmith on her bare feet cause her weapon's rubbish or stuff like that. You. Fu Wu. That's the kind of attitude that made blacksmith's numbers to decline in the first place. Kim Yurin didn't spit above words out. It was because what the female knight said was not entirely inaccurate either. Indeed, it was becoming a common occurrence for the members of Dawn that were enjoying ascendancy to openly pick fights with them. A knight from the Dawn Order who was famous in the entertainment industry caused a hot controversy by provoking the raven with a selfie taken in the interior of the Dawn Order's building and uploading the image with the hashtag Best Knights Order in Korea. And although there wasn't any physical proof, it was almost a sure thing that there were part-timers busy posting comments on various SNS and portal sites. In this environment, the chances of a toxic rumor spreading around were high, if a upper mid-tier knight was seen visiting an armory of a blacksmith who had made his debut less than half a year ago. Even though there was only a difference of one word, the power and position of an upper mid-tier was far greater than a mid-tier. If mid-tiers were seen as the regular combat force, then one could say that the upper mid-tiers were the true core of that force. Of course, there had been cases of such a knight seeking out blacksmiths in the past. But those were when the blacksmiths in question were either artisans or masters, and when the knights were going there to receive the completed weapons. No matter how famous the orc blacksmith had become, he was not an artisan but a newbie. And the real reason why there was so much attention being paid to him was because of his uncertain pledge that he would craft a minimum of two weapons every month. So, the worries of the knight E. Hyrin was not unreasonable. In a way, this was a battle of pride standing proud until the folks at the dawn ranked upper mid-tier started visiting the blacksmith first. 
Obviously it was all a useless thing, but that was how the knights rolled. Whatever the case, don't expect too much. I also can't ask for a lot, you know. Of course. Well then, let's recommence the meeting. Ah ah. It's been only ten minutes, though. You're being noisy. The passive skill, ruler of the water, proved to be really useful. Ooh, it really became warm. The only fault with it was that he was using it on practical stuff only. S.A.E. Jean touched the surface of the water filled up in the bathtub and changed its temperature, so it was just about the perfect warmth for his body. This was one of the abilities of the level F passive skill ruler of the water, that depending on the level, the host can manipulate water at will. The water's temperature changed in an instant, of course. For now, all he could do with it was to boil a kettle for a cup of coffee, cook a ramen or like now, get ready to take a bath. But he had a feeling that as long as the skill level was high enough, there would be lots of ways to utilize this skill. Ow oh yeah. He slowly lowered himself in the bathtub with a satisfied expression. Then he thought about the feeble sea monster form. Should I change into it now? It was nice and all that his monster form had increased by one, but since it didn't sound cool, he had been delaying checking it out until now. But today, he was feeling good so, might as well. Itchem. Finally deciding on it, he changed into the sea monster form. No special fireworks or light show went off. Only that, his height decreased suddenly, and scales grew out on his skin like fur. Having changed into the so-called the feeble sea monster, S.A.E. Jean dumbfoundedly stared at the ceiling-mounted mirror. What the? Is this even a monster? To call it a monster? It was just too dn cute for that. Within those pair of excessively large and round eyes were lots of moisture, and all over his body there were white and soft scales covering him. Thanks to that, his white as a snowman body looked uselessly dainty and cute. In other words, he looked entirely like a baby harp seal except, with a horn on his head. An adorable animal that could rouse a person's protective instincts just by its appearance alone. No matter what, this was not a monster. Subconsciously, S.A.E. Jean rubbed his own cheek. His cheeks, full and round and stuff, looked oh so adorable. King. The sound coming out of his mouth even resembled a puppy. What the hell is this? Of course, he suffered a full-on panic attack at that moment. Chapter, 45 On the promised day with Kim Yurin the dinner, S.A.E. Jean was busy paying careful attention to his attire, going as far as even checking out the pages of fashion magazines. Although, his careful attention was nothing more than dressing up the same as on those pages. It's not bad. Weirdly, he looked better than he thought but not because he had plastic surgery or was suffering from the case of narcissism. Whatever the reason, the height of his human form had grown another 2 centimeters to 183, and his overall build became broad enough make any clothes look good on him. But, it really is weird. He slowly scratched his sharper than usual jawline and lightly questioned himself. It felt like even his face had gone through an imperceptible change. Almost like it's what a human version of a wolf might be. Wong. But his thoughts couldn't be sustained any longer as the phone resting on the table vibrated. I'll be arriving there soon. Where are you currently, Mr. S.A.E. Jean? It was a business-like message from Kim Yurin. After sending a quick reply, he pocketed the phone and stepped outside the house. Having arrived first, Kim Yurin waited for S.A.E. Jean inside the restaurant. As he texted and told her to order for him as he was fine with anything, she was doing exactly that when a call came through to her phone. She was wondering whether that was Kim S.A.E. Jean, but when she took a look, it was actually from a man named Chai Young-ho, a chief knight of the Team 3. A chief was one of the subdivisions of the high tier rank, and it denoted the position of the head of the high tiers. Ow, S.H.T. Her forehead creased the moment she saw those three words on the phone's display. Chai Young Ho. Even though her position as the highest tier was far higher, as his career spanned well over 25 years, he wasn't some nobody that could be treated poorly. On top of that, this guy was one of those types that skillfully utilized all of his considerable experience in manipulating the flow of conversations which made him a tough customer to talk to. Even if they were in the same night's order, she really, really didn't like this guy. Hello. 
she thought hard about ignoring him, but in the end, she answered the call. He was the kind of person to come intruding if she didn't. It was far more preferable for her to end it with a phone call rather than go through the ordeal of speaking face to face with him. Oh, it's you, you're in. So, I heard. You're going to meet with the society chairperson Kim S.A.E. Jean, yes. She spat out a long sigh from the get-go. Even though she was in the higher position, he always addressed her with barely any acknowledgement towards her superior position. TL, the entire exchange between Kim Yurin and this Chai Young-ho is very difficult to TL, as the guy uses incredibly patronizing speech patterns to treat Yurin like a child. I did what I could, but oh well. And if she showed displeasure, then he would endlessly repeat, I've known you since you were 13 years old. Know what, exactly? He'd been forever trying to keep her in check but seeing that he was a contemporary colleague of her father, there wasn't a whole lot she could do. I'm about to meet him. That was why, all she could do was lament and resign herself into accepting it as the case of age before beauty. Since the call got through, the meeting hasn't started yet, am I correct? But you should have informed me in advance when you made the appointment with Kim S.A.E. Jean. You also know very well the equipment problems our people are suffering from. For instance, Young Jean's weapon he bought two weeks ago broke already. It's been only two years since Knight Young Jean became an upper mid-tier. What happened that time was normal. You already know this, so why did you bring that up? Hua. That is exactly one of the many problems you have, Yurin. You think it's okay for us to play the waiting game Kiam? Just tell me where you are. I think it'll be better for us if I go there personally. Wouldn't Kim S.A.E. Jean be happier to talk to two important figures of the Knight's Order? A promising gem like him needs to be nurtured properly early on. So, that was his real intentions. Of course, Chai Young-ho was an outstanding individual during his childhood which allowed him to become a high knight. But as the aging process took its toll on him who had no special trait to fall back on, he resorted to relying only on the personal connections to survive until now. It went without saying that his connections were truly incredible. Even if he caused a disharmony within the Raven Knight's order as he did just now, Yurin's father could not discard the man simply because of that point alone. The words that best described the connections of Chai Young-ho was the founding member of the society, Trilogy. Nothing else mattered, really. There is also the matter of Kim Sae Jean having a deep relationship with the Goblin Alchemist. That means you alone is definitely not enough. By the way, Yurin, I asked you where you are, so why aren't you answering me? Ah, uh, so, where is this, you ask? Right on cue, she heard a chime from the restaurant's entrance. Yurin turned her gaze over there. It was Kim Sae Jean. Oh, he's here already. Talk to you later. He's there. Hey, wait a. Yurin immediately hung up. She stood up from her seat to greet Sae Jean. This man was just too eye-catching even from a distance after all, the man happened to be built like a champion athlete. Were you waiting for long? As he smiled and sat on the opposite side, the familiar smell rushed in against her senses. Oh, no. I also arrived just now. She too, replied with a smile. Unlike the earlier expectation of things being awkward, there were plenty of topics to discuss for the two of them. Such as, how did he find the Leviathan Summoning Circle, whether the Orc Blacksmith indeed joined the Society or not, what were S.A.E. Jean's plans moving forward, and if the Goblin Alchemist disliked the Raven Knight's order, etc., etc. Kim S.A.E. Jean answered as truthfully as possible. Even though the dinner was only 30 minutes long, the results achieved during it were still tangible. Me joining the Society I think it'll be difficult. After the great dinner had ended, Yurin had to refuse him with some difficulty outside the restaurant. Is that so? That's a bit regretful, but can't be helped, I guess. Oh, by the way, here. Please take this. Strangely enough, S.A.E. Jean showed not an ounce of ill mood while accepting her answers. No, he actually gave her a gift, instead. With the orc smithing technique, it was possible for him to use other materials besides metal so he crafted a present especially for her. What is it? Yurin curiously looked down on the box that was already within her arms. 
It's a gift, to ensure the Raven Order and my society can enjoy a friendly relationship. Eh. Oh I am grateful, but I haven't prepared anything. She dug through her pockets hoping to find something but alas, there was obviously none. It's fine. It wasn't all that expensive, anyway. Oh, right here's something else as well. After watching her reactions with a satisfied expression for a bit, S.A.E. Jean pulled out a piece of paper from his inner pocket and handed it over to her. And what could this be? This paper, treated in special coding, could only be written on with mana. It was one of the security features applied to important contract documents. A weapon application form? Yurin dazedly read the letters written on the form before straightening her neck with a surprised face. Yes. Miss Yurin can use it for herself, or give to a subordinate you find promising. Once you have filled in the preferred type of weapon as well as the combat style, you can send it over to me. Then I'll pass it on to the blacksmith. Uh, will it be fine? But. Mr. S.A.E. Jean isn't the blacksmith. She swallowed these words down and simply stared at the man with a pair of very round eyes. It's all right. The blacksmith said he's a fan of Miss Yurin, so he can spare the time to craft at least one weapon for you. Well thank you very much. Oh, and please give my thanks to the blacksmith as well. Politely bowing her head, Yurin carefully pocketed the application form inside her coat. Hi Rin, please give it to me. Sung Ho, no, it should be me. My weapon is about to break as we speak. Hi Rin, who the heck are you to BT in here? Get lost. As soon as she returned home, Yurin took a photo of the application form SAE Jean gave her and uploaded it onto the private chat room for the Team 1. Predictably, all hell broke loose. When she checked after taking a shower, there were 999 unread messages in her inbox. Yurin read the contents with a content expression, before posting a new message while looking rather serious. One week from today I'll give this form to the person achieving the highest position in the internal rankings. And their reactions were fast. The eleven members of the team won, who wouldn't even bother to reply no matter what crazy antics were used during normal times, all showed positive responses within zero. One seconds. A few. While shaking her head and saying these guys are helpless, Yurin still had a full smile on her face. Ah. I forgot. She only then remembered the boxed gift S.A.E. Jean gave to her. The blame solely laid with the ridiculous impact that single piece of paper had. Could it be a piece of equipment? Yurin took the box and climbed on top of a couch. Without much thought, she opened the lid. Her mind blanked out for a second or two. Because, in this box, it was not a piece of equipment, nor was it a weapon no, there was a seriously cute doll of a harp seal inside. No, on a closer inspection, it was not a seal. It sure resembled one, but rather than fur, it was scales. Whatever it was, she still found it utterly adorable. And so, Kim Yurin ended up hugging the doll tightly without realizing it. And only after a long while of hugging the doll did she discover a card inside the box. There is a wonderful magic spell cast on this doll that will help you ease your mind and help you recover your stamina when you stay near it. It'll show a great result if you place it near you when going to bed. It was the very first doll Yurin received as a gift in her life. Another month had flown by. There were a lot of changes. First, S.A.E. Jean received an over-the-top celebration from the Monster Store employees for his rank advancement to the upper mid-tier. Then, the rank of his society also rose, from D to D. Of course, the Orc blacksmith produced two more weapons, as promised. One was a mid-quality rank swinger. It was for that night Ju Ji Hyuk who came to see S.A.E. Jean at that time. To match his fighting style, the weapon was imbued with the following attributes increased sturdiness, material destruction, weight reduction and stamina recovery for attributes that would shine brightly on the front lines. The appearance of Ju Ji Hyuk after receiving his weapon, what with very large tears threatening to burst out from his wet eyes, was altogether a memorable scene that S.A.E. Jean found a bit hard to stay and bear witness at the same time. The other weapon was a high-quality product, a long sword. And this one went to an upper-mid-tier ranked knight named E. Hyrin who was a subordinate of Kim Yurin. 
she was apparently someone famous enough to shoot TV commercials. The sole attribute imbued in this sword was bending, level C. This long sword would twist and bend according to her will, which made it difficult to predict where it would strike. E. Hyrin must have found the weapon very much to her liking because S.A.E. Jean received her three-page long handwritten letter the following day. For some reason, the letter also contained her selfies, signed autographs, and her private phone numbers. I might become an artisan at this rate. And now S.A.E. Jean was having a laugh while reading the reactions of the internet. The photos both E. Hyrin and Ju Ji Hyuk uploaded to SNS caused a stir not only locally but abroad as well. But, what the hell is this? It had been a long while since he last read the comments sections, but as he read more, his eyes spotted something rather strange. A bro I know is a knight in the Raven Order, and he says that as long as you have dinner with Kim Sae Jean, he'll get you a weapon, just like that. He will give you an application form, and when you fill it up, the weapon of your choice will be made for you. I even saw the photo of it. Upvoted 539 downvoted 113. A bro I know is the Lekan. He'll find you and murder you. He will rip you apart like he did with those vampires, so what you're gonna do, eh? I am a currently serving knight, and even I heard that rumor as well. The moron above me must be an escaped mental patient. FCK off. Have a meal with him and you get an application form. It's the truth. But it should be very difficult to have a meal with him. Who the hell wrote this piece of garbage and pass it off as truth? Still, he found all of this cute, so he just chuckled and moved on to the next article. Chapter, 46 The reason why a weapon was important to a knight wasn't solely because it was directly linked to his or her survival. It was, in a way, an expression of a certain gap within the same tiers. When the abilities were similar no, when the abilities were just about the same the strength of the weapon would separate the two, and the ranks would be divided. And such a division would determine everything for the knight affected by it the annual salary, the fame, the prestige, etc., etc. SFX for a sword swinging in the air. A heavy sword left behind a clear afterimage in the air as it descended. The aim of this terrible strike was a type of turtle. However, it was not an ordinary turtle at all. No, it was the big giant turtle. It was a big and rare monster that had to have two words stuck to its name just to signify how huge its size was. TL, yes, that's the monster's name in the raw. Hell, the author even wrote that in Korean version of the English words. This creature came about when a turtle couldn't absorb mana properly and ends up mutating into a monster. It wasn't particularly strong, but the strength and the hardness of its shell was not something to scoff at. Hell, the dang thing even possessed a sort of immunity that would negate a certain portion of every attack containing mana. So, although the payoff was quite good for its shell which could be made into weapons or armor, those knights who relied on mana rather than physical strength could only give up on hunting this monster. Oh. This time, however, was different. The Zwainder, made out of black steel and currently wielded by Ju Ji Hyuk, easily sliced apart the tough shell of this turtle. This was the resulting synergistic effect of the weapon's attribute, material destruction, and Ju Ji Hyuk's skills with the heavy sword. Now that's something else. I honestly believed that when your trade of heavy sword master became known, you'd be stuck in the mid-tier for the rest of your life you sure did get a great weapon, huh? Ji Hyuk's fellow knight who bore witness to this event sent out a glare and some words, both containing slight jealousy. But Ju Ji Hyuk didn't mind that and simply scratched the back of his neck while picking up the pieces of the turtle's shell. Ju Ji Hyuk's trait, heavy swords mastery. Dot. When he wielded a heavy sword that required the usage of both hands, he could demonstrate the maximum power and skills without any prior training whatsoever a completed trait, in other words, one that didn't need leveling up. That's why Ju Ji Hyuk could become a knight only a week after his trait awakened. However, it was wonderful only at the beginning since his trait was heavily affected by the weapons he wielded, it soon became his shackles and he ended up getting stuck in the mid-tier for the last five years or so. But that was until he got his hands on the orc Swainder. Haha <laughs> well, I guess so. Hey, by the way, you're going to sell that to the guys we promised to, right? Should I call them now? No. Ju Ji Hyuk stopped his fellow knight pulling out the phone. 
there is someone else that I'd like to give this to. Is that right? If it's like that, well but who are you going to sell it to? At the knight's question, Ju Ji Hyuk grinned widely. No, it's not selling, but paying back the favor. What? You're going to give that to the orc blacksmith, aren't you? Something that expensive? I'm gifting it precisely because it's expensive. As the big giant turtle was such a rare monster, the pricing of its shell per gram nearly equaled that of pure gold. It was the type of item that would easily fetch hundreds of thousands of dollars in the market if they sold it right away. You serious? The fellow knight's face became incredulous as he asked again. He was thinking that, how can a guy with a poor household even dream of giving away something so valuable? Yeah. However, Ju Ji Hyuk simply nodded his head with a smile on his face. The requests for interviews came in droves. Kim Sae Jin finally realized that there were so many media outlets in South Korea for the first time in his life when over 50 of them contacted him. Sae Jin was going to refuse them all at first, but then remembered the event in the past when the orc blacksmith got disparaged by the media. So, he gave the go-ahead only to four of the most reputable, well-known media outlets. But even that proved to be quite a trudge. Of course he understood where they were coming from, but well, just why did they have so many questions? Each of the interviews wasted a minimum of 30 minutes or so. On top of that, although it probably was nothing more than a gossip-style throwaway question, one of the reporters even asked him about the Lycan joining the society. The word Lycan was derived from the term lycanthrope, and even though that creature was seen as another species of human, it still had some outer resemblance with monsters, so that was enough of the connections for this guy. Ah, well then, this is the final, final, final question. Are you planning to admit new members to the hottest society in town, the monster? Whether it's a public, open recruitment, or as a special case. I mean, isn't it true that many, many hunters and knights are eyeballing Mr. Sae Jean's society as their potential target for signing up? This was already the fourth final question. It made him suspect whether the final had various stages were not to go through, but Sae Jean still smiled resolutely and soldiered on. Well, there is no plan at the moment. Unfortunately, I'm the type to shy away from showing his face around too much. Aha! So, in order to join the society, firstly a person should become more friendly with you, is that it? Eh? Ah. Well, yes. It's something like that. Fortunately, that really was the last question. The reporter thanked him for his time and bowed, before leaving altogether. Thanks to that, the time limit for the human form was running perilously close. As he was hurriedly getting ready to go home, someone knocked on the door to his office. Who is it? It's Euphras. T.L. Euphras was one of the employees for the armory Hazeline had selected. Her official role was a manager of the employees. As her western name implied, her race was an elf, and as a result, her pride was quite high. Was there something else? A knight named Ju Ji Hyuk has sent a present for you. Euphras brought the gift box and placed it on top of the manager's desk in a display of utmost respect and politeness, and without showing her back to him, carefully exited the office. Apparently, that was the elf's way of showing respect to a superior or some such. A present? Sae Jean looked at that black box for a bit, before lifting open the lid without thinking too much about it. Shell pieces? The contents were puzzling, to say the least. Why would he send a present of these things? But before he could finish that line of thought, the rising information window educated the ignorance of Sae Jean rather nicely. It's rated at the level B for potential strength? The level for potential strength signaled the maximum attainable ranking for the material after crafting was completed. At AB, it was just below that of adamantium. Along with the turtle's shell pieces, Ju Ji Hyuk even enclosed a handwritten letter as well. In it, he chronicled how much his life had changed thanks to the new sword, and just how grateful he was. What a swell guy. The expression of Sae Jean after he finished reading the letter was slightly unreadable. After all, he had never received such a sincere, heartfelt thanks from anyone in his life before. It was January the month of the harshest chills. The month of January might be so cold that most folks would rather not go outside, 
but it happened to be one of the most busiest months for the nights there was. Not only was the rank advancement exams held every half year taking place, there was also the matter of the knight's duel, which was a battle between knights with the honor of the participants and their orders hanging in the balance. Plus, they also had to be mindful of the so-called monster wave, that always broke out in the middle of the winter. On top of that, the battles of the knight's duel were broadcast live since five years ago, adding further burden to the participants. A few knights who enjoyed garnering attention to themselves obviously looked forward to the opportunity to flaunt their skills, however. I can feel the wall, you know. Thanks to all these situations, a young schoolgirl who should have enjoyed a winter school break was training like hell as a knight at the moment. A wall. What wall? You know, that thing. The insurmountable wall. Nowadays even my levels hasn't been rising. Oh. Right then, USA Young's voice stopped coming out of the phone. It was the slip of a tongue caused by her mind loosening up after finishing a lengthy training session just now. Your trait is a leveling up type. Yeah. Well, but, uh. If it's Appa, then it's okay to know, but please, keep it a secret, a secret, from other people, okay? When SAE Jean replied he got it, she then resumed unloading all her complaints to him. Obviously, she would have been under a lot of strain, as she became a knight before turning into a proper adult and had to train like there's no tomorrow for 14 hours straight every day. Ah, uh, my current win-loss count is 8 victories and 28 losses. I know I've been fighting against mid-tier knights only, but still, isn't this a bit too much? Oh, okay. By the way. S.A.E. Jean suddenly recalled a way he could help you S.A.E. Young out. The magic tattoos. Even if one argued a girl her age shouldn't get a tattoo, if it was the same color as her skin, it would not become a problem during the so-called normal life. He should know, as he already tattooed one of his arms. The tattoo he inscribed on himself had the following effects tattoos that store mana. Both the amount of usable mana, as well as the recovery rate for mana, increases. You don't want to try out a tattoo. Eh. What are you even talking about? As he expected, she replied in disbelief. After all, to inscribe a tattoo on not just any girl, but on the body of a precious descendant of a chable was TL, a chable is a Korean word for a massive business conglomerate, in case if you were wondering. Even he thought this was a bad idea. So, he muttered some incomprehensible excuse and tried to hang up. No, wait a second, Appa. Why did you suddenly mention tattoos? Is it linked to getting stronger somehow? However, USA Young had this insatiable need to become more powerful, and as her stubborn manner persisted, SAE Jean couldn't help but continue on from where he left off. Ah, the thing is it's related to my trait, see? This was not a lie, but the actual truth. The goblin's witchcraft technique was indeed a part of his trait. You can become a bit more stronger after getting a tattoo. Taking a mana stone and turning it into a liquid form by using the orc smithing technique, and then by using the witchcraft technique, this liquid mana is inscribed onto the body. After that, the usable amount of mana increased permanently, and the spent mana recovered a bit quicker. It was perhaps the greatest way to advance for a knight who was very sensitive towards his or her mana reserve. It wouldn't be incorrect to think of it as a type of an artifact that could be inscribed directly onto the body. Huh. That what is that? What do you mean? Unfortunately, SAE Jean's explanations were just too sparse to contain all the meaningful information for her. Ah, uh, you see, remember when I said my trait is related to my physical constitution? This tattoo thing is one of the ways to utilize my trait. When I inscribe a tattoo on you, depending on what ingredients are used, there will be different special effects. If you use a mana stone, your overall mana increases. Excuse me? Is that really possible? SFX for someone tumbling out of a bed in an undignified way. He could hear USAE Young messily getting up from her bed over the line. Yeah, it's real. Thinking that there was no reason to let one of his skills rot, he replied plainly to her. Ah, but, that a tattoo. I can do it in your skin color, so it won't show up too much. No, no that's not it. She took her sweet time before shyly continuing with the rest of her sentence. Wouldn't it be painful? 
What? When SAE Jean asked her back with a tone of disbelief, she began to ramble out her extensive excuses all of a sudden. No, that is not actually, I don't feel much pain when fighting monsters because of my trait, but, um, since this isn't a combat situation my trait won't probably apply, so it's possible it might hurt just a bit, right? It's not only me, but there are other knights like that too, you know. I mean, there are knights who are afraid of needles too. Of course, I'm not saying I'm like that. The following day, USAE Young came straight to SAE Jean's house. You. The tightly closed eyelids of USAE Young trembled ever so slightly. And that inexplicable tremble spread from her eyes to the rest of her body. Come on now, it won't hurt. SAE Jean thought her being like this, eyes tightly shut and her body shaking like a leaf, was quite adorable. But he couldn't start the tattooing process if she didn't stop shaking. He forcibly stopped himself from laughing out and admonished her. Yes. Please do it. Her shaking body remained the same, but her voice sounded strangely composed. I'm telling you, it's not going to hurt. So, just relax. As he said, the procedure didn't hurt. And the tattoo needle he wielded was just for him to draw a pretty image, that was all. Honestly, he could do the whole procedure with nothing but his own fingers. Chapter, 47 Yeah, I'm relaxed now. Please do it, Appa. Only then did her shaking lesson, just a tad. It was still a little bothersome but it was indeed a massive progress compared to that earthquake from before. Here we go. Okay. Oh, I want it in the flower yuk. When the instrument touched the shoulder bone on her back, the cold sensation crawled up her skin and assaulted her brain. She got surprised so bad, her body froze still in that moment. For SAE Jean, though, this was actually better. He quickly used the lull in her movement to draw on her white shoulder, like one would on a drawing paper. The chosen color was really similar to her skin. It would be hard to spot it with a concerted close-range inspection, and the color blended in with her skin so well, people would be unable to figure out whether she had a tattoo done or not from afar. As long as she didn't use mana, that was. If she accessed her mana during a battle or in some other instance, the area where the magic tattoo was inscribed would light up in blue and become very conspicuous. That was why the shape of the tattoo had to be considered carefully. It's all done. Eh. Having had its proficiency level raised by a few notches, the goblin's craftsmanship skill proved to be truly exceptional. Even though its effects would be a lot lesser as he was currently in the human form, the detailed tattooing process only required three minutes to complete. Already? Yeah. But the thing is, though. It's gonna hurt from now on. Those follow-up words, however, had to remain circulating within his mouth. Cook. Because, just before he could say a word, USAE Young's pitiful single-note whimper blocked him. Right away, she keeled over clutching her chest, and since he knew this would happen, SAE Jean swiftly moved to pick her up and gently laid her down on the couch. For the next ten minutes or so, like a very ill puppy, she could only suffer in silent agony, unable to even mouth a complaint. Only when the level of agonizing pain subsided to a level comparable to muscle ache did USA Young shoot him a resentful glare filled with tears. You said it wouldn't hurt. Why did you lie to me? My bad. Kim Sae Jean smiled awkwardly and scratched the back of his neck. Even with that, she remained furious, her lips pushing out in a pout and her eyes continuously glaring at him but as soon as she sensed the change within her body, her expression went a sudden shift. Her narrowed eyes opened up wide and her clenched jaw dropped to the floor. The person affected by the change could sense it better than anyone else. And not to forget, the mana stone she brought along as the base ingredient happened to be superior quality as well. So, although his magic tattoo only was at the skill level of D, as the ingredients used were just too good, she should be able to definitely sense the effects. Wow. The very first thing popping out from her open mouth was a short exclamation. So, how is it? Ah. Uh. She couldn't form a proper answer to his question and continued to clench and unclench her fists for a long time. She was currently trying to work out whether her mana reserve increasing was a dream or not. And in order to accept this situation as her new reality, 
she needed to waste another five minutes. W, woo. Appa, what the heck is this? Finally. At last. USA Young could indeed confirm that her mana had increased after checking her own status window. TL, so, there it is. I was always curious whether other trait holders could also access their own stat windows and such, but here's the proof that they can. That was the beginning of the madness. Kim Sae Jean had never, ever witnessed her express her feelings this violently, this intensely before. Jumping around all over the place with unbridled happiness, she then suddenly tried to rush in and grab hold of his collars as if to ask what the blooming heck is this? Before collapsing and fainting in the end from the aftereffects of her mana's increase. Sae Jean chuckled lightly and after grabbing the phone, he called her butler. If it was at all possible, he'd let her sleep it off here, but well, his situation didn't permit that. The goblin alchemist and the orc blacksmith. These two caused seemingly an insignificant but in actuality, a huge shockwave in the society as a whole. Firstly, the orc blacksmith. His existence alone brought great deal of hope to all the knights out there. The reason was his shocking pledge to produce two weapons per month. That pledge was kept for real and those two weapons found their ways into the hands of the owners. SNS, news articles, and those knights who had seen the products with their own two eyes, were all deeply astonished at their qualities. The ranks of the products easily exceeded the level of high quality. Most artisans and masters managed to produce a single item every year. So, this was like the orc splendidly smacking the heads of all those knights who were expecting to see, at most, upper mid-quality items from that two weapons a month pledge. And then, there was the goblin alchemist. Thanks to him, the potion drought that plunged the knights and the world of alchemy in anxiety came to a swift resolution. Triggered by the grand entrance of the goblin, the idle alchemists began supplying potions to the marketplace once more. And that's how knights' quests to hunt down monsters that had grinded to a halt became reinvigorated again. Unfortunately, this positive prospect only applied to the races living on this planet in a peaceful manner. And the race that was feeling very nervous right now at the waves of change brought on by the two geniuses was currently right here. The Nagas had sunk into the deep ocean, while the demon race is living a life of hell stuck in the boundary between the worlds. Truly these are the lamentable events, indeed. The base of operations for the vampires was, funnily enough, right next to the doorstep of the civilization. As a matter of fact, they occupied several buildings around the city of Seoul, one of them being this particular one named the Leon Crane, located on the outskirts of Gangbuk. The vampires didn't choose to own this building because of the classic mantra of hiding in plain sight, but simply because of their business interests. That's right in order to continue living in this capitalist world, even vampires had to get jobs. And that is how we are the only race remaining that still miss our old home world. Oh brothers, we are. Will you just shut the hell up? What will you bloody do, when the Lycan catches onto your magic communication? One other big point that separated vampires from the rest of the world besides the fact that they had to drink blood, of course was their strict adherence to a caste system. An absolute hierarchy system of the bloodlines, it just so happens to have some relation to the race-specific trait of the vampires. To these guys, talent was not some CP that the heavens decided to hand out randomly regardless of the inherited bloodlines. No, the greatness of a person was determined by the blood flowing in his or her veins. That was why, this kid in his early teens could speak rather rudely to an old man with a head full of white hair. Kiam. Hua uh, as I've said before, there is no need to worry so much. No freaking way. I am worried, and I am curious, too. I am curious to know how the hell the bloody Lycan found us in the first place. Those first-gen Suins screwed around with humans and became insignificant threats. Now, they can't detect us, isn't that right? They thought that, with the passing of all first-generation Suins, there no longer remained any race that could detect them. And that was how countless vampires blended in among the regular humans, and without a doubt, they would become the solid foundation for carrying out their upcoming grand scheme. But that thought process lasted until Lycan the mercenary made his entrance. The mother of King mercenary that had seemingly appeared like a falling asteroid, out of nowhere. Already, five vampires had lost their lives to this guy, 
and they were comrades taking somewhat important parts in their scheme. The elders, threatened by the existence of this leacon, commenced in a hurry with a plan that was clearly not ready yet, and the crudely put together operation couldn't even leave behind any form of lasting harm to the world of men. And so vampires began to think that the reason for all the missteps of their plans were because of the legendary mercenary, the Lycan. That is no one, absolutely nobody knows. What a rotten luck we have we just want to return to our home world, yet we keep running into obstacles. The home world. The place they lived before migrating to earth. When the end of their world approached with an imminent apocalypse, its inhabitants chose to migrate to another world, earth. Maybe the dwarves were right, when they said they might as well perish along with their home rather than migrate to another world. No, it is not. Dwarves died along with our world, but it is possible for us to go back to a living home world. Why the hell should we go back? Everyone's already dead over there. I explained to you the last time. Fool. The moment the vampires migrated to Earth forty years ago to this day they had continuously researched into the fissures, the gap that existed between the worlds or dimensions. When a fissure was ripped open until it could not be opened any further, a single possibility could occur. A legend clearly recorded in the annals of the ancient tome, the reversal of the time's axis. Vampires wanted to enter the deepest part of the fissure and return to the home world of the past. And maybe, avert the advent of the apocalypse before it happens. Are we sure it's going to work? If it all goes to hell in a handbasket, we won't be able to live here too, you know. Of course it'll work. Our wise lord, Rutkin has spoken. Are you doubting his millennia-old wisdom? That's not it. I'm asking cause I'm curious. Even if I have doubts, in the end I'll follow the commands of our lord and the elders, so you can stop worrying now. The boy replied with a nonchalant expression. And that is the right way of thinking. As expected of the pure blood of a nobility. The old man patted the head of the youth with a satisfied smile. Well then. Let us now commence with our plan, the fisher of the deep water. Let us first drag it out into the world. Yes. I've got the nameplate here with me. But, uh, what is this doll? It's small and fluffy and really adorable. Oh, that? Please keep it where it's most visible. It might seem like nothing much, but there's a special effect applied to it so you should place it near where you sell things. Kim Sae Jean gifted a similar plaque with the words affiliated with the society, the monster, to the Yosian Alchemy House at Hazeline's behest. And he also added a doll of what could very well be the baby Leviathan on top as well. A special effect? That's correct. Isn't it just too cute? It's just a simple doll, yet isn't it strangely attractive? That is the special effect I'm talking about. There was a special attribute added to this sparkling-eyed doll that would perfectly suit a shop. Sae Jean suspected that the alchemy house's takings should increase by at least 3% overall due to this attribute. Of course, he had already placed a doll on the counter as well as inside the manager's office in the Orc's Forge. Ah it's a mascot, isn't it? Trilogy's mascot is a tiger, right? Ours is a lot more cuter, though. Eh. Uh, yeah. Well it's better to be fluffy and cute, rather than all vicious and cruel and stuff, yes? And, if that creature fights with a tiger, it's going to win, hands down. He was telling the truth. If both of them were treated as fully grown real creatures then, even if that tiger was a great tiger, nay, a great saber-toothed tiger, it would still fly away into the nether with a single hit. Foot. I don't even know what to say to that. You're telling really tall tales every day now, aren't you? Ha <laughs> ha. I wasn't joking, though. Oh, if you want another one, just give me the word. I'll send it to you since it'll be nice to have it in your home as well. Thank you. Then, please send me another one. I like it sent, and it sure will be good to have one at home. He replied that he understood, and hung up the phone before turning his attention back to the TV screen. It was in the middle of broadcasting the night's duel. And currently, it was a showdown between the Dawn Knights Order and the Goryeo Order. Representing Dawn was USAE Young, while a female knight named Young Eun Ji was representing Goryeo. They seemed to have some sort of famous rivalry thing going from way back, 
according to the subtitles on the screen. Unfortunately, though, S.A.E. Young is going to win this one. The amount of mana was incredibly important to a knight to the point where you could say, along with the magic strength, it could be called the crucial factor in deciding the victor and the loser. Begin. The duel commenced on U.S.A.E. Young's body, mana rose and wrapped around her. The camera showed her body infused in blue mana, before focusing on her back. And now, everyone will know. On U.S.A.E. Young's back, precisely on her right shoulder bone, a single beautiful blue flower had blossomed on the surface. The adjective utterly beautiful, perfectly encapsulated the appearance of her back. The cameras seemingly didn't want to shoot anything else at all. Chapter, 48 Wow, what is that flower pattern? Why is it visible past the armors? Is it because her clothing type armor is thin? It's irritatingly pretty. Look how the camera is deliberately shooting only her back. The knight's duel was so popular, it was shown live on both the TV as well as on the internet SAE Gene was inclined towards the internet broadcast as he could check out the reactions in real time. Right now, the audience was paying far more attention towards the blue flower pattern that had emerged above the thin but strong armor, rather than on the battle itself. But that was just a momentary distraction. All those things that had very little to do with the fight itself were forgotten the very next moment. SFX for feet exploding off the ground. The first one to make her move was Yong Eun Ji from the Goryeo Knights Order. She kicked the ground hard and rushed towards USAE Yong. A speed as fast as a lightning, she arrived at the spot where S.A. Young was standing and slashed her sword with all her might. And the sword drawing an oblique line shot straight at her target's heart with a pinpoint accuracy. Clang! An ear-splitting noise resounded in the air, and from the blades in contact with each other, harsh sparks exploded out. And from this single encounter, Young Eun Ji who had attacked first, definitely understood the difference between them. 1. The difference in weapons. And 2. The difference in their mana. Unji could only bit down hard on her teeth. The gap in the quality of their equipment could be accounted for, somehow. After all, that girl was holding a weapon that every knight in this place was envious of the orc blacksmith's greatest work yet. But right now, there was another difference between them. Why? She couldn't understand why her mana was losing out to USAE Young's. There hadn't been such a disparity between them only a week ago. So, how come? And how did she? How could this girl experience such an explosive growth during that short window of time? Yong Eun Ji had to take a big step backwards. She hated to admit it, but there was no hope for her in a frontal assault. She had to search for an opening. It was right then. USAE Young's aura went a sudden change. Mana that had pooled around the blade's edge, let out a chilly blue light and her slightly bent forward body exploded outward like a loaded spring. Yong Eun Ji raised her sword to resist against the terrifying onslaught, but the ultra-quick sword slash simply destroyed her armor like tofu. The duel ended so quickly, it might as well be called anticlimactic. Even the referee was lost for words, and on the entire indoor arena thick silence descended down. Two strikes. No, if one was to think of the first sword clash was nothing more than to feel out the opponent, then this duel had ended in a single strike. Such an absolute result was unthinkable for a duel between knights of the same tier. But just who was Yong Eun Ji? Although she was older by two years, wasn't Yong Eun Ji an outstanding knight, someone who was comparable to USAE Young in terms of talent and the looks department? And taking the hint from the relationship between the Dawn and the Goryeo, the media called her the rival to USAE Young, even. And more importantly, such a massive gap like this did not exist during the last week's trial duels. Winner, USA Young. Remembering his role again, the referee hurriedly shouted out the result. How is it possible? With a hollow expression, Young Eun Ji muttered out dazedly. The wall. The limit one had to surmount in order to climb up higher, an opponent that sometimes seemed just impossible to overcome knights called that, the wall. And Eun Ji had felt that wall right now. In just one week, her opponent had changed in such a shocking manner. Just wait a. Young Eun Ji turned her crazed eyes towards USAE Young. But already, SAE Young had disinterestedly turned her back on her, 
and was walking towards the exit for the victors as if she didn't even play Soon Ji in her eyes. She didn't even stop to shake the hand of the defeated. That bitch. At the sight of her mannerless appearance that showed total disrespect, Yong Un Ji clenched both of her fists tightly and gritted her teeth. USAE Yong, meanwhile, had to deal with the mic of a reporter shoved into her face the moment she entered the exit. It was nominally an interview for the victor. She didn't really like doing this, but still, knew enough not to refuse one outright during a live broadcast. What is the real identity of the tattoo on your back? The whole world is dying to know. The reporter made a quick and simple congratulatory greeting, and then immediately brought up the matter about her tattoo. Since she already heard from SAE Jean that the tattoo would become visible through the clothing once she utilized her mana, USAE Young could nonchalantly continue on with the interview. I'll reveal the truth at a later date. It's not something I can arbitrarily decide to share on my own. I apologize. Eh. Oh. Yes, well. At USAE Young's dignified answer, the reporter also chose not to query her further on this topic and moved on to other questions. And she replied in the manner dictated by the Dawn Knight's Order Standard PR Guidebook. After the Knight's duel had ended. Considering Kim Sae Jean's position, USAE Young did her best to beat around the bush whenever the topic of her tattoo came up. However, this world was a wide one which happened to be filled with discerning experts as well. The public guessed that the tattoo causing the unexplainable situation was some type of magic, and that prompted wizards to step forward with their theories. Wizards were the kind of people whose obsession for knowledge bordered on sheer lunacy. And with their incredibly diligent, fervid investigation, the truth behind the tattoo was revealed just after one day had passed. The first one to break the news was the Tower Lord of the Kongwan Province's Wizard Tower, a wizard ranked A, Yun No Han who had called for a press conference. There is mana contained within this tattoo. It's an innovative device to increase the overall mana reserve of its owner. However, the method to utilize this is still a mystery. In order to create this tattoo, items with mana in them such as mana stones need to be liquefied first, but that process requires intense heat. However, such heat scatters mana away, so the effects would become completely negligible. Yun no Han. In other words, are you saying that as long as one has the necessary ingredients, tattoos similar to what USAE Young has can be recreated? Reporter. No, that is incorrect. There won't be any effects of any kind simply by tattooing oneself with liquefied mana. No, you run the risk of facing side effects, instead. The reason for that is, it's impossible to contain the liquefied mana within a human body just by tattooing Yun no Han. And when the contents of this press conference spread among the populace of knights and wizards, a riot occurred. It was understandable in a way, as mana was their most important source of power which also happened to be the most difficult to raise as well. So, emboldened by the curiosity of the public and media, they demanded the truth from the Dawn Corporation, the Dawn Knights Order, and more specifically, from USA Young herself. However, the three in question resolutely remained silent over the matter. In rage, knights and wizards began casting the figurative stones at their directions. Is it really okay to tell them? Yeah. That's why, SAE Jean told her to say that his trait was responsible for this ruckus. He decided to deceive them by saying that he could only do it once a month. He figured that, although the clingy types would still cling to him to make his life inconvenient, there should be considerable benefit for himself once the truth came out. Okay, I understand. Ah, and by the way, SAE Jean Appa. I went ahead and decided on the compensation for this tattoo on my own you are not unhappy, right? Ha. Huh. A compensation? He wondered about that briefly, but in reality, there was no need. A compensation from the dawn. He had no reason to refuse. And if a rumor of him doing a tattoo for free spread around somehow, then without a doubt, people would hound him like crazy. It's fine. I'm actually happier that way. So, what is it? Oh, that, well you still haven't rented out the office for the society yet, right? There's an extra building in Kongwan province we own, so I shall give it to you. Of course, the gift tax as well as other taxes that might arise later will be taken care of by the dawn as well. 
S.A.E. Jean became utterly speechless. A goddamned building. He almost wondered out aloud if that building was the one he had seen before. A compensation for a tattoo was a building it might have seemed a bit extravagant, but he chose to think of it as how much U.S.A.E. Young valued mana. Uh. Oh, thank you. I am grateful but isn't it too generous for me? No, no. It's still too cheap, you know. And, um. On the other side of the line, USAE Young swallowed down the rest of her words. There was certainly a bit of selfish reason for doing this. If she handed over an entire building as a price for that tattoo, then that would set the precedence on the pricing from now on. If so, then most regular knights wouldn't even dare to make a request for a tattoo. She was aiming precisely for this. And? Ah, it's nothing. Don't worry. It's just that I am really thankful, Appa. Really, the day I met you Appa wasn't the fate trying to aid me. I'm gonna hang up now. Eh. Why? Why? Since he had no such hobby of listening to cringeworthy lines suddenly being read out in an angelic voice, he decidedly ended the call. Fool. Okay, let's do it. And then, he went back to the work he was doing just now. In his hands, there was a rag doll. It was the accidental mascot of his society, the little Athony. The origin of the name was rather obvious, if one thought about it from the word Leviathan, of course. Whatever the case may have been, the reason why he was fooling around with this doll was because he had gotten an inspiration after witnessing the surprising popularity of the doll placed in the Yosian alchemy house. He wanted to turn this doll into an artifact. The only attributes he endowed to the Athony dolls were to gather the attention of people and let out a pleasing scent, and that was it. Even with only those two, it'd be enough to treat the dolls as a merchandise, but the problem here was with them not being the type that could be manufactured in high numbers. And if he wanted to sell the doll depending solely on the attributes imbued in it, then he had to make each and every one a really expensive luxury item that was sold in limited numbers. Such a chain of thoughts eventually led to artifacts. Accessories just like necklaces, rings and bracelets with magical effects imbued within, the so-called magical items ruinously expensive products with low numbers available in the market thanks to their unique magical effects. But it was difficult to ape the magic effects on those items just by relying on the attributes alone. Plus, as this Athony doll had to benefit the owner and not the wearer, the difficulty did indeed went through the roof of ridiculousness. The answer S.A.E. Jean arrived at was to utilize the magic tattoos and the orc smithing technique at the same time. This method became possible only after the skill proficiency level for the magic tattoos had increased and as a result, he could inscribe tattoos on materials as well as on living people. The very first thing to do is. He began inscribing the tattoo on the back of the doll with a white ink, to make sure it would not be spotted. The base ingredients used were a mid-ranked mana crystal and a mid-grade recovery potion the effects from the two combined would be, recovery of mana and energy. It's done. As of now, this doll of Athony would be able to recover its mana and energy. But since a doll would be in possession of neither mana nor energy, if he stopped here, then all his efforts until now would be in vain. He needed to go through one more step, the orc's forging technique. S.A.E. Jean changed to the orc form and while holding the doll in his hands, activated the smithing technique. The additional attribute he wanted to add on top of the magic tattoo was spread around to the surrounding area. The doll of Athony became dyed in blue light before returning to normal. Changing his form back to human, S.A.E. Jean quickly accessed its information window. A doll of Athony maker, Kim S.A.E. Jean. Applied attributes, especially adorable bee, Special Aroma C. Special Aroma, within the radius of 60 meters, the aroma with the effects of energy and mana recovery will be spread around uniformly. I did it. It was completed. The value of this kind of a merchandise would be amazing as long as its effects were proven. Its ability to recover spent mana reminded one of the famed mana springs and to build one of those, an astronomical sum of moolah was required to do so. Of course, he was not claiming that one Athony doll would work just as well as a real mana spring. At least, I should ask someone. Now that the product was ready, the remaining work was to get its effects verified and register it in the patent office. 
So, S.A.E. Jean called the person who could take care of such work. And in the following morning, waking up from all the chaos outside his house and still half submerged in the dreamland, S.A.E. Jean opened the front door. At the same time, countless eyes of knights and wizards converged on him. As S.A.E. Jean stood there, totally dazed, they began moving their mouths first. And well, he got to find out for the first time just how loud human voices could become, on this day. Chapter, 49 In all twenty-three years of his life, Kim S.A.E. Jean had never seen this many knights and wizards gathered up in one place. I have a question to ask you. How does your trait manifest hey, stop shoving, man? The compensation for you S.A.E. Young's tattoo was the Rutan building in the Kongwan province, was it not? This place, where knights, wizards and even reporters all mixed in, was a scene of pure chaos. Hell, some wizards used magic spells to levitate themselves and started shouting out their questions from the air. While S.A.E. Jean was dazedly admiring this chaos, the crowd jostled and pushed and shoved until they were right by his doorstep. If he didn't do something right away, they might rush inside his house, so S.A.E. Jean hastily slammed the door shut. What the hell? Kong. S.A.E. Jean muttered absentmindedly as a sound of the human wave crashing into the closed door entered his ears. This was somewhat unexpected. He definitely said he could only do the tattoo thing once a month, plus the price of getting one on S.A.E. Young was a whole dang building. So, he truly didn't even imagine these many people would seek him out like this. Wong. Right on cue, his phone vibrated. H, hello. Ah, uh, hello. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. This is Park Hyun -oh. Park Hyun -oh was the butler as well as the chief secretary in the Don CEO's household. He was there back when U.S.A.E. Young didn't know him and acted rudely back when they encountered the troll. He was the guy who quickly called the knights to avert a big disaster. T.L., well, it's official Park Hyun -oh it is, then. That other guy is now completely forgotten. Hello. But what can I do for you? Firstly, I'd like to convey our unreserved apology at your great inconvenience caused by our miss. Huh. Oh it's fine. I did receive something. Big in return, after all. S.A.E. Jean tensed up in that moment. Was this guy calling to tell him that they had changed their minds? If so, that's a relief. However I assume it is rather disorderly outside your home as we speak. Fortunately, Park Hyun -oh didn't even mention such a thing. Oh, yeah. It is somewhat chaotic, yes. When will they go away? S.A.E. Jean hoped for the dawn to swoop in like the last time and sweep these guys away. But Hyun -oh's reply was against his expectations. Even we're not certain. We too are in not much of a different situation than Mr. S.A.E. Jean. All the night's orders excluding the dawn have come to an agreement, so regrettably, there is very little we can do to aid you at the moment. Ah. I am truly sorry. As expected, even the dawn could not easily withstand the might of the people combined with political will. In that case. Please, try to be patient until a suitable solution has been found. And our miss will be out of reach for the next few days because she is being harshly reprimanded by the chairman and the order master at the moment. Ah, uh, is that so? Yes. Right now, she's in the next room, getting disciplined with a cane. Ah. Uh, by the way, it's not S.A.E. Young's fault, you see. There's very little anyone can do, as both her guardians are very upset by the fact that she had gotten a tattoo without consulting them first. So, that's how it is. Replying as such, S.A.E. Jean wished you S.A.E. Young best of luck. The situation remained the same two afternoons later. It was as if reporters set up military encampment outside his home and they showed no signs of leaving. And somehow, they had found out his phone number text messages and phone calls inundated him at all hours. This was, without a doubt, his own sin for underestimating the desires of the knights and wizards wanting to get stronger. Foo. So, he had to make a decision, which he did. If this continued and one or two of them broke into his house, then an irreversible disaster might befall on him. Well, he could only remain as a human for a set period of time, after all. Hmm, hmm. Standing behind the door, 
S.A.E. Jean tried to loosen up his throat for the short, impromptu press conference he was about to hold. He breathed in deeply three times, then let out two fake coughs. With that, he swung open the door. He came out. As soon as the door opened, someone cried out and that caused a tsunami of humans rushing towards him. Before they could start causing havoc, S.A.E. Jean shouted out loudly first. Three questions. Meaning, I will answer three questions only. Ask me what you're most curious about. However, he couldn't understand any of the questions as there were just way too many people here and their voices got all tangled up. Narrowing his brows, he raised his hands in a gesture to calm the crowd down. Of course, it had no effect whatsoever. Tell me more about the tattoos. The government, with Mr. S.A.E. Jean, is planny. Knight's orders are. Wizard Towers. No matter what, the voices entering his ears could not go past one or two words at most. So, S.A.E. Jean had to let out another loud shout. Wait a dn minute here. He decided then, instead of waiting for questions, he'd rather one-sidedly start telling them stuff. I know that you have many questions regarding my tattoos. S.A.E. Jean shouted out, hoping that the crowd would focus on him. Am I right? So, I will speak up now. Only then, the chaos seemed to die down somewhat. S.A.E. Jean breathed in deeply, then spoke about the point they were most likely curious about. First of all, I can only inscribe a tattoo once a month. And that is being very optimistic. This trait requires me to spend a great deal of my energy, so even with once a month rule, it still poses a great deal of burden to me. That is why Miss USA Young had paid an incredible compensation for it. So, I'm telling you now, there is no point giving me this amount of attention at all. As soon as he was finished, camera flashes went off. And there were some indication that another chaos was about to break out. In order to suppress that before it happens, SAE Jean quickly continued with his words. And now, I will accept one more question from one person. Ah, over there, that gentleman. He quickly pointed at a rather good-looking man. The person, who might have been an elf, seemed taken back slightly by being singled out, but he recovered soon enough and threw out a question. What you're saying is, in order to acquire a tattoo, you need to have money, is that right? Eh. Ah uh, no, that's not it. Of course, appropriate compensation is a part of the consideration, but... Does that mean the fellow members of your society, the monster, will potentially receive a preferential treatment? Eh. Ah uh, yes, of course. Instead of strangers, fellow society members will be considered first. He ended up answering more questions for the next ten minutes. S.A.E. Jean worked very hard to make sure there were no verbal slip-ups. Now then, please go back to your lives. This is a residential area your presence here is causing a great inconvenience to not just me but also to the entire neighborhood as well. Finally, he shouted out loudly in hope, asking them to go away. However, he wasn't expecting miracles. His thoughts were that, now he had cleared up some air, one or two might start leaving from tonight or so. And as expected, wizards and knights stayed put. Weirdly enough, though reporters began packing up, however. What the, where are you guys going now? Those who were not reporters started getting flustered by this occurrence. Even S.A.E. Jean was tilting his head as well. He said we should go now. And we already heard what we came here for. D.I. Since when did you people listen to what others ask of you? While this kind of conversation was taking place, S.A.E. Jean got to understand the reason for this strange occurrence with an alert window popping into his view. Following skills have merged together, the wolf forms howling and the human forms the pleasant voice. Using his voice, the host can now potentially direct the sentiment of the crowd at will. This skill will have varying degrees of success depending on the target's mental strength. Condition complete, a human's potential to create successfully combined skills for the first time. From now on, the host can combine skills depending on the values of his stats as well as the skill proficiency levels. Two days later, Kim S.A.E. Jean made his way to the monster field after what felt like in ages. However, he was not alone he came along with a hunting partner. And, what a surprise, it was not his regular partner, U.S.A. Young, either. 
a person who was slightly unfamiliar someone who carried a heavy sword on his waist, a mid-tier knight Ju Ji Hyuk. He was the hunting partner for the day. This is great. It's so satisfying to hunt together with you. Haha <laughs> now I can understand the reasons for your title, the heavenly gifted. In life, one would sometimes encounter a certain type of people you'd want to treat better the more you get to know them. Usually, those overflowing with simple, honest and good personalities fell under this category. Of course, there were those bastards who tried to belittle and take advantage of such folks, but Kim Sae Jin was not an asshole like that. That was why he found Ju Ji Hyuk immensely to his liking. Ha ha ha, you're too kind. Kim. But, although Ju Ji Hyuk was a good guy, the awkwardness existing between the two was par for the course. After all, they had only met once before today. Ah, uh, I also heard about it as well, Mr. Sae Jin. About your trait and the special tattoos oh, please be rest assured, I'm not requesting you for one. It's just that, within my order as well as others, the story is causing so much hysteria. Ahaha right. That is why I came out here in this disguise, isn't it? I became famous all of a sudden, after all. Sae Jean joking said while pointing at the hat that was pulled low and a mask covering his face. This was a necessity as there had been too many inconvenient events happening to him lately. For the last two days, he had to stay stuck indoors, unable to go outside even once and to stop them calling him all the time, he even changed the phone as well. Seriously, some female knights called him in the middle of the night, telling him that they would do anything he desired, as long as he helped them out just one time. That's how great the madness of the wizards and knights were, when it came to the matters relating to their mana. Hell, even Hazeline showed interest in the tattoos and had asked him about it. Haha <laughs> you're probably right. By the way, your trait is about tattooing yourself. No. It's just one of the ways to utilize my trait. It's actually related to my physical constitution. Oh I see. And then. Silence. Ju Ji Hyuk's face said that he still had a few more questions left, but he was stopping this conversation because he didn't want Sae Jin to feel uncomfortable while answering them. Having figured this out already, Sae Jin admired the guy's personality once more. And so, some time after they had hunted two monsters. Uh, Appa? A female knight discovered them and lightly hopped to where they were. Um, um. Unji, is that you? What are you doing here in the mid-tier hunting ground? Ju Ji Hyuk spoke while reaching out with his hand. The female knight smiled and took his hand, shaking it. Then she took a glance at the person next to Ji Hyuk. And this is? This person? He's a? My hunting partner. He's an upper mid-tier hunter. Oh, is that so? Hello there. My name is Yong Eun Ji, a low mid-tier knight. While continuing with her smile, she also reached out for a shake with Sae Jin. Hello. It's a pleasure. Yong Eun Ji of course he knew who she was. She was the opponent Sae Young defeated in the night's duel. She took a closer look at Sae Jin's face and then, tilted her head slightly while looking somewhat puzzled. E, Eun Ji. Why are you alone anyway? Where are your teammates? Seeing this, Ju Ji Hyuk hurriedly tried to change the topic. Ah, uh, that. I was on my way out just now. I came here on a whim, you see. The thing is. There's a rumor doing the rounds right now. In SNS and in all the chat rooms. Uh. What rumor? They say Mr. Kim Sae Jin came out to hunt in the mid-tier hunting ground. I thought that maybe if I lingered around here I must be such an idiot. Yong Eun Ji lowered her head with a sorrowful expression. Normally, it was a common courtesy to offer a word of encouragement or something, but right now, two men could only look at each other and show off a pair of panic-stricken faces. Uh so, uh, why are you looking for him? Just because. I also wanted to try my best, you know. It's like, I realized that the best efforts of mine is just not enough. Ahem. Um, Appa also saw that, didn't you? How I got beat down so easily. But I just can't accept it, you know. How come that girl could use connections earned from the reaches of her family while I? 
While she was laying out her grumblings, S.A.E. Jean surveyed the atmosphere of the surrounding area. Compared to an hour before, he could definitely sense more activities of humans now. By the way. Meanwhile, Yong Eun Ji narrowed her eyes and took a hard look at S.A.E. Jean's direction. His face is and his scent. Come come. Suddenly, she began to sniff the air. S.A.E. Jean was slightly taken back. If she knew this much, then rumors about him must be quite widespread by now. Excuse me. Can you remove the mask, please? Not going to happen. Eh. No, I insist. Just a little peek will do. As if she had seen through the ruse, she took a big step towards S.A.E. Jean. Unji, why don't we get out of here first? This hunting ground is a bit too much for you. Right on cue, Ju Ji Hyuk stepped in front of Yong Eun Ji and then sent a signal to S.A.E. Jean with his eyes. Ha! Huh. Yeah, I know, but Appa, can you step aside for a second? No can do. You're coming with me to the lower mid-tier ground first. I understand, so will you just move aside? Hey, just wait a minute here. What the, Appa, what gives? As the two of them raised a ruckus, it caused other knights to hear the commotion and they started coming closer in order to investigate while hoping against hope. H, hey, what is that? Yong Eun Ji then used the most commonest distraction method there ever was. What, what? And then, Ju Ji Hyuk fell for it like a chump. Move. By the time Eun Ji successfully shoved Ji Hyuk aside, S.A.E. Jean had long disappeared from his spot. Gritting her teeth and stomping on the ground in anger, Eun Ji stood in front of Ju Ji Hyuk and confronted him. It was him, wasn't he? She glared at him with a pair of blazing eyes and asked. What are you talking about? Besides that, what are you doing right now? It was just a rumor, but you stepped into the mid-tier ground all alone. As long as I don't get ambushed, it's fine in this low-danger area. But that aside, why ah? They said there was one other person alongside Kim S.A.E. Jean. And that guy was you, Appa. What the heck is this girl even saying? Although there were huge dollops of cold sweat pouring out of him, Ju Ji Hyuk still valiantly pretended with all his might. And later that day, after returning home, S.A.E. Jean decided not to go outside of his house for the next week or so. Chapter, 50 After feeling the suffocation of being confined to his house, S.A.E. Jean belatedly decided to search for any information available on the Leviathan. His reasoning was that the final evolved form for his feeble sea monster was almost certainly the Leviathan. And he thought that there must be some commonality in the way the abilities of his new form and that of the legendary sea creature operated. Of course, he still had no idea how the heck such a cute, defenseless little thing could evolve into something so terrifying but, well. Whatever. S.A.E. Jean dived into the World Wide Web. As expected, Internet was the hub of all information gathering, and he found quite a few things about leviathans in it. However maybe because a leviathan was a creature to be avoided at all costs and not an opponent to fight head-on, there didn't seem to be that many first-hand accounts out there. Most of the stuff he found online were either recap of the legends of the past, or folktale-like stories busy chasing after clouds. It's easy to mistake a leviathan as a gentle creature as it spends half a day in slumber. However, as its nature is vicious, it would definitely attack any lifeforms entering its territory. A mysterious point to consider here is that, although the leviathan lives in water, it can fire incredibly hot magma out of its mouth. As he sifted through this and that info for more than an hour, S.A.E. Jean finally found the information on the Leviathan's immediately known abilities. The origin of mana is nature, and all nature stems from water. And that is why, seeing a Leviathan freely wielding mana found in the atmosphere, is not a mystery at all. The Leviathan can instinctively understand mana existing in solid and liquid matter that comes in contact with its body, and it can also potentially replicate this mana. It was as if a light bulb went off inside his head. This could be an unexpected way to utilize the skill ruler of the water. He hurriedly got up and went to the bathroom. S.A.E. Jean filled the bathtub with water and changed into the baby leviathan form. And then, he repeatedly tried to divide the small amount of mana already present in this tub of water. Lo and behold, as he performed this task, 
the proficiency level that seemed like it would remain stuck in F forever, began to improve ever so slightly. And he also got to witness a truly mystical scene of nearly imperceptible mana separating from water. However, the problem was with his mental strength. Wine. When he repeated did this exercise for the next 20 minutes, his head suddenly became dizzy and all strength left his body at once. This was the so-called groggy state, achieved after exhausting his mana completely. As this was the first time for SAE Gene to experience this state, the side effects proved to be unexpectedly severe. And for the next 10 minutes or so, a small baby seal with a horn on its head floated around on the surface of bathtub's water, unable to lift a finger. The following day, Kim Sae Jin headed to the monster field once more. However, he was not in his human form this time. It had been a long time since he last did this he used the four-legged ebony wolf form and jumped over the wire fence. It's really been a while, huh? The first thing he did was to seek out a cave hidden on the side of a mountain, located in the lowest tier hunting ground. Vines, moss and the overgrown vegetation covered its entrance, making it hard to tell whether there was a cave here or not. Indeed, it was the cave that faithfully served as SAE Jean's base for quite a length of time. He sure did live here for a long time. Even though he couldn't wait to leave this place behind towards the end of his stay, now that he was back after all this time, his heart was quickly dying in the colors of reminiscence. Hmm. The ebony wolf had morphed back into the human form before stepping into the cave. As soon as he entered, a strange object came into view. On top of the stone bed he made with utmost care, there was a square box that was wrapped like a birthday gift. S.A.E. Jean slowly approached the box while totally on guard. Ah, uh, maybe. Then suddenly, he remembered the promise Kim Yurin made while parting ways with him, back when he treated her as a goblin. I'll definitely come back later with a proper present. That was a pleasant memory to recall. Most likely, that box was Kim Yurin's promised present. She still hadn't forgotten that day's memories, not just yet. He did wait patiently for her during his stay in this cave, but maybe she was too busy with work to come for a visit or something. Or, she could have gotten lost trying to find the way back here. Knowing Yurin's real personality, the latter being the right possibility was quite high. Should I open it? He slowly opened the lid of the box while smiling gently. Inside the box, there were a piece of paper and a single bracelet. One could see the deepness of Kim Yurin's kindness from this paper. She wrote a letter on the backside, while on the front, she drew illustrations in consideration of the goblin not being able to read Korean well. And this bracelet was a bracelet of promise item rating, high quality durability 1010. An artifact that brings good luck to its wearer. A high quality item? S.A.E. Jean dazedly muttered out. Why a high quality, though? Why would she buy something so expensive? Now that he looked back, Kim Yurin did say that she was running short on funds after buying a piece of equipment, back in that restaurant. Why would she gift something so valuable to a monster, when she doesn't even know whether it's still alive or not? Of course, compared to the price of the life saved, it was still on the cheap side but anyways, she was an angel, wasn't she? He gazed at the beautiful and colorful bracelet for a long time without saying anything. He stored the bracelet in his body using spiritualization, and then stepped out of the cave to head to the low-tier hunting ground. The reason for heading there instead of the usual mid-tier area was to grow his new monster form. Well, since Athony was a sea creature, he should have gone to the nearby East Sea, but no clear demarcation of monsters by their tiers existed there. There were only two sea routes in the ocean, the safer one managed by the country in Knight's Orders, and the other which was not. As for the rest of the oceans, it was hard to estimate what kind of monsters would pop out from there. Wine, wine. Currently, S.A.E. Jean changed into the feeble sea monster form and was busy dragging his belly across the ground while going somewhere. He was already more or less familiar with this form's methods of attack. The most basic one was to shoot jets of water from his mouth and once that came in contact with the enemy's skin, boil that liquid in high heat. In the human form, he could only control the temperature if he was in direct contact with a body of water, but as Athony, all types of moisture and mana contained within a 50 meter radius could be controlled at will. But he thought this was somewhat lacking. 
So, he investigated more about Leviathan's information online and found out that there was another, much more fantastical way. Mana is nature itself. This was the method he had just barely began to grasp after repeatedly practicing countless times. And that was an inspiration on how a leviathan living in the sea could spit out flames or even poison that were definitely not water. Wizards were always yapping on about this. Mana can become anything. And as a proof, they always pointed towards magic spells as an example. Creating something from nothing, it was indeed akin to creating miracles. However, in truth it was not creating something from nothing, as there existed the ingredient called mana. Once one changed and rebuilt the properties and characteristics of mana, that created the phenomenon known as magic. And that was where the significance of the skill ruler of the water came in. In other words by changing and rebuilding mana present within water, he would be able to spit out flames or poisons instead. In a way, it was a similar type of action as casting a magic spell. Unlike regular wizards, though a leviathan had no need to recite those complicated chants since, as a distinctive creature-specific feature, it could understand and remember mana hidden in all materials coming in contact with its scales. It should work. He succeeded once or twice practicing at home. And now, it was time to try out for real in a live combat situation. Facing against a monster, he wanted to grandly spit out something whether that was water, fire, mud, ash, light beam or even lightning, whatever. However, his plan got ruined from the get-go. SFX for the ground vibrating. Out of the blue, the ground began rumbling in an ominous manner. Panicking somewhat, SAE Jean took a quick look around. Trees and plants began to dance nervously and birds or maybe flight-type monsters were hurriedly taking to skies. Is it an earthquake? If so, then that was a big problem. There was a fairly good chance that an earthquake usually was accompanied by the so-called monster disturbance. This disturbance occurred when monsters occupying mid and upper mid-tier hunting grounds rushed down to lower tiered areas like a tsunami wave for some reason or the other. When such an event happened, then there would inevitably be massive casualties of low-tiered hunters and night since, well, they would be out hunting in the easier grounds that just about matched their own rankings. Let's just get out of here first. He was about to morph into the human form and make his escape. However, a reflection of light came from somewhere and stabbed his eyes. What was that? Narrowing his brows, he changed the direction of his gaze to the light's origin. Gulp. He saw a camera and a man busy operating it. The light was reflecting off from the camera lens hidden in the tall grasses and it sure felt like he was being attacked by it. SAE Jean's heart stopped beating for a second then. If he had changed back into a human while totally unaware of the camera now, wouldn't that be the shortest route to utterly screwing up his entire life? Are they filming me? When he took a closer look, he saw a few more people behind the camera. The lowest and low-tier hunting grounds were the only areas in the monster field that the regular civilians were permitted access. He heard that, what with the program the qualities of a knight hitting it big in the ratings, there were several other TV shows about monsters currently in production. Not only had he heard that there were three such shows being filmed within the low-tier ground these past two months, SAE Gene even saw them in action with his own two eyes. Upon thinking about it a bit more, it seemed that he didn't have to worry anymore. Since they were filming here in the low-tier hunting grounds, the crew would have been escorted by knights ranked at least mid-tier in case of an unforeseen emergency. Ark. Should have just gone to the sea. Athony was a sea monster. On dry land, he just could not bring out his full powers. However, it was only due to the various passive skills possessed by the ebony wolf form which remained active even in other forms that he even got to see out in front and get to hear his surroundings properly without those. The chances were, he would never have realized that the camera was there at all. On top of that, they were even using artifacts to erase their sense and presence as well. But, uh, they wouldn't suddenly attack me, right? After all, he was just an adorable little thing. Actually, the crew was tensely filming him without taking any other actions. Since there was no information at all on a baby version of the Leviathan, it was quite likely that they thought this was simply a huge scoop to capture the appearance of a rare, never-before-seen monster and were relishing the opportunity presented here. 
So, SAE Jean deliberately made cute noises and moved around as if he was swimming on land with his two short arms and then, from somewhere, he heard nearly imperceptible sound of someone holding his or her breath. Hey, this might end up being a great advertisement. He had already completed the registration of the Athene character since he was planning to officially sell the dolls, although the availability would remain rather limited. Whenever SAE Jean moved his body, the camera carefully followed him around continuously. Unfortunately, such a relaxed atmosphere could only last for five more minutes. Yuhok. What the hell? And that's how the humans, blinded by the surefire prophet in front of their eyes, ended up missing the most important matter of all, dot. The small earthquake that happened just now, the ill omen of things to come. SFX for a shrill scream of a woman. Truly out of nowhere, a life form descended swiftly from the sky like an arrow and ripped a leg off one of the crew members. The torn limb flew in the air, and then landed on the ground somewhere. At this horrifying new event, all eyes hidden behind the bush turned up towards the sky. A griffin. A creature possessing the head of a hawk and the body of a lion the flight-type monster ruling the skies over the mid-tier hunting ground. Griffins were normally found within the boundaries between mid- and upper-mid-tier ground so, one of them should not be here. However, right now, this was an emergency. Although the causes were unknown, that earthquake from moments ago was a stark reminder of this important truth. Do not panic. Hide behind us. For knights unsheathed their weapons and took guard against the griffin. But it was a clever monster. It had a tendency of picking on those it judged to be the weakest, first. SFX for screeching wail. The BD let out an ear-splitting scream and fell down like a lightning before ripping off an arm of another film crew member. The female members' scared screams and cries resounded in the air, and at the same time, SAE Jean fell into a dilemma. Chapter, 51 That, that, please do something. Kihu Chaos unfolded below the griffin flying around in an aloof manner. The crew member with his arm cut off was sobbing while grabbing hold of the missing limb and the rest of the film crew, unable to even think about running away, simply nagged incessantly at the knights present. Just stand behind us and don't move. Unfortunately for them, even the knights were helpless here. Now normally, in order to hunt down griffins, services of hunters specializing in long-range sniping or those knights capable of exerting delicate control over mana were needed. But these guys were just a group of escorts consisting of two mid-tier and another two low mid-tier knights. No one could have imagined that a griffin might make an appearance in the low-tier hunting ground today, of all things. It can't be helped, huh? Kim Sae Jean finally made his decision to help them out. If he let them be like that, then the knights might be fine but the film crew would no doubt get 100% wiped out. So for now, he readied several warning shots. He extracted all the moisture in the ground into his body, before moving them to his mouth. There was still one more step to go through, though. Since Griffins feared fire, he thought of converting the water in his mouth into flames and then, shoot. Phew phew. He wasn't making that sound deliberately it was just that, they came out when he ejected water out of his mouth. But quite unlike what the enthusiasm-draining sound effect suggested, the destructive force behind the streams of flame coming out of his mouth was something else entirely. The flames shot out super fast in a dead straight line and seriously threatened the griffin. The monster showed an indication of panic at the flames flying at it like lightning and twisted its body this way and that while trying to take evasive actions. And the knights as well as the film crew gazed at the flame-spewing unidentified life form with a bunch of dazed eyes. Just what was the identity of this cute creature shooting jets of flame that threatened the griffin, all the while making the few, few sound? This scene was, honestly speaking, something a person may or may not get to see in ten, no, fifty years or some such. All those present desperately burned this sight into their retinas. Rough, angry screeching wail. The griffin let out a coarse roar. At that moment, everyone tensed up. The knights moved to protect the horned seal. Aiding them, from the sudden descent of the griffin. But fortunately enough, the airborne creature just circled around once in the sky before flying off to elsewhere. The knights could only look on at the sight of the retreating monster in a daze. It's coming here. 
one of the film crew members muttered out and that jolted the knights out of their stupor they got ready for another battle quickly. But when they saw the figure crawling on the ground towards them, they ended up slowly lowering their weapons. Why is it approaching us? A knight murmured audibly. This strange creature used its two arms to drag itself across the ground and approached the group, until stopping before the crew member who had lost the arm and was currently unconscious from the shock. Only then, the rest of the film crew and the knights broke out from the firm grips of this dreamlike event and hurriedly got closer to the person with the horrific injury. What is it doing? But they paused where they stood once more. This seal was busy spitting out what seemed to be saliva on top of the fainted crew member. The effects of a healing potion, this should be enough, right? SAE Jean had made numerous potions so far, and this body of the Leviathan understood these liquids' properties well enough already. A Leviathan could sense the flow of mana with its body. Even though he could not explain it, this body already knew how to reconfigure mana present in water to match the properties of a potion. Ha! Huh. When the liquid that seemed like the monster's saliva landed on the area of the missing limb, a blue haze began rising up from there quite suddenly. Uh, this is Hey Man. Hey, where is the severed arm? Is it still usable? The knight who looked like the one in charge shouted out, and another knight hurriedly went into the thicket to locate the arm and brought it out. The surface of the wound was horrifically shredded. However, the knight still brought the limb closer to the bleeding stump of the fainted crew member. The rest of the film crew had no idea what was going on and it showed on their confused expressions, but all the knights remained rather very serious. Because, that blue haze thing was quite similar to what would happen when a potion was used. So, just maybe. Oh. Wow. The mountains reverberated with the sounds of people's exclamations. The hideously torn arm began to reattach itself. However, they did not have the luxury to dazedly admire this amazing scene. There was still one more crew member with the leg torn off at the moment, after all. H, hey, can you go over there oh, it's already going over there. A knight let out a hollow chuckle as he spoke. Even without anyone requesting it, the cute creature was busy crawling towards the wounded person. Can you find the leg? The tensed-up atmosphere became more relaxed at the sudden entrance of a healer. A film crew member pointed towards the base of a tree, where the torn leg from below the knee was located at. And without any orders, a knight walked up to it, picked it up and brought it to where the grievously injured was. The same treatment process occurred once more. When the creature spat out its saliva, the severed limb was reattached back to its place. How the heck is this possible ah? Hey, man. Did you get this on film? The producer who was watching this scene in a daze belatedly shouted out in a hurry. Fortunately for him, the cameraman with over ten years of experience was a type of a person who was much more at home looking at things through a camera lens rather than his own eyes. Phew. The producer let out a sigh of relief. They said that in life, a misfortune could be an omen to a lucky event, and so it proved to be true here. From this horrific incident, he ended up getting a huge scoop. Let's get the hell out of this place. Since a griffin appeared here, we have no time to waste. A knight picked up one of the still-fainted crew members over his shoulder and spoke. What about that little guy? The female crew member pointed with an unwilling expression at the seal that was laboriously crawling towards a destination unknown. Since it had saved them, wasn't there some sort of obligation for them to ensure that little creature's own survival? That monster can easily chase away a griffin, so you don't have to worry about its life. But besides that, hurry up, please. The atmosphere in this place is taking a turn for the worse. The knights were not moved by her plea. So, the film crew had no choice but to follow them and quickly evacuate from here. Arriving back home safe and sound, SAE Jean received a call from Hazeline right away. It's regarding our Athony doll. The testing of its effects are finished. And the patent registration has been completed as well. In only ten days. Yep. They tested the effects and found that the weakening of the wavelength during the period of ten days was almost zero. And taking into account the differences in the surrounding environment, it was deemed to be zero, so we ended up getting the result of perpetual effect really quickly. But seriously, how did you make this doll? 
a dull type artifact that can restore energy and mana just how were you able to add those magic effects to a doll? Ah well, I used a variety of methods, you see. It seemed that the Athene doll's final classification was decided as an artifact for real now. Scratching his cheek, he turned on the TV. Did you already figure out a way to sell it? Eh. Oh, that. He did think of a way. No matter how great the effects of the Athene doll was, they could not be determined by one's eyes alone. So, if he set the price way too high, then no one would buy it regardless of the product's rating. The doll's main ingredients, a low mid-grade recovery potion and a medium-quality mana crystal, would cost upwards of 900 grand together. So, if he set the price too low, then not only there wouldn't be much profit to be made, he might even run into problems in the future when he wanted to raise it. I am going to gift one each to the Raven and the Dawn Knight's orders. So he decided to gift as a bait the first two to the most influential Knight's orders out there. And since the Knights affiliated with famous orders possessed keener senses, they should be able to realize the benefits within a month or so, which then would lead to rumors spreading around. Especially so with the Dawn's people, who were already well known to be loose-lipped when it came to posting stuff on SNS. Ah. That might be a good plan as well. Hazeline easily saw through SAE Jean's schemes. His ideas weren't all that shocking, though. Lately, as the Knights' influence in the world at large increased, there had been a concurrent increase in the number of private corporations sponsoring Knights' orders while asking them to use their wares in public and whatnot. If so, would you like me to send one over to the Dawn Order? Yes. Please do. The conversation ended with that exchange. SAE Gene turned his attention back to the TV. Right on cue, it was showing a news broadcast reporting on the disturbance at the monster field today. The news was saying that the origin of the disturbance was a fissure opening up on the ocean floor in the east coast. A deluge of powerful monsters poured out from a fissure measuring five. Zero in magnitude that had opened there. The resident monsters in the mid-tier hunting ground sensed the dangers first and in panic, they tried to distance themselves away from the ocean, resulting in the rushing monsters, the disturbance. The broadcast then said, currently knights and wizards had responded speedily, and after freezing the ocean's surface right above the fissure, they started the operation to clean out the monsters. However, there was a case of receiving an unexpected aid during all this chaos. Huh. And that aid was from this mysterious, previously undiscovered and arguably the cutest monster there is. S.A.E. Jean watched the news with a puzzled expression. He sure as hell wasn't expecting the reveal this soon. Since they treated it as a huge scoop, he thought the producers would hold it back until their program was ready to air, but... Today, a production team shooting a documentary called The Ecosystem of Monsters was attacked by a griffin. Oh. It's just an advertisement. S.A.E. Jean understood right away after listening to the anchor's words. It was likely that they would only show a short clip first, and then tell the viewers to check the rest out when the documentary goes on air. Let us take a look. The footage was edited to be as short as humanly possible. It showed a horned creature that looked somewhat like a baby harp seal chasing away a griffin while few fewing flames out of its mouth. After that, it waddled closer to those grievously injured crew members and spat out its saliva which then healed the serious wounds. Wasn't that the most amazing thing ever? Nowadays, stories of monsters helping people out seem to have increased. There have been witness testimonials of a certain werewolf rescuing several knights in the mid-tier hunting ground as well. And now, the attentions of the public will be captured by this adorable creature for a foreseeable future, I believe. And with that comment, the segment on Athene had ended. That was a nice advertisement, that. A great timing, it was the unveiling of the Athene doll coinciding with this news. Feeling utterly satisfied, he was about to turn the TV off, when. And this is the next item. A crime attributed to the mercenary, Likan, has occurred again. This time, it was in Goziang area of Kongwan province. With those words of the anchor, S.A.E. Jean did not. A cutie that's also kind. Such a great little thing. I wanna hug it tightly. Upvoted 1038 downvoted 31. But what is its identity? A unicorn seal. Upvoted 559 downvoted 108. 
That's the mascot of the monster. You can see one when visiting the Yosian Alchemy House or the Orc's Forge. It's such a cutie pie whenever I see it, but it was an actual monster. A reporter already did an interview. Kim Sae Jean saw it by accident and based the doll on it. Our Knight's Order has the doll of Athene. It's supposedly an artifact, with effects of energy and mana recovery. But it came in yesterday so can't tell if it's true or not. Upvoted 339 downvoted 182. Of course it's bullshit. A doll is an artifact. Oh oh it's still 10 years too early, looking at how wizards act nowadays. Seems like your order is also made up of a bunch of losers. Do you even have any idea which one I'm affiliated to when running your mouth off? Why should I care? Probably a bottom barrel trashy order anyway. The comment sections of news websites were inundated with the story of Athene. But SAE Jean was getting rather physically uncomfortable with all of this. Because of Athene and the fissure developing on the ocean floor, the stories most important to him, the Lycan, became buried deep in the pile and showed no sign of emerging at all. Ha! Sighing out grandly, SAE Jean fell on the couch. Was it a copycat? There was a distinct possibility of that, but maybe. A full moon. He definitely possessed a special passive buff effect only applicable during the full moon. Called the Knight of the Wolf, all his stats would rise by 15%, and his aggressiveness also became stronger as well. On top of this, he always went to bed in the wolf form, so it could be a plausible theory. What the hell is going on? Sae Jean roughly tousled his hair up as the frustration overwhelmed him. Why? What is happening to me? Questions continued to inundate his head. Chapter, 52 For about a week, Sae Jean searched for every scrap of information there was for the Lycan. There was a total of three crimes committed which he had no memories of and according to what he found, all the bodies discovered were maimed horrifically as if a wild animal had attacked them. So, he thought that this was not the work of a copycat. Everything was in doubt. The continuously growing height. The sharply changing facial structure. And the crimes of Lycan which he could not remember. What if they were? Is my human form being slowly taken over by the monster form? Definitely, the power balance of all five forms within his body had been seriously out of whack for a while now. Specifically, ever since acquiring the beast's heart through absorbing the werewolf's mana stone, the wolf side had become much stronger than the others. After all, he could now throw down with an upper mid-tier knight quite easily in that form. Ha! Sae Jean hugged his head that ached so much it might split apart from the gap in the window, the grey light of the dawn's moon entered the room. That new moon's clear light seemed so sinister for some reason. He did his best to avoid using the wolf form, instead preferring to stick with the goblin, orc and the human forms while sleeping for less than three hours a day. To lose his own self, even it was only for a bit he found such a notion as an unimaginable terror, a powerful fear. There was the good possibility that the full moon had the most effect on him, of course. But his current state of mind was too unstable to consider such points yet. FCK this. He even swore out loudly at this difficult problem that seemingly had no answers as he hit his own head. On top of this, there were only 30 minutes remaining on his human form. Only now had he realized that the human mode in the wolf form was not truly a human. He remembered that time when his consciousness blurred after discovering a vampire. And when he was fighting Kim in Su, he remembered clearly his body moving on its own volition. For a while, I should not use the ebony wolf form. Sae Jean decided thus. That would reduce the total amount of time he could remain as a human to around five hours but, it was still much better than losing himself from the unknown instincts of a monster and become something that was not human. He began to rub his chin without realizing it. His beard had grown somewhat, all thick and bushy-like. But he was never the type where lots of beard grew naturally. SFX for gagging noise. As soon as his thoughts reached there, he felt nauseous all of a sudden, and ran to the bathroom. Since he hadn't eaten anything of late, only the dull yellow stomach acid came out. He emptied his insides for a long time, and then stood before the wash basin. The face in the mirror was similar to Kim Sae Jean's but at the same time, also different from before. 
Of course, he might have made a mistake as his mind was not completely healthy at the moment. But no matter what, the sharp eyes and the thick jaws. They totally resembled a wolf. At first, when the rumor of a doll type artifact that could recover energy and mana began to circulate, the public as well as the majority of knights and wizards thought of it as nothing more than a dog's empty bark, not even worthy to be called a rumor. An artifact was difficult to make. The consensus of those in the magic related industry was that a material like a doll was just too weak to withstand the high level of magic enchantment required to bestow a single magic effect on an item. However, the rumor that everyone thought of as nothing but hot air the Knights of the Raven Order ended up proving as truth. So, this is that artifact. Currently, this was the first class training facility of the Raven Knights Order. Most Knights Orders had divided training facilities according to the rankings. Rather obviously, the higher the ranking was, the better the training equipment provided. Wizards affiliated with the Daehan Wizard Tower were busy examining the doll type artifact placed inside this facility. TL, the word Daehan actually comes from the first two letters of the Republic of Korea's Korean name. Yeah, but uh, by the way. The knight tasked with showing these wizards around was actually feeling rather nervous at the moment. He was afraid that these guys might start touching the doll or stuff like that. One could say, this was a case of the so called reversal of fortunes. This doll, Athony, was left forgotten on the shelves of the fourth-class training facility, or sometimes even, thrown around and discarded on the floor. But now, the very same Athony was sitting pretty in the middle of the first-class facility, protected by the magic-reinforced glass case. Now, it was being treated with utmost care after transforming into one of the raven's treasures. Excuse me can you step back for a bit there? I think Athony is a little afraid of you. Wizards all showed disbelieving faces, but they still did as told and moved away. It's really faint, but there definitely is a strange aura coming off of it. When did you first notice this doll's effects? It hasn't been long. Has it been a week? At first, we left this doll by the fourth class training facility and nobody paid attention to it, but then, the efficiency of lower ranked knights began to improve dramatically. They began to train for three hours or more, when two used to be their limit. And the rate of their mana recovery was also abnormally fast but only within that training facility. At that revelation, wizards' lips went oh, shaped as they exclaimed slightly. Just from the words alone, wasn't the effects just wonderful? And there were no noticeable changes in the mana spring? That's correct. Finding this event strange, we took a measurement of mana's concentration in the fourth class training facility and found that the recovery rate there was higher than the first class facility. And that's when we discovered the doll's effects as we investigated the cause of this change. Hmm. A wizard made a puzzled face and tilted his head. According to their estimates, the story was that this doll possessed abilities to aid in recovering mana as well as one's energy. However, these two recovery abilities were expensive enough to be only found added to high-class wearable accessories. To his knowledge, there hadn't been a way invented yet to let the effects permeate around like an aura. I heard the Dawn also received this doll as a gift. But why are they remaining silent over this matter? They tend to monopolize the good stuff, don't they? Most likely, they realize the effects well before we have just that, they are keeping their mouths shut. Hmm. The wizard took another glance at the doll. He thought that, when the clueless government officials approved of a strange artifact, they were wasting their time once more but honestly now, he really wanted to dissect that doll. Of course, considering its effects, it should be incredibly expensive, but if he could just find out what its secrets were, then. You cannot. The wizard was blocked the moment the guiding knight noticed the perverted light shining in those eyes. The wizard let out a fake cough and then, in a serious tone, asked, Kiam. How much did you say it was? From what I hear, you can't buy it even if you wanted to. As expected, then. It should be impossible to mass manufacture an artifact like this. Yep. And with the situation as is, where even the news outlets have reported on the doll's proven effects. Not only the local organizations but even the international bodies have apparently lodged requests for purchase to the monster society as well. The wizard nodded his head. 
Obviously, stories related to this doll were trending big time in overseas social media forums as well. But the society itself isn't giving out any replies yet. That's why besides the Dawn and Us, no other Knight's Order possesses this doll. So, that's how it was? Yes. Thanks to this shortage, I hear that the lower ranked orders are apparently burning in useless competitive spirits. For the right to become the next owner of Athene, or stuff like that. The wizards present chuckled slightly at that. Knights orders and their knights from the point of view of these wizards, they were the types that became harder to fathom the more one got to know them. You are really, really okay, right? Yeah. I'm fine. Since his mind was preoccupied, S.A.E. Jean ended up missing the phone calls from other people inadvertently. But his mind had calmed down after a month to the point of being able to welcome the fact that there was someone worried about him. But why didn't you answer your phone until now? U.S.A.E. Young asked him. Her voice sounded genuinely worried. Well I got occupied. You also know, right? How our mascot became this huge phenomenon. He heard about this from Hazeline yesterday. A doll-type artifact that aided with the recovery of mana and energy. He heard that both the Knight's Orders and Wizard Towers were going mad with desire as soon as Athene's effects were proved. Which was understandable, as they were obsessed with mana obsessed enough to spend tens of millions of dollars to construct a mana spring and further hundreds of thousands just in its upkeep annually. Hazeline added that several overseas Knight's Orders and corporations had inquired directly about the magic tattoos and the Athene dolls via the Korean government already. Oh, right. What's your plan on selling the Athene dolls? If you got any, we'll buy them all. We'll more than adequately satisfy your demands. Ah, that later. I'll let you know later. For now, he didn't want to think about the complicated stuff yet. Actually, only ten minutes ago, Someone from the Foreign Relations Department gave him a call regarding the Athene doll issue. It seemed that a famous American Knights Order had requested for a serious meeting with him or something. Huh. Oh. I understand. So, by th. Right. I'm hanging up now. No, wait. Stop. Hey, don't hang up. As he was about to end the call, USAE Young suddenly screamed at him from the other side of the line. What's the matter now? Why do you keep on hanging up in the middle of a conversation? I still have things left to say, you know. Seriously. She sounded genuinely ticked off. Ah, my bad. I like to rush things, you see. As he was a guy who used to do two to three part-time jobs in a single day, he had this mentality of doing things fast without delay. Now that he thought about it, compared to those days, right now this was a heaven amongst heavens. For we, uh, haven't seen each other in a while, right? Oh, you mean as in hunting? KHM. Right, yeah, hunting. SAE Jean deliberated for a bit. The time to go out on a hunt with someone else, well. My bad, I can't, for the time being. He no longer had that. He deeply agonized about the possible solutions to the problematic situation of him slowly becoming an ebony wolf. One definite cause for this was. There was an internal power imbalance due to the ebony wolf form becoming far stronger than the others. The best possibility to rectify this situation was to enhance the strength of other monster forms. And the other one was to let the ebony wolf form fully evolve into a lycanthrope. Since the lycanthropes were a subspecies of humans, maybe something might happen if he evolved into one. Of course, both of these methods were not 100% guaranteed to work and that only made his chest tighten with worry. Hell, he even felt nauseous several times a day from the worries. Whatever the case may have been, all the possibilities pointed towards hunting monsters and so, wasting time was a luxury he couldn't afford anymore. Eh. But why? USAE Young hurriedly asked. That is I've got a situation. What is it? Can't say at the moment. She became silent for a moment. Then, in a powerless voice, she spoke in a tone that clearly indicated how upset she was. Okay, fine. Then when you find the time later, give me a call. Right. I got it. But not sure if I'll have the time law. He hung up the phone quickly. 
USA Young seemed to be saying something, but his old habit ended up rearing its head again. It's time to go. But the call had ended already. Carrying a bag full of luggage, he headed to the monster field. A certain afternoon, with sunlight shining down. A hunting party consisting of one somewhat overweight male knight and two female hunters were searching for prey in the forest of the hunting ground. Ah, uh, so that doll is still in possession of only the dawn and the raven? The main topic of the conversation happening in the middle of the hunt was about the hot potato, Athony. Of course. It seems obvious that it would be difficult to make an artifact like that. But, hmm. I don't know if I should be saying this or not. With two rather pretty female hunters attached to both of his arms and walking around with a triumphant air, this knight was named Odesu, a mid-tier knight. He was the second son of the vice order master of the mid-ranked Daybeak Knights Order. TL, Daybeak means Great White. I just couldn't name this order as the Great White Knights Order as it sounds a bit well. Eh. What is it? Please tell us. She's right. You should finish what you started. When he suddenly stopped talking, the two pretty female hunters began acting coquettishly and teased his sides. Koo, Kwem. This is a secret, so you must never tell anyone, got that? Of course. Oh Daesu did another fake cough. Abnormally sensitive towards their rankings and gradings, knight's orders would often compete aggressively with one another even in small, insignificant squabbles. But from the knight's order's view, it could not be helped. One only had to witness the state of affairs where the public and the media were ridiculing the Dawn Knight's Order after they lost to the Raven at the all-important Knight's Duel. Many people are wondering who could possibly become the next owner of the third Athony doll. The doll of Athony it was the artifact trending hotly among the various Knight's Orders. But a month had passed by without a single sign of the third doll appearing in public, and the fact that the Dawn and the Raven were the only two to possess the dolls were enough to fan the flames of competitive streak of the orders in the lower rankings. And the media, of course, took bite of this fun little bait the public too began to hold a great deal of interest and watch things unfold. Really, which knight's order could become the next owner of the Athony doll? Before anyone knew it, this matter had become a battle of pride between different knight's orders. It looks like we may become the next owner. Ha! Huh. Really? Wow! That's such a big news. What about the Goryeo Knight's Order? Aha. Uh -huh. Still with Goryeo this and that let's not talk about a Knight's Order that's been abandoned behind, eh? Aha uh -huh. TL, author made another pun-based joke here. Goryeo used to be a name of a Korean kingdom founded over 1000 years ago. However, he used the term Goryeojang which means leaving one's aged parents behind in a pit to die. Hence, my attempt at trying to save this joke. Which was not funny to begin with. The two female hunters grabbed their tummies and began guffawing loudly at his lame wordplay. And feeling even more confident than before thanks to their laughter, Oh Daesu straightened his shoulders a bit more. By the way, how did you accomplish that? I heard that guy Kim Sae Jin is really famous for being picky. I also heard that the vice masters who got promptly turned away already number 4 or 5. You're right. He's one difficult customer, that one. My dad had to work real hard to make this thing happen. He even had to stoop low to associate himself with a bottom feeder employee of an armory, someone he'd never even bother to take a glance at full. Let's just end this talk here, shall we? As if to show that he was distressed by his father's humiliation, Daesu briefly paused his words there. However. Thanks to my dad's unceasing toil and hard work, the owner of the third Athony will be us. We've indeed brushed aside the orders Sachin, Genesis and Goryeo, you see. Oh Daesu further added to that in a proud voice, as if to demonstrate how great his order's current status was. I knew it you're so amazing, Mr. Knight. With that, both girls clung on to him even more, and the smile on Odesu's face grew so wide it might have poked the heavens above. He even thought, oh, this is so much fun. I hope that a monster shows up soon so I can display my great skills. And Odesu's wish was granted not too long after. Ah. Uh, look over there, an orc. One of the female hunters pointed to the hill visible past the bush and shouted. Oh. 
It's an orc jaguar. He made a guess that an orc found in the low mid-tier hunting ground could only be a measly jaguar. Odesu stepped forward, full of confidence. The pair of female hunters followed him too, without showing any worries whatsoever. Even though his reputation wasn't so good, but still, Bo Desu was a mid-tier knight who passed the required exams of Eden. There was just no way he'd lose to an orc in the low mid-tier hunting ground. Hey, you BD. O Desu took great strides and shouted. Only then, the orc turned around to face him. And when their eyes met, all three in the hunting party froze where they stood. The appearance of this particular orc was somewhat strange. Its height was nearly three meters tall the muscles on its body were far more sinister than its brethren's it was covered in blood from head to toe, and on one of its hands, it held a menacing mace. That was the unmistakable appearance of a battle-hardened warrior even though it was standing over there looking at them, its overwhelming spirit still traveled to where they were. Maybe it's better for us to run. One of the two female hunters swallowed her saliva and spoke. I, I also think so, too. The other female hunter cautiously agreed as well. Everyone in this party was thinking the same thing. That was not a normal orc. There was a heavy pressure comparable to an ogre bearing down on them emanating from the creature, and from those pair of brightly burning eyes, they could sense the majestic aura of a heroic warrior. So, how can any one of them call it a measly orc now? No. All you guys have to do is to hide behind me. I'll take care of every tea. However, when the prideful Odesu unsheathed his sword in a show of useless and reckless boldness. SFX for a very loud roaring of an orc. The orc roared out in anger and slammed its mace down on the ground. The shock wave from that terrifying attack caused the earth to rip apart like quivering snakes. Chapter 53 Inside the personal office of the highest tier knight Kim Yurin, located in the Raven Knight's Orders HQ. I've told you many times already, haven't I? He's not answering the phone. As if she was getting really frustrated, Yurin pounded her chest while complaining to a certain guy. About ten minutes ago, as she was finishing up her paperwork, Chai Young Ho suddenly barged into her office. And as usual, he proceeded to advise and lecture her for the next five minutes then. He abruptly began asking about Kim Sae Jean. She already told this man yesterday that she could not reach him by phone, yet like a blood-sucking leech he was tenaciously questioning her going so far as to question whether she was lying to him or not. Hua. Uh, just how poorly do you take care of your personal connections that you manage to severe one after only a single dinner? He ended up accepting her words as truth after seeing her frustrated expression that verged on tears. But rather than going away, he began to take issues with her interpersonal skills instead. What do you mean by severe? Everything was going Alric. Yurin was about to fire back, when one thought entered her mind inexplicably. During the dinner, she identified Kim Sae Jean as a prideful person, and that he also had a lot of pride in his society, the monster. But she refused him outright when he made the suggestion of her joining the society. Since she had legitimate reasons for the refusal, they just chuckled and let it slide, but. Could that be it? I knew it. Seems like there was something, after all. Of all people, you just had to go and make a mistake with a person who's considered as very important right now I repeatedly said this to you, didn't I? You and your father just lacked the ability to treat other people properly. I should have. I said, it was not like that. Yurin slammed down on her desk when Chai Young Ho began mentioning her father with a smug, know-it-all face. Slightly intimidated by her outburst, his body trembled imperceptibly. Fool. You just wait and see. Still fuming, Yurin pulled her mobile phone out from her pocket. I'm going to call him right this instance. Then, she called one number out of many, many saved numbers on her phone. Please pick up, please pick up, please pick up please pick up. Please. The hand holding her the phone shook noticeably, and before she knew it, sweat drops were forming on her forehead. And forty seconds later. He's not answering. In the end, Kim Sae Jean didn't answer and all she could do was quietly put her phone down. Chai Young Ho watched this scene with an expression showing contempt before beginning his loud lamentations. Ha! 
didn't I tell you this repeatedly before? If you continue to look down on people just because of your talents. Why do you accuse me of looking down on people? You weren't even there to begin with. I don't have to be there to know. You probably did something I knew you would do without realizing it yourself. And that's why you failed to even recognize that you did it. No, that's not. Yurin gritted her teeth. Whatever the case may have been, it was true that she could no longer contact Kim Sae Jean anymore she stopped making excuses and lowered her head. Might as well, since if she kept on making excuses and brought up her own justifications, this torture would only be prolonged for her instead. She decided to endure for now. Endure, then she'd try to call Sae Jean tomorrow. And around the same time. Eu Herk. Oh Desu fell on his BT from the might of the shock wave that stopped just short of hitting his nose. The scene in front of his eyes were truly hellish. The ground was split apart in a terrifying manner as if an earthquake had struck, and from the gaping chasms, hot steam was rising steadily. Gulp. Oh Desu unconsciously swallowed down his saliva after witnessing this awesome sight. When he imagined what would happen to him if he was struck by that shock wave he didn't even want to think about it. Most likely, all his limbs might have been ripped asunder. SFX for someone's running footsteps. And from the back of the squatting Odesu, sounds of running footsteps could be heard. When he glanced back, the two female hunters were making a hasty retreat. One of them fell face first, but got up in a flash and continued running, utterly not giving a DN whether it looked pathetic or not. And Odesu felt resentment towards the two. SFX for a low growl. Right then, the low-frequency growl of the orc resounded in his ears Odesu's heart stopped beating for a second. His entire face covered in perspiration, he slowly turned his gaze to take in the sight of the orc standing atop the hill, looking down on him. He suddenly felt the pressure from the gap in their strength ruthlessly trampling down on his body. It's much more stronger than I thought. And in the meantime, Kim Sae Jean was feeling quite shocked at the phenomenon he had just created. The fierce strike, an active skill he earned after endlessly pounding monsters to death with his mace. When activated, each of the hits would contain three times more explosive power and a special shock wave would occur as well. At first, he thought of it as one of those additional buff skills but hell, now that he used it, wasn't this on the level of being just too DN deadly. This was the fruit of his hard labor for the past ten days, indeed. Currently, his trait level was at twelve. And all the equipment absorbed into his body via spiritualization ranked high quality or above. Even though he was nominally an orc jaguar, his combat prowess alone should equal that of a great orc warrior. Yu Yu. TL, no idea what this sound is supposed to be. Left as is. As Sae Jean stood there admiring his own growth, the knight squatting on the ground finally managed to stand. Gu, Fu Yu, Yu, Yu. TL, wait, is this supposed to be how an orc sounds? Hmm. Sae Jean then thoroughly enjoyed watching the back of the escaping knight who was making strange noises. TL, I guess not. That guy would take a few steps, then collapse on the ground. He then forced himself up, glanced back at Sae Jean, and tried hard to push forward with his shaking legs. It was a rather pitiful sight. However, the previous attack with the fierce strike was nothing more than a warning shot. Sae Jean wasn't going to kill that fat knight with a bulging stomach in the first place. SFX for the orc's roar. Sae Jean let out a roar that meant get the hell out of here, dot. Odesu got shocked and fell down again, but he continued his desperate escape while crawling on all fours. So, why did you try your luck with me, moron? Sae Jean originally thought of letting the hunting party go if they moved to escape on their own volition, anyways. He put behind the pathetic appearance of Odesu and began searching for his next prey with his heavy footsteps. Ah! My body's aching all over the place. After achieving the daily hunting quota, Sae Jean returned to the cave. These past ten days, Sae Jean in his orc form confronted monsters, knights and hunters for a fight. His reasons were simple. Maybe the conditions for his evolution were related with battles, somehow. But that didn't mean he killed people, no. 
He did break their weapons and armor and sometimes made them faint but always let them be with their lives intact. Of course, there was nothing he could do about the injuries they got from these battles, but since no one lost a limb or stuff like that, he wasn't too worried about it. But I ended up with a plethora of skills, instead. Unfortunately, rather than the actual evolution, he ended up earning some strange skills in droves. The active skill that boosted his strength momentarily, the fear strike. The passive skill that hardened his body like metal, the indomitable hard body. Etc., etc. Of course, it wasn't as if he didn't like the number of his skills increasing like this. He loved it. Why would he not love his orc form getting stronger under the current circumstances? Anyways. It should be doable now, right? The action he wanted to perform right now was to combine his skills. And the skills he wanted to combine were the Leviathan scales and the indomitable hard body. Ten days ago, his skill proficiency levels were too low and it proved to be impossible to do it back then. But the indomitable hard body's level rose to C so he figured that now it would work as the Leviathan scales was still rated at F. Let's do it. According to the alert window, all he had to do was to think about combining two skills in his head. That was it. After waiting for a bit, a new alert window would pop up. Just like now. Skills have been successfully combined. The skills Leviathan Scales and the Indomitable Hard Body have joined to become the new skill, Leviathan's Hard Body. The host is unable to combine skills for another, 89 days 23 hours 59 minutes and 56 seconds. Passive skill, Leviathan's Hard Body. Scales of Leviathan rated F will cover the body can be activated deactivated at will. The scales will possess a fixed amount of resistance towards all elemental attributes. This skill can be activated during any form. Oh, I did it. His body moved excitedly in pleasant surprise. Originally, the skill Leviathan scales was a form-specific ability that could only be used during the feeble sea monster form. But after it was combined with the skill Indomitable Hard Body, he had succeeded in making the skill available to not only other monster forms but the human form as well. This definitely could be labeled as a great result, for sure. To test this new skill out, SAE Gene activated it. All over his body, scales of cold gray color rapidly spread out. Oh! An orc covered head to toe in brilliantly shining scales. Wasn't this a pretty cool sight? A month went by since S.A.E. Jean began wandering around in the monster field as an orc. Lots of things happened during this period of time. The fissure that opened up on the East Sea of Korea may have been subjugated without much trouble, but that wasn't the only one opening up on that day. Another one had opened up on the Atlantic Ocean near the African continent. And it was still not brought under control by the united but ultimately insufficient forces of the African nations. The rumor spreading around like an itch currently was that they would make the request to both the United Nations Own Knights Order and the Overseas Orders for their military support pretty soon. The Demon Orc Ah. You mean, the mutated orc found in the mid-tier hunting ground? Ah, uh, yes. Right now, we are forming a team, you see. However, the most trending topic in the Republic of Korea, which was located a great distance away from Africa, was something else entirely. That had to do with a certain orc found in the low mid to mid tier hunting grounds, an existence some people took to calling the demon orc. Apparently, one could tell this orc apart from the others of its kind by the azure scales covering its entire body. After defeating countless knights without even causing a single death, some even began to call it with a strange nickname. The gentleman, currently, the creature had become a sought after big target for those knights who were trying to make a name for themselves. Would you like to become a part of our team? A mid-tier knight named Kim Wonjong was showing the greatest amount of courage he had ever mustered in his entire life, by requesting USA Young to join his team and subjugate this particular orc. As an aside, when seven or more knights gathered together, it was referred to as a team. It was a somewhat weird thing to see a team being formed to subjugate one monster found in the mid-tier hunting ground. But, the Dawn Order was actually encouraging the formation of teams comprised of low mid-tier and mid-tier knights. A normal hunting team would form around an upper mid-tier knight, usually. The purpose of this move by the management was to let the lower-tiered knights gain some valuable experience in this manner. 
Plus, they must have not been too worried, because the orc, for some strange reason, had not killed any knights or hunters until now. Of course, there was always an exception to the rule, but judging from the 100 or so victims of the orc, the most serious injury suffered was some fractured ribs. So, one could safely concur that this orc clearly wasn't planning to kill people. An orc that didn't want to kill. What a crazy idea that was, but then again, wasn't the very existence of monsters shrouded in a veil of mystery. Her arms crossed, USA Young agonized for a bit. The Demon Orc. The creature's official record was 148 matches, 148 victories and zero losses. It was a champion among champions. So, if that monster was successfully subjugated, then the achievements gained would be seriously enormous. And those achievements would directly influence her rank advancement exams for the mid-tier. After thinking for a bit, she abruptly pulled out her mobile phone. Those who had the honor of having their numbers saved on her phone were the likes of upper mid-tier knights, wizards ranked B-class or higher, and high-ranking officials of politics and financial world. There was only one hunter among these giants, and that was Kim Sae Jean. Please hold on for a moment. By the way, is there a spot for a hunter to join? Uh. Ah, uh, um, there isn't, but I'll make one. When the guy proclaimed loudly, USAE Young nodded her head and called that person. If it was possible, she wanted to hunt together with that man. No, maybe, this was her making up an excuse or a justification because she wanted to see him again. It had been over a month now since all contact with him had been lost. And she just failed to understand why she could not get a hold of him all of a sudden. SFX for a ringtone. And as the ringtone continued to extend, USA Young began to bite her nails without even realizing it. She was feeling nervous. Why wasn't he picking up his phone? The number you dialed is currently unavail. In the end, it was the same result. Ha! Sighing out grandly, USA Young pocketed her phone while carrying a hurtful expression. And then, turned her gaze back to the very hopeful male knight waiting there. I'll do it. Oh. At the surprise yes, the male knight shouted out. As she was feeling somewhat prickly at the moment, USA Young frowned sharply at him which caused the knight to let out a fake cough in an apologetic expression. Kume. Thank you very much. Oh, and, uh, should we reserve the spot for that hunter you mentioned? SAE Young powerlessly shook her head. No. That means. Do as you wish. If possible, fill it with someone capable, please. She coldly cut his words in the middle, and walked with heavy footsteps towards the training ground. Did I do something wrong? Her chest began to tighten suddenly. Such a frustrated feeling was rather unfamiliar to her. She was someone who people fawned over her entire life, so why was she all hung up over a single person? She just could not figure this one out. Was she afraid of losing the connection she had built with Kim Sae Jean? No that was just one of the reasons. There definitely was more. Fu. The spiritless USAE Young had arrived at the training ground before long. Sighs automatically came out of her mouth. Something was weird. Really, the training she looked forward to performing every day was beginning to feel oh so tedious now. Chapter, 54 Nowadays, one got to see lots of hunting teams, made up of various knights, coming and going within the rest stop of the monster field. They all came here to achieve one singular goal. And that goal was to subjugate the demon orc. The demon orc a monster that became quite famous after appearing on SNS, community websites and news broadcasts. It was now so famous, the mass media even went and gave it an utterly thoughtless name of a monster superstar. Of course, such a thing was only possible because the creature hadn't killed anyone yet and so the public didn't view it with hostility. No, they even gave it a favorable attention, instead. My name is Oh Daesu, the leader of this subjugation team dispatched by the Daebeak Knights Order. And that's why one could find many cameras and recording equipment in the rest stop. As a matter of fact, a hunting team was being interviewed right now by a news crew. According to Oh Dae Su from the Daebeak Knights Order, he had fought against the demon orc in a desperate, bloody battle but regretfully, he had to taste defeat in the end. 
Perhaps, you've made preparations this time. It's simple, really. I ended up losing unfortunately last time, but I will definitely defeat it this time. Ah. You're overflowing with confidence, aren't you? Then, may I ask what the composition of your hunting team is? When the reporter asked him about the touchy subject, Odesu's lips quivered slightly as he hesitated with his answers, until he finally replied in an unwilling tone. We have four mid-tier knights and three low mid-tiers. Ah. Uh. Well, that's more than expected. You said that there was only a tiny little difference between you and the orc, so why is there a need for so many knights? Aha. Uh -huh. At that time, things were different. When I confronted it back then, it was not covered in strange scales, you see. The change most likely came about after experiencing the intense battle against me, which in turn helped it to grow further. Oh Desu strung a bunch of utter drivel with a dignified face. However, being a professional, the reporter tried to listen till the end. That lasted only until the team for the Dawn Knight's order entered the building, of course. As expected, even monsters know how to discern great opponents and... Yes, thanks for your time. It was nice to hear from you. The reporter hurriedly turned on his heels and rushed over there. What the hell, how rude. Oh Desu glared at the back of the departing reporter with a deep frown. But, almost right away, his face color changed to a lively hue and he too ran over there as soon as he saw the identity of the person the reporter went to speak to. Oh Desu being one of the moderators in USAE Young's online fan club was an open secret among all the knights orders out there. Receiving much attention from the filming crews, USAE Young and her team of knights set foot on the monster field and headed straight towards the mid-tier hunting ground to find the traces of their target, the demon orc. Her current ranking was only at the low mid-tier but, her abilities were better than a regular mid-tier so, no one in her team, including herself, was worried at all. The demon orc's fame might be pretty big now, but in truth, that was earned simply by beating up the knights from the orders that were nothing to write home about in the first place. The Dawn Knight's order was a different kettle of fish altogether they would not be a pushover like the others. Also, what could possibly happen to this team, comprised of three mid-tier knights and another three low mid-tiers? Thus, the team members were not worried at all. Ha ha ha. Today's weather is pretty good, isn't it? And so, to the knights in this hunting team, the goal of subjugating the demon orc could be seen as just a means to an end. Their main objective now was to get friendly with the most important person present and build connections with her. Obviously, who would give a toss about some random orc when there was the personification of the golden spoon right next to them? Seems like it. However, USAE Young continued to give out short answers to the endless stream of questions. Even then, these five knights did not give up. They worked very hard to talk to her even for one more second. And it so happened that there was no woman in this hunting team within the heads of these males, dreams of definitely impossible romance were being played out. Thankfully, such pink-infused daydreams didn't last for long. Quang. From somewhere unknown, a faint sound of explosion could be heard. That could have been the sound of impact from a blunt weapon. The faces of knights hardened in an instant and they glanced at each other. There was no need for a lengthy hesitation, though. Because, USAE Young dashed towards the direction of the sound like the tempest winds. SAE Jean wiped the blood splashed onto his face. His opponent this time was a juvenile ogre. Although it was supposedly a juvenile, it was still a gigantic monster with height easily exceeding 5 meters. At the moment, it was nothing more than a pile of meat near his feet, though. Trade has leveled up. All stats will rise. It took about another two weeks for his trait level to rise up to 13. Maybe it was due to receiving lots more experience points from defeating both the monsters as well knights, his level up came pretty early, but he didn't feel any particular joy from it. The most important thing right now was his evolution. He couldn't feel relieved at all until, at minimum, the orc form evolved into the great warrior. S.A.E. Jean abruptly sensed the presence of a human running towards him like a beam of light. And there were more than one. Another hunting team. From what he could sense, it seemed like yet another team of knights. This was the third time this week already. 
He found it all so annoying since most of these guys were equipped with artifacts that erased smell and made it hard to detect their presence. Of course, if he wanted to run away, then he could activate the whirlwind dash at any time, but he wasn't going to, when a fight was delivering itself to him like that. Kim Saejin held his mace tightly and waited for the knight's arrival. And precisely ten seconds later. Foo. The knight revealing herself from the thicket was someone he was all too familiar with, Usae Young. At this unexpected encounter, Sae Jean panicked a little. And during that short opening, the rest of the team arrived as well. Wow so, the stories were true. One of the knights looked at the orc in front and muttered. The creature was indeed an incredible existence, now that he saw it with his own two eyes. Especially so, when looking at the majestic appearance of the orc standing there resolutely with the blazing sun on its back. The bright lights reflected off the demon orc's trademark azure scales the imposing muscles on its body quivered, full of life its dignified appearance would perfectly suit an orc chieftain no, the orc great chieftain, instead. One or two knights present subconsciously swallowed their saliva and tensed up at the monster's humongous frame emanating an unidentifiable noble aura. Except for one person, that was. Let's go. Usa Young shouted out aloud and kicked the ground hard as she dashed forward. The other knights only then shook out of the momentary stupor and hurriedly chased after her. Hop. With a short shout subconsciously leaking out from between the opening of her clenched teeth, Usa Young threw everything she had behind her sword strike. Her oblique sword swing left behind the traces of mana in the air as it approached the orc. However, her target Kim Sae Jean did not even try to block her attack, nor did he move to dodge it. He wanted to give her an inch and then, take the yard from her. First of all, in a battle against a group of opponents, making them no longer able to participate in combat as quickly as possible should take the utmost priority. He would cancel out this trifling attack with his own body and then go after her proper. Sorry. He felt apologetic towards USA Young, but it couldn't be helped. It'd be a struggle even for him to take on a team of six knights all alone. He'd like to refuse taking part in a cliched event where he messed around unnecessarily and then ended up finding himself in danger. From the beginning, he had no desire to kill them, but since they were attacking him with an intent to subjugate him, wasn't there a clear difference in opinion here? Also, importantly if one was to assign blame here, then there was Usae Young who was rushing towards him like a rash idiot. Kowar. The orc roared out loudly and slammed his mace against Usae Young's waist. This wasn't one of his regular attack but actually, his fear strike, after adjusting its overall power. Qek. The mana barrier surrounding her shattered rather powerlessly, and leaving behind a short yelp, she bounced away like a kicked barrel. SFX for a body ragdoll ng around loudly. Her body bounced around endlessly until it struck a sturdy tree's trunk and only then did it come to a stop. There was not a single hint of movement from her. She was definitely out for the count here. Sae Jean could now easily decipher mistakes or openings in the enemy's offense after his passive weapon user, which allowed him to wield weapons efficiently, rose up to level B. And what happened to Usae Young was the result of her foolishly rushing into the mace's effective attack range. She probably meant to get the first surprise attack in and do some serious damage. Actually, her attack was scarily powerful. Since she also possessed a similar level-up system as he did, there might have been some sort of a skill involved here. No, it was definitely a skill, all right. Kim Sae Jean looked down on the stab wound left behind on the chest scales, and he chuckled wryly. But such carefree attitude was a luxury he couldn't afford yet. There were still five more knights left. Miss Sae Young. He set his sights next on the knight who had called out Sae Young's name as if he had a lot of leeway here. He must have thought the current situation was nothing but a playtime or something for such a clueless guy like him, a course in stern education was a necessity. Sae Jean avoided the attacks from other knights narrowly and slammed his mace down on the back of that guy trying to run after Usae Young. Euark. The knight showing his back let out a short cry before collapsing in a heap. There was only one attribute added to this mace, enhanced striking power, level B. With such a stupidly incomprehensible level of power endowed to this weapon, it'd be way too greedy for anyone to hope to remain conscious after getting struck on the backside with this mace. 
And so, SAE Jean got to easily thin out their ranks by two nights. But the real fight would begin in earnest from now on. Maybe it was because of the two prior attacks, the remaining four knights did not show any gaps in their defenses. By working together, they covered each other's openings and confronted the orc. At their remarkable coordination, SAE Jean was slowly being pushed back, step by step. Well, actually he was allowing them to attack him freely. It was just that, their attacks were weak and could not penetrate the leviathan scales at all. The knights also understood this so, they began concentrating their attacks on his chest where the scales were slightly damaged due to USAE Young's earlier attempt. However, even under such a concentrated barrage, Kim SAE Jean was not flustered at all. There was still one more ace up his sleeve, after all. Although the duration was only for five minutes, he could become twice as strong by activating the skill, the Warrior of Reversal. Of course, if he used that then the rest of the day's hunting plans have to be thrown out the window, as his energy would be all used up but to fight against these four very well-coordinated knights, it just couldn't be helped anymore. Just a little bit more. We're almost. One knight sensed hope from their advantageous position. As he said, just a little bit more if they endured a little bit more, then surely, the victory would be theirs. But that was only until the ominous aura began emanating from the body of this orc. What the? Don't stop attacking it. The knights continued to attack while trying to disregard the ominous feeling. Stopping their attacks when the going was good that was something only trashy idiots would do. The guy who was trying to look after USA Young from the get-go and then got owned was one such trash, though. However, the orc's movement changed. Maybe, that unidentifiable red aura oozing out of its body and its eyes were to blame the orc's movements became far nimbler and its power became ridiculously stronger, too. Weeing. The wind pressure from the mace splitting the air shattered apart a large tree and even though it was just a slight tickle on his thigh, a knight felt an incredible pain akin to the nerves in his leg being severed. FCK. In the end, the knights could only swear out loudly. Before they knew it, the flow of the battle had reversed completely, and they became busy just trying to defend. Unfortunately, even the defending bit couldn't last for long. SFX for a loud orsish roar. In that moment, when the orc roared out angrily and slammed his mace down on the ground, the earth's crust itself shot up into the air. And that wasn't all. The shock wave from that dreadful smash got transmitted in full to the knights within the range. The pain they felt was similar to having their limbs trampled on. Yuck. Cook. The space left behind in the wake of the vicious assault looked terrifying. The once level ground had become a deep crater, and the knights tumbling within couldn't even lift a finger as pain racked their bodies. Heck, two of them had already fainted from the impact, even. To these guys, this was the first time experiencing such immense pain as well as the fear of death. Quite unlike the hunters and the regular soldiers, the knights were seen as the high-class manpower of humanity and thus, were treated with utmost care and respect. Which led to them having a completely different mindset to that of hunters who had to bet their lives each time they hunted, after all, a knight only saw monsters as an easy source of wealth and saw the process of hunting as a simple labor. So, a knight only got to get familiar with cutting and killing living things as if they were slaughtering livestock, but rarely did they find a chance to sharpen their resolves to face their own death. And that's why it was not a coincidence that one of the assessments for the rank advancement to upper mid-tier where one could be called a true knight included the so-called proper mindset as well. Kim Sae Jean walked towards them with thudding footsteps and looked down at the defeated knights. Orcs love this feeling of being the sole victor. And that was one of the reasons why looking down on losers like this was imper. Hey, you. Right then. S.A.E. Jean heard a familiar voice and he turned his head to check it out. U.S.A.E. Young was standing over yonder after regaining her consciousness somehow. Listen. Take the three unconscious knights and escape from here. While pointing her sword at S.A.E. Jean's orc form, she shouted at the knight still groaning in pain inside the crater. And sure enough, commotion broke out from there. The things they said how can we leave you behind, etc., etc. Well, they were what one would expect under this kind of circumstance. In any case, this orc supposedly doesn't kill people. But right now, she could not be certain of this fact as it were, 
precisely because of the ominous aura still oozing from the orc. But. Will you just hurry up? I have my own plan that I want to try out, so just get the hell out of here, now. What the heck is wrong with this girl? It was Sae Jean who was in slight turmoil after seeing Yu Sae Young's determination. However, the current appearance of her was busy overlapping with another one from the recent past within his mind. Back then, when she was confronting the troll in the ravenous state. While she was facing up to the monster all alone, she was busy urging him to scram. It's known to not kill humans so stop stimulating it and let's just escape with us from here. You were the ones who stimulated it anyways. Stop wasting time and go find some help, now. USA Young shouted out again. The situation seemed slightly different this time. Back then, she was telling the others to run while having no clear plan of her own but now, she had an ace up her sleeve, a surefire killer move. Wong. Winds picked up the sword began vibrating and mana began converging. Her killer move, where the sword aura was being compressed in an incredibly high pressure. Mana accumulating on her blade was so high in density and concentration, her sword was actually humming in tune with it. That was the skill that had transcended the mana blade, the destruction blade. It was a skill so difficult, even upper mid-tier knights struggled to control properly. And now, she was doing it. The two still conscious knights then quickly shouldered the three fainted ones and moved away as soon as they saw what she was going to do. And well, a knight was still a knight, whether his arms or legs were broken. Their speed was actually faster than a regular person's full tilt sprint. When they were safely out of the potential strike zone, USA Young began to earnestly scrap together every bit of mana still in her. Such a massive convergence of mana was enough to make SAE Jean nervous as well. So, he threw the mace at her with some power. His proficiency with this weapon was so high now, making it fly like a boomerang wasn't even a challenge to him anymore. He used the greatest strategy to victory under the heavens, also known as those who strike first, wins. As she was gathering mana with every ounce of her concentration, USAE Young could not react in time at the sudden attack. Kong. Kayak. And so, she got hit on the head with the thrown mace, then promptly passed out where she stood. That was, honestly speaking, an anticlimactic end. It's not enough just activating the skill. You should know how to use it properly first. As expected, her youthful naivete got exposed again. Growing up as a gold spoon, just what chance would she have to experience true hardship? She probably had become too conceited for her own good, and only ended up learning useless habits, such as acting recklessly and all that. Phew. S.A.E. Jean searched the surroundings for signs of humans, and when he couldn't find one, he changed into the human form. Then, he picked U.S.A.E. Young up on his back and started walking. The help would have come with the passage of time, but he couldn't leave her here like that. That's why you should have just run away. You truly are an idiot. He inwardly criticized the girl on his back. But, there was a grin etched across his lips at the same time as well. Condition complete, defeated five hunting teams. When one more condition is successfully fulfilled, the orc jaguar form will change into the orc great warrior form. Ah. Uh. Mr. Kim Sae Jean. The butler and the chief secretary of the Dawn household, Park Hyano was standing around waiting nervously for someone before noticing the figure of two people walking closer. He hurriedly ran over there. To be precise, it was one person walking, while giving a piggyback ride to the other person. It's been a while. Chuckling slightly, Kim Sae Jean greeted the harried Park Hyano and then handed over USAE Young to the butler. Yes. It's truly been a while. But why haven't you contacted us? Our little miss was. Ah, since she's still suffering somewhat, shall we talk about that later on? Of course. I already administered a potion so you don't have to worry too much. Park Hyano let out a sigh of relief after hearing S.A.E. Jean's words. Did this happen when trying to defeat the demon orc? I heard that she was among the team of six knights Park Hyano. The demon orc. Ah uh, well, that orc must have been pretty strong, it seems or maybe, one or two knights accompanying her must have been inept. Park Hyano proceeded to ask him lots more questions afterwards. 
such as, how did SAE Jean find you SAE Young, what had happened to the demon orc, etc., etc. SAE Jean made up the story where he coincidentally discovered the scene of the knights fighting the orc. And out of concern for you SAE Young's well-being, he stayed behind to witness the event and then, when the chance rose, escaped with her in tow. Well then, we should get going. We are truly grateful for your help today. Well, yeah take care. After seeing you S.A.E. Young away safely, S.A.E. Jean headed back to his home. After all, it had been a while. And that evening. Stories regarding the injured U.S.A. Young, the knights from the Dawn Order and the one responsible, the Demon Orc, caused an uproar. It dominated the real-time most searched results as well as many news broadcasts. Even the Dawn Order fails to subjugate the Demon Orc is it finally the turn of the Raven? In the situation of complete defeat, Hunter Kim S.A.E. Jean rescues U.S.A.E. Young. Again, the Demon Orc does not take a single life the public instead welcomes the creature's continuous victory. The stories were all mostly like these. Chapter, 55 Kim S.A.E. Jean returned home for now. His worries hadn't been addressed yet, as the Orc form was still not powerful enough but there were just too many things he had been neglecting so far. The Goblin, often referred to as one of the most prolific alchemists in recent times, hadn't produced a potion in over three weeks the third Athony doll was yet to make an appearance in the world and not to forget. The promise of two weapons per month made by the orc blacksmith was in danger of being broken only after the second month. Of course, he had already paid off all his debts to Hazeline by now. Even if he took it real easy and worked slowly, He'd still make enough mula to live out the rest of his life in comfort, but S.A.E. Jean didn't want to stop advancing his life forward here. This life he was living right now, this precious life, was something he worked hard to secure while living in that damp squalor of a cave for more than five months of his life four months previously and one just now. He was not going to miss the opportunities right in front, that would enable him to achieve all that he could only dream about back then. Yes. Please send someone over to come and fetch the potions. No, don't worry. Nothing much happened. Well, it's a secret. It sure had been a while since they talked, but he called Hazeline and told her to come and fetch the potions. While obviously being ecstatic, she proceeded to tell him about the worries expressed by the media, knights, and the public after the goblin alchemist seemingly having gone AWOL on them. Right. Talk to you later. He talked to her for around five minutes and after finishing up the call, he then went online. The website he connected to was the home page for his society, The Monster. Maybe it was because the site was created by the specialists hired by USAE Young, it looked and operated as good as the top portal sites out there. However, most likely due to it being not well known, there had been only two visitors today, including himself. To reinvigorate the website, he decided to write and upload something here. The artisan, the ORK, is seeking new owners for his weapons, the Orc series. For a week, starting 9 a.m. this Sunday, interviews will commence on the premise of the Orc's forge. The person conducting the interview will be the society's chairman, Kim S.A.E. Jean. Please prepare application forms with the same format as before, by writing everything truthfully. The pricing will be discussed with the successful applicants. As soon as he pressed enter on the keyboard to upload the public notice, his mobile phone vibrated. While leaving his gaze fixed on the monitor, he answered the call. Hello. However, not one word came from the other side. When he took a glance at the caller ID on the touchscreen, it showed you SAE Young. He chuckled slightly. Why did you call me? Oh, so you finally decide to answer your phone. She replied only after he asked her again. Her voice was steeped in icy coldness. My bad. There was a thing I had to take care of. Well, I understand, really. And you don't have to apologize to that extent. Well, it was me who called you out of the blue anyway, so it's not like I'm feeling hurt or anything. I thought we were friends, but I guess Appa thought differently, huh? I wonder why I felt like that. But it's nothing to worry about. So. Seeing how she continued to prattle on needlessly, he could definitely tell that she was sulking right now. S.A.E. Jean could somehow imagine her face on the other side of the line. Her eyes deeply narrowed, her lips in a lengthy pout, 
all the while busy scratching her innocent fingernails. There's that, but how is your body feeling right now? Eh. Oh, it's okay. By the way is it true that you rescued me? Yeah. By coincidence, I was hunting nearby. What? A hunter was moving alone in a mid-tier hunting ground. It was then his conscience became prickly for a moment, but he just sighed out grandly and began speaking to her in an accusatory tone. In cases like these, it was better to be thick-skinned, after all. Oi. I noticed just now that you talk as if you think hunters are trash or something. Huh. Ah, that is, it's not. What do you mean, it's not? Now that I think about it, when we met for the first time, you treated me like an insect when I told you I was a hunter, right? Eh. Eh. No, no that's not it. W, what are you saying, in, insect? I never treated Oppa like a bug, you know. Never, never it's a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding. They say one knows his or her sins the best. Remembering the event in question, USAE Young began spewing gibberish in an unbridled panic. Don't do it again. Treating people badly like that, it's not a good habit to have, you understand. He was telling the truth. He met countless number of people after jumping headlong into the front lines of life at a young age. And among them, the bastards he found most disgusting were those who judged others by positions and talents, and after deciding the others were beneath themselves, completely disparaged them. I understand. She sounded a little bit sulky, but since it was her fault to begin with, she didn't try to retort back at him. Ah, uh, right. Can I ask you for a favor? Since she called him first, S.A.E. Jean decided that, might as well, ask her for one favor. Mm -hmm. A favor? What is it? You do those SNS things, right? Pardon? Oh yeah, I do social media. You want me to send you a friend request? What's your handle? No, that's not it. He was slightly surprised. He honestly thought that she might stay away from such things. Right now, on our society's homepage, the orc blacksmith had left behind a notice, you see. I want you to spread the word. Really? You'll see when you log on. I'm counting on you. He almost unconsciously hung up right then, but somehow, he was able to stop himself just in time. Fine. I got it. Okay, thanks. And that's how the conversation between the two ended. However, neither of them dropped the call first. You're not gonna hang up. Yeah. You should hang up first. If there's some other stuff you want to talk about, that's fine too. As if you had listened to other stuff I wanted to say before. SAE Jean told her that he'd listen this time as he turned his attention back to the computer monitor. Because he suddenly remembered the matter of the Athene doll. So, he began typing again. Looking for the new owner of Athene. All details will be decided after the interview has been conducted. The location of the interview is the company building of the monster, the Elrin Building, situated in the suburbs of Wanju, Kanwan Province. If you post your questions on the open notice board on this website, we'll contact you one at a time. Well, it's fine. I don't have anything else to say anyway. I'm hanging up now. I can check the details in the home page, right? Yeah. There should be two notices. All right. See you. Bye. However, he didn't drop the call and waited. Even USAE Young did the same. Oh. It's for real, now. Don't you test me. She let out a short exclamation full of mischievous tone, said she was hanging up for real, and she finally did. When S.A. Young advertises a lot on SNS, then hang on a second. Then, a thought suddenly popped into his head. Maybe I should also do that SNS thingy. He was at the sweet old age of 23. That was at the age when the desire to jump into society would be running rampantly. But, swept up in the stormy winds called the working hard to survive, he could never afford to enjoy such things up until now. Cume. He did a fake cough and called USAE Young first this time. March 21st. The United Nations' own Knights Order proclaimed the first-class threat, the Annihilated, on the southern part of the African continent. 
when the first class threat classification was given, that meant the area had to be abandoned due to the high number of powerful monsters. And the equipment as well as the personnel brought in to suppress the threat were simply not sufficient enough. At least, they were successful in closing the fissure with great difficulty, meaning 80% of the continent was protected. But the rest 20% became an inhospitable hellhole full of uber-strong monsters that defied all classifications. The focus of the world's media, including Korea, gathered around on this tragic event that had cost so many lives. The countless denizens of this planet mourned the loss of life as well. Also, using this event as the clear evidence, several organizations began to urge the others to stop treating fishers and monsters as sources of income but as a real, tangible threat that could steal away many lives and to change the mindset to become more vigilant and less lackadaisical. However, maybe the event taking place in a land so very far away didn't touch people's hearts as deeply as it should have the blazing flames of grief weakened until nothing was left in less than a week and the fickle attention of the public quickly moved on to another topic altogether. USAE Young's SNS post was the beginning. A week ago, she posted a comment regarding her society, The Monster, for her over 2 million strong followers to read. And the contents within were great enough to make people forget about the African Fisher incident the third Athony doll as well as the Orc series armaments. The moment her post went live, it gathered explosive amount of attention from the knights as well as from the public and the servers of the monster could not handle the traffic inundating the home page which led to it crashing several times. How long should I wait for? And right now, this place was in the middle of the society causing all that ruckus. The monster's own private building, on the top floor fifth. Kim Yurin sighed at the unrelenting passage of time. She had a lot of work piled up today, but it wasn't like she could just run away from this important agenda with a flimsy excuse of attending to her own personal matters. It felt like her innards were burning up from all the nervousness. But there sure are lots of people here. Well it's a ridiculously good item, so there's that. The reception was packed to the brim with numerous awaiting knights. Not only the members from the local knights' orders, but the people from the overseas orders, and several wizards were present as well. Without a doubt, they came here for the mascot doll that had become famous the world over, the Athony. The Knight's Orders and Wizard Towers sent out purchase request forms to the monster as if they were in a contest or something, after checking out the notice on the Society's webpage. As there were way too many requests, Urin heard that only ten interviews would take place every day so, judging by the sheer number of people present, it seemed like the big shots of each order came here with their own entourage. Should I have brought people of my own too, I wonder? Kim Yurin felt a slight regret born out of loneliness gnawing at her, but she quickly shook head. That guy Chai Young Ho would have tried to weasel his way in if she hadn't declared her intentions to come here alone. So, this was actually better for her. Uh. Aren't you night Kim Yurin? As she sat there and continued to wait endlessly, out of the blue some guy walked up closer and tried to chat her up. In that moment, the focus of the surroundings gathered here. Ah uh, yes. Hello. She did wear a hat and a mask since she wanted to avoid this kind of situation, but. Yurin felt uncomfortable about this, but out of common courtesy, took off her disguise and greeted the man. Since it was quite likely that the knights here were all some kind of big shots in their respective orders, she had to maintain a certain amount of decorum. Also, the words of Chai Youngho when he accused her of inadvertently ignoring other knights played in her mind, too. The raven also came. Hua, uh, how troublesome. They are so greedy Kuemem. However, the atmosphere of the place quickly turned strange. Inside this spacious reception area, eyes of every knight present sharpened like knives and they began glaring at Kim Yurin as if she was their mortal enemy. She panicked slightly as her gaze fell on the knight who had recognized her first. Unfortunately, this guy carried an expression of utter satisfaction at this turn of events smiling contently. He then deliberately spoke at the top of his voice. By the way, I thought the Raven Order possessed an Athony doll already but well, I can sympathize. Having two would be better, after all. The title of the best knight's order in South Korea should be safer this way as well, too. Honestly speaking, it's actually better for the Raven to acquire the doll instead of other orders as far as the country's interests are concerned, am I right? 
Anyone could hear from the tone of his voice that he wanted to cause trouble for her here. Feeling a bit of anger swell up inside her, she was about to speak her mind when the dude said some CP like he was praying for her success and stuff, before disappearing to some other place. Hey, excuse M. With steam of anger rising from her head, she stood up abruptly from her seat, but her thoughts froze in their tracks when the whispers of the surroundings entered her ears. A few. Look how she came here all alone. As if she's afraid of sharing her achievements really, she's not the youngest highest tier in the history for nothing. She's a cold one, that one. No names, no faces she could only hear their voices. Only then did Yurin realize it. This place here had turned into a huge political arena. These individuals had even forgotten about keeping a cordial front just for a chance to acquire the doll of Athene. Getting mentally struck by multiple blows of dissenting voices loaded with clear hostility, Yurin crumbled back down on her seat. She realized that she had no allies in this place. And so, Kim Yurin had to endure all the hostile glares and cold sarcasms of other knights by herself alone. Well then. We'll be in your care, Mr. Chairman. Please take care of us. The Vice Order Master of the Daybeak, Oh Young Hyuk and his son Oh Dae Su bent their backs in 90 degree angle. On their sides, really thick documents and rolled up papers could be seen. Those were all the PR materials they prepared for this meeting. The pair of father and son prepared an extensive presentation for the meeting with Kim Sae Jean, such as how the Daebeek would assist the monster if they acquired the Athene doll, projections of real benefits for both, as well as strategies to appeal to his sensible side, etc. Of course, S.A.E. Jean was well aware just how badly Knight's orders wished to acquire the doll, but such an unexpectedly fervent ardor still ended up giving him a case of migraine. And his time was running short, too. Ah, uh, yes, well there was no need to go that far still, thank you for coming. The results will be announced in two weeks' time. S.A.E. Jean also felt slightly uncomfortable at the sight of two people who were obviously older than him be so mindful of their manners and end up looking unmanly in the process. Please, we'd be deeply satisfied if you think of us in the most favorable light. As we spoke to you earlier, our knight's order can. Oh Young Hyuk did his utmost best to alert S.A.E. Jean to the benefits his order could provide it right up until the very end. Phew. After finishing up this interview, S.A.E. Jean took a short break. He jotted down what Oh Young Hyuk had said on a piece of paper, and then pulled out his phone. Wow. Fifty thousand, already? It had been only three days, but he already had 50k followers. As expected, the power of U.S.A.E. Young's word of mouth was considerable. Well, her help here was nothing more than her becoming a follower but still, since she followed only one person him obviously the public had to pay attention to the latest change in her SNS profile. Should I send in the next appointment? The voice of the temp employee from the Dawn Corporation entered his ear. Yes. Please do. The door opened, and a single woman walked in with heavy footsteps. It was someone S.A.E. Jean was familiar with Kim Yurin. But her state seemed a bit peculiar. Her face was red her normally neat hair was somewhat disheveled and there was a trace of blood on her lips as if she was biting on them too hard for too long. She walked heavily while gritting her teeth, and sat opposite to S.A.E. Jean. Will it work, Dad? Of course. You also saw that things went smoothly in there, right? And just how much money did we spend on Kim S.A.E. Jean's close aides? And I even gave out a little present to that manager elf from the armory, 2K Wem. Let's talk about this later. The manager. At Oh Dae Su's confused question, Oh Young Hyuk looked at his son with disappointed eyes. The gaze contained the feelings of a father who felt sadness and pity for his son who was clueless on the ways of the real world. That elf manager from the armory. That woman who is being suspected as Kim Sae Jin's main squeeze. How come you didn't who? Fine, fine. I shouldn't even have brought it up. Oh Young Hyuk shook his head and stepped into the elevator first. Daesu stared at his father with envious eyes and then, with a huge grin on his lips, followed Young Hyuk into the elevator as well. As always, I knew you could do it, Dad. You became friendly in that short amount of time with the girlfriend of the society's chairman. Calm down, son. I told you, 
it's still just a speculation. It's not a definite thing. Well, since Kim Sae Jin is a man, he surely would have held one or two indecent thoughts about that elf by the way, why are you smiling so happily right now? Oh Yung Hyuk grumbled and slapped the back of his son's head. Regardless, Oh Dae Su continued to stare at his father with clear, round eyes of adulation. Even though the boy was not all there up in his head, as a father, he just could not bring himself to hate his own child. EI, UBD. Didn't I tell you to lose some weight many times already? Oh Yung Hyuk poked the belly fat of his son while chuckling slightly. Chapter, 56. Are you alright? Kim Sae Jin carefully asked. But with a dark and clouded expression, Yurin simply nodded her head weakly and grandly sighed out. This here is what the Raven Knight's order is considering as its proposal. She handed him a bound copy of a report. Oh, ah uh, thanks. Sae Jin received the report and then took a quick glance at the contents. Even though this was already his fifth interview today, in all honesty, most of what he was reading right now didn't want to enter his brain at all. The printed words were small, there were lots of numbers and calculations, and even some needless English words thrown in there, too. Without a doubt, it was a typical report drawn up by civil servants working in the government-run Knight's Order. I really need dedicated employees for this. He again reaffirmed his thoughts on hiring more specialized workers, even if it meant asking USA Young for it. Mm. He closed the report while trying to look as if he had understood most of the contents within. However, Kim Yurin's eyes busy studying him seemed a bit strange. She sighed out, not caring whether anyone could hear her or not, and then weakly muttered out in a disappointed voice. You didn't even read that properly. Eh. No, no, that's not correct. I have read it thoroughly. Now feeling a bout of guilt, Sae Jean hurriedly waved his hands in denial, but that only made Yurin's eyes to droop down even more in sadness. Mr. Kim Sae Jean. Why, yes. As if she had something to say, her lips moved slightly. However, the words she wanted to say didn't come out easily. She took her sweet time agonizing over the matter, until finally, decided that this wasn't working. She shook her head and then tried to speak in a cheerful voice. I'd like to thank you for the gifts you gave me. What she managed to utter out didn't suit the current situation at all. That caused Sae Jean to be flustered momentarily, but he tried to sound as unperturbed as humanly possible. Ah yes, it was my pleasure. That the Athony doll you gave me that time and the dolls of now are different, right? Eh. Ah yes, that's correct. Their effects do differ, but the doll I gave to you is just as good an item as the others. As I thought. Whenever I go to bed, I have it near me and I've always felt something was special about it. As you said, it helps me to calm my mind, and somehow, it's become a close friend I can't do without now. Ahaha well, that's a relief to hear. And soon, the conversation that started with the discussion of private matters slowly led into the official business. However, their talk frequently got cut off for some reason and felt rather awkward and unnatural. Yurin deliberately tried to sound cheerful, but she actually had a rather timid personality. The memories of ten missed calls and eight unchecked messages from her still weighed like a heavy baggage in her mind. And not to forget, less than ten minutes ago, she was being mentally assaulted by the countless number of enemies, so it was not possible for her to maintain a normal state of mind. In the end, their conversation came to a close and between them, silence descended like a fog. As he had been a listener only until now, Sae Jean truly had no clue how to take the lead in a meeting like this and so, he began repeatedly thumbing through the poor pages of the report. One hour, thirty minutes. While he was doing that, suddenly the alert window for time remaining brushed past his consciousness. When he looked at Yurin, she didn't seem to have anything particular to say. So, Sae Jean carefully asked her. How about we end the meeting here? Uh. Ah. Uh. Yurin's face became clouded in disappointment and her gaze dropped to the floor. Well, the truth was that, this meeting only started ten minutes ago. If one considered how other night's orders spend twenty, thirty minutes per meeting, then there was a significant difference. Instead, how about I treat you to another meal later on? There are still things I'd like to discuss with you, after all. 
S.A.E. Jean quickly smiled and spoke further after witnessing the dark complexion on her face. Eh. Oh. Sounds good. I happen to have next week Saturday free, so. Then it's settled. The same restaurant as the last time? Yes. That's fine. Great. S.A.E. Jean reached out with his hand, and Yurin shook it while carrying a slightly confused smile. But then, thinking that she must convince him with this new opportunity, her face hardened as she shook his hand with added strength. Nowadays, Kim S.A.E. Jean's daily life had become complicated. During the day's lunch time, he assumed the human form and went through a ton of piled up work. And precisely after four hours of doing that, he'd leave the office of the society and head towards the monster field to focus on his growth. And always, while in the hunting area, he assumed the orc form the demon orc. On the official monster bestiary, he was now known as the orc jaguar covered in pronium scales. This name came about because the scales of the skill leviathan scales covering the orc's body resembled the blue-colored metal, pronium. Additionally, the images and stories of the demon orc had crossed the borders and permeated into international community chat sites, causing quite a bit of stir from all corners of the globe. Thanks to that, several international news agencies such as BBD, CNC etc. had come over to Korea and set up shop. Their reasoning was to film the unique and powerful monster that could only be found in Korea. I should be really careful when hunting from now on. S.A.E. Jean sighed out while browsing the Dawn Knight's Order's exclusive app Dawn Page, which was only possible to do so after he borrowed U.S.A.E. Young's login ID. From it, he found out that numerous mid- and upper-mid-tier knights were forming hunting teams to subjugate the demon orc. The Dawn Order's master got royally set off at the fact that his daughter got hospitalized and consequently, he placed a bounty of nearly two million dollars on the orc's head. So, how could anyone not participate in this hunt? Fewing. And that's why Kim S.A.E. Jean the Orc could only squat inside his cave for now. But he wasn't wasting his valuable time by doing nothing. The Magic Tattoos. He was in the middle of tattooing the entire body of the Orc. Not even a trace, huh? Kim S.A.E. Jean looked on at his completed tattoos with satisfaction. Since Orcs had no dexterity whatsoever, the end results were rather crude but, the color of the tattoos were the same as his skin so it was hard to spot them. And when he activated the leviathan's hard body, the scales would cover up his entire body, meaning it didn't even matter anyways. With the absorption of a mid-grade element resistance potion, a certain percentage of the element-based magic's effects will be resisted. Depending on the power of the element-based magic used, the host can ignore the damage from spells ranked below D. The reason why S.A.E. Jean went and got himself these tattoos was he got properly schooled by a certain mid-tier knight with a trait called the Magic Swordsman. From this encounter, he learned that, while an orc's body possessed a strong resistance towards physical damage, it was found utterly hopeless against attacks containing magic. Fool. Even though he was quite chuffed at the completed tattoos, he suddenly felt his chest tighten and ended up sighing out loudly. Just when can I become an orc great warrior? As soon as his orc jaguar form evolves into a great warrior after fulfilling that single remaining condition. The power balance within him should stabilize and that would give him a peace of mind but, he just could not get a sniff on what that bloody condition might be. Well, nothing to gain by just sitting around. The orc's expression turned sour as if he had stepped on dog poo, and unwillingly, he began to walk out of the cave. Early in the following morning. An interview? Yeah. I just got a call from the Time magazine, saying they want to interview the members of our society. I don't know why they contacted us first, but what do you think, Appa? S.A.E. Jean welcomed the morning call from U.S.A.E. Young. The Time magazine? Aren't they, like, super famous or something? Even if he was a dirt poor orphan growing up, he still managed to overhear a thing or two. And one of those things was the magazine U.S.A.E. Young had just mentioned. Yep. It's them, all right. They are probably the world's best weekly publication out there. Anyways, one of the topics they are covering this week is the rising societies, and that's why they want to interview us, apparently. USAE Young didn't even try to hide her happiness as she giggled loudly. It sure will be totally weird and so funny if Appa is selected as the person of the year or something. 
she even started saying some unnecessary things as well. That doesn't even make sense. But you do it if you want. I don't think I can make it. S.A.E. Jean was filled with regret as he spoke his refusal. Even though he desperately wanted to do the interview, there just wasn't enough time as he had no idea how long it might take. Excuse me. But why? You're the society's chairman, so how can you be absent? Huh, well then, what about Mr. Goblin, Mr. Ork or Miss Shenarine the Wizard? Ah uh, hmm. I don't think they will be available as well. Ah uh, ah. S.A.E. Jean chuckled as her despairing cry came from the other side of the line. He also thought that before too long, he should let her know of the identity of both the alchemist and the blacksmith. I should just tell her straight one of these days. He thought that he had gotten pretty close to U.S.A.E. Young by now. It had been already nine months since he got to know her, and the girl who was a minor back then was already standing on the cusp of adulthood. There had been a lot of eventful things happening since then. He appeared on TV together with her, went out on hunting together, and while hiding his identity, he even ended up smacking her around. And so, she had become someone he could place his absolute trust in. This, this, I'm just gonna say no. It's just too much. Uh. No, don't do that. It's a good opportunity to increase the visibility of our society, after all. Eh. I know you want to do it. So, why not? Just don't forget to package other members nicely while you're at it. As if she was completely speechless, USAE Young couldn't even retort back. Oh, right. Besides that, can you find the employees I told you about? Yeah huh. Oh, that? Yeah. Since we'll be getting people from the Dawn Corporation, you don't have to worry about their capabilities. The only problem is that, we have way too many applicants. Ah, that's not an issue. In the history of mankind, finding out a person's character through only his or her appearance alone was nearly an impossible task. There was a reason why many idioms such as honeyed tongue and two-faced, etc., etc., got invented, after all. However, S.A.E. Jean actually possessed the ability to see past the outer appearances. And that was the skill now rated at B, the eyes of the wolf. Thanks to the skill receiving lots of level up, he could now discern the character of other people even when he was in the human form. The methods of discernment was simple enough. After he turned up the sensitivity of his eye reads to the maximum, he then would look into the eyes of the others their eye color would change according to the innate nature of the person. The polar opposites evil and good were colored black and white respectively, and depending on which side the person's color was closer to, he'd then designate either dirty or clean. This skill even made it possible to discern not only a person's true character but his or her relevant abilities as well. He just had to take a look at the aura rising from their bodies. When the color was closer to a brilliant golden hue, the person was an extraordinary individual, but when the color was closer to being weak and feeble, then that person was just a regular Joe. Of course, the color of his own eyes would change into a bright golden hue if he used this skill, but a pair of contact lenses would take care of that problem so he was not too bothered by that prospect. I will take care of that problem. Just round them up in one place, and I'll need only five minutes to browse through them in one go. How many applied? 270. Yep, it's Finn what? 270. Now that was an unexpected number. Why were there so many applicants? S.A.E. Jean failed to understand why 270 folks were willing to abandon their positions in one of the most prestigious companies in the world for a spot in a society rated a measly C. Why the hell are there so many people? The outlook of our society is really positive, so there's that, but most importantly, it's because you, Appa, put up way too good employment conditions, you know. I mean, who promises a monthly wage of $5,500 after tax? You even promised excellent welfare benefits. No, that's, well you shouldn't be stingy when investing in people, you know. He acted like this because of a certain resentment rooted in his heart. A human being needed to be treated as a human being. He got to learn this maxim the hard way at a young age while enduring against scorn, abuse, ridicule as well as ignorance. Okay, then the plan is to have them gather in the society's building this Friday, so Appa, please take care of it. Right. 
then you do the interview. And if it's at all possible, speak nicely about me, okay? Hugh Yum yes, well. Since our great society chairman decreed so, I must totally submit to it, then. After all, that is the condition to join our society, right? Her unexpected and loaded insinuations went straight for his jugular. Hey, you. Where did you hear that? What do you mean, where? Everyone's heard of it by now. The conditions for joining our society are complete submission and cannot join any other society, isn't that right? Kum. The former is incorrect, but as for the latter, we should do exactly that. I hate bats. He said those words mischievously back then but now, they had somehow become the official joining criteria. Suddenly, he recalled the mug of Kim in Su. Did that fool spread the rumor? But I hear there are still lots of people wishing to join us. Ah, uh, right. Is it true that the upper mid-tier knight Ju Ji Hyuk will be joining us? Everyone's been talking about it, you see. It's all been hectic inside our order, too. Other knights are going crazy with jealousy, saying Ju Ji Hyuk is now moving up in the world and stuff. Ah, uh, Mr. Ji Hyuk. I thought he's a good hearted and diligent guy. Since it was a society not just in name only, obviously the member count couldn't remain at three forever. That was why he had set his eyes on Ju Ji Hyuk for some time now. And when SAE Jean indirectly raised the matter with the dude, Ju Ji Hyuk's expressions were like he'd die from happiness just thinking about it. I already received his application papers. I'm going to admit him in tomorrow. It's all good. He is a really dependable guy, after all. Hmm then maybe I should eat out together with Mr. Ji Hyuk tomorrow. USAE Young's voice seemed to suggest something as the ends of her sentence blurred somewhat. Maybe, she was trying to incite something like jealousy from SAE Jean. Oh. That's a good idea. The fellow society members should have a cordial relationship with one another, after all. But Kim SAE Jean was disinterested, personified which caused her to sigh out deeply and then, abruptly hang up the phone first. What's her problem? As the call had come to a sudden end, he just pocketed his phone and he stretched his limbs grandly. Today was the beginning of the weekend. For him, it was the beginning of the busiest day of them all. Onwards, to the monster field. An orc and an ogre was having a contest of raw strength. Now normally, the ogre would flatten an orc jaguar into a sheet of A4-sized paper with a single punch. That's the common sense, regardless of where one was from, be that a hunting ground or a plane of existence. SFX for the orc's loud roar. But the current status of this battle was going the other way. The mace swung with all the might this orc could muster didn't simply stop at destroying the wooden club wielded by the ogre, it even shredded a part of the ogre's arm. It was truly a display of terrifying power. SFX for an ogre groaning. After losing one of its arms and its trusty weapon, the ogre seemed to have lost its balance and slowly fell down. One wouldn't have to do anything to achieve victory in this case, but orcs were an impatient bunch. With light reflecting off its blue scales covering its body, the orc jumped in the air and smashed the ogre's face in with the mace. Quahang. The shock waves coming off from the impact swept past the trees and so, that's how this particular ogre left this world. After finishing up the fight, the orc then turned its attention back towards the peanut gallery that shouldn't even be there in the first place. Wow. Oh. Clap, clap. Out of the four people standing over there, two of them must have lost their marbles because they were busy clapping their hands in delight. Kim Sae Jean glared at them while his expression reflected how absurd this situation was. And that situation was thus, about twenty minutes ago, as he was roaming around the low mid-tier hunting ground, Sae Jean ran into an adult ogre, a creature that shouldn't have been there. Even though it lacked any distinguishing features such as patterns or horns, an adult ogre was still a monster ranked upper mid-tier that should have been found only at upper mid-tier hunting ground. The ogre that seemingly had appeared out of nowhere was busy chasing after this party of people. Kim Sae Jean didn't even hesitate for a second before activating the warrior of reversal skill and took on the ogre head-on. Shouldn't we run now? No, it's okay. That orc doesn't kill people. No, no, I know that. But, although it might not kill, 
it still hurts you pretty badly, right? Oh, I forgot about that. Fortunately, one of the group, a Su-in, with her ears trembling in fear, seemed to be in the right frame of mind. Okay, hang on a sec. Let me take a quick selfie here. However, instead of realizing the error of her ways, a woman possibly a knight decided to do something even more stupid. Finding this rather ridiculous, Sae Jin began moving his feet slowly towards this woman. I got it. Let's run. That female knight actually waited until the orc could be seen better within the camera screen before snapping the image and as soon as that was done, she ran off real fast as if her feet were on fire. Really, the world is vast and there truly are one too many crazy idiots out there. While recalling the famous line from somewhere, Sae Jean approached the dead ogre and pulled out the mana stone from the creature's still heart. A mana stone from an adult ogre. If he used this as the base ingredient for his tattoos, then without a doubt, he should receive a tremendous boost to his overall power. Just thinking about receiving the power of an ogre made the demon orc really happy. Khrng. However, Sae Jean discovered a certain something attached to the dead monster's thigh. When he took a closer look it was an egg. It was an egg with a sticky surface that helped it to effortlessly stick onto just about anything. And as far as Sae Jean's knowledge base went, he knew only one monster's egg that could do this. Chapter, 57 The griffin a strange monster possessing the head and wings of a hawk, a body like that of a lion, and its front limbs resembling that of a hawk. Griffins that ruled the skies of mid-tier hunting ground was rather well known to the public thanks to its dignified appearance. And there was one more thing. The surfaces of the griffin eggs were strangely sticky which allowed them to cling on to pretty much anything hunters and knights hunting in this region could find these eggs, albeit on very rare occasions. Did it get picked up by that ogre when it was walking around? Sae Jean the orc walked towards the griffin egg in thudding footsteps and picked it up. The unique liquid felt icky in his fingertips. Should I eat this now? He scanned all over the egg while drooling slightly. From the words of those people who had coincidentally discovered the eggs, a griffin egg tasted absolutely heavenly. Besides, the creature inside this egg was a monster that would definitely become a headache for the humanity. After all, because of its nature and instincts, not even a newborn could be tamed by human hands, which made it reasonable why they were referred to as monsters in this regard alone. Kung. And so, as he was thinking about whether to fry or boil the egg, like literally out of nowhere, an alert window filled with the list of passive skills he possessed rose up to his view. The passive skill predator, skill proficiency level, C. The host will grow stronger the more enemies the host eliminates. The prey can feel fear towards the predator and could surrender wish to submit under the rule of the host. There was a skill exactly for a situation like this a passive skill he happened to acquire when he became the werewolf, one that could be utilized during all of his forms. Since there was no literal prey-predator relationship between humans, the skill didn't apply, but right now, it was very much applicable. Honestly, wasn't he thinking about making a sunny-side-up fry out of this egg only 30 seconds ago? Carrowing. When he imagined a scene of an orc maybe, even a person riding on a griffin now that was seriously cool. He let out a fake cough for some reason, and then placed the griffin egg inside the expanding pocket. It was the following week's Friday also the day the employees for the society, the monster would be picked. Kim Sae Jean spent nearly an hour finishing up the interviews. The first thing he looked for was the abilities and so, he picked those with rich golden auras from the gathered people. The number of hopefuls decreased from 270 to mere 30 that way and afterwards, he performed a personal, face-to-face -face meeting with each individual to check out their real nature respectively. Evil guys were ones to avoid, but at the same time, real goody two-shoes were no good, either. However, after finding out that 27 applicants' eyes were dyed in black, Sae Jean had little choice but to hire the remaining three with purest colors there could be. Now that he looked at the process, it somehow had become one with a horrible failure rate of 90 colon 1, but Sae Jean felt satisfied in the belief that he ended up hiring good people. Welcome to the team, said Kim Sae Jean, while looking at the group of one woman and two men in front of him. My name is Kim Sae Jean, the society chairman. It's our honor. All three replied with full of energy. Please, 
Introduce yourselves. From the left Miss So Jean Hui first. Ah, uh, yes. Yep. M, my name is So Jean Hui, and I worked for T, two years as a gopher in the planning department of Dawn Electronics. So Jean Hui was a cutish young woman with freckles on her cheeks. Her replies sounded quite strained as she was tightly wound up with lots of nerves. However, SAE Jean tilted his head in slight confusion. The golden aura coming off her was the strongest of the three here, so why did she spend two years as a gopher? My name is Joe Hansung, and I also hail from Dawn Electronics, this time as a deputy in the marketing department. Next up, was a guy with a sturdy physique, Joe Hansung. This time too, things were just as puzzling. He seemed to possess good abilities, and he was certainly not a young rookie anymore, so why only a deputy? SAE Jean and his lack of knowledge base still knew that a deputy in a department was not a high position. My name is Yudong. I used to work as a general manager in the financial department of the Dawn Trading Company but was waiting for the right time to do that voluntary resignation thing. Haha <laughs> but I ended up receiving another opportunity like this. I'm truly grateful. Thank you. TL, voluntary resignation resigning before the official retirement age. The middle-aged man with an unusual name smiled honestly while scratching the back of his neck. Now that he heard their introductions, a weird feeling was taking root in SAE Jean's heart. Within the ranks of the Dawn Corporation, there were plenty of appealing people possessing good abilities, wonderful education, as well as lots of achievements. However, he now heard that these three people with good personalities had to either waste away as a low-level employee or await for retirement. Was it because their colleagues were wary of them? Or did they get exploited by their superiors or colleagues who belittled them for their good hearts? Well, thank you for your introductions. From now on, all three of you will start working as the chiefs of your respective departments. Whatever their life stories were like until now, SAE Jean had no plans to treat these people who were overflowing with abilities and potential badly at all. Uh. At SAE Jean's sudden declaration, the faces of the three rapidly underwent changes. Their eyes widened, and their jaws hit the floor. The faces of utter shock they had never in million years dreamed of starting their new jobs from such a high position as a chief of a department, just like that. Especially for the society, the monster, that was busy distinguishing itself in the various spotlights of the social media, news articles, etc., etc. No need to be that surprised, you know. There are only three employees, and only three departments, so it's natural that you guys become the department heads. While speaking like this, SAE Jean picked up a thick pile of documents resting on the floor and placed the stack on the desk with a big thud. Not just once, either thud, thud, thud a total of four stacks. The shock from the sudden promotion to the position of department chiefs lasted for only a brief moment. The new employees gulped big time at the fearsome amount of work making its entrance. This stack here is for the Athony doll this here is for all the partnership requests from various wizard towers and this here is for, uh, the society members' application forms. Ah, uh, don't worry about this stack, we can just burn them all. Fortunately, from all the potential misery, one of the huge pile of documents sank back beneath the desk. The final one should be details of financial transactions regarding the potions and armaments crafted by the society's members. Well, then. Please take these stacks accordingly to your specialties and do your best. Kim Sae Jean clapped his hands loudly. As soon as he did that, the temp employees he borrowed from the Orcs Forge entered the office of the chairman. They will show you to your individual offices. Oh, and when you're done well, please compile reports containing summaries of this and that, and I'd appreciate it if they are short and easy to read. Also, if you need more helping hands, please use your discretion and bring some others in. I'll take a look and if they are capable, then I'll insert them in right away. You know, like parachutes. TL, hmm. The term parachutes isn't literal parachuting off the plane or anything, but more like hiring a person and placing them in important positions based solely on the whims of the guys doing the hiring in most cases. You could accuse them of nepotism, as that's the most prevalent example of parachuting. When Kim Sae Jean smiled brightly at the three, the new employees could only nod their heads in a daze. Another week went by after that. 
and the owners of the third Athony doll was finally decided upon. The conditions given by the dawn was the best, and the prestige of the raven was the highest, but in all honesty, having those two dominate all the time was just a bit uncool, so S.A.E. Jean chose the Daybeak Knight's order instead. Actually, the government also requested him to do so as well. The reasons were, the vice order master, Oh Yung Hyuk and his son Oh Dae Su pleading with him so ardently, and their offer was only slightly worse than that from the Dawn Order. When this decision was made public, the real time search results became full of nothing but the stories of the monster, Daebeek Knight's Order, as well as the Doll of Athony. The rumor floating around in the grapevine was that, on the day of the announcement, all the knights and hunters affiliated with the Daybeak Order gathered together in celebration and enjoyed a victorious feast or some such. Additionally, the plan was for the Athony doll to be escorted by platoons of knights and an official state vehicle sent by the Daybeak Order to its headquarters two days later. Just when will it hatch, though? However currently, the man responsible for making all that ruckus on the internet was feeling very impatient at a single egg. He heard that griffins hatched quickly to ensure their survival, but it had already been over a week since he brought the egg home. Worrying that either the chick had died inside the egg, or maybe it could be an unfertilized egg instead, the deeply worried Kim S.A.E. Jean in his goblin form busy roamed around his home without taking a break. SFX for an egg vibrating. Right then an imperceptible tremor occurred from the egg sitting inside the incubator. Immediately, S.A.E. Jean ran over to the machine and knelt before it. Suddenly, a new worry came crashing down on him. Just which form should he use to greet this little guy, the orc, the human, or the goblin? Unfortunately, there wasn't much time for indecisions. The egg that was only trembling softly just now, suddenly shot up and started bouncing around madly. A woo. In the end, S.A.E. Jean assumed the human form and approached the egg. Right on cue, the egg split apart and a small, cute life form emerged into the world with weak cries of Payak, Payak. S.A.E. Jean forgot what he wanted to say in that moment. Didn't matter whether it was a human or an animal, the newborns were the cutest. This little creature who hadn't even opened its eyes yet was seriously just so dang lovable. Payak, 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 Peak, P-P-A-K-K. However, the reality was, no matter how cute the thing looked, it still was an offspring of a monster. From its tiny beak, a thunderous roar exploded out in a hurry. Only then, S.A.E. Jean could recover his sense from the dazed state caused by its cute exterior and he began actively using the skill predator, dot. He began stroking the head of the baby griffin while sending his own thoughts of absolute obedience and submission towards the creature, such as, I am your owner. Pai Payak, Payak. Soon, the thundering roars quietened down until it was no more louder than some vigorous breathing. This was the scene where, for the first time ever in written history, a human being had succeeded in taming a monster, and a griffin turning into a sort of a pet. So cute. S.A.E. Jean murmured in daze as he continued to stroke its head. Its smooth fur and the tender skin felt so wonderfully soft. The baby griffin hadn't fully opened its eyes yet but it still turned its head towards the hand that was touching it and began poking its tongue out. And then began licking his hand. S.A.E. Jean gazed down on the creature with a fatherly smile. Ah. However, there was still one more thing he had to do. The owner of the griffin wasn't just S.A.E. Jean in the human form. He changed into the orc and then the goblin form, one at a time, to make sure the griffin would recognize them. Thankfully, the baby griffin was ignorant of the ways of this world and was able to accept everything without a fuss. Hmm. And some time passed by like that. S.A.E. Jean changed back to his human form and activated the eyes of the wolf. He was kind of curious about this creature's potential. Ah that's too bad. Unfortunately, the aura coming out of the griffin was as unremarkable as one could possibly get. But, it's still fine. It didn't really matter, though. When it grows up all healthy, then he'd make it into the strongest griffin in the world with a few well-placed magic tattoos. The time flowed by like the running water and the eventual arrival of the spring's winds warmly embraced the naked trees, finally awaking them into the beginning of a new cycle of life. During this time period, many issues regarding Kim S.A.E. Jean and his society, the monster, rose and fell. First of all, the orc blacksmith revealed two new weapons. 
one of them was rated fifth rank branded goods which ended up causing a sizable shock. The branded goods ranking was divided into five sub-categories, and the closer an item got towards the first rank, the better its quality was. However, there had been an equally big backlash during the process of unveiling this weapon as well. The reason was that, the orc ended up selling that branded goods to a foreigner. The person who purchased the orc's weapon was a knight affiliated with the knight's order ranked one of the top five in North America, Veritas Order's vice master, Angela. The deal was successful only because the vice order master personally visited the orc's forge, and also the fact that her serious and dignified request was spoken in Korean. However, the Korean knight's orders and the mass media tore into these facts like a pack of feral, crazy bitches. Slanderous rumors spread around uncontrollably like wildfire one saying that, since Angela was one of the most beautiful women on the planet, she either seduced the orc blacksmith or even sold her body for the favor. Another said that, since the orc sold the branded goods rated weapon overseas, he was a traitor to the nation, etc., etc. This forced SAE Jean to issue a statement on SNS. Originally, he thought of holding a press conference, but then, officially at least, he was not the orc blacksmith so, he thought it was not appropriate which made him choose SNS instead. When a Korean knight rises up to a certain rank, he or she begins to think that it's embarrassing to be publicly seen while visiting a blacksmith. Unfortunately for them, blacksmiths also have their own honor as well. And that's why the orc blacksmith had chosen Miss Angela who had treated him with respect. His post was spread among his 400,000 strong followers and soon, USA Young and Kim Yurin both shared it as well and with the aid of the dawn, the public's opinion on the matter had reversed almost overnight. And Angela became his SNS follower too, by the way. The arrows of blame and criticism were then pointed firmly on the knight's orders and the media outlets biased towards the said orders. With some saying that by dismissing blacksmiths in that typically complacent attitude, Republic of Korea was failing to read the ever-changing flow of the world. However all this war of words got buried real fast by the emergence of a new, hot topic. And that was the news of the Dawn Knights Order affiliated upper mid-tier knight, Ju Ji-hyuk becoming the newest member of the society, the monster. SAE Jean's society had grown to the point where every little rumor concerning admittance and dismissal of its members would cause a stir so. Only a day after he submitted the official documents to the relevant government entity, countless numbers of articles exploded out into the open. Right away, reporters swarmed Ji Hyuk with requests for interviews and film shoots as for the man himself, although he was quite flustered by this development, he still managed to reply as normally as possible. Dot. The chairman Kim Sae Jin admires every one of the society's members, and I am deeply grateful to be able to join them. On top of that, simply by becoming the member of the monster. Ju Ji Hyuk was now chosen as one of the 30 most promising knights to watch this year, by the foremost authority on all things knight related, the weekly publication called Knight of Night. TL, that's the name. The author wrote that in English, even. However, the chairman responsible for causing all this attention and ruckus was currently stuck inside a certain cave in the monster field. Can you fly now? The orc form Kim Sae Jean was busy sending thought orders to the griffin while sitting atop the saddle mounted on the creature's back. Kiruk. The griffin, with its body quite big now, tilted its head while its tongue hung loose. The amazing rate of growth was a specific trait of monsters. Only three weeks after its birth, the griffin had grown up into a level comparable to an adolescent. I said, can you fly now? Sae Jean had named his griffin, Muffin. He took Riffin off Griffin and then somehow turned that into Muffin. When Muffin didn't seem to understand what he was saying, Sae Jean sent out another thought message, dot. But, as if Muffin misunderstood his intentions, it craned its head towards him and began licking his face instead. Krong, Kurarung. In the end, Sae Jean became cross, and only then, Muffin understood his intentions. SFX for wind rustling through feathers. When the wind slipped in between the feathers of a giant pair of flapping hawk-like wings, Muffin began rising up to the sky while carrying Sae Jean on its back. Since it hadn't matured fully into an adult yet, and with the orc's considerable weight added on top, they could only try out a low-altitude flight that just barely cleared the tops of the trees. 
but the feeling SAE Jean was experiencing at that moment was indescribably amazing. Until he heard the alarmed cries of unknown people from below. EU, EU Arc. It's a griffin. The low altitude flight got spotted really fast, and the hunters and knights plying their trade here in the lowest tier hunting ground didn't even stay to confirm who was riding on top of the griffin before hastily running away. Since this was going to become a nuisance, SAE Jean had to land back on Earth after spending only a few short minutes flying. How regretful. Serp. He licked his lips as he secured Muffin against the resting area he had created inside the cave. I want to take you home. Changing back to his human form, SAE Jean sighed and brushed the head of the griffin. He found his muffin so lovable, what with its eyes arced in a half moon from absolutely enjoying his attention. He slowly got up from his seat while deeply agonizing whether he should hold a press conference and then just announce to the world that he had succeeded in taming a monster. I'll be back by the nightfall. Wait for me here. SAE Jean waved his hands as he left the cave. And shortly thereafter, Left all alone, Muffin slapped the toy SAE Jean left for it away with its two forearms and then, yawned out as if it was bored silly. As if the smile it showed to SAE Jean just now was all forced, its current appearance was cold and aloof. Chapter, 58 Also, 100 internet points for those who got the reference first. 4th of April, the time when the skies would slowly become clearer. With her training ending sooner than expected, USA Young was left with nothing much to do, so she decided to head to the HQ of the monster located in the Kanwan province. It was to check out how things were progressing in the society, as well as to share a conversation with the chairman, Kim Sae Jean. The HQ building looks really nice. However, there was a fly that had just landed in her ointment. An upper mid-tier knight, Ju Ji Hyuk. His eyes went round as he studied the building of his own society. It was a bit hard to believe such a stylish and elaborately constructed structure was reserved for the exclusive usage of a single C-class society. Yes, well. It's quite obvious, isn't it? The Dawn Corporation had built it, after all. So, of course it's nice. USAE Young answered disinterestedly and entered the building while making that characteristic noise from a pair of high heels. Ju Ji Hyuk carefully followed in right behind her. Welcome. As soon as they entered the reception, an unbelievably beautiful woman greeted them. The ground floor counter was manned by a female elf. USAE Young's brows narrowed almost immediately the moment she spotted the elf, and while carrying a strange expression, she approached the receptionist. Are you an employee here? Yes. I was working as a manager in the Orcs Forge before being promoted to this position. Even when facing USAE Young's wary voice, the elf replied in a very polite manner. Hmm. Well, okay. That's that, but where is SAE Jean Opera right now? The society chairman came in the early hours of this morning but he has returned home now. Ah. USAE Young lightly bit her lower lip. She was feeling irritated for some reason. If SAE Jean just replied to her messages, then she'd not have wasted time coming over here like this. Just what the heck could he be doing during these three hours? Got it. USAE Young replied tersely and turned on her heels to walk out of the building, but then. Oh, that's too bad. Ah, uh, by the way, can you tell me where the training facility is? Ju Ji Hyuk started asking about a training facility she didn't even know about. With a dumbstruck expression, USA Young glanced at him. A training facility? Now why would A? It's on the first basement level. Elf receptionist. Excuse me. It's really here. I mean, but why is it here? USAE Young. Pardon. I am not aware of the reasons, but the chairman commissioned two to be built. One is on the basement, while the other on the top floor. The top floor facility is reserved only for the chairman's private use, but it's not completed yet. Elf receptionist. USAE Young got surprised at the elf's words, and began glaring at Ju Ji Hyuk instead. Her gaze seemed to contain several complex meanings, including one that said, How the heck did you know something that I don't even know until now? Ah, uh, that, well. The chairman gave me a call not too long ago. He said that a prototype Athony doll version 2. 
Zero is installed there so I should come and test it out when I find some free time. Ju Ji Hyuk scratched the back of his neck and slowly advanced towards the elevator's entrance. And USA Young just dazedly stared at his back. While USA Jun Ji was feeling let down by Kim Sae Jin, the man himself had completed his quota of hunting for the day and was returning to the rest stop of the monster field in a relaxed fashion. There have been simultaneous and frequent occurrences of monster outbreaks around the world. Currently, many cities in the United States of America, Japan and China are beset with these outbreaks, but not only that, the world is shivering in fear at the revelation that the causes of these outbreaks are not the fishers. As soon as he arrived in the rest stop, the first thing to enter his ears was the news broadcast from the TV installed to the side. The resting knights and hunters were paying careful attention to the unusual nature of the news while discussing it among themselves, but S.A.E. Jean didn't have the time to do that. He only had five hours as a human every day. And that sure was way too short to live like a human, too. On top of that, he had to go to the bank today as well. So, he quickened his pace. Thank you for your patronage. Sitting inside the VIP room of Gangwondo Bank, Kim Sae Jin checked the latest balance printed on his bank book while being treated with utmost courtesy by the branch manager. And boy, were they enormous or what? The American Knight Angela paid close to 18 million US for the weapon so that was understandable, but he sure didn't expect her to send another 18 million again. Perhaps, if you haven't given a concrete thought on managing your personal wealth, may we recommend skilled asset management specialists. The bank's branch manager carefully made his suggestion, while busy rubbing his hands like a house fly. However, the color visible in his eyes were badly leaning on the wrong side, so S.A.E. Jean coldly shook his head. No, thank you. I shall take care of. Kwong. It was then, out of nowhere, a powerful blast could be heard from the outside. Then, it was followed by an eerie tremor right after. At these ominous events, both S.A.E. Jean and the branch manager froze on the spot. What was the? Iyuyut? Kwahang. An explosion even louder than the one before could be heard this time. Sensing something had gone very wrong, S.A.E. Jean quickly pressed onto the window and tried to gauge the situation outside. What the hell is that? And that's how he started muttering in a total daze without realizing it. Maybe, the news he half listened to while exiting the rest stop must have been the sign. SFX for loud screeching noises of monsters. The downtown of Kongwan had turned into a scene from hell. It even felt like deja vu of the sole monster outbreak. Gigantic wyverns hung in the blue sky like gathering dark clouds, and gargoyles were firing off evil magic spells towards the ground while being backed by those wyverns. Not only that, there were countless monsters lining up the pavement. Not just wolves, goblins and other low-tiered monsters, but even liches, ogres and also, a dang manticore. It was enough to make him wonder whether this was a monster field or the middle of a city. Hey, man. You need to. S.A.E. Jean was going to ask the branch manager about how he'd deal with this suddenly unfolding emergency situation, but the mother of King manager had already ran out of the VIP room like a released arrow. As expected, a person's body would never lie. Sighing out deeply, S.A.E. Jean was about to break the windows and make his getaway from here. Kayak. Wa, what's going on here? Eu ah ah ah. Run. Run away. But before he could do that, screams of people coming from downstairs weighed heavily on his mind. He could confirm with his nose that the closest monster just happened to be orcs and a manticore. He could somehow deal with orcs, fine, but in human form, Kim Sae Jean had no hope in hell against a manticore. SFX for window glass breaking up. Sae Jean gave up. He slammed his fist against the glass and it shattered so easily. And he was about to jump downstairs and escape, when. SFX for a young child crying. His body froze after hearing the belated cries of a child from below. He gritted his teeth and quickly took a look around the VIP room. The eyes of the wolf could also spot hidden things just like how he could spot people's auras. Thankfully, he didn't see any CCTV cameras installed within this VIP room. Ha! He spat out a sigh. When he concentrated his olfactory senses, 
he could sense many signs of knights hurriedly mobilizing with haste since this was the downtown area, but all of them were quite a distance away from where he was. And I'm not even a superhero from a 60s comic book. One more intake of a deep breath. And then, inside the VIP room, instead of Kim S.A.E. Jean, an orc was standing there. Cruer. The orc took a step back, before roughly pouncing on his feet and dashed towards the window. SFX for concrete wall breaking apart. Not just the windows but the section of the bank's wall crumbled down and within this gap, a giant orc fell down like a falling meteor. Kwong. A powerful shock wave spread out as it made landfall. At that moment, citizens running away from the monsters, as well as the monsters busy chasing said citizens, froze on the spot and stared at the orc that fell from the sky. With its entire body covered in blue scales and an ominous aura oozing out from its eyes, the orc swapped the ends of his gaze between humans and monsters, before smashing its mace towards the nearby monster. The moment unidentified monsters descended on the city, the bank's deputy branch manager came up with an ingenious idea on the spot and activated the security systems of the building. And thanks to that, customers inside the bank were temporarily safe. Kwong, Kwong, Kwong. But as the word suggested, it was just a temporary respite. The manor reinforced metal security sheets blocking the exits were cracking under the strain of constant barrage from the monsters. There could only be two outcomes if things continued this way. The metal sheets would break before the knights arrive, or the whole building might collapse from the monsters' attacks instead. Foo. The deputy manager sighed. There were too many people to protect here. However. SFX for metal ripping open. From one particularly strong impact, the gaps between the metal sheets widened as if they might break apart at any moment. There really was no time left anymore. He had to decide now. The deputy manager clenched his fists tightly and shouted out. Everyone, stand up and head for the bank's vault. The one place in the bank that best protected money was its vault, and it also could just as well protect people, too. But that idea came about one step too late. Before anyone could act. Kwong. The manor reinforced metal sheets gave in first. SFX for a monster's footsteps. The serene footsteps of the monster that contrasted with the chaos of outside, rebounded within the walls of the bank and it was enough to give despair to all the people present here. The face that resembled that of a person, a body of a lion and a pair of bat-like wings on the back, a hideous chimera-type monster. An upper mid-tier monster infamous for its wickedness and also its physical might, the manticore. The creature entered the bank with what looked like a smile on its face, and then leisurely scanned the crowd of terrified humans. And then, it trudged towards a woman holding a child in her arms first. Even as the manticore approached her, the mother never let her child go as the flood of fearful tears fell out of her eyes. Kohahi. However, Manticore seemed to enjoy her appearance, instead. It licked its lips and broke out in a laughter. The sound coming from the crooked lips on that human-like face also sounded pretty close to that of a person. You ha ha ha. Manticore didn't wait any further. The monster continued to laugh out in that evil and vile manner, as the tentacle acting as its tail began dividing into tens and then to hundreds of strands. It was preparing a cruel and vicious attack that would turn every single one inside this bank into meat paste in an instant. And as people closed their eyes in fear of the horrible deaths to come, a roar filled with fighting spirit that could not be described in words rang out to everywhere. SFX for loud, powerful footsteps. And right after that, accompanied by the violent sounding footsteps, a giant silhouette rushed towards the manticore and swung its weapon. Qek. The weapon smashed into the face of the manticore as it folded the air and the manticore was launched into the deeper parts of the bank like a kicked empty can of soda. The person, no the life form, that blew away the manticore with a single shot was. An orc. And it was an orc with its body covered in blue scales. It was a creature famous enough for some people here to recognize it, also known as the demon orc. Silence fell on the bank at this sudden entrance of an unlikely ally. Of course, that silence didn't last for long. Monsters poured in from the bank's now broken doors. And the orc firmly stood there like the guardian and began destroying everything that came his way. 
Whenever it swung its mace, the limbs of monsters got easily torn off like pieces of fabric, and the torn bits flew around in the air. Blood spurted out like fountains and coated the interior of the bank, leaving behind a strange and sticky mess. No matter what, it was a gut-wrenching sight. But, for the citizens staring at the back of this orc, they sensed this inexplicable feeling of trust. Kuihi. Hyuhu. SHT. It didn't die. As the orc was fighting, the laughter of the manticore came out from a distance. S.A.E. Jean bit his lips at this troubling turn of events. He tried to kill it with a single shot so he even activated the warrior of reversal and the fear strike, but Manticore did live up to its infamy. SFX for heavy footsteps. He could hear the sounds of a lion running behind his back. However, the front of him was also packed with monsters so how could he pay attention to his back? He then decided to leave everything to Leviathan Scales. Quajik. But contrary to his hopes, the fangs of the manticore easily penetrated the leviathan scales. At the scalding pain bursting out from his shoulder, S.A.E. Jean had to scream out in anguish. And that pain soon morphed into anger. He roared out powerfully, before grabbing the manticore's tail and threw it against the wall, hard. But that meant he could not deal with the monsters in his front. This time, it was the turn of a spartoi. True to its fame as the undead skeletal warrior formed from the bones of a dragon, its might was considerable. SFX for a blade cutting against skin. The cold bone sword swung by the undead monster left a deep wound on the orc's side. I gotta get out of here. After receiving two critical blows, and with the time limit for the warrior of reversal coming to an end, his consciousness became dizzy. Thankfully, he still had a means of escape in the form of whirlwind dash, so it was now prudent to stop here and leave everything to the knights. Kruror. But before that, he just had to smash that ugly as SHT Spartoi apart or he wouldn't feel better, so he swung the mace hard at the head of the bony monster. SFX for things scattering. The monster's cranium that got struck by the fierce strike containing all of the orc strength exploded into tiny bits and got scattered in the winds. Then, strength abandoned S.A.E. Jean by the bucket loads, making his legs falter. Even though the manticore still lived, this was clearly his limit. However, suddenly, anger rushed in. Orcs detested retreating more than defeat and hated defeat more than death itself. Was it something like the instinct of its race, or the chain of logic for orcs that had to be followed no matter what, from somewhere deep inside him, indeterminable desire for battle and anger whipped around violently? It was just impossible to contain all these emotions and so, S.A.E. Jean let out a powerful roar without even realizing it. The orc then tightly grasped the mace once more. And right in that moment, an unexpected alert window floated up to his view. Simultaneously, the sleepy consciousness sobered up and the excruciating pain from his wound subsided immediately. Condition complete, a desperate battle for survival, the orc's tenacity 22 The monster form of the orc jaguar will change into the orc great warrior. The passive skill, warrior's special quality, skill level F has been acquired. Chapter, 59 He didn't even have the time to check the new skill out. As soon as he evolved into the orc great warrior, the warrior of reversal got activated once more. Right away, his stamina that had hit rock bottom rose up again like the rising dragon uppercut, and an unbearable strength spread throughout his body. The orc let out a roar that could rip the world apart and then, he powerfully slammed his mace against the empty air. Kwang. The shock wave spreading out from the air formed a crescent moon shape and turned every monster coming in contact into smithereens. As expected, the power on display was on another level compared to that of the orc jaguar. And with that single attack, the monsters inundating his front got completely wiped out. Of course, there was still one creature left here. The orc spat out rough breaths and turned around. The manticore had stepped back and was surveying the situation after the orc's vigor went a sudden reversal as if it was studying the scene, with its tentacle-like tail swaying gently back and forth. Unfortunately for the monster, the orc's instincts would not allow for such an easygoing attitude. The orc rushed towards the manticore as his feet crushed the tiles of the bank's floor underfoot. The incredible turn of speed displayed by the creature did not match up with its huge, muscular body. 
There was simply no time for the manticore to take an evasive action it could only stare at the approaching mace wielded by the orc helplessly. Slam! That was the final, final strike. An attack with every ounce of power squeezed out of the orc separated the head of the manticore from its body cleanly. Splash! And after it lost its head, the manticore's sticky blood sprayed on the floor. The only thing remaining afterwards was silence. The overflowing aura of danger oozing from the orc great warrior scared away the lower tiered monsters from getting near it, and thanks to that. The bank could somehow enjoy a lengthy bout of quiet stillness that was obviously contrary to the severe emergency situation on the outside. Unfortunately, though, SAE Jean's own situation wasn't so stable at the moment. DN it, the bleeding won't stop. Breathing with some difficulty, SAE Jean stumbled around for a moment or two while enduring the aftereffects and then began to move his feet. As the dazed eyes of the bank's customers followed him, he trudged out of the bank altogether. Was it because he had used the Warrior of Reversal, twice, as well as abused Fear Strike, quite a lot? His consciousness was getting sleepier by the second and his sights were blurring rapidly. Even still, he searched for a deserted area. If he ended up passing out like this, then everything he had built up until now would be gone. He could never allow that to happen. He desperately walked on and on until he found a partially destroyed building. He quickly hid among the rubble and once more, made sure there were no eyes around him. Fortunately, there were none but even if there were, his time had run out anyway. He then assumed the ebony wolf form for the first time in a long while and activated whirlwind dash. Like a black lightning, the wolf sped along quickly towards the safety of his own house. The way this event unfolded was quite similar to how the monster outbreak that occurred in Seoul half a year ago played out. But there was one crucial difference. The conclusion from the investigation to the cause of this disturbance was that there was not a single trace of a fissure to be found anywhere. There were two ways monsters could end up attacking a city. One was where a fissure opened up near a settlement and the countless monsters contained within poured out like a hailstorm. The other possibility was that some wild monsters aimlessly wandering outside the monster field somehow evaded the patrols and walked into a nearby city. Since there was no fissure, the former option had to be dismissed. But there were just too many monsters in this event to say the latter option was the cause. And so, the government, as well as the UN investigators, could not even begin to grasp the potential reason for this incident. On top of that, another unfortunate thing happened. A truly destructive piece of news was broadcast that caused much consternation among the so-called experts, while at the same time, it caused much fanfare from the general public. This is the footage captured by the CCTV cameras of the demon orc. The orc swings its mace around and kills countless other monsters, and it's as if the creature is trying to protect the people trapped inside the bank. And the following footage is taken from a male student's mobile phone who was also trapped within the same bank. It shows the development of the situation more clearly. The demon orc that made so many knights taste defeat in the monster field, had now become the hero, orc that protected many people from other monsters. Some people even jokingly suggested nonsense like the orc should be awarded with a medal or some such. Ha ha ha. We've already received real-time requests to correct the term we used, the demon orc. We'd like to sincerely apologize. We shall change it to the hero, orc from now on. By the way, by calling it the hero, orc, does it not evoke the feeling of a video game or a legendary tale of the distant past? Indeed, ha ha ha. It does feel that way. But what's really interesting is that, with the arrival of this hero orc, even the way people call the orc blacksmith has gone through a certain change as well. Like, the two orcs that helped the humanity or something like that. Almost all the TV channels were talking about the stories related to the orc. Not only the TV stations, even the internet, the SNS, etc., etc. were also dominated by it. That's so mysterious. Judging from the footage, that orc's beard and the hair was really long so, most likely it has grown past the level of a jaguar now. There must be something really special about that guy gosh, I wanna meet him at least once. Even Hazeline was the same, while sitting by SAE Jean's bedside and leisurely enjoying a tangerine. That orc Kung you differentiate orcs by their hairstyle. I thought that was only for liches. 
S.A.E. Jean's brows tightened from the pain coming from his sides whenever he tried to speak. However, Hazeline didn't even spare him who was suffering in agony a single glance she replied while only paying attention towards the TV on the wall. Of course. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, you've never seen a real orc great warrior before, haven't you? You have no idea how cool they are in reality. Lengthy beards, long hair tied at the back the hair and the beard symbolizes the level of experience and strength for orcs. I didn't know that. By the way are you sure you used a potion that I've made? This the pain doesn't seem to be lessening at all. S.A.E. Jean moaned in pain as he touched his side. Currently, his situation was that, the wounds he suffered during the orc great warrior carried over even to his human form. He couldn't move freely because of the severity of the wounds, resulting him unable to concoct a potion by himself and so, he came up with a hasty excuse and asked Hazeline to send him one, instead. However, he wasn't expecting to see Hazeline herself show up rather than some gopher. Well, of course. You said you got struck by a Spartoi? A wound from the Spartoi's bone sword is difficult to treat, so it can't be helped, you know. So, please endure for now. Nayam. Hazeline continuously ate tangerine pieces one at a time even while speaking her words. Choo choo. Those cute and smooth lips bobbed up and down rather adorably. I think it's fine for you to go now, you know. S.A.E. Jean muttered in disbelief after watching her act like this. It had been almost thirty minutes since she showed up. And so far, she had already consumed more than twenty tangerines without a break. He was really grateful for her bringing the potion, but he didn't have a lot of time left. And his tangerine stock was running out, too. Mm -hmm. No, it's all right. Not sure why, but being here puts my mind at ease Nayam. Nayam. Nayam Nayam. He was about to say something, but S.A.E. Jean stopped for a moment or two. Maybe because she was an elf, although she was simply eating tangerine, the whole scene looked like it was straight out of some famous painting or some such. Nayam Nam. T.L., in case if you're wondering what this is, it's a literal T.L. of Korean onomatopoeia, the overly cutish sound made by girls and children when eating something delicious. Besides the weird noise leaking out of her mouth, that was. Please, just get going already, would you? It's getting late, you know. Another five minutes went by while he observed her obsession with the fruit called tangerine. So, S.A.E. Jean pleaded with her again. No, it's fine. I don't have much to do today anyways. Because of all the chaos, looks like the alchemy house will go on a break too while I'm here, my mind really feels so comfortable. At her relaxed reply, S.A.E. Jean's brows twitched automatically. How come she was acting so dense right now? If you feel that uncomfortable, I will get going in around 30 minutes. S.A.E. Jean quickly confirmed the remaining time for himself. There was just over 2 hours and 23 minutes. Since there was some wiggle room here, he relaxed a bit and gently lied down on the bed. And exactly 30 minutes later, Hazeline did leave while saying, Get well soon, okay? As the experts had feared, this incident with the monsters was not a one-off thing. From all corners of the country, small to mid-scale attacks involving monsters broke out dozens of times a day. In the end, the Korean government declared a temporary state of emergency throughout the entire country and at the same time, ordered all the knights' orders to be in state of readiness. However the focus of the public was directed elsewhere, regardless of whether there was a state of emergency declared or not. And that was the topic of the so-called good monsters. The public was going crazy with excitement at the demon orc that had appeared during the chaos, rescued people and then abruptly disappeared from the scene. It was the same story around the world as well. SNS and community chat rooms were focused only on delivering any new news stories related to this hero orc. And serious discussions regarding the topics of if monsters could be tamed, or monsters that can possibly communicate with people, with the demon hero orc as the main subject took place among the academic circles. What the hell are these? However, despite these hot reactions, the man responsible was just feeling dumbfounded at the moment. He bitterly chuckled as he read the news articles and comments sections full of people praising the orc. Knock, knock. Someone knocked on his door. S.A.E. Jean put his mobile phone down and said, 
come in. Zhou Hansung walked in with an armful of documents in tow. What is it? These are purchase request forms for the Athony Doll version 2. Zero. As a result of expanding the scope of operations worldwide as ordered by you, the chairman, we've received requests from hundreds of knights' orders located throughout the globe. Even if we schedule meetings right away, at least a month is an E. Ah, that. Please, you should take care of that matter, Mr. Hansung. You are the chief of the marketing department, after all. Huh. Zhou Hansung initially thought he heard wrong. Nowadays, as a simple merchandise, one Athony doll would go for several tens of millions of dollars. But when taking into consideration whether a knight's order owned an Athony doll or not affected the prestige of the said order, then the real value of that doll was truly astronomical. Seriously, even the Korean government's foreign relations office ended up sending a half a favor, half threatening request, asking for an Athony doll to be sold to them in order to use it as a tool for diplomacy between nations. An Athony diplomacy, as they had put it. So, just why would the chairman give such an important business matter to a mere former deputy of a marketing department like himself? Oh, by the way, Mr. Hansung. Please take a seat over there. Pardon? Quickly. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Zhou Hansung was still in a somewhat dazed state, but he somehow walked towards the front of SAE Jean and sat down on his opposite side. The pleasant scent coming off S.A.E. Jean helped in relaxing his mind a little. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the highest academic degree you've earned is a doctorate in the monster anthropology, yes? Yes. I also earned a bachelor's in economics as well. Mm. That's good. And that is why. S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck and hesitated a little. His expression was whether he should openly discuss this matter or not. Well, here's the thing. In your opinion, how would the public, the media, and the government react when, hypothetically speaking, it's announced that a monster has been tamed? Zhou Hansung tilted his head in confusion. Since what he heard was so outrageous, he thought it must have been a joke. However, S.A.E. Jean's face showed he was dead serious. S. So, you're saying you can actually communicate with monsters, is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. It's something like that. You can think of it as one of my skills. S.A.E. Jean spoke up to hear and entered the elevator, which prompted Zhou Hansung to hurriedly follow him while still carrying a confused expression. But just how did you tame a griffin? It's famous as an unruly and vicious creature, after all. I found an egg by accident, so I began brainwashing it since it hatched. With my skill, I can use a bit of power of coercion as well, you see. Ting. The elevator soon arrived on the rooftop. The layout of the roof on the society's HQ was peculiar. There was no roof so the sky was visible, but all the sides were blocked by opaque glasses that made it impossible to look inwardly from the outside. It was the result of the construction work that started a week ago, but to think, it was all for a griffin. Zhou Hansung ended up gulping down his saliva. It's over there. It's living in that cave-like structure. S.A.E. Jean spoke as he pointed towards the section of the roof that was shaped into a deep and dark artificial cave seeing that, a sigh involuntarily escaped his lips, just remembering how troublesome it was to move that creature over here. In all honesty, I was planning to keep it a secret for a while longer. But coincidentally, the topic of taming monsters is doing the rounds thanks to the incident with that orc. Since the timing seemed right, and also, if I don't take this chance, it somehow feels like there will never be another one in the future. S.A.E. Jean stopped talking here and whistled. Then, there was a strange vibration coming out from the cave. You herk. Zhou Hansung hastily took a step back. Completely disregarding that, the vibration coming from the cave intensified until, finally. Kikiek. A single griffin revealed its beautiful appearance. The beautiful and tidy white fur on its head imparting the impression of a nobility and the sturdy, powerfully built body of a lion without a doubt, that mysterious being was a griffin, a creature rarely spotted even in the wilderness. Zhou Hansung's brain stopped working then. It's pretty docile, actually. Its name is Muffin. I took the last two syllables off griffin, but riffin sounded a bit lacking, so. 
Kim Sae Jin left behind Jo Han Sung whose entire thought process had grinded to a halt, and approached Muffin. While gently patting its head, he began sending more thought orders to the creature. Humans are your friends. Jo Han Sung is a human. So, Jo Han Sung is your friend. Would you like to touch it? Sae Jin secured the safety measures just in case, and then called for Jo Han Sung. In that moment, Han Sung felt goosebumps exploding on his skin out of sheer shock. But then, the dedication of a scholar he had to bury deep in his heart reacted first. That something within him, that instinct he had to abandon in order to get a job and to survive in this world, made his legs move. Before he realized it himself, Han Sung had walked to the place right in front of the griffin and was carefully reaching his hand out. Muffin didn't even show a hint of hostility at all. It just had its eyes closed, quietly accepting the arrival of a new person. Pat, pat. And that's how he succeeded in brushing the head of a griffin. It was unbelievably soft. How is it? It's amazing, right? Yes. It, it truly is. Kim Sae Jean smiled in satisfaction. He was actually looking for someone to share the responsibilities of looking after the griffin. And now, the perfect person for the job was right here. T that's it. Nice and easy. In the eyes of Joe Hansung who was busy stroking the griffin, flames of strong desire lit up. Mr. Joe Hansung. Since it has come to this, how about taking on the role of the chief of the monster research department as well? I will double your monthly salary. If you want, I am prepared to offer you more. Sae Jean's smile resembled that of a devil's. But to Joe Hansung's point of view, that smile sure looked like that of an angel's. After Sae Jean had left. Joe Hansung, with his chest full of determination to take care of muffins. Ha! Huh. Where did it go? Mm -hmm. What is it, muffin? When Hansung called out, muffin revealed itself again. This time, though, there was a ball between its beaks. You want to play? Hansung smiled and reached out for the ball. However, Muffin chucked the ball to a corner, and then. Kayek. Yuark. Muffin stretched its wings wide open and began threatening Jo Hansung. Its appearance had gone a complete 180 from when Sae Jean was here. But, but, why? Muffin continued to point at the ball with one of her front limbs and threatened him. He understood just a bit what she wanted from him, so he hurriedly ran over to the ball and brought it back to her. TL, yep, Muffin is a female. Here. KHRNG. As she was satisfied by that, Muffin bestowed the privilege of stroking her head one more time to Hansung while carrying a purely evil grin. R, right. There, there. Unfortunately for him, that was not the end. She then picked the ball up again, and this time, she threw it a little bit further outside the roof altogether. The ball drew a gentle arc as it flew outside the roof of the society's HQ, and landed somewhere on the grasslands near the building. And as Joe Hansung stood there in daze with his mouth agape at this needlessly cruel act, Muffin slowly approached him and then. Kikiek. She expanded her wings again and loudly spat out a cry that said hurry up. Chapter, 60. Also, 100 internet points for those who got the reference first. Things progressed quickly. First, with the aid of the dawn, SAE Jean could safely negotiate complicated consultations and interview procedures with the Korean government as well as other related organizations. Of course, the person who had attended all these meetings was not Kim SAE Jean, but Jo Han Sung instead. However, some information got leaked to the press in the midst of all that and landed on the front pages of many newspapers. That prompted Sae Jean to hold an official press conference and later on, submit images of Muffin performing a test flight to the press. As expected, the voices of opposition were numerous. The organizations related to monsters approached him with crazed fervor, while several hardline knights showed up with their weapons drawn, saying they came to kill the monster. But then, only a week later, most of the opposing media outlets got suppressed ruthlessly and smoothly when Sae Jean uploaded a footage to his SNS profile. In that footage, one could see Muffin with her eyes arching gently, smiling in a lovable manner. 
The cute sound of giggling captured within the short clip proved to be a nice bonus, too. One could also see Joe Hansung having a somewhat bitter face while looking at Muffin during the filming of this footage but to SAE Jean, his griffin was just the most adorable pet ever. At that perfectly tamed appearance, the academic circles hotly debating the pros and cons of this whole thing became utterly stunned. Well, they believed that this master-slave relationship was a temporary one enabled by the promise of food, after all. But from that footage, it seemed like the creature had been truly tamed by the owner and was loving the presence of humans. And so, most of the media shifted towards the yes side. In the middle of this, though, a strange opinion suddenly popped out of nowhere. And it was enough to send us A.E. Jean into a bit of panic mode. Dot. The original instigator of that opinion was unexpectedly some entertainment TV show. So, are you saying that he can potentially speak to the hero orc as well? It was basically a talk show for knights to come on air and share their stories. USAE Young was the guest this time, and the MC naturally asked her about Kim SAE Jean. Eh. Well. Probably. But I dunno what is what exactly. I'm just a gopher, you know. Yep, that's exactly it, I am a gopher. I never know what is going on. And he never tells me anything anyway. But, that's because I'm just a gopher, you see. She was upset by the fact that S.A.E. Jean had not told her a single thing about what was going on with the society. And so, whenever the topic of him came around, she always spoke in a very unhappy manner. Ah, so that's how it was. And that topic came to an end with only three paragraphs uttered, but the aftermath of that show was puzzlingly fierce. Firstly, the sight of USAE Young referring to herself as a gopher in the self-mocking tone must have left a deep impression. As gifts of that moment spread throughout the internet and naturally, the contents of that interview received much interest as well. Since it had not killed anyone but actually rescued people, wouldn't it be possible to talk to the hero orc? An actual professor from the Hankook University came to speak to SAE Jean about this very topic, even. Of course, as the person who knew the truth, S.A.E. Jean was rather frustrated by the Absu. Rudity of it all. By the way, even I am curious if it's possible or not. Kim Yurin carefully asked S.A.E. Jean while taking a quick glance at his reactions. Currently, albeit belated, these two people were making good on the promise they made over three weeks ago. Even Miss Yurin, too. Ha, ha. I'm sorry. As expected, it's nonsense, right? Ha ha ha, even I ended up saying some unnecessary things. Strangely, though, he found her state during dinner quite odd, to say the least. Every time she spoke, and whenever she moved, her eyes were always carefully observing changes in S.A.E. Jean's moods. It was so very different to how upfront and proud she was back then. Well. It's not a total nonsense, I guess. If we get to converse properly, then that orc might truly help us. Aha, uh -huh, is that right? Ouch. Maybe it was because she was so tense, Yurin ended up biting her tongue. Um, are you alright? Ah, uh, yes. A-I-A-E-M fine A. Just. Please excuse me. I should, to the ladies. In the end, she hastily got up from her seat as if she was running away and headed for the bathroom. Just what is the matter with me? Standing in front of the wash basin and the mirror, Yurin deeply sighed out. Even though she came here alone after having a showdown with Chai Young Ho. But right now, she felt like crying at the moment. The burdensome words Chai Young Ho told her, stuff like he's an important person, that man is the key to everything, the monster will someday follow on Trilogy's footsteps. Continued to plague her mind. And to make matters worse, there was the unbelievable news of him taming a monster or some such, which resulted in her getting more nervous and that made it harder for her words to roll out of her mouth, too. Ah. I just want to get out of here. For Kim Yurin, experiencing this sort of feeling was a first in all 27 years of her life. She had always been up front with nothing to hide. Foo. But she also did not know the meaning of giving up. She washed her face with cold water once more, and left the bathroom while clenching her teeth tightly. Inside the Dawn Knights Order's Team 1 conference room. 
Following the government's command for all knights' orders to remain ready, there had to be a certain minimum number of knights always present at all times and that was why. Even though it was already late at night, there were a few personnel currently present within this conference room. Full. But what instead filled the room up to the brim were heavy atmosphere and thick silence. The knights inside this room were all keeping quiet while busy observing the souring mood of one person among their ranks. Ha! USA Young was continuously sighing out while carrying a deeply frowning expression. Although it was somewhat bizarre to see all seven knights here to remain mindful of someone only ranked low mid tier, she wasn't just anyone but USA Young. Not only was she the daughter of the Order Master, she was also the founding member of the society, the Monster. Having said that, for some reason she'd been showing the self mocking side of her lately, while busy repeating I'm the lowest form of a gopher ever for the society. Dot. Tang. USA Young suddenly slammed her phone down on the table. Everyone in the room stiffened up simultaneously. Seriously. Is he not planning to call me back? The two tightly clenched fists of USA Young trembled. Obviously, she was cross with Kim Sae Jin. By a lot. Like, seriously a lot. Even if it was in name only, she was still a founding member. But then, she had to hear the stories of her own society, big and small, from other people or even from a news broadcast. Once or twice, fine, she can understand, but on multiple times. Was he deliberately trying to disparage her? Such thoughts of disappointment began to form in her mind. If one was to get technical here, then without a doubt, the Dawn Order and the Corporation helped S.A.E. Jean out immeasurably, never once putting him in a difficult spot until now. And everything that happened could only be possible because she asked her father and her grandfather. But him keeping her out of the loop like this. That was why, U.S.A.E. Young deliberately cut off all contact with S.A.E. Jean for the last two weeks. Unfortunately for her, the one feeling the frustration was her, all the while he was going from strength to strength. Almost daily, he was uploading photos on SNS of him taking it easy with the members of the society, such as Ju Ji Hyuk and Jo Han Sung. So, in the end, she had sent a really lengthy message to SAE Jean roughly three hours ago. It contained all of her accumulated disappointments, but she also placed emojis here and there to make sure she didn't sound too cold or anything. Seriously, how bloody infuriating. She bit down on her teeth out of frustration and roughly tousled up her hair, before checking the message she sent to S.A.E. Jean on the phone. He still hadn't read it yet. She spat out another long sigh and this time, checked out his SNS profile. There was a new posting. What the heck is this now? Finished my first hunting with the orc short sword. To Chairman Kim S.A.E. Jean, I'd like to thank you for selling this weapon. I am using this weapon gratefully. Please send my regards to Mr. Orc Blacksmith as well. It was from Victoria Angela. She bought a weapon from the Orc Blacksmith before. She posted a picture of her smiling next to a corpse of a monster to SAE Jean's SNS profile. Wah! Seriously? In that moment, her annoyance shot up through the roof. His followers were now numbering over 950k, which means he was snapping on her heels already. No, that was not important, nope. USAE Young threw the phone away and covered her face up. The message containing all her thoughts, no, it'd be better to call it a letter, was being ignored for over three hours straight and she found this unbearably embarrassing, disappointing, and also deeply irritating. Even then. She still took multiple quick glances at the discarded phone. Hoping that he had sent a reply. Ow, this effing. Then, a sense of shame overwhelmed her and her head ended up lying sprawled over the table. It was then. Viewer. The phone vibrated. The agile movement exhibited by her body in that moment couldn't have been any more sharper than normally possible. SFX for ungracefully tumbling around. She moved so fast that she nearly upended both the table and the chair as she grasped the phone. The words showing up on the liquid crystal display was SAE Jean Appa. Dot. Her heart skipped a beat, then. Yu Yu. However, she held herself back desperately. She had to endure this. She must not answer the phone right away. She should ignore this first attempt and only on the second one. 
but what should I do if he doesn't call back? In the end, USA Young answered the phone after it vibrated four times. Hello. At first, she replied in a cold voice, her tone blunt. Hey. I saw the message. My bad. I didn't know you were feeling that disappointed in me. You know me, my interpersonal skills have always been a bit terrible. His baritone voice still sounded just as calming as before, but S.A. Young was determined not to fold over easily this time. She was planning to remain cross for as long as possible. Is it okay for us to meet and talk? Her heart skipped a beat again. B, B, but why? Now, why? Why meet and talk? It's already too late, you know. No, that, there's this thing I need to talk to you about. T, that, fine, but why didn't you reply to my message for the last three hours? I sent it at 9 p.m. but now it's past midnight. My bad. I was busy with another matter. For SAE Jean, it was something impossible to talk about. The dinner with Kim Yurin ended at 9 but when he got home, the time remaining on his human form ran out, so there was just no way for him to call her back as a monster. What matter was it? Ah, uh, that. I was talking to Miss Kim Yurin. What? Why did you meet up with Miss Yurin? Why? What was your purpose? It was nothing special, we talked about the Raven Order, about Athony dolls, the weapons of the Orc blacksmith, etc. At his reply, USAE Young's forehead creased up in dissatisfaction. She somehow held back the question of were you alone with her? Circulating in her mouth. She didn't want to be seen as obsessive, after all. It was definitely not being obsessive, but actually being envious, but. Honestly, it was just that, nothing else. So. Can we meet? Yeah, well, sure. But I'm doing the night watch duty so not right now. Tomorrow. No, since it's past midnight, today. Let's meet up at 7 o'clock in the morning. As soon as this night watch is over, I'll head straight to the Society HQ. As soon as she was done talking, she abruptly hung up. Ha, huh, taste your own medicine, see how it feels like. Ha. Huh. You're here already. It was in the early hours of the morning. As soon as Kim S.A.E. Jean opened the doors to the chairman's office, he spotted you S.A.E. Young dozing off while sitting on a chair. You're here. Yawn. Now that he had arrived, she stretched her limbs grandly and chased away the remnants of her drowsiness. Yeah. He chuckled slightly and sat on her opposite side. Her messy, unkempt hair, a pair of bloodshot eyes. Now that was a sight wonderfully demonstrating how tough the night watchman job could be. Wait for a second. She dug through her pouch and pulled out a small mirror and then got shocked by her appearance, so she hid her face and then got up from her seat. Um, I should shower. No, no, let me go and wash up quickly. I look real untidy. Go ahead. He graciously allowed her. What she was about to hear. Would be quite shocking, after all. There was a need for her to prepare herself. And ten minutes later. USAE Young returned and sat back on her seat with her face still moist. So, what did you want to talk about? Then, with her arms crossed, she asked coldly as if to display how hurt her feelings still were. S.A.E. Jean lightly smiled and pointed at the sword hanging on her hips. Hand it over. Eh. W. Why. What do you want to do with it? You, you're not going to hit me with it, right? No, I'm not crazy. I just want to take a look. So, let me see. His smooth voice contained some sort of charm that was hard for USAE Young to oppose. Even though she was unsure, she still unsheathed the sword and handed it over to him. This. I crafted this sword. However, she couldn't understand what he said next. Excuse me. Ah, uh, well. A fellow member of the society did make it. No, no. That's not it. Cume. Right, for now, hand me a potion from your pouch, too. This time, S.A.E. Jean pointed at her thigh-mounted pouch containing her batch of potions. 
It was a well-known fact that ever since she was cured of her paralysis with the goblin alchemist's aid, she had never used anyone else's potions other than the goblins until now. She was one of those fixed, regular consumers of the goblin, in other words, his fanatical supporter. USA Young was confused enough for her brows to narrow, but still, without saying anything she handed over a vial of potion. When he grasped the bottle, he spoke the exact same thing as before. This. I brewed this potion. Appa. What are you trying to say to me here? Does it look like I'm here to kid around right now? She of course got angry at his foolish words. She came over because he had something important to tell her, but now, it seemed like he was trying to waste her time with stupid jokes. But Kim Sae Jin never lost his smile and relaxedly continued on with his words. What do you mean, kidding around? You said that there are too many things I'm keeping from you, right? That's why I'm letting you in on the biggest secrets of mine. You must never tell anyone about this, you know? Eh. What? This is no secret, it's just some nonsense. As I said, the orc blacksmith who makes weapons, the goblin alchemist who brews potions, both of them are me. The entirety of USAE Young's face crumpled. Those words were completely, utterly unbelievable. So why was this man still keeping such a serious, straight face? Are you telling the truth? Yep. You're lying. Full hut. In the end, Kim Sae Jean burst out in laughter. Seeing this, USA Young thought inwardly, I knew it, and was about to say something but then, her lips froze. Dear Miss USA Young. I crafted a broadsword, imbued with a mighty miraculous ability that will surpass other magical enchantments in the form of the weapon growing by itself. I'll always cheer you on, as one of Miss USA Young's fans. Uh. Eh. What he just said now was the exact contents of the letter written by the orc blacksmith for her. Was it correct? It's been a long time so my memory is a bit blurry there. Those were the parts one can remember off the top of my head. Huh. No, no, wait a minute. This is. You see, this weapon, I originally made this just for you. Your main weapon has always been a broadsword, right? I even asked you what was the exact type of weapons you used while we hunted together. Can't you remember? Her mind blanked out in that moment. Not one thought formed inside her head. But when she looked back, things began falling into their places. At that time, she treated it as a coincidence, but now, the voice of the orc blacksmith from back then. It was just way too similar to that of the man in front of her. But most of all, on that letter written by the orc blacksmith, the errors in grammar were the same as. Completely dumbstruck, she continued to stare at him without thinking of closing her wide open mouth. Chapter, 61 Kim Sae Jean further explained afterwards, but Sae Jean, with her mind not working at all, didn't seem to understand a word he said. While frozen in a dazed expression, she replied with a short yes, ah, that, etc., etc. H, how is that even possible? These words were what she could string together after pulling herself out of the lengthy confusion. He deliberated for a short moment on how he should answer her, before settling on the broadest answer possible. It's thanks to my trait. What? Just what kind of trait is? Just what kind of trait is that great? USAE Young shut her mouth while feeling slightly unfair. Normally, a trait was divided into two big subsections the completed type and the level up type. Those born with the former type of trait, the completed, could wield enormous power from the word go. But since the trait could not be developed any further, the only way to grow oneself was through practice and rigorous training of one's physical body. One of the more obvious examples of this trait was the heavy sword's mastery of Ju Ji Hyuk. However, although the latter type, the level up, started off on a much weaker note than the completed type, but with lots of effort, both the trait and one's physical self would grow. That meant there was a high possibility that in the later years, the holders of this trait type would reach greater heights than those with the completed type. More than half of all the knights, wizards and other specialty professions were holders of some kind of traits and among them, it was understood that around 80% were the completed type while the rest 20% were the level up type. 
but seeing that more than half of that 20% level up type trait holders were knights ranked higher than upper mid tier. Or wizards ranked B or higher, it was safe to say that this type of trait was truly a blessing from the heavens or some such. So that's how it was. She decided that Kim Sae Jean was the wielder of the level up type trait, even a uber super fraudulent version of it, and stopped short of asking him about the finer details. She had never, ever even heard of such a world breaking bug trait existing before, but whatever the case may have been, it was still taboo to inquire too deeply about another person's trait. Oh, so you believe me now? Sae Jean smiled and looked at her with eyes showing how proud he was of her. He was expecting her to doubt him at least for a little while longer and start assaulting him with more questions. What choice do I have? Even though it's really unbelievable, since you said it's true, I have to trust you. For some reason, USA Young felt content when his gentle gaze landed on her. And that's how, a deep smile began dawning on her lips as she stared back at his face. Yawn, by the way, where is the break room in this place? I'm feeling way too tired and my head is so fuzzy, it's like I'm still dreaming right now. You'll tell me more when I wake up, right? USAE Young yawned out as she spoke. Of course. Finding her appearance really adorable, he somehow ended up walking towards her position and started gently stroking her head. It sure was a sudden skinship, but she found his touches not too bad at all. No, it was actually quite nice. Ahem. That was why she let out a fake cough and hurriedly lowered her head. No doubt her hotly burning face was dyed in deep red, and she didn't want to show him that appearance at all. It's located in the basement. Come, I'll take you there. When Sae Jean took away his hand while saying these words, she shyly nodded her head while showing a slight disappointment. And now, inside the Raven Knight's Orders HQ. Kim Yurin stood before the doors to the executive conference room and breathed in deeply. On the day she stubbornly and resolutely decided to go and meet Kim Sae Jean alone, at the promised place she made a deal with Chai Young Ho and other executives. And that was to report on the results of the two people's dinner. It was because Kim Sae Jean's fame had risen up way too high to call the simple dinner between him and Yurin as a mere private matter anymore. And so, today was the day she'd report on her meeting with Kim Sae Jean last night. But there was no need for her to fret. Even though she didn't receive any concrete answers regarding the Athony doll, just like last time, Kim Sae Jean gifted her another weapon purchase application form. You can do this. Yes, you can, Kim Yurin. Just relax. Yurin did her best to self hypnotize, and then carefully opened the door. Inside the conference room, the team leaders from the teams 1 to 8 were all present and waiting. In other words, besides the beleaguered vice order master who was staying at home currently with various scandals hanging over his head. And her father the order master who had to go and meet the president on this same day, every one of the upper management was here. Oh, you're arrived. Chai Young Ho welcomed. Her first. She then replied to the avalanche of greetings with a warm smile and found an empty seat for herself. So, what did you two talk about? As expected, it was Chai Young Ho who fired the first round. He was taking secret glances at the paper in Yurin's grasp. Judging by the style of the coding that was rather suspicious, he thought that she had indeed brought home something after all. We were able to converse regarding various topics. Out of all those, the one that left most impression on me was his future plans on how he'd improve the Athony doll. Kim Yurin deliberately spoke in a relaxed manner. Last night, Sae Jean told her about his plans on what he'd like to do with the doll without too much thought. What he said was that the effects of the doll should improve by at least 100% from before obviously because the orc form's evolution prompting the growth in the skill smithing technique. Hua. Doesn't that mean it's going to be as effective as an A-level mana spring? Even now, that one doll's effect rivals a BC-level spring huh, really now. Even if it was something Sae Jean had spoken out carelessly, to these guys it was a priceless information. One or two executives present were even thinking of getting rid of their share of stocks belonging to those wizards' towers mainly specializing in building mana springs. Yes. And besides the Athony doll designed to aid training, he also spoke of his plans to develop the doll to new directions as well. 
Encouraged by the positive reactions of the executives, Yurin became more lively with her replies. By the way, what is that paper in your hands? However, Chai Young Ho managed to cut off the flow rather abruptly. Yurin ended up frowning slightly, but still, she didn't say anything else and placed the paper on the conference room table. It's the weapon purchase application form for the Orcs Forge, a gift from Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Oh ho. So this is that famous application form. As expected if you have a dinner with him, then he'd gift you a weapon made by the Orcs so, it was true, indeed. The executives near the paper Yurin produced brightened up considerably and quickly swarmed around it. It was only Chai Young Ho who carried a somewhat unhappy expression while submerged deeply in his own thoughts. How are you planning to utilize this form? How about well, it seems like a good idea to put this up as a prize for the person achieving the number one internal rankings I'm happy with whatever works the best. Kim Yurin. For her, the reactions of the gathered executives were great, but most importantly, Kim Yurin found the cloudy expression of Chai Young Ho just so wonderful to behold. So, with a bright smile blooming on her face, she spoke with full of energy. Later on, if there's any message you'd like to pass on to the society's chairman, just talk to me. We've become really friendly with each other, you see. Ah. As soon as she spoke, she realized her own faux pas. Actually, the mood during the meeting with him wasn't so good due to her being way too tense. Their conversations didn't flow smoothly at all, and at one point in time, she even saw S.A.E. Jean make a frustrated face. Oh. That is a relief. Nowadays, I've heard that other knights' orders are agonizing over the ways to befriend that man. As expected, our Yurin is just a blessed girl. Blessed, I say. Aha. Uh -huh. I've always believed her to be like that, but you were different, no. Miss Yurin. That old man there was getting jealous of you a month before you earned your rank of the highest tier. What nonsense are you barking out now? And I'm still in my forties, so who the heck is an old man? But seeing this lively atmosphere and the rotting face of Chai Young Ho. Ha, aha is, is that so? She just couldn't find the chance to correct her mistake. But, she was also beginning to feel rather bitter in the corner of her mind. While these people here devalued whatever results she brought in after going through the proverbial hell the achievements deemed important for the real knights the same voices were now sincerely approving of her actions after making this one personal connection. You can talk to me at any time. Five incidents. There were that many. Yes. As you've requested, I arrived before other knights could and resolved all the situations. And few, even the mobilization time is on another level altogether. Well, considering it only takes ten minutes from Seoul to Kanwan province, so. Wow, but wouldn't there be some problems with your body when moving that fast? It's fine if one uses mana barrier. But, in order to withstand this much atmospheric pressure and air resistance, I think one needs to be higher than a mid-tier at least. This was the openly encroaching season of the blooming flowers but the affairs of this planet were, as if they had a prior arrangement or something, all flowing towards a clearly bad direction. And strangely, out of all the countless countries in this world, the Republic of Korea was having it the worst. The citizens were rightly feeling anxious at the sudden, unexplainable monster incidents occurring as much as 31 times a month one every day. Unfortunately, the shifting, burning embers of the current state of things somehow fell on top of Kim S.A.E. Jean and Muffin. The number of people suspecting how safe it could be with Muffin had increased explosively all of a sudden. And so, in order to change the perception of public opinion, he asked Ju Ji Hyuk to ride on Muffin's back and to eliminate monsters. So, how was the reactions of the citizens? Were they afraid? Not at all. I didn't see anyone like that, instead I even met a few who were smiling. Saying they found the new twin tail hairstyle adorable. Just in case the ordinary citizens found Muffin scary, S.A.E. Jean inscribed a magic tattoo that emitted a pleasant smell, and on top of that, he even braided the long white hair of the griffin into a twin ponytail. He wanted to maximize the creature's cuteness, and also since it was a female, there was that, too. By the way, did Muffin act in any weird way? Mr. Hansung was referring to Muffin as the Satan reincarnate or something like that. Pardon. 
What did he mean by Satan, when it's this adorable hoo-hoo? Maybe that guy dreamed a nightmare. You think so, too? Looks like maybe Mr. Hansung is suffering from overwork. I should hurry and hire more people. Ha 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 ah, Mr. Chairman, I just received a request for an interview. What should I do? You do what you think is the best. Then, let's end the call here. Understood, Mr. Chairman. When the conversation with Ju Ji Hyuk came to an end, Sae Jin pocketed his phone and brought up his status window. Name, Kim Sae Jin. Age, roughly 23 years old. Height, 185. 1 centimeter weight, 85 kilograms. Status. Physical strength 113. Endurance 112. Agility 116. Energy manipulation 46. Mana affinity 36. Magic strength 31. Luck 17. Time remaining for the human form, 300,343 minutes. Few oo. He let out a sigh of relief. Fortunately, his continuously growing height stopped increasing for a week now only his weight had changed slightly. But even that change came from one of his newly acquired passives. The warrior's special quality skill proficiency level, F. Step 1, the host's body will undergo changes to better suit a warrior with the passage of time. Current percentage of completion, 15. 5%. The subsequent steps will only be unlocked after the completion of step 1 foot dot. It seemed that with this warrior's special quality activating, he could relax somewhat about being assimilated completely into the ebony wolf for now. However, there was a new, completely unexpected and somewhat related problem that had occurred in the meantime. The culprit was a single notebook on top of his desk. This book was a communication tool he had crafted by activating the orc smithing technique for 10 minutes straight. He made a pair of them and when letters were written on the pages of one, the same letters would appear on the other one. The reason why he made these notebooks was for the sake of security while communicating with the mercenary's tavern. Fearing that the Lycan might act without his knowledge, he had sent one over to the tavern more than three months ago. An you were trying to prosecute me up until now. Feeling somewhat dumbfounded, he picked up the book again. On the middle of the twenty-first page, these words were clearly written. The government has sent the word out that they wish to enlist the Lycan's aid. The job is to uncover the truth behind the current incidents. The compensation is a weapon made by the orc blacksmith and expungement of the prior criminal records. Looks like the government understands how much it wronged you, the Lycan, and thus is offering up these fairly substantial rewards. But, I shall leave the decision making solely up to you. And furthermore, this notebook will be confiscated by the Special Investigation Division of Police. I've immediately tore off the pages prior to this one the moment your messages came through and burned them, but still, I must apologize for getting discovered. The reward was supposedly a weapon made by the orc blacksmith. A hollow chuckle threatened to break out of his mouth. Really, this is ridiculous. From a few weeks ago, a certain civil servant, claiming to be the deputy commissioner of some government entity, came every two days to sincerely beg him for the sale of an Athene doll. He said that it'd be used purely for the diplomatic purposes between countries. Sae Jean was going to ignore the man, but since it was allegedly for a good cause so, while saying an Athene doll was impossible, he handed over the orc's weapon application form instead. And they are using what I gave them right here. Obviously they had no idea that Kim Sae Jean and the Lycan was the same person, but still, this was definitely not right, wasn't it? This wasn't diplomacy, after all. Foo. Sighing out grandly, Sae Jean began jotting down the words of refusal on the pages of the notebook. Since he was feeling somewhat wronged as well, he also deliberately showed off a bit of arrogance and bravado. You turned me into a criminal in a blink of an eye, and now you're asking for an assistance, which leaves me quite speechless. In all honesty, I've already seen through to the bottom of these incidents as well as the ringleader behind them. But how can a criminal solve these crimes? He then stopped here. As he was trying to hide his handwriting, he was writing with his left hand and that wasn't easy at all. Of course, thanks to the skilled goblin's craftsmanship, his left hand writing was almost indistinguishable from regular people's writings. And that is why, 
before my so-called criminal records are expunged, as well as the personal apology issued by that tiger woman, Chief Yu Song of the Special Investigation Division, I plan to sit tight on what I have discovered for myself. At that moment Kim Sae Jin wrote these words down. Kwang. The desk where the notebook was resting on became nothing more than sawdust under the fist of a certain woman. Eu ah. Mommy. With the screams coming off the surrounding people, all gazes gathered on this particular woman. The ferocious and violent personality resembling the Real Tiger but portrayed as the guardian of the Korean nation by the media and perhaps this world's most two-faced woman. Ha, a tiger. That measly, worthless son of a bitch dares to. The world's only living divine beast type Suin, Yu Bek Song. She just couldn't hold back her anger at those sudden words of insults. Her trembling eyelashes and deeply frowning face illustrated the level of anger she was feeling right this moment. Wow. I, I seriously feel like I'll go mad. A tiger? She hated the word tiger with passion. As she was a white tiger, she had this irrational obsession that caused her to zealously separate herself from the lowly common garden variety tigers. Kwang. Yu Song let out an animalistic roar. Of course, she was still a human, and on top of that, a woman with a somewhat small physique so it didn't sound at all threatening, however. If anything, one could even call it rather adorable. But she did this contrived and unnatural act regardless, whenever she became beyond incensed with anger. The excuse was that it was the expression of the pride at being a first-gen. Suin and the resulting animalistic tendencies or some such. Kwang. Kwang. Thanks to this scene, all the people present here had to do their very best to suppress their rising laughter. Chapter, 62. Reversing of the public sentiment was a success. Ju Ji Hyuk ended up earning the nickname of the Griffin Knight, and Muffin even performed an interview with a reporter. The killer smile of Muffin that spread out to all social media in real time was adorable enough to give people heart attacks and that's how she temporarily got to own the internet. But quite strangely, only Joe Hansung gritted his teeth and called Muffin the Satan reincarnate or some such, but Sae Jean didn't pay too much mind to it. As Muffin became famous, inquiries from Knights and Knights Orders throughout the world rushed in like tsunami waves via the society's homepage. A Chinese Knights Order even suggested that Sae Jean tame the monsters with the eggs they would bring in for a cool fee of post tax 180 million. Well, it seemed like the romantic ideals of knights were the same regardless of where they were from. Plus, riding on a griffin wasn't just a simple romantic dream for knights, either. After all, imagine a knight astride a griffin, tearing through the sky wasn't that just the coolest sight ever. In other words, it was a wonderful marketing opportunity, right there. Whatever the case may have been, thanks to this thing with the griffin, Kim Sae Jin's name had begun to spread around the world for real from a humble regular citizen of a small country, to the leader of the society that had become the focus of the world. As an evidence of his fame, the number of his SNS followers had blitzed past 1 million and was closing in on the 2 million mark quite rapidly. And just last week, the society's class saw another advancement, this time to see in other words, things have gotten pretty DN nice for SAE Jean lately. TL the final line of this paragraph confused me like no other the literal TL would have meant that there was no need for him to do more, but that didn't seem quite correct so I had to do some research online as well as to ask around. And what I TL'd here was the result of that research but still, I'm not 100% sure if that's what the author was trying to say in the first place. I also want to ride one. Currently, inside the chairman's office located in the monster's building. There was yet another knight present here who wanted her own griffin. USAE Young was gently staring at SAE Jean's face as he was doing some paperwork while hunched over his desk. Her large and sparkling eyes contained an earnest desire within. I'm sorry, but you can't. You're still a low mid-tier. Didn't you hear what Ju Ji Hyuk said before? Come on, Appa. A knight's tear isn't the true reflection of her abilities, you know. I mean, it's like, since the rank advancement exams take place only twice a year, sometimes people rank up slower than compared to their capabilities. Me, I can do this no problem, you know. She came to work, to the society's HQ instead of her own dawn order. Apparently, 
her superiors easily granted her the permission when she said she'd be coming here to ride on a griffin. Not going to happen. But S.A.E. Jean firmly refused her, causing her cheeks to puff up in annoyance and she started pounding on the desk with her palm. Every day, you're always favoring Night Ji Hyuk only Appa, you into guys. What the? No, I'm not. Then why do you hate me so much? After spitting out her words, she then observed changes in S.A.E. Jean's mood for a bit. However, he was still toiling away with his paperwork. Pretending to work hard only in situations like this. Usually, he'd dump all the work to his subordinates, anyways. Still pouting, USAE Young tenaciously stuck around SAE Jean's office. The patience, obsession, and the tenacity possessed by the precious daughter of the Chable household was not to be underestimated. Ten minutes, twenty minutes, and then thirty minutes' time flowed quickly, but all she did was simply stare at SAE Jean without giving up. Of course, as far as time was concerned, S.A.E. Jean would always be in a disadvantage before he knew it, his legs were trembling ever so slightly. All right, then, let's do it this way. In the end, S.A.E. Jean had to concede first. When he got up from his seat while putting on a jacket, those excessively sparkling lights came back in full force in her eyes. Bring me a griffin egg. The documents he was poring over just now was actually information regarding griffin eggs. In the past, records showed that five to six eggs appeared on auctions throughout the year, but nowadays, not one half, so far. And the financial department head Yu Dong also mentioned that even if one did appear, it should commence a sky-high price anyways. So, he was thinking that, even if it was the might of the dawn, finding one would take some time, and USAE Young would no doubt have become a mid-tier by then. Then I'll make sure you can ride on one. Cool. He quickly added these words and then lightly patted USAE Young's head once before hurrying outside. I've got things to take care of, so I'll get going first. SAE Jean left like that. And with a blank face, USAE Young's eyes chased after his back, visible through the open gap of the doors. Phew oh oh. Then suddenly, she let out a long sigh. Riding on a griffin certainly, that would be nice. But that was only a part of the reason why she was here. I wanted to ask him out for lunch. Was he really too dense to notice, or did he really not like her that much? While hiding a disappointed and melancholic heart, she trudged towards the restaurant she had made a reservation with. It was late at night. A goblin that was lying on a bed tossing and turning, abruptly opened his eyes. From his two bloodshot eyes, a strange aura was oozing out. Foo. Scanning the surroundings for a moment or two, the goblin let out a long sigh before suddenly morphing into a human being. It's happening again. Kim S.A.E. Jean dazedly muttered out. The clock said 2.30 a.m. Roughly a month after acquiring the orc great warrior form, he was currently suffering from various negative side effects. First of all, it became impossible to enjoy a relaxing night's sleep anymore. The vitality of the orc residing within him did not permit things it did not agree with, such as lying down for more than three hours straight. This much was fine. With his body so sturdy and strong, there would be more than enough stamina for the whole day even with minimal amount of sleep. The real big problem was the explosive increase of his base instincts and desires, such as gluttony and lust, as well as his aggressive tendencies for violence and confrontation. Against the strong, he'd give his everything in a challenge, but against the weak, a deserved domination and trampling. Craving to be the true victor, but the defeated would be ruthlessly humiliated and stepped on. To editor, whelp. I tried, but this is how the raw is like. How should I fix this? Now that he threw away the identity of the werewolf, orc's basic instincts and racial tendencies were spreading all over him. DN it. S.A.E. Jean held his head in distress. Just what kind of a vicious cycle was this? He chased so hard after his evolution in order to overcome the threat of losing his ego but now, he simply had no avenue to soothe his powerfully surging instincts. While gazing at the cold white light of the full moon permeating through the curtains, he slowly got up from his bed. There would be no change whatsoever by sitting on his as doing nothing, after all. Whatever the case may be, he just had to work harder. The conditions of his evolutions couldn't simply be satisfied by hunting monsters. 
That was why, if at all possible, he had to try out everything. For now, there was no other way but to try out any old random things. Hyuk Hyu, Yuk. Sae Jean was thinking, would he be able to evolve somehow, if he killed the night crawling in front of him? No, that was too much, so maybe he should just break a leg or two, instead. As long as I don't kill. He could assist the victim with the best potion brewed by the goblin alchemist. He then walked in heavy steps towards the female knight and grabbed her by her slender waist. The huge hand of the werewolf was enough to pick her up off the ground. Let let go, let me go. When he saw the terror-stricken face of the female knight, from deep inside of him a powerful sense of enjoyment bubbled up to the front. So, the wolf's long tongue reached out and licked her face. Kayak. Her terrified screams stabbed into his ears. It sure was a loud sound for the wolf with a very sensitive hearing ability, and fortunately, Sae Jean could recover some of his humanity from that scream. Ah. He turned his gaze towards the sky. The dawn sky with the full moon high up was dyed in the deep shades of navy blue. That was it, the full moon. No doubt, the cause for this crisis was the werewolf's instincts enhanced by the full moon getting all tangled up with the orc's desires. SFX for a childlike sobbing. It was then, the knight captured within his hand began crying like a child. Only then did Sae Jean check who she was while tilting his head. And she was someone he had been somewhat acquainted with before, the girl who lost to USAE Young at the knight's duel, Young Eun Ji. Why was the female knight famous even in the entertainment industry out hunting during these dangerous hours? KHRNG. From the jaws of the wolf, a strange and murky, low frequency growl came out. Taking this as a sign of the creature attacking her, Young Eun Ji squeezed her eyes shut. But what happened next was quite confusing to her to say the least. Come back when you get stronger. He freed her while carrying a mischievous grin. Of course, to her eyes it was one of the most terrifying expressions she'd ever seen. SFX for thudding footsteps. And then, walking with heavy steps, he headed off elsewhere. Her face all messed up with snot and tears, Young Unji sank to the ground powerlessly and continued to stare at the back of the departing werewolf silently. Sae Jean continued to walk through the forest for a while longer after that, before sensing a strange energy. Even from this great distance, he could sense that nearly imperceptible evil energy with black and crimson colors blending together to give off a seriously bad vibe. As if he was a moth drawn by the light, he approached it and found a stone that seemingly looked as innocuous as it could get. There was no need for him to wonder what this thing was for, as a summoning rock. An installation type portal. Remaining number of usages, 2024. A stone made by an unknown individual for summoning purposes. 24 times a day, monsters within its effective area will be transferred to the specified area. It'll break once the number of usages run out. As he possessed a leveled up passive that allowed him to take a peek at the information of things other than weapons. Sae Jean immediately figured it out the moment he read the alert window. This was the culprit of all those monster incidents happening throughout the country until now. No, the real culprit was something else. The alert window said this thing was made by an unknown individual, after all. But what an unexpected harvest. For now, Sae Jean sliced apart this summoning rock and stopped its operation. It is now known that Knight Yong Eun Ji is complaining about the mental trauma suffered at the hands of the werewolf while being treated in the private medical facility. Two days later, after being seen as a big scoop, the stories related to Yong Eun Ji exploded out into the open. Sae Jin definitely didn't give her any external wounds. The only thing he did was to break her weapon, that was all. But seeing all that exaggerated reactions coming from the news, the various publications and even from the netizens, clearly the identity of the victim played the biggest role of all, it seemed. Although experts concur that this werewolf has been active within the monster field for quite some time. They are suspecting that there might be some type of connection between it and the monster-related attacks that have been occurring frequently. SFX for papers rustling. As Sae Jean was paying attention to the news broadcast on the television, out of the blue, he could hear the sound of something being written inside the desk's drawer. That was an indication of someone writing on the communication notebook. So, 
he pulled the book out from the drawer. It is simply too difficult to believe you when you claim to have seen through the scheme and the culprit behind the current incidents. If you can prove this, then we're more than willing to follow through on all of your demands. It was a message from the Special Investigation Division after a long time had passed by. The truth of these incidents as he did find something two days ago by sheer good timing, he picked up his pen with certain amount of confidence. Haven't you ever wondered why the number of monsters within the monster field had decreased? Also, have you heard of an item called Summoning Rock before? I already have figured out everything. But unless you prepare a suitable reward, I refuse to reply further after this. In all honesty, it wasn't because he was refusing to he couldn't, even if he wanted to. But still, he passed on everything he knew this way. He found negotiating like this when many innocent people were suffering out there rather uncomfortable after all. And when he realized this uncomfortable feeling within his mind, he somehow felt happy as well, knowing that it was the evidence of him not being assimilated to either the orc or the wolf form. Even though replies were hastily being written after his own words. S.A.E. Jean coolly closed the notebook. June 21st. The longest day in the year, and the true beginning of the summer. The society that's expanding internationally, the monster over 300 knights orders gather for the demonstration of the Athene 2. 0. The orc's whip sword, the revolutionary weapon that can bend its blade like a whip when mana is injected certified as a fifth rank branded goods. The reasons why the orc's work isn't from luck or coincidence. The goblin alchemist produces a high grade potion once more the Yosian alchemy house is now being referred to as the goblin house. Our society is doing really well right now, isn't it? No wait, isn't it Appa who's doing really well? After finishing up with her work, USA Young showed up in SAE Jean's office just like before. This time, he was reading a newspaper he chuckled slightly and got up to leave. Don't you have to go to school? Well, no, I'm admitted to a university already. Meaning, it's the same thing as me being an official adult no, I am an adult now. I even got the driving license, too. USAE Young seemed to be in an especially good mood. Today was actually the day she was going to have lunch with him. She even wore a sleek, fancy outfit and a pair of high heels for the occasion. Is that so? Well then, shall we get going? While speaking, Kim SAE Jean smoothly wrapped his arm around her shoulders. At this subtle contact, USAE Young was stunned slightly but she could only swallow down her saliva. Without saying much, she naturally followed his lead. So, where would you like to go? Mm -hmm. Oh, right. I made reservations, but it's fine to go where Appa wishes to go. No, it's alright. Let's go to the reserved place. Chapter, 63 With Kim S.A.E. Jean riding shotgun, USAE Young drove the car by herself to the restaurant located within the city limits of Kongwan province. TL, the name of the city isn't specified in the raw. She drove quickly for 10 minutes, before arriving at their destination. We're here. Oh. You're pretty good at driving. Her skills behind the wheel, whether it was driving or parking, was so perfect it made him exclaim out in admiration. Honestly speaking, at first, he got so nervous, he had to pull the seatbelt as tightly as possible. Obviously. I'm good at everything, you know. What she said could have been seen as a jinx, but he couldn't help but find her brightly smiling face simply endearing. E. Usaya. She got off the car first, then hurriedly walked over to the passenger side and opened the door for him. S.A.E. Jean chuckled slightly as he exited the car, thinking, isn't a man supposed to do that for a lady instead? And so, the two of them approached the restaurant's entrance. USAE Young continuously searched for the right opportunity to link their arms together, but simply couldn't work up the courage to go for it. And so, her body continued to flinch this way and that while still searching for that right timing but, before that could happen, the Matri D had already approached them. Feeling genuinely bummed out, she began to resent the waiter in her mind. Have you made reservations? Yes, yesterday. Under USA Young, 4-2. The restaurant she had made reservations with, the Dinner in Angel, was so famous for its wonderful flavor and classy atmosphere, it operated on the reservation basis only. 
As far as SAE Jean knew, a regular Joe would have to make a reservation a month in advance for his spot that's how famous it was. TL, that's the name of the restaurant in the raw. I didn't mess it up. Of course. Please follow me. SAE Jean and USAE Young followed the Matri D's guidance and entered the restaurant's interior. The melody of a classical music number gently floated in the air one could tell that the decor was very expensive, even at a casual glance. And the patrons here were all someone S.A.E. Jean thought he might recognize from somewhere. His facial expression became slightly stunned as he discovered celebrities he saw often in TV shows, as well as famous knights and wizards here. This is your reserved table. The place they were guided to the table USAE Young had reserved was located in the best spot next to the windows where one could see the panoramic view of the cityscape below. Kim S.A.E. Jean still felt out of place in such a luxurious restaurant, but as expected of a gold spoon, USAE Young was just fine. She placed her order in a relaxed manner and then shifted her gaze towards S.A.E. Jean, who was still scanning the other diners around them. It's going to taste great. As she spoke, a brilliant smile was spreading on her face. I think so, too. Hee <laughs> hee. Right? Shortly after, their food arrived. Their meal started off with soup, then moved on to tiny little steaks, followed by slightly bigger steaks, etc., etc. They chatted away while savoring the food. Even though S.A.E. Jean spoke about things that just randomly popped into his head, the big smile on U.S.A.E. Young's face showed no sign of disappearing. At one point, she even laughed out too loudly and drew in the attention of the surroundings. And so, over forty minutes had gone past the meal came to an end just as S.A.E. Jean was beginning to feel nervous about the time idling away. Let's get going. He got up from his seat first. USAE Young also got up, but her expression was somewhat regretful at the same time. Right away, SAE Jean quickly ran towards the counter. He was trying to pay for the meal, but unfortunately for him, there was no need to do that in the first place. This restaurant is owned by the Dawn Corporation, and as such, Miss USAE Young and her fellow patron is exempt from paying. Waiter. Oh. Is that right? As S.A.E. Jean blankly nodded his head, a sonorous voice could be heard from his back. Did you hear that? Maybe Appa got too used to it and keeps on forgetting it, but I am that kind of a woman, you know. She puffed her chest out and tried to sound imposing and all. It was then, the expression of the waiter behind the counter became a little strange. Obviously, it was not her first time dining in this restaurant. She had brought along other nights from the Dawn Order, saying they were her colleagues and stuff like that. But her expressions now and back then were completely on the opposite side of the spectrum. It was enough to make the waiter wonder if she was the same person or not. She did not smile at all back then, ditto for the coy facial expression. Her rigid lips were only used for consuming her food, and it was quite obvious from her expressions just how much she wanted to go home as soon as possible. Is she flirting with him? That notion sounded totally nonsensical. Just what would make you S.A. Young flirt like that with another person? Of course, the waiter knew the guy next to her as he'd heard and saw him before. Kim S.A. Jean. Although he hadn't yet made an official appearance on TV, but still, he was a man the attentions of the public was focused on. As evidenced by his name being mentioned at least once every day in every television program there was, even including those variety shows but they do look good together. The waiter silently stared at the departing backs of S.A.E. Jean and U.S.A.E. Young while feeling a sense of emptiness. Appa, um, since there's some time left, so how about we catch a movie? As they stepped out of the restaurant, U.S.A.E. Young carefully asked him. Uh. Oh that. I, uh, I'm not really into movies. He replied while scratching the back of his neck. Movies well, he never really had any luck with such leisure activities before but ever since his trade awakened, it had become totally impossible now. Ah, if that's the case, then what about those machines where you win plush toys? There are loads of them around here. She walked alongside him and tried to lead him towards the next thing. She really didn't want to end today's meeting with only a single lunch together. However, his situation didn't permit that. Even that is, still. T, then, why don't we go to a cafe and just talk? You see, after today, 
we won't be able to see each other for a few weeks you heard, right? The order for the emergency standby. Anxiety could be heard in USA Young's voice. But there was nothing he could do. After sighing out deeply, he patted her head and spoke. I'm sorry. Let's just head home for today. S.A.E. Young's gaze remained directed to the floor without saying a single word for a while. But that didn't last for long. As if nothing had happened, she smiled brightly and replied to him in a lively manner. Yeah, well. I guess it can't be helped. By the way, Appa, you know you missed a big chance today, right? She quickly walked towards the car and entered it but S.A.E. Jean stood there momentarily after sensing her voice tremble. He was left utterly frustrated and bitter. The meaning behind the time limit for his human form was that he wouldn't be able to develop a deep relationship with another person. He wasn't sure since when U.S.A.E. Young developed such feelings for him, but. What are you doing? I'll drive you back to your house. She lowered the driver's side window and shouted at him. He trudged to the passenger side and entered the car. Right away, the engine roared into life and she expertly maneuvered out of the parking lot. Did you enjoy the food? S.A. Young tried to engage in small talk as if everything was fine, but it was plain to see that she was not okay while sitting behind the wheel. He felt so apologetic towards her, seeing her rigid face with a forced smile on it. After that day, S.A.E. Jean immersed himself even deeper in his evolution. Until the night fell, he really tried pretty much all sorts of things while utilizing the wolf form, and even resorting to the forms of the goblin in Athene. However, while his evolution seemed so far away still, an official decree for his subjugation was issued. It was called the subjugation order for the black-colored werewolf found between the low-mid and upper-mid-tier hunting grounds. The problem came from the fact that, while he still didn't kill anyone just like when he was the demon orc, his much stronger bestial tendencies ended up causing various psychological issues to his victims. His skill predator was active during all forms but since it was acquired after he became the werewolf, so naturally, its effects were the strongest when he was in the wolf form. On top of that, there were times when he couldn't properly control his instincts at all. Yung Eun Ji, who had suffered the hardest, was still confined to the hospital room and besides her, twenty more knights were suffering from lighter psychological traumas. Which then precipitated the government and the knight's orders placing a bounty on his head and issue that subjugation decree. And that's how, the fame of the werewolf, once referred to as the guardian of the monster field, had been replaced by infamy. SFX for claws tearing through stuff. The lightning fast claws of the wolf tore through a knight's armor. A shrill scream reverberated throughout the mountainside. Today's opponent was a four men hunting party comprised of mid tier knights from the Raven Order. As if the members of this team had worked together for long time, their cooperation, individual stamina management, as well as their abilities left nothing to be desired. But the reality was, there was just too wide a gap of strength between them and the werewolf, since there were five branded goods level items stored in him via spiritualization, currently level B. Stealth, level C. Improved striking power, level B. Increased intelligence, level C. Material Destruction, Level C. Light Refraction, Level B. The most significant bit was the last one, Light Refraction. In a close-quarter battle involving bladed weapons, the one of the most important part was correctly judging the distance between oneself and the enemy. But this Light Refraction made the concept of correct distance pretty much irrelevant. The claws definitely aimed towards the lower torso, but the resulting terrible wound appeared on the upper part or the claw swung from a distance would twist around quite strangely before arriving right in front of the target's nostrils in the blink of an eye. On top of this, the wolf's claws had leveled up over and over again until they rivaled adamantium in hardness alone. Dealing with each of the slashes from these claws was the same as a brush with death. Q Hyuk. And so, these four knights were swept away by the wolf's unconventional attacks. To these knights ranked around mid-tier or lower, they just didn't have much experience in unpredictable battle situations. S.A.E. Jean in the wolf form was just too tall a wall for them to climb. S.A.E. Jean fell into a dilemma while seeing the four heavily bleeding knights groveling on the ground. Did he really need to take a human life, or at least cut off a limb or something, to evolve? If that was the case, then then. 
KKHRNNG. However, he quickly distanced himself from the fallen knights and ran. Kim Sae Jin was a human, not a monster. In the case if the condition for his evolution really required him to take a human life, then he'd never accept it. Because, that act alone would push him further away from being human. Next day. Sae Jin, accompanied by Ju Ji Hyuk, was heading towards a hospital fairly early in the morning. You wish to see Miss Yong Eun Ji? She's not nurse. My name is Ju Ji Hyuk. Eun Ji should feel okay around me. I also got the permission from the order as well, since I'm here to treat her. The reason was Yong Eun Ji. Even if he couldn't help it as the wolf's instincts had taken over back then, his conscience made him feel responsible after seeing her going through so much for the past month or so. And since his wolf form was the cause of her distress, there was a good chance that he also possessed the means to cure her. By the way, Wai Eun Ji, suddenly. Ju Ji Hyuk asked carefully as they headed towards one of those single bed patient rooms. Ah, that I am Miss Eun Ji's fan, you see. That's why I even brought the goblin's potion along as well. Although Yung Eun Ji was nominally a knight, she also actively participated in the entertainment industry as well, which meant that she had quite a fan base so it was not a strange excuse to make. UHT, eh? The goblin, you mean the goblin alchemist? However, Ju Ji Hyuk was more interested in the goblin alchemist instead of Sae Jin allegedly being Yong Eun Ji's fan. But that was par for the course, really. Since the goblin alchemist was being seen as some sort of religion in the world of potion making by the so-called mud spoon knights as well as regular citizens going through tough financial situations. It was a well-known fact that making recovery potions graded upper mid or high was far more profitable. But disregarding that, he was busy making low mid-grade potions for sale at a low price. Even more, he maintained the rule of one potion per person when selling them. And so, the goblin was currently being praised that bordered on reverence as the ideal example of noblesse oblige. Of course, the reality was slightly different. The low mid-grade potions he brewed wasn't even a proper potion to begin with. It was actually saliva from the athony form. The nature of the moisture within the athony form was changed to mimic potions and then was discharged in other words, it was his spit. As he could produce over 100 liters of spit a day quite easily, he couldn't in good conscience sell that with a high price tag, so that was the reason for the low cost. And he only set the rule of one potion per person because he didn't like those people that acted like scalpers and resold his wares. Yes, it is that alchemist. Ting. While he spoke, the elevator had arrived at the top floor already. Chapter, 64 Yung Eun Ji's state was unexpectedly serious. Her face was haggard and the complexion, pale. And there were deep, dark circles below her eyes. As if she was lost within the confines of fear, her body continued to tremble, and she was even scared of making eye contacts. Phew! Ju Ji Hyuk did his very best to converse with her but it proved to be difficult in the end. When he shook his head as if to indicate that he was about to give up, Kim Sae Jin let out a bitter sigh. Mr. Ji Hyuk. Can you step outside for a second, please? Eh. Oh of course. Ju Ji Hyuk left the hospital room without suspecting a thing. Sae Jin stared at Yong Eun Ji for a bit longer, before activating the eyes of the wolf. As he thought, he could see some kind of an aura. The deep blackish red energy oozing out of every pore in her the intense hue and the concentration of it seemed to show how severe her condition was. First, he brought out a potion with the effects of a sedative. Obviously, this would not cure her, but it should help her get some much needed peaceful sleep. He was planning to treat her while she slept. Miss Unji. She trembled even more when he suddenly called out her name. Her head slowly raised up. Please take this. When comparing the odor from the wolf form and his human form, the former was thicker and stronger so one would be hard-pressed to think they were from the same source. But there was some similarity there still. She couldn't even dare to refuse him, and with quaking hands, received the potion. Drink it. Yong Eun Ji wordlessly drank it. And precisely one minute later, she passed out on the bed. After confirming that she was out cold for good, he extended his claws. 
Then, he slashed lightly at the bad energy rising up from her body. And when he did that, the gently dancing aura began to coagulate around his claws as if it had finally found its owner. What the? He was slightly taken back at this unexpected development. He was thinking that aura would be sliced apart just like before, so why? However, the contents of the alert window rising up were even more absurd in nature. The skill dark energy link has been generated. Dark energy link. Obedience through terror and fear. Whenever the ruler wants, he can cause the emotions of terror and fear in the ruled subjects. The ruled subjects will feel terror and fear when trying to refuse the ruler's orders, requests and or suggestions. However, the ruled subjects will not be aware of the effects of the link. The ruler can sever the link at any time. However, if he wishes to reconnect the link, he must go through the same process as before. After creating the link with 17 humans and then, by maintaining them successfully, the host will evolve into lycanthrope. Dot. He ended up receiving the clues to becoming a lycanthrope quite unexpectedly. He dazedly studied the alert window. Definitely, that dark and red energy coming off her had vanished. But seeing those words written on the alert window heck, wasn't this pretty similar to a master and slave relationship? Soft moaning. Yung Eun Ji suddenly shifted her body slightly. Her frowning face had already reverted back into the relaxed, emotionless one, and her body wasn't trembling anymore. Even her breathing had become calm, resembling that of a young sleeping child. Whatever the case may have been, it was true that his treatment was complete. So, he hurriedly escaped from the hospital room. Ju Ji Hyuk was leaning against the wall while waiting for him. When he approached, Sae Jin spat out quickly and headed towards the elevator. I think she'll be fine from now on. But Mr. Ji Hyuk, if and when she wakes up and starts saying strange things, please, you must call me first before anyone else. Please, I'm begging you here. Ju Ji Hyuk dumbfoundedly stared at Sae Jin's back before entering Eun Ji's room while scratching the back of his neck. And around three hours later, the call from Ju Ji Hyuk did indeed come. The contents were simple enough. Yong Eun Ji had recovered completely from the trauma after ingesting that potion, so she had requested him to send her thanks to Sae Jin. Is this that thing about the subject not being aware of the skill's effects? Sae Jin scratched his cheek slightly while looking at his SNS profile. Yong Eun Ji had uploaded a photo of her brightly smiling face and a lengthy message there. The monster chairman Kim Sae Jin came to visit me personally. With a potion brewed by Goblin Alchemist. I'm recovered now thanks to this potion but he left before I woke up, and I have no other way of showing how grateful I am other than this one. The idiot knight Ju Ji Hyuk said that Kim Sae Jin is a fan of mine please call me anytime. What a relief. He pressed the like button to show that he had received her message while not giving the matter too much thought. And about one hour later news articles regarding the supposed relationship between Sae Jin and Yong Eun Ji exploded out into the internet. And USAE Yong whom he thought wouldn't call him for the next few weeks phoned him first while gritting her teeth like crazy. On this day, Sae Jin finally understood what it was like to lead the life of a celebrity. There were no real benefits of getting famous instead, there was only the pretty useless handicap of having one's life become more complicated. Afterwards, Sae Jin went around doing slightly cowardly things. He assumed the werewolf form and attacked knights ranked lower than low mid tier, causing them to suffer psychological shocks. Knights with ranks higher than low mid tier possessed stronger mental resistance, and thus forming a link with them was not possible. And he'd go and see them under the pretext of helping them, all the while scheming to form the link, which would then take him one step closer to his evolution. During this process, the fame of both Sae Jin and the Goblin Alchemist rose up higher and higher, while the infamy of the werewolf also soared high enough to pierce the heavens. The assault on knights and hunters by the werewolf occurs once more today. The thug of the monster field how long do we need to witness this? The ineptitude of the knights who can't even deal with a single monster is finally revealed for all to see. Even the media took issues with the werewolf, calling it cowardly but intelligent monster that avoided the strong while terrorizing the weaklings. Before long, the werewolf became the face of evil, and knights ranked upper mid and high tier began moving to subjugate it. 
Thanks to this development, SAE Gene unfortunately had to stop after creating links with only 10 people. And so, time continued to flow and now, it was 13th of August. On this sweltering summer day heat, the planned product demonstration of the monster opened up on an auditorium in Kamwan province. The central aim for this event was to advertise the Athony doll version 2. Zero, which now came with effects improved enough to replace a mana spring. Over 3,000 knights and reporters from all over the globe showed up for this demonstration. Since this number exceeded the capacity of the auditorium, the remaining 500 or so people had to view the event through the giant monitor set up outside the venue itself. The MC for the event was Joe Hansung but the role of introducing the Athony doll too. Zero was entrusted to Kim Sae Jin. Initially, he was really worried but it unexpectedly ended without him getting jittery. Maybe, it was an obvious result since all he had to do was to step up for less than 10 minutes and the things he had to say wasn't a lot either. He simply walked up to the stage while holding a doll even he found absolutely cute, and then. Well, first of all. All the knights and wizards present here, please sense the mana coming off this doll of Athony. After speaking up to here, he waited until the knights and wizards become stunned by the vividly flowing currents of mana and then he suggested, the estimated value of the doll that even a layman could understand. With that over and done with, the rest was left up to the audience members. The knights spat out exaggerated words of admiration and praise in honest shock, while wizards' faces carried deep frowns of jealousy and the fingers of the reporters pounded on their notebooks as if to break them into pieces or something. And into this powder keg, he threw in one more spark of fire. In three months' time, we are planning to release another invention besides the Athony doll to the market a special item that contains the essence of the monster. Please look forward to it. The auditorium descended into a chaotic arena of fervor as he quickly stepped into the backstage. Was there really a need to do a live broadcast like this? Maybe I should reprimand the marketing department later on. Watching the footage coming out of the TV, an embarrassed smile spread on SAE Jean's face. Eh. No, I don't think you have to do something like that. Maybe because your height has grown taller, you looked really good up on the stage, you know. I mean, really, really cool. If I was a bit younger, I'd have fallen for you already. While taking a cute little bite at an apple, Hazeline spoke. Today, she had come to see SAE Jean about a problem regarding debt. However, this time she was here as the lendee, not a lender. In other words, she came to borrow some money for the Alchemy House expansion plan. The amount was nearly 4. 5 million US, but since SAE Jean owed her for her generous support back then, he didn't even hesitate in lending this money. That was probably why she was flirting. With him like this with a huge smile on her face. Haha <laughs> is that right? Of course ah, uh, right. By the way, one Athony doll too. Zero should go for at least around 50 million so, doesn't that mean Mr. SAE Jean is loaded now? Her voice was filled to the brim with envy. Ahaha actually, I don't have much in my bank account. You see, I'm busy purchasing land right now. Land? But why? Well. The financial and the planning departments gave me an advice. By buying up the land between the society's building and the Yosian Alchemy House, it would aid in the society's expansion in the future. Hazeline dazedly calculated the distance between here and her Alchemy House then her jaws dropped to the floor while carrying a shocked expression. From here to there. Wouldn't that cost a fortune? Even if the land price in Kongwan province has hit rock bottom because of all the monster incidents. I've already acquired about the half of the area. The pricing on the orcs' weapons has gone up by a lot, you see. Hazeline blankly gazed at him, before swallowing her saliva and did a fake cough. And then, she carefully opened her mouth. Ah, the economy is in the doldrums lately. Maybe I should increase the rent. Mr. S. Sa, S.A.E. Jean, what do you think? It was a well-known fact that the building the orcs' forge was located in belonged to Hazeline. Her appearance in that moment was unbelievably cute quite unlike her real age of thirty-ish and it was enough to momentarily rouse the instinctive lust in him. Ah, ha ha ha. He suppressed his rising instincts to the best of his abilities and awkwardly laughed out. His quest to evolve into a lycanthrope had to come to a halt for now, 
but SAE Gene didn't become lazy at all. This time, he worked hard to advance the human form instead. He was able to somehow squeeze 30 minutes out of the time he could stay in human form and during this half hour, he focused on training and exercising. And then, went on monster hunts as a human. Before long, he was able to grasp the title of the youngest ever high-tier hunter in the history. Are you referring to partnering up with a knight's order? That's correct. I'm pretty sure there will be plenty of orders who wish to participate. Regrettably, training alone had its limits. So, he called for Zhou Hansung to request a cooperative hunting with a willing knight's order. Yes. Probably, it'll end up with the order we choose. But, wouldn't it be better if the chairman contacts the Dawn directly? Right away, SAE Jin's sharp eyes landed on Hansung. Even though the number of people working under him was the highest among all the departments at 13, from some time ago, it felt like he was trying to shuck his responsibilities, somehow. No, no it's not like that. I will send the relevant documents right away. Zhou Hansung quickly saw through the meaning of his gaze and bent his back in 90 degree angle. Thank you. Well. Oh, right. Mr. Hansung, are you aware that the space for our HQ is continuously expanding? Yes, of course. I am planning to construct more buildings on the area adjacent to this one. The goal is to let each department occupy at least one whole building by themselves. The plan is to also build break rooms and night duty rooms where one can rest, so please spread the word to other employees as well. Then, Han Sung's eyes gleamed hopefully. If, if that's the case, then, the Satan, no I mean, Muffin will be. Obviously, the marketing department will continue to look after her. Since she's a fussy girl, it wouldn't be too good to change the current caretaker, after all. Ah. Joe Hansung's expression became of someone who had lost his country. But, but, I'm not a caretaker. I'm not, and it's definitely more correct to call me a slave instead. Pardon? S.A.E. Jean. Unfortunately, Hansung could not continue with his words. He simply swallowed back the rising sighs and just shook his head. At the same time, Kim Yurin received a summon from the Raven Order's master in a long, long while. Kim Hyun Suk not only the Order Master of the Raven, but also selected as second seat in the list of knights around the world otherwise known as the best highest tier knight in the Republic of Korea. And also, Kim Yurin's father. He once said that the relationship between a parent and a child was not much different to that of a boss and a subordinate when Kim Yurin was first admitted to the Raven Order. In other words, when she was just a high school freshman, he forcefully kicked her out of the house, regardless of how much she cried and begged him not to. And then, for the past ten years, Kim Hyun Suk treated his own flesh and blood poorer than he'd a stranger when it came to official matters. And so, it had been nearly four years since her last visit to the Order Master's office. Pardon? A diplomatic war? Kim Yurin. Correct. Now that the Athony doll's effects have been proven without a shred of doubt, and also it's possible for the International Knights Orders to buy one, the number of them lobbying the government has increased by far too much. The reason Kim Hyun Suk had summoned his daughter was, of course, to discuss the matters of the order. Currently, the top Knights Orders around the world were engaging in a weaponless war all for the Athony doll too. Zero. Seen as better than an A-level mana spring due to the effects mana recovery and stamina recovery added simultaneously onto the doll, it now became a core issue directly related to the status of knight's orders in general. On top of this, this situation now was different to when the competition only occurred between the local orders. If another country took it away, then that would damage the prestige of the nation itself. And. And so. Kim Yurin. I heard that you're on friendly terms with the society's chairman. Kim Yurin's body trembled slightly. That that was. Was it a lie? N, no, it was not. I am friendly with him. We even spoke on the phone yesterday. Yurin roughly shook her head. This was the first time her father had summoned her officially and placed complete trust in her. That meant that there was no more suitable person than her for this job and it also showed how much her father believed in her. She didn't want to betray his belief in her. Is that right? Then I shall leave this matter to you. 
Please be rest assured, F.A. Master. The word father circled around once in her mouth before dissipating altogether. For a while now, calling Kim Hyun Suk master instead of father had become the norm for her. Chapter 65 From the blood soaked altar, an eerie aura spread out and descended like a darkest, blackest fog, casting a heavy veil on the surroundings. A certain ritual type ceremony was occurring in this accursed place. The purpose of this ceremony was to take the deepest wishes of the gathered few and to turn that into mental energy which then would cause a physical phenomenon. Is everything ready? A bewitching voice could be heard from the throne located one level higher than the altar located in the middle. The language used was of unknown origin not English, not Chinese, nor was it Korean. But her voice was a clear proof of its owner being the next ruler of all vampires, judging by the way all nine vampires stopped their preparations and deeply bowed their heads. There is no need. Instead, please inform me of the progress made so far. The benevolent voice spread out like a cold wind. One of the nine vampires present, with his eyes red and a robe covering his entire body, carefully opened his mouth. We're almost done with the preparations. We found the coordinates of our home world following the wisdom of our Lord, and all that's left to do is to open the portal with the sacrifices and the accumulated mana stones, my queen. Hulhut. Haven't I told you not to refer to me as a queen yet? You must stop that immediately. Unlike her words, she sounded pretty chuffed, however. So, then where will this portal be opened? There are a total of three possible locations. The country we're currently located in, England the country where Dre Toon has chosen as their base, China and Korea, where the old man and the kid are currently residing in. However, Vampire with the robe showed signs of hesitation and stopped his words there. It's quite all right. Speak. That is the one with the highest possibility of being the right portal is the one in Korea. It's probably because there are two dead fishers located in the vicinity of such a tiny landmass and so, the probability of our portal connecting there is very high. The vampire suddenly stopped talking here. It was because the wavering aura oozing from the queen sitting atop the throne was becoming quite serious. My apologies. The vampire who spoke just now quickly began prostrating on the floor. But the queen simply sighed out once, and instead of reprimanding him, she encouraged him to continue. No, it is quite all right. This is actually for the better. I would have settled our quarrel with the kids sooner or later anyway. Then, let us simply head over to Korea. I trust that you have made the prior preparations already. Pardon? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, of course. Then it's all good. We shall believe in you and leave the rest to your capable hands. Only then, the powerful pressure bearing down on the entire altar scattered away like the blowing dust. She was gone. The nine vampires present could only breathe out and try to calm their minds. It is good that she wasn't as furious as we feared. That is that, but besides that, what are we going to do? We haven't even made a single preparation whatsoever. A different vampire asked in frustration. Kume. Just book out a room in a five-star hotel, I'm sure she will enjoy that. Our queen isn't too knowledgeable of the outside world anyway. Huh. But what about the other hotel guests, then? Just say they are her attendants or something. There's a chance she might be happier this way with the increase in the number of servants since she'd never set foot outside the ancient Frederick Castle, not even once. At this nonsensical suggestion, the other eight vampires looked at this guy with disbelieving eyes. Truly, there will not be any problems after all, does she not hate being in the same space as the poorer bloodlines? There's simply no way she'll run into other hotel guests. But. Enough. Let us stop this discussion here and begin the most important part of our operation. A certain afternoon of a summer day with bright sunlight casting down. Hop. Even today, Kim Sae Jean was diligently hunting in the low mid-tier hunting ground alone. This was a repeated labor he performed every weekday. Being alone posed no significant problems with all the magic tattoos inscribed on him, as well as the items stored inside with spiritualization, he had grown strong enough to defeat a gang of low mid-tier monsters by himself. Tui. Sae Jean spat out the blood of a monster that had entered his mouth. 
His current appearance after massacring seven monsters was quite a sight to behold. On his face, streaks of blood he didn't yet wipe away had solidified, and his armor had become unrecognizable, after being completely repainted with blood, top to bottom. All this was due to the combat style he naturally developed, one that was born out of the orc's rough and unsophisticated instincts. He was massacring monsters worse than monsters themselves could, with cruelty and no mercy shown. Tui, Tui. While still looking like a bloodthirsty demon when seen from others' perspective, S.A.E. Jean started moving his feet. But after he took only a few steps forward. Suddenly, a strange vibration could be felt by his senses. Since it was something he couldn't really fathom, he changed his form into the ebony wolf which possessed far sharper senses. This is. And that's how he was able to pick up the metallic smell so faint, it was close to being undetectable, coming from a great distance away. And it was a somewhat familiar smell to boot. Vampires. Judging by the variety of smells, looked like there were more than one. The chances of their number being over ten were pretty high. What's going on? He became greatly curious as to why vampires were moving in a group, when they were well known to prefer moving around solo as well as to what that vibration he felt just now could be. Unfortunately, the distance was just too great. The likely location of where their smell was coming from was over 10 kilometers away, judging from how faint it was even with his olfactory sense deployed to the absolute maximum. Way too far. Changing back to the human form, S.A.E. Jean's brows narrowed. He thought about returning home and ignore this, but he still felt quite uneasy. The mere fact of those vampires moving around in a group meant that they were busy doing something definitely dubious over there. Well, since I can't be sure, I should call Samiohm. After deliberating for a while, S.A.E. Jean pulled his phone out from the pocket and then. All of a sudden, the smell of vampires disappeared. At the same time, a powerful shock wave coming to life from out of nowhere thundered across the horizon. Quahahang. A stupendously loud noise that ripped the skies asunder the vibration that shook the earth no, this wasn't some measly vibration at all. The earth's crust itself was undergoing a transformation. Oh, FCK. When the flat piece of ground he was standing on began rising up sharply, SAE Jean rapidly assumed a monster form. Normally, a monster field referred to areas that fell under the influences of a dead fissure. A dead fissure referred to a fissure that was dead, meaning it did not expand any further but still continued to produce monsters from within. However, at two o'clock in the afternoon, a dead fissure suddenly generated on the boundaries between the monster field of Kongwan province and the adjoining North Jiangsang province. TL and the result was the earth's crust was twisted apart by the distortion caused by the dead fissure's appearance, and a portion of the North Jiangsang province had become a new, uncategorized monster field. As this was quite possibly the worst catastrophe to befall this country ever since its inception, the government immediately declared a state of national emergency. Currently, the areas where monsters of the dead fissure is rampaging in are the counties of Munjiang, Wuljin, Banghua, Yangju, and Yechun in other words, one-third of the North Jiangsang's total surface area. All citizens of the North Jiangsang are advised to evacuate to the south. Unfortunately, even though all the knights residing in the neighboring Kongwan province sprang to action almost immediately, the casualties numbered in the thousands, and the damage to property was thought to be truly astronomical. And what made the matters even worse was that the scale of the destruction was still increasing even now. Um, Director Nim. That was why a cold tempest wind that contradicted the hot summer weather was blowing within the halls of the Special Investigation Division, the folks entrusted with preventing such disasters from occurring in the first place. What? That is Mr. President has summoned you to the Blue House. Yu Song sighed out grandly after hearing her subordinate. She was busy alternating her attention between the various reports coming in from the affected areas and the live news broadcast on the television. On top of the desk belonging to Yubek Song, who was busy massaging her temples while her forehead was deeply creased, was a single notebook. It was the only method of communication with the mercenary Likan. But there hadn't been a single reply from him appearing on this mysterious notebook for quite a while now. Humph. It seems that chaos is breaking out even in the president's office. Then, I'll be on my way. Yubek Song deliberately tried to speak in a relaxed manner, 
but it was incredibly difficult for Suins to hide their true emotions. Her pure white tiger ears atop her head that usually stood up straight, were drooping down low, demonstrating how upset she really was. Make sure to take care of things during my absence. The subordinates present all looked on at the sight of Yubexong's petite figure trudging towards her execution ground with pitying eyes. And precisely one hour thirty minutes later, she returned even more downcast compared to at the time of leaving. Not only her ears, even her tail had lost all energy. Still, she declared out in a deliberately energetic expression. Call for a press conference. We're making a public apology to Leakin. And an unrest quickly developed within the office. The evidence, given out by the Leakin while claiming to know everything already, did indeed sound like a proper lead to follow. They even had found a summoning stone by accident, after all. But the issue with the Leakin was just how trustworthy he could possibly be. With only a piece of mercenary application paper dating back from twenty years ago, and every other scrap of information lost during the decline of the mercenary profession. There was just not enough info to determine whether his achievements and abilities were real or not. But, there will be a lot of problems. The president gave his go-ahead already. I'm sure will be criticized by one or two minority races' rights groups, but by applying the laws regulating mercenaries, there should be no problems, legally speaking. And also since we know that this isn't a natural phenomena, we need to grab hold on to any straws we can find. Yu Bexong's decision was unchangeable. Since it was impossible for a white tiger, famed for its inflexible ego, to apologize just because of some external pressure, it could only mean that even herself had made up her mind well beforehand. And such a determination would not be changed easily, so her subordinates didn't speak any further and simply did as they were told. At the same time Yu Bexong had made up her mind. Kim Sae Jean was lost. The sudden twisting of the land caused the previously nice-to-walk trails to become a difficult mountainous terrain, and the banks of stream had now changed into a steep cliff. And to compound his misery, he had to assume the orc great warrior form which he had been avoiding using until now, all thanks to encountering three upper mid-tier monsters. It seemed that there was a problem with the machines separating monsters by their tiers. Imma go crazy here. That was not the end, though. On top of all this misfortune, unexpected leeches had appeared. Right now, the Raven Knight's orders has been deployed near here. The leeches were the group of survivors busy following behind him like a row of baby ducks. About an hour ago. After defeating a upper mid-tier monster called Bladed Ghost, with some difficulty, a group of three survivors had approached him before he knew it and stared at him with doe-like eyes, full of hope. They probably wanted to rely on the beautiful, fame of the demon, no, the hero orc that everyone had heard of. Should I have left them then? Back then, he thought they might die if left alone, and since they didn't say anything before following him so he let them be, but now. Phew oh oh. What a relief. It's all thanks to that orc, isn't it? Indeed. But compared to what I've seen on TV, his beard and his hair has become much longer now. It's all shiny and stuff. It's really awesome looking. And as he walked westward after thinking there might be an exit there, he continued to pick up more survivors and before long, three had ballooned to thirteen. Nine of them were hunters, while the rest four were knights. He entertained the idea of leaving it all to the knights but from what he could overhear, they were at most low mid-tiers. They wouldn't be much of a help in this place where only the monsters classified mid to upper mid-tier continued to pop out. Hmm will it be alright to take a photo of his back? He's pretty sexy for a monster, you know. Ha! Huh. What the heck are you even saying right now when our lives are still hanging in the balance? Please don't do anything that might agitate the orc. While hearing that conversation, S.A.E. Jean sighed out inwardly. It was then, suddenly his intuition rang the alarm bell. Fortunately, there was only one movement. No, it was just one person moving. Something's coming. Get your weapons ready. A knight who also sensed the movement shouted out loudly. SFX for sound of light footsteps. Following the sounds of light footsteps. Oh. A lone female knight revealed herself from behind the thicket. It was Kim Yurin. And when Kim Sae Jean saw her, with her body covered in vegetation and monster blood, his heart nearly jumped out of his mouth. 
Chapter, 66 Among those missing from this disaster is the chairman of the society, the monster, Kim Sae Jin. Although the number of victims numbered in the thousands, there was one particular missing person that caused much hullabaloo around the world. And that missing person was Kim Sae Jin, the leader of the society rated C. As he was being seen as the guy to lead the monster-related industry in the future, his disappearance caused quite a bit of shock. For just what the hell is this? Thanks to the news of him going missing, a proverbial storm had ravaged through the mansion of USA Young's family and the people working for them. Of course, it was all USA Young's handiwork. Currently, the monster field had turned into a hellhole where monsters of all different tiers ended up chaotically mixed together with no clear separation whatsoever. Thus, Knight's orders only selected knights ranked mid-tier or higher to enter the field. Knights with lower tiers were ordered to remain at standby behind the defensive line set up around the perimeters. At first, USA Young followed the order without much complaints. But that was only until she heard the news of Kim Sae Jin going missing. It was a pure coincidence how she got to hear this piece of news and after becoming really nervous, she tried to call him on the phone multiple times. When her attempts all failed, she then tried to jump over the defensive line and enter the monster field. Obviously, she was stopped by other knights and the soldiers stationed there, and after causing a scene while shouting at them to let her go, USA Young was dragged back to her home about one hour ago. However, she didn't give up. Instead, she clung on to her grandfather and sobbed and begged him. Her grandpa, Yu Dae Ho, was taken back at her actions which he had never witnessed before until now. But he also knew well enough not to send his granddaughter to a definite killing field. So, he promised her that he'd mobilize all of the considerable resources of the dawn to find Kim Sae Jin's whereabouts. Even then, USA Young searched for a chance to escape her confinement from the Yu household mansion, and in the end, the resident wizard was called in to imprison her in her own room. But still, she continued to throw a fit in a manner Yu Dae Ho could never truly understand, such as breaking the windows and pounding on the door endlessly. What is S.A. Young doing now? Yu Dae Ho. She has fallen asleep at the moment, sir. The butler of the Dawn household, Park Hyun-ho replied with mixed feelings. Did you give her that potion with relaxation or what not effects? Yes, sir. Besides that, just what kind of relationship does my granddaughter have with that BD Kim Sae Jean that makes her behave like this? It was in poor taste as the guy in question had been swept away in this crisis and it was still unknown whether he was alive or not, but as the grandfather of USA Young, Yu Dae Ho just had to express his anger and hostility at the man. At the Chabel's words, Park Hyano scratched the back of his neck and shook his head. Their relationship isn't what you think it is, sir. Rather it's our miss who has developed a one-sided crush on him. What did you say? For you Dae Ho, that was even more unacceptable. Just who the hell was having a one-sided crush on who? From his perspective, it wouldn't even be enough for countless men to throw themselves in front of you S.A. Young's way, but this was. How the FCK do you know about this? When a momentary bout of anger exploded out, Yu Dae Ho had to forego his status as the most powerful elder statesman of this household, at least temporarily. Ha ha ah, that is I checked the messages received and sent on her phone. What did you say? Why the hell are you BD looking at the messages of my granddaughter? But sir, you have ordered me to manage our miss until she becomes a full-fledged adult. Kiem. The replies of the butler were calm and concise. Yu Dae Ho, with his face crimson, tried to calm himself as well and leaned his back against the sofa's backrest. Fine, but what is the progress made so far? Searching of the low mid-tier hunting ground where Kim Sae Jin has allegedly gone hunting is 70% complete as we speak. However, we still have not located a person nor remains that could be identified as our target as of yet, sir. Hmm. Wait a minute, 70% complete already? Yu Dae Ho tilted his head slightly in confusion. The current low mid-tier hunting ground was now a field full of mid- and higher-tier monsters due to the distortion of the Earth's crust. But how come the search had advanced by that much in such a short amount of time? This was something even I was not aware of either, sir, but it seems that several international knights orders, including the likes of Aline and Veritas, have sent their knights in to assist with the search. Hua. 
They are doing something so easy to see through. They didn't even bother to show up during that Africa incident. Yudeho shook his head in a disapproving expression. All this, just for the benefits called the Athony doll and or the orcs weapons. Their foolish intentions were so easy to see through hoping to be rewarded for their generous efforts if and when S.A.E. Jean was found alive. Well, I'll go and talk to S.A.E. Young's father, so you take full responsibility of stopping that girl. Yu Deho. Yu S.A.E. Young's current set of abilities were more than enough to become a mid-tier knight, but she was still a low mid-tier right now. And what's more, during these tumultuous times, it'd be a great luck just to avoid dying a dog's death by going over there. As a man who deeply loved his granddaughter, he'd do anything to avoid losing her at all costs. Yes, sir. Please leave it to me. It's Kim Yurin. The survivors cried out loudly while pointing at the knight revealing herself from behind the thicket. With the situation being such a chaotic mess, people here simply didn't have much mental leeway to remain polite and stuff. Is everyone all right? Kim Yurin asked the survivors while her chilly blue-colored, mana-infused sword pointed at the demon orc. Yes. Everyone's doing okay, thanks to this orc. This orc? Whatever, just come over to this side, now. Almost right away, all the survivors ran over to the back of Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean felt quite bitter at that. This was why the old saying of never take under your wings a dark-haired animal was invented. T.L., it loosely means humans are ungrateful animals, or something similar to that effect. Um, excuse me, Miss Knight. I think it's fine to lower your weapon now. That orc is. There are other knights to the rear of my position. Please make your escape from this place with them. Hurry. But, Kim Yurin didn't lower her sword. With an unshakable attitude, she evacuated the survivors first, all the while continuing to stare down at the orc often referred to as the hero. Throughout all this, her sword tip pointed unflinchingly towards the orc's head. What should I do now? Kim S.A.E. Jean the orc's lips were drying up real fast. Even if his strength had gone through the roof as the great warrior, taking on a highest tier knight was still impossible. After all, she was ranked ninth in South Korea, and 33rd in worldwide rankings as a highest tier. Even the orc's instincts were cowering before the huge gap in their power level. One second. Three seconds. And then, five seconds. Time continued to tick by, but the female knight remained silent, while the orc was busy shedding cold sweat drops. A chilly wind blew across the night sky. Under the bright glare of the moonlight, Kim Yurin brought out mana sleeping within her body outside. Mana that was boiling like the dancing flames soon became a thin layer that covered her entire body. It was the mana barrier, the greatest protective shield only the knights boasted about using. She was finally done with her preparations, and as things had come this far, even S.A.E. Jean had to grab hold of his mace tightly. S.F.X. for a low grumbling growl. However, just as she was about to launch into S.A.E. Jean's direction. From somewhere, a low growl of a monster resounded everywhere like an unpleasant vibration. At this suspicious noise, the taut tension between S.A.E. Jean and Kim Yurin eased somewhat. Yurin quickly surveyed the surroundings for a moment, before her eyes went extra round at the large head that poked out from the forest behind S.A.E. Jean's position. At her strange reaction, he too got surprised and turned his head around to see what was going on. And a hideous dragon-type monster was there. A giant snake-like body covered in jet-black scales a face that resembled a still-growing dragon. The legendary creature often seen in the oldest of old folktales, sometimes even referred to as the Little King, in Greek basiliscos. A basilisk. It was a monster that resided in the deepest caverns within the high-tier monster fields. It was an infamously powerful monster that, in the case of a fully matured individual, a minimum of six high-tier knights were needed to hunt. And the reason for such a terrifying creature to roam around here? Most likely, the location of its residence the deep caverns had become all mixed up due to the Earth's crust distorting about. Ow, CP. And judging by the concerned reactions of Kim Yurin, it was quite clear that this basilisk was a fully matured one as well. SFX similar to G but instead, done by a basilisk. 
the basilisk raised its head high and surveyed the area around it. Then seemingly having found its next meal, the monster shot forth its powerful glare towards their directions. In that moment, S.A.E. Jean sensed a strange feeling of his feet becoming heavy. It was probably the eyes of petrification that the basilisks obtained upon fully maturing. This effect also affected Kim Yurin as well and so, two people more specifically, one woman and one monster ended up rooted to the spot, staring at each other. And sure enough, S.A.E. Jean could fully understand the complicated light gleaming in Yurin's eyes. The subjugation of the basilisk by partnering up. Without saying a word, he grinned slightly. He then showed her his answer by gripping his mace tightly. Hugh. No matter how friendly it was to humans, there was something scary about an orc's smile. But Yurin was not in any position to worry about such a thing right now. If she could not defeat that basilisk here and now, the survivors and her fellow knights busy making their escape would fall into great danger. She withdrew the sword pointing towards S.A.E. Jean. And that became the signal. S.F.X. for an orc's roar. S.A.E. Jean roared out and instead of his mace, he swung his claws around. Currently, he was busy deploying the eyes of the wolf and the claws of the wolf as well. Since he was in the orc form, their powers were lessened somewhat but still, it was enough to erase the effects of the eye of petrification. He quickly scattered the darkish brown energy between himself and Kim Yurin, and sent her a signal with his eyes. And at that moment she nodded her head, S.A.E. Jean rushed towards the basilisk as his feet let out thunderous explosions. His reddened muscles bulged until they might burst under the activation of skills Whirlwind Dash and Warrior of Reversal, he then powerfully jumped into the sky. His aim was to hit the head of that lizard with the fierce strike. But of course, the basilisk wasn't going to let him get an attack in that easily. The BD opened up its mouth very wide and spat out thick green-colored breath towards the airborne orc. It was the basilisk's breath, capable of melting pretty much anything it touched. But that green breath was blocked by a wall of mana that suddenly popped out of nowhere. This time, it was Kim Yurin's turn. Well, she was a highest tier knight who had transcended the limits of the high tier and reached that certain plateau, after all. The ferocious battle only lasted for ten minutes. The magnificent and showy battle was probably enough to wow the entire world but, it was inevitable that there would be incredible damage caused to the actual arena itself. The acidic blood of the basilisk had spread all over the place and as a result, the powerful rotting stench came from everywhere. And within the radius of 500 meters, all vegetation was either uprooted or was cleaved in half. The battleground was so devastated, it was simply impossible to even imagine that this place was a lush forest only five or so minutes ago. Ah! And finally propping her body with her sword acting as a cane, Yurin was doing everything she could to hold on to her consciousness but in the end, with a short whimper, she collapsed on the ground. But seriously, that was just too dn amazing. With some extra stamina provided to him by a spare potion spiritualized and stored within his body, S.A.E. Jean was able to remain standing he recalled the short but fierce battle that took place just now and exclaimed out in deep admiration. The tirelessly dancing sword aura of Kim Yurin the adjective beautiful perfectly described the clear man infused sword auras that were simply wondrous to behold. He searched his surroundings for a bit. As a basilisk had shown up here, there was a good chance that monsters with lower ranks would have scurried away from this place. So, it was probably safe to relax somewhat. Phew oh oh. Kim Sae Jean then carefully searched for any signs of people around the vicinity before changing back to his human form. He then approached Kim Yurin lying on the ground. And when he slowly lifted her up. Amem. Kim Yurin's muffled voice leaked out from between her lips. In that moment, S.A.E. Jean's head blanked out. He thought she had passed out but instead, her body was trying to move. Anunchim. But fortunately for him, she was just mumbling in her sleep. After sighing out in relief, he carried her in his arms and quickly moved his feet. Ah. It's a person. S.A.E. Jean didn't have to walk too far to meet the searching knights. These knights discovered S.A.E. Jean walking closer from the distance with Kim Yurin in his arms and hurriedly ran towards his position. Me, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. We were looking for you. We are dispatched from the Goryeo Knights Order. 
can you take care of Miss Kim Yurin first? As his consciousness was all hazy and stuff, all S.A.E. Jean could think of at the moment was to head home as soon as possible. Chapter, 67 Kim S.A.E. Jean returned home after somehow shaking off an avalanche of reporters, several nights and even an ambulance. As soon as he came back, he headed straight to his bed. And he finally got to enjoy a deep and restful sleep in a long, long while. It was because the orc's desire for battle had been fully satisfied by the deadly encounter with the basilisk. And so, the sun rose on yet another morning S.A.E. Jean felt great as he got up and when he switched on the TV out of habit. He got to experience the symptoms of his brain suddenly stop functioning for a moment or two. The reason was the footage of the press conference held by the chief of the Special Investigation Division of Police. The so-called Special Investigation Division of the National Police. The special bureau within the police force that specifically dealt with the criminals possessing traits or the knowledge of mana utilization. Nominally, the Special Investigation Division formed a part of the overall administration of the government, but due to its nature of dealing with special circumstances, it was treated as a separate entity most of the time. On top of this, the treatment its employees received was better than some run-of-the-mill knight's orders, so there had been many cases where talented knights were scouted away to the division instead. But, just as the status within the society and the prestige indicated, pride the Special Investigation Division possessed as an organization was incredibly high. TL, from now on, I'm shortening it to SID. Some people called them egoistic or conceited, but in truth, ever since the division's inception. It had faced tens of thousands of cases yet the number of times they failed to solve the crime numbered in a single digit, so their pride was indeed fully justified. What the heck is wrong with her? That was why, back then, S.A.E. Jean wrote the words of I'll accept the job after you apologize, half out of mischievous mind which, now that he thought about it, was him behaving like a brat. A public apology from the chief of the S.I.D. Now that was pretty much the same thing as the entire organization bowing their collective heads at him after reigning in their pride somehow. And such a thing had never happened, not even once in the history before. The mercenary Leakin had been working hard all by himself to prevent more tragedy from unfolding after predicting the occurrence of these incidents. However, we at SID ended up committing a grave sin by calling his efforts terrible acts of hate crime. The voice coming out from the quivering lips of Yubek Song was feeble and rather pitiful. Before he knew it, S.A.E. Jean had taken a proper seat before raising the volume of the TV. The result of Sid's investigation is that, these monster-related incidents are definitely crimes and not accidents, and during the course of our investigation. A vampire who had requested for protection from the government two years ago has become one of the prime suspects. While he dazedly stared at the cutely bobbing mouth of Yubek Song, his mobile phone began ringing loudly next. He couldn't tear his eyes off the TV, but still managed to answer the call. Hello. Appa, it's S.A.E. Young. Are you unhurt? The call was from U.S.A.E. Young. Strangely, her voice was so small, it was lower than even a normal whisper. Yeah. I'm fine. Phew. That is good. She couldn't finish what she wanted to say. Out of the blue, he could hear the loud, angry shouts of you little rascal. Are you calling him from the other side of the line and promptly, the call got cut off there. What was that all about? And as S.A.E. Jean was tilting his head in confusion. I, Yu Bek Song, as the chief of S.I.D., is making this public apology to leak in the mercenary, and also wish to earn his cooperation as well. He could hear the declaration of apology from the aloof white tiger. Two days later. He had never seen chaos quite like this one. The anxiety regarding the monster field that had suddenly expanded twice its original size had subsided incredibly quickly and instead, the news regarding the Leakin had the country in total upheaval. As expected, devastating ripples of making a white tiger apologize publicly, who seemingly had never apologized to anyone ever, had far-reaching consequences. So, the public and the media kept their eyes and ears very wide open for the response from the leak and whether the legendary mercenary would accept the apology from the SID that tried to have him prosecuted as a criminal and start working for them. Or just like until now, stay silent over the matter. Imma go crazy over here. But in reality, the person central to this chaos, 
Kim Sae Jin was deeply mired in regret and dilemma while looking at the messages Yu Bek Song had written on the communication notebook. They said that a stone thrown without care would kill a frog now that he had thought about what he had done, he did indeed behave too dn thoughtlessly. He didn't have to think too hard to realize that, for SID, their pride and fame was hanging in the balance over solving this crime. And he just had to make fun of such people like some DN airhead. Fool. SAE Jean grandly sighed out and lied back down on the bed. Vampires or, those DN bloodsuckers. He wasn't able to think about them in death lately, but his anger towards them remained true. The thought still swirled in his head why did those bastards murder my mom? Was there a particular reason for that or was it simply to fill up their hungry bellies? And also just who is responsible? These days, whenever he thought about these questions, his anger boiled so much that sometimes he even woke up in the middle of his sleep. Perhaps, monster's instincts also affected him there. The wolf, for some reason, hated vampire species, and orcs as monsters didn't know how to calm their anger without fighting, so. He believed that, no matter which monster form end up assimilating with him, the fury towards the vampires would only get stronger and not weaker. After a long, long deliberation while trying hard to think under the clear mindset and logic of a human being, S.A.E. Jean came to a decision. His fault in this matter was just too big to ignore. Plus, the debt vampires had with him was even bigger. And most importantly, didn't these bastards throw a dead ball at the population of the planet Earth first by using these incidents, so would it be okay to let them be, just like that? After sorting out his thoughts, S.A.E. Jean wrote down his replies on the notebook. And around ten minutes after he made his reply, news media sent out breaking news reports. Breaking news. Leakin accepts SID's commission. First edition. Comments 4830. OMG. He accepted the job. But these cops made him into a criminal like 2093 disliked 858. Honestly, he is a criminal. He murdered vampires. Liked 398 disliked 693. You crazy nutter. These incidents were caused by the fking vampires, but you call these motherfuckers humans? They are fking worse than fking animals, that's what it is. Hey you fking bloodsucking suckers, compensate me for my destroyed house, you cnts. The fking poster above mine sounds like a vampire so, someone trace his GNIP or something. Liked 673 disliked 203. But man the Leakin was a real mercenary. My uncle, who acted as a mercenary for a short while as the whole thing came to a crashing end, says he's never heard of the man. Liked 1681 disliked 1458. You are uncle's a bitch, that was why, you fool. Liked 381 disliked 158 nads. Created committal 1 mobile, floor, 0. zero 5, refresh limit, 10, refresh time, 90, sizes, 300, 250, report, enabled, true, wording, report add, position, fixed bottom center. Most mercenaries regular citizens heard of are all bottom feeders in reality. The really powerful mercenaries would never hand over their personal information to anyone, because it might threaten their lives, right? And there were lots of mercenaries who worked while never registering as one, two, but if records remain, then the credibility is 99%. Liked 481 disliked 38. The post above mine is correct. The jobs of mercenaries 20 years ago was to kill hostile races, so why would he advertise who he is unless he's gone senile in the head? One mistake, and he'd be assassinated the next day. Liked 581 disliked 48. Wow. Does this mean the war between the races are starting again? Liked 1581 disliked 958. No, you crazy. We just need to find the vampires responsible and kill them all. Liked 581 disliked 358. What do you mean, kill? We should rehabilitate them. It's people like you making this world cruel and dangerous to live in. Liked 181 disliked 458. Don't make me laugh. Did you know that 80% of all vampires sent to prison commit suicide? They kill themselves after resisting drinking animal blood, saying how much they hate that stuff. Rehabilitation. What a joke. Just kill them all. 
liked 481 disliked 358. Over 4,000 comments appeared in less than 3 minutes on the news articles that popped out 10 minutes ago, after the Leakin had accepted the commission. It showed how highly focused the public's attention was towards this crime and the Leakin's decision. Few oo. However, Kim Sae Jean was letting out a soft sigh as he gazed at the contents of the notebook. There isn't much space left in this notebook now. We need a new method of communication. Maybe it was because he had added a simple enhancement on a regular notebook, the pages were all filled up. It was quite understandable as how this happened the SID must have felt rather anxious, judging by the daily messages which easily filled up each page that were sent by them all the while SAE Jean was busy ignoring their calls. He fell into a thought. There were two ways to handle this situation. Give them another notebook, or meet them face to face and get this over and done with. The former option was simpler and safer. The latter option was far more complicated and there was also a lot of risk involved. But still SAE Jean chose the latter. Of course, he wasn't going to reveal his identity. No, it was simply pushing Kim Sae Jean, the public persona, forward as the intermediary. Also, the Leakin in the mercenaries' records was a completely different person to Kim Sae Jean as well. Never to forget, by the time Leakin began moving stealthily in the shadows ten years ago, he was living a grey-coloured life in an orphanage with no dreams and hopes of the future so, there was just no way he'd be suspected of anything at all. It should be better this way. If discovered, then there was the danger of getting arrested for the crime of public fraud but he still chose to go ahead with the latter option. Like this, he'd be able to demand them to reopen the case of his mother's murder that happened well over ten years ago. There won't be no other methods of communication. If there is something you wish to say to me, call the leader of the monster, Kim Sae Jean. This was what he wrote down. And in the underground conference room for the SID where the message was received. Yu Bek Song's face became momentarily blanked out. It was the same for the other top agents present in the conference room to plot their next course of action. Why did the name of Kim Sae Jean pop out of this thing? Oi, you. What the hell is this SHT? Pardon? Yu Bek Song bluntly poked the agent sitting next to her and asked him. That, that is maybe they are. Uh, friends. What did you say Kim Sae Jean's family relations were? Nothing. They are all dead, sir. Then how the FCK does he know the Leakin? Yu Bek Song narrowed her brows and glared at the agent. Please excuse me, sir. The agent received this stare for a short while, and then became the proverbial beam of light as he quickly ran off to somewhere. Kim Sae Jean. I'm hearing this name way too often nowadays. Yu Bek Song leaned against the backrest of her chair and in an expression pregnant with unknown meaning. Yawn. She let out a mighty yawn. A divine beast was still considered young at the age of 40, and as such, Yu Bek Song still needed plenty of sleep. After the incident of the dead fisher's sudden appearance had calmed down somewhat. Kim Yu Rin found herself in a deep dilemma while playing around with her phone. By the way, that Kim Sae Jean must really be an incredible guy or something, right? He even has a personal connection with the Leakin. Maybe the rumor of him using his trait to regress back from the future is true after all. No way. That's just stupid. Oh, right. Hey you, did you submit those papers in yet? Currently, Yurin was taking a break in the temporary rest stop near the monster field. Stories concerning one certain man completely filled up this place. What papers? Didn't you see the public notice that went up? Saying the monster is looking for new members. Ah, uh, that? Of course I already submitted my papers. Well, I hear that in the dawn order, almost everyone, including the high tiers, all submitted their forms even the raven's upper mid tiers might do the same, or so I hear. Yurin stopped listening to the incoming yammerings and began lightly tapping on the table with her fingertips. She was busy recalling the memories of four nights ago. That was when she subjugated the basilisk with the aid of the hero orc Sae Jean appearing suddenly and approaching her, who had fallen down from exhaustion after the battle and the orc that had gone missing almost at the same time. The time difference is just too short hey, wait a sec. Kim Sae Jean said he could communicate with monsters, so maybe maybe, 
he also succeeded in taming the demon orc. But how even still, could he possibly tame something so humongous? SFX for a pain groan. She began to develop migraine from thinking so hard. She massaged her temples while glancing at the LCD screen of her phone. Kim SAE Jean 082-2349-3048TL, this should be a fake number. Guys, don't try to call this number. Besides the questions lingering in her mind, shouldn't she still need to express her gratitude for helping her out back then? She swallowed her saliva and made the call. SFX for ringtones. Unfortunately, he didn't answer his phone again. Ah. And there was yet another evidence of a missed call from her. Kim Yurin felt so embarrassed and began roughly tousling her hair up. At the same time Yurin tried to call him. Will it work now? Kim Sae Jean in the goblin form was concentrating on an experiment. If I fail again, then I'll be in Mana O-Ring, TL, this is a Korean online gaming slang term. Best artist from the gambling term, all in. Mana O-Ring means mana is completely used up. This was the inherent danger of crafting a highly specialized item. The more specialized the purpose, the higher the complexity its manufacturing process was. This was his thirteenth attempt already. Just to make one lousy item, he was about to experience the dreaded mana o-ring. First, he used the skill ruler of the water, now at level D, on 100 milliliter of his own blood contained within a beaker, then he extracted pure mana from it. Then crystals would form from that mana. However, the Kim Sae Jin's mana crystals had no use whatsoever in this form. But if he added these to the process of magic tattoos, then it was another story altogether. Originally, a person's particular traits and skills were contained within that person's unique mana signature. Of course, it was plainly impossible to give his trait over to something else in its entirety but with the rising proficiency levels of the related skills, it became possible to imbue a part of his passives to other materials. In other words, Kim Sae Jin was trying to add one of his passive skills to a regular material and in the process, create a special tool. The skill he wanted to transplant was the wolf's sense of smell. And the tool created with this skill was a necklace designed to sniff out the unique smell emitted by the vampires. The tool would operate like this, the core of the necklace where the wolf's sense of smell has been added to, would also come equipped with another attribute added to it thanks to the orc smithing technique. When the tool detected the particular odor, it would start vibrating and emit a crimson light. It did indeed possess some similarities to regular magic artifacts on sale to the public. But it exceeded them in terms of performance as a powerful skill was wholly imbued into it although having said that, the skill's effects would be somewhat weakened, but still. For now, even making one proved to be tough challenge for him and he was making a specialized investigation tool because of the current circumstances and not something with a variety of actual uses, but. But as long as he could become proficient in the manufacturing process, then he'd be able to craft better items in the future so this was all perfectly fine by his standards. Plus, his proficiency points were shooting up through the roof as well. Ki Hung. Sae Jin in his goblin form poured absolutely every fiber of his being into performing the magic tattoo, and then finished up with the orc smithing technique. And this was his thirteenth attempt today. If he failed now, then that was it for the day. Hop. He then controlled the characteristics of the moisture in the air, and successfully created an odor that closely mimicked a vampire's own musk. It was that metallic smell that nearly caused him lose himself to anger just by sensing it. When the smell slowly approached the necklace, suddenly, a clear red light began emanating from the item's surface. I did it. Changing back to human form, Sae Jean picked up the necklace and let out a relieved sigh. But because he had used up a lot of his mana until now, he felt dizziness assaulting him. But there was no time to rest. Knock knock knock. This is the chief of the SID. Since he had made an appointment with you Bexong today. When he confirmed the time remaining for his human form, there was still four hours left. That was enough. He quickly headed towards the entrance to open the door, but then, stopped in his treks. Write my scent. The scent coming out of him was just enough to make normal humans feel friendly towards him, but the story became more complicated if a Suin was involved. And Yu Song was the so-called pure-blooded, first-generation Suin, 
one of only eight remaining in the world. Since her sense of smell would be more developed than other Suins, his scent might be just too effective on her. Ha! Huh. There shouldn't be a problem, right? However, if she couldn't even endure the urges of some random scent, then she shouldn't even be called a divine beast in the first place. He let go of his worries and then, opened the door. Chapter, 68 Welco Kim Sae Jean opened the door wide. However, there was no one in front of him. And when he confusedly lowered his gaze, only then did he find Yu Bek Song looking up at him with a dissatisfied face. Pure white hair. Sharply shaped eyes. Tightly shut lips where he could easily spy her stubborn personality her perfectly defined facial features definitely showed the beauty of the divine beast seriously well. However, for Sae Jean, what drew in his focus more was not her facial features but the two perfectly cute pair of ears standing straight on top of her head and the stiff tail of a tiger on her back. She's a lot smaller than I thought. Falling into even more confusion, Sae Jean looked down on the top of her head. Frankly, the impression he got was that she was quite a tall person from all the televised interviews that only showed her face. But hell, wasn't this at the level of a middle school student? At a push, what, 155? 156 centimeters tall. Kum, Kum. Yu Song spat out a couple of fake coughs. Quite unlike the first impression of being scary and mean, he just couldn't help but think she was really a cute little girl, what with her small stature and sharp face all working nicely together. Welcome to my place. Kim Sae Jean quickly bowed his head. And Yu Song wordlessly looked up at his face for a while. That continued for a bit longer. And then she began doing the very thing he was worried about. Sniff, sniff. Yu Song's nose twitched as she began sensing the scent coming off Sae Jean's body. And as expected, there was a certain addictive quality to his center actions of sniffing him up didn't end there. Sniff, 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 sniff. She totally forgot all about the real reason for coming to meet him and was completely immersed in smelling him. The stiff tail had become loose before anyone knew it, and was now gently swaying from side to side. And those cute but straight ears of hers had also became softened and rounded as well, slowly fluttering and all that. Are you alright? Ah. Excuse me. When Sae Jean called out to her, Yu Bek Song could finally regain her senses from the stupor of his sense. I'm Yu Bek Song, the chief of the SID. She handed over a business card with her small and pretty hand. The jet black card contrasted her pure white skin. Sae Jean received the card and then offered her his hand for a shake. I'm Kim Sae Jean. If I were to say what my job is, then it's the chairman of a society. I've heard a lot about you. Is it fine for me to enter? Please. When he stepped aside, she entered past the front door and into his house. Sniff, sniff. And as soon as she was inside, she began to sniff the air again. Kum. Kim Sae Jean swallowed his saliva in slight anxiety. It had been almost a year since he started living at this place. He had been living here while using various monster forms, so there should be quite a lot of accumulated odor of monsters in here. Your house smells really nice. But fortunately, Yu Song seemed to focus less on the fleeting smells of monsters and more on the scent of the wolf instead. She then expressed her satisfaction at this great atmosphere. Is, is that so? Well please follow me. He carried a bitter smile as he guided Yu Song to the living room. No actually, he tried to. She was moving with some difficulty. She'd take a few steps, then stop and start sniffing the air. Then she'd recover her bearings, start walking again for a few more steps, before stopping again to sniff, sniff. Um, hello. Your interior decor is pretty nice. As she spoke those words, there was a certain light glow on her face visible to naked eyes. If one thought she seemed terse and stubborn in appearance initially, now she looked rather coy, somehow. Seriously, she was indeed a Suin whose mood would change according to the environment she was in. Ah well, thank you. Please, follow me. There is something I'd like to show you. Understood. Only then did Yu Song follow him in while making the sounds of pitter-patter. 
Just past the passageway and into the living room, one could see the SAE Jean's favorite couch where he just loved to lounge around. And even Yu Song didn't simply walk past that couch. She too gravitated towards that particular piece of furniture naturally, as if it was done all subconsciously. This is it. SAE Jean picked up the necklace and spoke confidently. But unexpectedly, there wasn't any reaction. And when he turned around in confusion to see what was going on, he witnessed Yu Song breathlessly shoving her face all the way up into the couch and busy sniffing it. Excuse me. Excuse me. S.A.E. Jean had to call for her three, four times after that. However, she didn't even pretend to hear him. In the end, S.A.E. Jean had to pick her up by the scruff of her neck and move her away from his couch, like one would pick up a stray kitten. Ah. Hey, what gives? Yu Beck Song threw a temper tantrum and flapped her limbs around, but then, quickly remembered the sorry sight she just showed off, so she let out a fake cough and tried to act composed. Kume. What is it? Grabbing someone else's scruff already. My apologies. It seemed like you were too infatuated with the scent. Infatuated? Whatever. So, what was it you wanted to talk about? Ah, uh, that is. He gave the freshly crafted necklace to Yu Song. She stared at the necklace resting on her palm in silence, before asking him with her head tilting slightly. What is this? It's a tool to differentiate vampires from the populace. With this, even a normal person can easily find out whether there is a vampire in the vicinity or not. Please, try it on. Hmm. Yu Song's facial expression was of extreme distrust, but she still tried to put on the necklace. How do I put this thing on? Unfortunately, as expected of a divine beast who had never worn any accessories whatsoever in her life, she didn't succeed. This son of a Yu Song. As there was no progress made the longer the time was wasted, besides getting Yu Song's face into a deeper frown and her mood all riled up so, losing his patience first, S.A.E. Jean stepped in to help. He walked up towards her and personally put the necklace on her neck. Yuaha. However, in the middle of trying to put it on, a strange and steamy breath touched the edge of his collarbones. He got so surprised, he quickly withdrew from there. Kyung. Yu Song avoided his gaze while pretending nothing was wrong, but her two deeply reddening cheeks told no lies. What, what? No, besides that, what the heck is this thing? She then deliberately shouted loudly in an aggressive growl. S.A.E. Jean chuckled slightly and explained the abilities of the necklace. But it looks like a regular necklace, though. Yu Song muttered to herself as she fiddled around with the necklace around her neck. You can trust me. While searching the areas around the Kongwan province with this item equipped, you will be able to track down those vampires hiding among regular people. Even though I don't need this thing to distinguish vampires. Before he knew it, she was already addressing him without any honorifics but somehow, it didn't feel too bad. In reality, although her face looked especially young, the gap in their ages was close to twenty years anyway. But funnily enough, it felt like he was being spoken to not by a much older adult, but by a very young kid instead. Well, I'm sure that a divine beast can do that with ease. But, isn't it impossible for the other agents? Humph. With her ears standing up straight, she began thinking for a bit. The abilities of vampires to blend in with the crowd was so fantastic, even the first-generation Suins that enjoyed senses sharper than normal animals had real trouble differentiating them. And, most of the first generations had almost gone extinct now. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say, there were only Yu Song the Divine Beast and Kim Sae Jean throughout the entire world who could smell out a vampire with their noses only. Did Leekin make this thing? And he told you to pass it over to me? Eh? Ah, well you can think of it as Leekin and I have cooperated on its creation. Hyum. Yu Song took a suspicious glance at him before nodding her head. Maybe it'll help out with investigation. We'll see. But besides that. She easily undid the necklace. It was simpler to take it off rather putting it on, so there was no trouble this time round. Isn't there some kind of info Leakin is supposed to give us? Huh. Oh let's talk about that a little later. 
For now there is a condition attached to handing over that tool to SID. A condition? Her brows narrowed at the sudden change of topics. Her expression was of how unhappy she was, but... Of course. It's not for free. Since it was so, so difficult making that tool. S.A.E. Jean subtly got closer to her. It was in order to let her smell his scent better. E.U., yum. He only got closer by three hand spans. But she was visibly panicking. It even seemed that making eye contact with him was getting difficult for her. You see, the thing is. His expression slightly hardened when he thought about his mother. He got closer to her a little bit more. W, wait, don't come closer. Yu Song found it hard to keep her thoughts straight as the thick scent invaded her senses. She tried to arouse her strong mental resistance to endure this onslaught, but but his scent was simply too much for an immature divine beast to withstand. On that day, S.A.E. Jean was able to get a definite answer from Yu Song. As expected. Trying to win over a divine beast by using nothing more than his scent was difficult but the fact that she was a first-generation Suin came to bite her in the rear since by having highly developed senses meant that she would also react very sensitively towards his scent. Kim S.A.E. Jean crafted five more necklaces per instructions of the S.I.D., and they paid over whooping for five million U.S. for each one of these artifacts. Afterwards, things moved swiftly, to the point where the Leakin didn't even have to help out at all. That was how great the abilities of the SID agents were. Within a week, they were able to arrest 39 vampires, and also uncover the fact that seven of them were indirectly related to this disaster of the dead fisher as well. When that happened, several reporters who wrote articles that supported vampires, as well as members of the rights groups that advocated for the vampires' rights had all vanished into thin air. With these discoveries, it became somewhat clear that vampires had blended into the human society. The public showed great indignation at this fact, all the while singing the praises of the Sid's swift response and Kim S.A.E. Jean's timely inventions. And the monster's class was readjusted to be after its contribution towards the investigation was acknowledged publicly. Additionally, as the land price in Kongwan province hit rock bottom, buying up the available land concluded faster than expected. This whole buying up land was one part of the future strategy both the planning department and the financial department had suggested. It was definitely the case of a blessing in disguise. And that was how a society, founded less than a year ago, had grown to become one of the biggest in the country that possessed over 10,000 Payung of land in the Kongwan province. TL, 1 Payung 3. 305 square meters. Development of the society's lands? Yes. I believe this is the perfect timing. The planning department chief So Jin Hui came to see him and submitted a report. With curious eyes, he began poring through it. The report was filled with many ideas on how to utilize the nearly 10,000 Payung wide land. A theme park using Athony as the mascot a luxurious magic shop that sold artifacts that S.A.E. Jean would make in the future and plans of forming an alliance with Hazeline's Yosian Alchemy House. Then converting the area around there into an exclusive district reserved for the Goblin Alchemist and the Orc Blacksmith. They are all good ideas, but wouldn't they cost a lot of money? No, not at all. If I do this together with Mr. Yudong, then I can definitely get us lots of savings. Plus, several famous international societies are already doing similar businesses as the one I'm proposing, and have met with great success so far. We can do even better than they did. On top of that, many knights' orders said they will help us. So Jean Hui sounded so enthusiastic. S.A.E. Jean smiled deeply while gazing at her. In any case, he was not worried as far as the abilities of the people he had picked were concerned. And simply holding on to money was the same as letting them rot, so investing them this way was probably the right thing to do. I understand. Please, give it your all. Giving his permission, Kim S.A.E. Jean signed his decision on the report. Seeing this, So Jean Hui did her absolute best to suppress the overwhelming emotions and bowed her waist deeply at him, then left the office of the chairman. As soon as she left, S.A.E. Jean could hear her energetic shout hooray. Of celebration coming from the hallway. Kim S.A.E. Jean's face held a thin smile from that, but soon, 
his expression hardened once more as he pulled out another document from the desk's drawer. Chapter, 69 Two weeks ago The month of October began with the monster serving as the hottest topic in town. In order to recruit new members for his society, Kim Sae Jin uploaded a notice on the home webpage and then advertised it on his SNS profile. His reasoning this time was that having only six foot members while he was three of them in truth when the member limit for the class of his society was 250 excluding employees seemed like a bit of wasted opportunity to him. This was quite a departure from the other societies with classes higher than B that recruited new members in total secret the home webpage then ended up crashing due to all the traffic after the declaration of the public recruitment went online. Leading to many news outlets to focus on this matter and report on it. Apparently, huge chaos erupted in the various community chat rooms dedicated to individual knights' orders. Such as that of the Dawn Order allegedly, some knights affiliated with the same orders even held meetings to determine what they should do. And the final number that had applied during the week-long recruitment process that included knights from both local and abroad, hunters and wizards, was as many as 3,000. If one was to count in people from other professions, then that number swelled up to 4,000, making it even more ridiculous. However, among these applicants, there was one man that made SAE Jean rather anxious. Kim Yusone. The boss of the mercenary's tavern, and the man responsible for transforming SAE Jean into the legendary mercenary, Leakin. Does he know? Kim Yusone's trait involved dreams and people. While dreaming, he could see from the perspective of a specific person for a short while. In other words there was a good possibility that Kim Yusone was aware of SAE Jean being the Leakin already. Hmm. But then again, he wondered if it was better to bring the source of his anxiety closer to his side instead. More importantly, even though they had never met face to face, his credibility was completely assured. If he was a bat-like person, then he'd have sung the tune the moment SID began poking him. Plus, Kim Yusone certainly worked his BT off for a person he had never met before. He had taken the records of his own past when he was working as an A-ranked but still nameless mercenary and modified it into the Leakins, and thus made it so that. When the SID tried to investigate Leakins' prior activities, instead of suspicion, the confidence in this legendary mercenary would rise instead. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kim Yusone has come to see you. Should I admit him in? Speak of the devil Kim Sae Jean breathed in deeply. Let him in, please. He greeted Kim Yusoon while being somewhat nervous. That means, you knew from quite a long time ago. Kim Sae Jean's worried premonition proved to be right. Kim Yusoon said that around three months ago, when Sae Jean was rampaging around as the demon orc, he had figured it out. No, rather than figuring it out, it was more like he came to understand, instead. Yes. The truth of the chairman being the leakin I came to understood somehow, in one certain moment. You meant to say you saw the others, as well? Yes. Indeed, Kim Yusone said he got confused quite a lot. Sometimes, his dream would start as an orc, sometimes as a wolf, sometimes even as a human. Because he suddenly had dreams as monsters, he had to wonder if his trait had leveled up or something like that. But he got to truly understand when Sae Jean in his orc form ended up saving countless people. Well, I'll be. It's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? When seen through the eyes of the wolf, Kim Yusone had not one speck of ill will in him. If he had any evil designs to begin with, then he would have started blackmailing him a long time ago already. Will it be alright for me to know this truth? Kim Yusone. Even though his worries had become a reality, strangely enough, he felt as if a burden had lifted off his shoulders. In any case, he didn't think his secret would be maintained forever anyways and also, he couldn't have kept it inside him forever, either. No, no. Of course it's not like that. It is my Achilles heel, after all hmm. Looks like I don't have any other choice. Pardon? At Sae Jean's words, Kim Yusone's body shuddered. The middle-aged man must have thought that what Sae Jean said was equal to his intentions of disposing him, and so, he began to slowly retreat back. Looks like you'll have to stick by my side for a long while, then. Fortunately for him, though, Sae Jean simply smiled and reached out for a handshake. Oh. 
Ha 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 why, yes. Thank you kindly. And on that day. The construction of a new mercenary's tavern commenced on the grounds of the monster, with Kim Yusong serving as its boss. The amount of things to do after becoming B-class society increased by a lot such as, registering as a corporation, acquiring related business licenses, and of course, recruitment of new society members. Thanks to that, almost the entirety of the time limit for his human form had to be spent on taking care of the society's administrative work, and that naturally led to him having less and less meetings with other people for private matters. Does Appa really need to do that selecting new members thingy? And so, it became a daily occurrence for USAE Young to come and see him in the chairman's office after ending her own days of work only after the punishment period set out by her grandfather had ended, of course. It couldn't be helped, as Kim S.A.E. Jean wouldn't meet her anywhere else other than here. Yeah. Besides, there are only about 100 people left, so. Humph I can also help out, you know. I can finish up in 30 minutes if it's 100 people. And well, you're only a mid-tier, so let's not. Wah, again. You looking down on me again. Didn't I tell you that a normal mid-tier and the youngest ever mid-tier is completely different? USAE Young's brows narrowed in a deliberate show of her displeasure. He simply smiled at her dissatisfaction and finished up with the last of the authorization work needing his attention. With this, his daily admin duties were done for the day, as the interviews with the applicants would only take place on the following day. Um, Appa? USAE Young was carefully studying Kim S.A.E. Jean for a bit as he got up from his seat. Then, with her fingers fidgeting around, she asked him. You can't make time today again. Every day. She wanted to do something anything with S.A.E. Jean. However he checked the remaining time for his human form. One hour, thirty minutes. To be with her, it just was not enough. No, no. It's not like I want to go someplace specific. Just we can go to Appa's place, you know. Quickly reading his mood, USAE Young carefully added more. Her shy appearance was powerful enough to worsen the repressed desires residing within his heart, but SAE Jean was somehow able to endure it, and he quickly shook his head. You're still too young to say you'd go to a bachelor's place like that. Just train diligently in the basement training facility. He gently stroked you S.A.E. Young's head once and headed outside the office. His destination was the monster field. Since the Earth's crust became distorted, the entry was now heavily restricted for regular civilians as well as for the lower-tiered knights, but S.A.E. Jean had things to do there. Ahem. Um, but suddenly, USAE Young approached him and grabbed hold of his arm. He turned around to see why and then, forgot what he wanted to say. She was biting on her lip, and her eyes were wet with tears. USAE Young breathed in deeply, before slowly opening her mouth. Where are you going? Can't I come, too? No. You can't. Regrettably, SAE Jean had to be firm. Of course, as he was not a total idiot, he had already seen through her feelings for him that had developed some time ago. She always came to see him the moment she got off from her duties. And then after parting ways, she'd send text messages until they went to bed. Without having a deep affection for him, she'd never do those things. Why not? You always say I can't, but why not? Because you're still young. For someone like S.A.E. Jean who had never held a deep enough relationship with opposite S.X., this was the only excuse he could come up with. No. If he made up his mind, then. He could have told her everything about this mother king trait of his. After all, Kim yu Son was aware of the truth already, anyways. But then, she was not Kim yu Son. Because U.S.A.E. Young was someone incredibly precious to him, someone Kim S.A.E. Jean had connected with after going through so much, and that caused him to be reluctant. The potential misunderstanding, fear, and terror she might feel after seeing him transform into monsters played heavily in his mind. And most importantly of all the reason why she even began to have these feelings for him in the first place, was due to the skills of monster forms it was not a feeling that had naturally developed. What would she think, once she found that out? The instincts of monsters shouted out within him that none of his worries mattered, but the human Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't want to hurt this still young and naive girl. You are. Of course, U.S.A.E. Young couldn't accept such a reasoning. 
If he was to continue pushing around the excuse of her being young, then why did he give her all those subtle hints with skinship? She clenched both her fists tightly. She wanted to scream out at the top of her lungs and ask him, whether he was leading her on with these cheap baits or not but also, wasn't she too big of a fish for him to jerk around? But. I got it. Even though she found herself pitiful and pathetic, she didn't want him to hate her. Kuhurur her. The manticore let out a strange cry as it collapsed on the ground. Kim Sae Jean the ebony werewolf then shoved his claws deep into the monster's heart. The mana stone of the manticore has been absorbed. All stats rise. A new passive skill, vocal cord reconstruction, has been acquired. Vocal cord reconstruction skill level, F. When the level rises higher, the host will be able to speak even when in the monster forms. What the hell is this? The very first monster he ran into upon entering the monster field was a monster he had an experience fighting against the manticore. Back then, he didn't have the leisure to stay and absorb its mana stone, so he found this encounter a rather fortunate development. And the victory came much easier than he thought this time, thanks to a branded goods item stored within his body with spiritualization. But why the hell is this skill so rubbish? He didn't like one bit about the skill he got after absorbing the monster's mana stone. Things were a lot different when it came to SAE Gene absorbing the mana stones of upper mid tier monsters. It was because he'd earn a new skill simply by absorbing one mana stone. That meant, as long as he successfully hunted a upper mid tier monster, that would serve as the fuel for his exponential growth. Plus, as the entry to this place was heavily restricted, there were no knights or hunters in the vicinity as well. But, maybe it's not today. However, all of those was side distraction for the main reason. Kim Sae Jean was roaming around the monster field every night simply because of the premonition Kim Yusone had. He said, I've dreamt of a soul vampire walking within the monster field. I believe that there might be a big harvest if you catch this individual and make him talk by either intimidation or by coercion. Hyum. Kim Sae Jean let out a fake cough for no reason. Funnily enough, he really did sound like a human just now. What the? Of course, correct pronunciation was still a bit too much for now. Kim Sae Jean could now sort of understand how a manticore could sing, dot. It wasn't the kind of skill with a variety of uses but well, he began moving his feet while deciding to feel happy about it since having more skills was always better than not having any. And shortly thereafter, Sae Jean found the smell he was wandering around for. A British national of Hispanic origins, a bottom feeder vampire named Dwayne was able to enter South Korea with minimal issues thanks to his identity as a hunter from a first world country. His role was to investigate the lay of the land within the monster field after it had gone through the distortion. Specifically, to investigate the portal that would lead to their home world as well as the dead fisher, and then submit the findings to his superiors. SFX for sounds of shaking grasses. And as Dwayne was walking around doing his job, he heard the sound of grass being disturbed from his back. He quickly turned his head around to look but he could see no living creature there. Thinking that it might have been the wind, he brought his attention back to his front. Ah. Uh. And then, something else filled his vision up. It was a lone wolf. A gigantic bipedal wolf. The wolf made a suspicious grin and slowly opened up its jaws in a terrifying manner. It's been a while. A heavy, low-frequency voice. Even though the wolf only spoke a single line, Dwayne passed out where he stood with bubbles forming in his mouth. What the? It sure was a strange reaction, but Sae Jean could figure out the cause right afterwards. There were 23 skills related to his voice alone. And when those skills blended in with the wolf's own voice, the fear effect doubled in its potency. Whatever. Less work for me. Sae Jean confirmed the dark energy rising from the unconscious vampire, and then formed the dark energy link with him. Kim Sae Jean left a mental order of cooperate fully with the questioning on his imprisoned vampire, and then tied him up in a place far from all human activity with a note that said, This guy will spill everything out if you torture him. After arriving back home, he phoned you Beck Song. Since they had met a few more times in private already because of his mother's case, Sae Jean thought they had gotten a bit closer. That's what he thought. Miss Beck Song. I'm gonna hang up. Huh. 
Why? Didn't I repeatedly tell you to address me by my full name or I won't even speak to you, eh? Unfortunately, Yubexong was still a feisty little divine beast and without the influence of his scent working on her, she maintained a cold attitude towards him. Miss Yubexong. Okay, what? Please send someone to the address I'm about to give you. Leakin said he has left a vampire in there. A vampire? S.A.E. Jean told her the address where the vampire was. By the way, what about the matter I asked you about? Oh, that. All the related info is ready. Then let us meet tomorrow. You wanna meet? Yu Song showed signs of hesitation. Obviously, because of his scent. Yes. We can't entrust the delivery of such important data to a courier service or to an agent, after all. Fine. I'll call you tomorrow. While maintaining that indifferent tone of hers, she hung up. Chapter, 70 The following day, the time was noon with the blazing sun overhead. Kim Sae Jin had no choice but to walk straight into the proverbial den of the tiger, located in the middle of Seoul. Yu Bek Song had chosen her own house as the meeting place this time, in order to minimize the effects of his scent that had permeated into everything he had touched. And so, right now, he was checking the contents of several documents while placed a fair distance away from Yu Bek Song inside her house. His expressions were solemn and grave, but in total contrast, Yu Bek Song was busy sniffing the scent that still somehow managed to cross the room with her tail slowly swaying from side to side. Ha! Huh. As Sae Jean was studying the documents, a hollow chuckle broke out before he knew it. Within these papers provided by Yu Bek Song, several truths he had absolutely no idea of were recorded. One of them was the fact that his mother was a mercenary and the father he didn't even know he had, was a knight. His mom retired from the life of mercenary the moment she became pregnant with Sae Jean, and his father took the job that was meant for his mom, and ended up getting killed by a vampire. And most of all, the fact that all this information was cleansed, out of the Korea's government archives, now that was something he just could not understand why. I wasn't the division chief back then, but anyways, I can see a lot of suspicious things in there. First of all, there's a trace of the SID performing investigation into the matter but someone completely removed the existence of all the records. Yu Song studied Sae Jin's reactions and then continued to speak. Additionally, your mom was the subject of special surveillance by the National Police for a period of eight years, meaning from your birth until her death. Such a thing only applies to either an important eyewitness or a prime suspect of a case, but I don't know why your mom was being watched at all. As I've said before, all records had been erased clean. Sae Jean raised his head. There were small pools of moisture around the corners of his bloodshot eyes. In other words, you are saying, right now you don't know the full details. Yep. For now, this is the limit of what can be found. More time needs to pass before something can be done. More time. Yu Song narrowed her brows slightly. I'm currently the chief of the SID but that doesn't mean I'm the top cat there. We are still the part of the government, you know. The former chief is still a part of the administration too, so who knows just what kind of trouble might end up stirring once I start digging into an old cold case. I don't want to face such unknown dangers. However, Sae Jean did not withdraw his fixed gaze. Yu Bek Song let out a grand sigh in the end. Also, there just isn't enough number of agents available right now. You are aware that all of Sid's resources are focused on these vampire incidents, right? You just have to sit tight for maybe three years, until this chaos is resolved. Maybe, what Yu Bek Song said was correct. To dig into a case that was nominally closed over ten years ago, and furthermore, a case that for some unsavory reason, was erased from the history even if it was someone like Yu Bek Song, the burden of danger would be great. Unfortunately, Kim Sae Jin as he was now couldn't be considerate toward such a thing. Even if he had to resort to cowardly and unfair tactics, he needed to uncover the truth as quickly as possible. Miss Yu Bek Song Sae Jin increased the power of the skill, the scent of the wolf, to the maximum. He even deliberately spoke in a baritone voice as well. He then conquered the two of her most vulnerable senses, the hearing and the smell. I, I told you, I'm not gonna. He took large steps towards Yu Bek Song. 
Then, he reached out to grab the shoulders of the retreating woman. Her petite body shuddered. Six months. I don't think I can wait more than that. How about it? Kim Sae Jin leaned over and whispered into her ear. Her tiger ears imperceptibly quivered a sign that his voice was working its magic. He then gently stroked the flapping ears while continuing with his next words. I'm not saying you should do it for free. I will give you one item you desire from our society. With that, it should be enough to satisfy those upstairs people who might get irritated. He added this new condition. The Doll of Athene version 2. Zero was an item the government begged him incessantly for. With that, they should forgive him for at least a handful of misdeeds. T, that I, I don't, no, I know. Yu Song's voice was shaking so pitifully now. This indescribable feeling that was burning up her body was something she had never experienced before in her life. Please let go. She needed to resist one punch would be enough to knock this BD out but strangely, her body wasn't moving as she wanted it to. That warmth transmitting from her ears sent her consciousness into a blur, and plunged her body into a state of trance. Hugh. In the end, she breathed out roughly and leaned into his arms as if to embrace him. There is no need to worry. This is a wonderful proposal, after all. While carrying a cold smile, he whispered into her ear. That became the critical final blow. Two days ago. Agents of the SID were mobilized towards a certain hill with little to no human activity, and as Leakin had said, they found a vampire tied to a tree and terrified out of his mind. The agents dragged the guy back to the SID headquarters and then, began interrogating him for the past two days. But it was the craziest thing. The vampire caught by the Leakin was different to others of his kin and sang like a canary. As he was a bottom feeder, he didn't know all the important details, but still, the general information provided by the vampire that was directly involved in this matter was like a sweet, sweet rain on the dry desert that was the current SID. Initially, the SID thought about using this information to continue investigating in secret. But they chose to apply pressure to those vampires hiding among the general populace and so, they delivered all the necessary details to the media outlets. And they stumbled over each other to break the news first. And so, the information revealed this way caused a huge shock throughout the country and the world. From the Western European nations that maintained the position of amiable relationship with vampires, such as France, Germany, and England. Strange atmosphere began to leak out and from the other extreme end of perspective, there were signs of racial cleansing operation about to resume in China. As it has been reported in the various media outlets, from the combined investigative work performed by the Leakin and the SID. It has now come to light that the vampire's final goal is to rip open a fissure to its biggest yet and in the process create a portal that should lead them back to their home world. Even though the SID had revealed all the information already, countless reporters still showed up for the press conference Yu Song was standing in front of them and loudly announced the findings. Innumerable camera flashes threatened to blind her, but her eyelids didn't even flinch. Additionally, the number of vampires hiding in the society is far higher than estimated and they are divided into factions that serve different leaders. This was everything Dwayne the Vampire had confessed to. I shall now answer your questions. When Yubek Song began accepting questions, reporters threw up their hands in fierce competition as if they were waiting for this moment. She pointed at the reporter sitting in the front. What relationship does Leakin have with Kim Sae Jean of the monster? I don't know. Ask me questions related to this case, please. Why the heck is the name of Kim Sae Jean uttered in this place? Thinking so, Yu Song frowned a little and then pointed at another reporter. Currently, a new rumor of both the Leakin and Yu, Miss Yu Song, joining the society, the monster is. What the hell is this SHT, now? Yu Song didn't let the guy finish his question before cutting him off. There will never be such a thing. If that's all, then this conference is over as it seemed like there were no useful reporters here today. Yu Song chose to end the QA session sooner than expected and turned on her heels to leave the reporters then belatedly began throwing the right questions at her way but she remained coldly indifferent. And so, the press conference ended sooner than expected, but still, the truth of the Leakin's effort resulting in the breakthrough of this case had now been revealed. 
Then, a strange new trend started up all over the world when it became known the Lycan's continued efforts had played a crucial role in uncovering vampires' goals. And that was people wanting to become mercenaries. In other words, the profession of mercenaries that had gone past the level of being in decline, and into complete dissolution was showing the signs of rejuvenation. We've received a lot of commissions. Jobs such as tracking, investigation, eradication, etc. They are quite varied in nature. Kim Yu Son. Is that so? Kim Sae Jin. Thanks to this development, Kim Yu Son had suddenly become incomparably busy. We should refuse them all, yes. Yes. Because of their current circumstances, they had to refuse every one of the commissions, but still, Kim Yu Son's voice was thick with joy. And also, there have been an increase of people coming here, applying to become mercenaries. There were a few serving knights among them as well. That is why, Mr. Chairman, how about forming your own private mercenary company using this chance? Ha! Huh. A mercenary company? That's correct. Under the name of the Monster Mercenary Company. Of course, although the mercenaries of the old operated on their own, as the times change, so should we. My son has also decided to help me out as well. If the chairman's thoughts and ours align, then my son and I will. All right. Please make it happen. S.A.E. Jean's reply was swift. If it's a mercenary company affiliated with his society, then that meant he could wield them like his own private soldiers. Since receiving the information on his parents, S.A.E. Jean was thinking about doing this, too after all, he just couldn't sit tight and do nothing while waiting for Yu Song to come through forever. I beg your pardon. Why, you are serious. Is it okay not to think it over? It's fine. Ask the financial department for the necessary funds. Oh, and by the way, will it be possible to raise intelligence operatives as well? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yes, it's definitely possible. After all, I specialized in that field when I was younger. Kim Yu Son hoarsely replied in a near scream. That's good. Then, Mr. Kim Yu Son, please take the reins of this matter and give it your best. I'll reposition you as the commander of the mercenary company as well. Ah, uh, right. Before you pick a mercenary, please bring that person to me at least once. I'd like to see their faces. I, I understand. However, the role of the commander should be you, Mr. Chairman. As for me it's enough as the director of the mercenary company. If that is the case, then I shall leave everything in your capable hands. After ending the call with the brightly smiling Kim Yu Son, S.A.E. Jean then immediately phoned both the planning and the financial department. And on that day, on a certain spot of land belonging to the society, the foundation for the future headquarters of the Monster Mercenary Company was laid out. Wah, what is this thing? Just like before, as soon as her duties ended, U.S.A. Young came over to Kim S.A.E. Jean's office. However, today was slightly different. Kim S.A.E. Jean was waiting for her to come and as soon as she showed up, he gifted her a magic artifact he had crafted, and U.S.A. Young's eyes went extra round at this sudden and unexpected gift in the shape of a necklace. It was a stunningly beautiful necklace with a ruby serving as its centerpiece a masterpiece S.A.E. Jean poured in a lot of effort to create. He imbued the effects of the skill warrior of reversal into this ruby necklace. Depending on the amount of mana poured into the ruby by its wearer, the strength and the duration of the skill would vary accordingly. Of course, it was still a pale imitation of the real skill but, for the knights whose positions could be decided on even the smallest differences, such an item would truly be a priceless treasure. I made it for you. It's an artifact, but it's a bit different from the others. Oh, is it similar to those necklaces you gave to the SID? She smiled happily and immediately put the necklace on. Yeah. But it's also quite different. You heard that an artifact shop is going to open within the grounds of the society, right? Uh. Ah, uh, are you going to sell this necklace over there? Her joy was short-lived, and she became really disappointed. Ha. Huh. No way. I've made that especially as your present, you know. He chuckled and explained further about the necklace. Then her eyes went round again, as she'd never heard of such an artifact before in her life. Really? Can I try it out now? 
she immediately poured her mana into the necklace. Right away, a mysterious vitality began entering her body. This explosive feeling where all the mana in her body wanted to erupt out although the process only lasted for 60 seconds, this experience left a huge impression on her. As if she became an imbecile all of a sudden, she stared at S.A.E. Jean with her mouth gaping open. Her prior experience of buying and using countless artifacts told her all she needed to know only after using it just once. An exceedingly beautiful exterior and a special effect added to it, this was an incredible item that couldn't be properly described in mere words. I'm giving this to you as an apology for the past. But don't be burdened by it, please. It's not purely a simple gift anyway. You're making lots of appearances in television nowadays, right? Please wear it when you are in front of the camera. If you fail to wear it even once, be prepared to hand it back, okay? At her frank reaction, S.A.E. Jean smiled in satisfaction. In spite of that, she continued to stare at him without moving until suddenly, a drop of tear formed in her eye. What, why are you crying? Did I do something wrong? No, it's not that just. I'm just thankful. Instead of saying these words, USA Young took one big step forward and tightly hugged him. Um. The human form Kim S.A.E. Jean experienced confusion at this sudden, unexpected, and abrupt skinship. And his response to this situation while suffering through the confusion, came out from his instincts. He gently wrapped his arms around her waist and embraced her even tighter. And so, their embrace continued on until S.A.E. Jean somehow could recover his senses. Chapter, 71 Inside a country house located in the rural Giala province, the location shoot for a certain entertainment program was taking place. The program was called Knight's Country House, considered as the hottest among the rampantly expanding number of Knight's-related shows currently. The concept of the show was as the title suggested. Nine Knights would reside in a house located in the monster-free area of Giala while performing missions and games planned out by the producers, as well as cooking their own meals and have honest chat together. At first, the idea might sound rather plain, but by having nine people with strong personalities, many entertaining situations were captured on film. For example, as eight out of the nine participants here were groomed to become knights from very early ages, only one knew how to cook rice properly, so naturally, chaos ensued whenever it was meal time. Among these colorful characters, the one with most amount of fans were, of course, USA Young. Although she maintained an indifferent expression most of the time, the dazzling smile brighter than the sun itself that sometimes leaked out made her such a charming woman on screen. It truly wasn't an exaggeration to say that this program was instrumental in her official fan club being established. So, in a way, USA Young had greatly benefited from this show, as well as being its most important contributor. It's been too long, S.A.E. Young this Uni thought she was going crazy from wanting to see you. T.L., Puni is the female equivalent of Appa. Even though we saw each other two weeks ago. The filming of the episodes took place every fortnight, for the period of four days and three nights, and so, it somehow did feel like it had been ages since all nine of them could sit down in one room together. They had gathered in the living room while sharing greetings among each other, and then waited for the producer to give them a new challenge. Wowzers, S.A. Young. What is that necklace? While they were waiting, a female knight named Kim Huisu pointed at S.A.E. Young's necklace and asked. Yeah, yes. What? Although she was expecting it but now that the question was finally here, S.A.E. Young couldn't help but feel quite nervous. She did have an excuse called indirect advertisement, but well, this necklace was the very first gift that man had given her, after all. Humph. Did a boyfriend buy it for you? A male knight sitting on a couch while putting on a serious air spat out while looking dissatisfied. He was Son Chuljun, a high-tier knight from the Goryeo Knights Order and supposedly, having a romantic interest in USAE Young. Although the said interest was nothing more than SAE Young who couldn't cook to save herself, utilizing his skills a bit but since they looked good together on screen. The producers, the writers, and the viewing public came up with their own narratives all on their own. Wow, is it true? OMG, a really big event broke out before the filming even began. The filming started already, though. Anyhow, S.A.E. Young, did a boyfriend really give you this as a present? 
No, no, did S.A.E. Young have a boyfriend before? Wow, Chul Jun Appa is so screwed now. Right away, all nine knights began yapping away, with Yu S.A.E. Young's necklace being the focal point. This was the charm of this particular show, where the scenes of chaotic yammering would often fill the airwaves. And, no, it's not like that. In the end, USAE Young had to shout out and only then, the sounds of their conversations died down. USAE Young's face reddened as if it might burst open from all the attention poured onto her by her co-stars and the film crew, which numbered around 60 people. If this was her normally, then she would have assumed the same cold indifferent attitude and end this fiasco right there, but since it was related to Kim S.A.E. Jean, she couldn't maintain a calm facade at all. Well, it is a present, that's true. But it's not from a boyfriend, is that what you're saying? Son Chuljun chuckled lightly and for some unknown reason, slicked back his hair. Too bad for him, USAE Young didn't reply. Honestly speaking, she had never been in a romantic relationship before, and maybe because of that lack of experience, she was getting quite conscious of Kim S.A.E. Jean's presence, which was unlike her. They did embrace, sure, but since he didn't say it out aloud, it seemed certain that they were not an item. But what if he doesn't like it, if she declared that fact right here? What the, so, it's true. Son Chul Jun momentarily lost his composure. Regardless, USAE Young didn't open her mouth for a long time, until. Not from a boyfriend, but it's a gift and a sponsorship deal at the same time. In the end, she denied it. As soon as Son Chul Jun let out a sigh of relief, this time the female knights jumped on her like a pack of hungry animals. Even though they were knights, well, they were also women as well. The ladies began asking about the necklace, such as where did she buy it, how much was it, was that ruby real, etc., etc. Well, everyone, please calm yourselves. We're filming for real now. Only when the producer stepped up did the noisy hullabaloo come to an end. But the signs are good. There was a huge grin plastered on the producer's face. It was understandable, as a potential gold mine had been unearthed only after the cameras began rolling for less than 30 minutes. On top of that, the rare sight of USA Young being so shy was wonderful enough to make him want to embrace her himself. No, 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 that's not it. The producer quickly shook his head and then displayed a board with the participants' mission written on it. Well, you guys must be feeling peckish by now. Why don't we have something to eat first? An afternoon with the sun blazing down. Seven nights left on the mission, or the collection of ingredients, for their food. Meanwhile, USAE Young stayed behind to learn how to cook from Son Chul Jun. Even though it was called how to cook, with no ingredients to practice, she was just cooking rice for now. But SAE Young was paying 110% attention to what Son Chul Jun was saying. Before, she only pretended to learn as there were cameras filming her, but from some time ago no, more correctly, that moment with Kim S.A.E. Jean, changed her thought process greatly. Thinking about the appearance of S.A.E. Jean enjoying her cooking just imagining that alone made her happy. Is this enough? U.S.A.E. Young pointed at the pot filled with rice while carrying a needlessly determined expression. Yeah. There's just enough water and it looks good. Seeing her adorable appearance, Son Chul Jun chuckled slightly and reached out to pat her head. However, the speed of USAE Young's reaction was incredible, and his hand ended up dancing in the empty air. Kiam. Oh, a mosquito. Getting embarrassed now, Son Chul Jun waved his hand around twice more as if there really was an insect there or something. Let's make the soup next. I'll buy you something more expensive later on. During the break between the filming, Son Chul Jun suddenly pointed at USAE Young's necklace and laid on a thick smile. Excuse me. I meant that thing. Discussing about buying something expensive to a third generation chable was the strangest thing as she could buy anything she wanted but for the sake of maintaining a certain public image. In the interview she always said that she lived frugally while being given an allowance. So, the misunderstanding of Son Chul Jun was, well, understandable. You mean, something more expensive than this? USAE Young looked at him with a slightly disbelieving face. Maybe this situation came about because the artifacts from the monster hadn't been unveiled to the world yet. USAE Young found Chul Jun's attitude of looking down on the gift necklace rather disagreeable, 
but he remained ever so confident. Obviously. I know that the true value of a gift isn't judged solely by its price, but I can tell there will be much more prettier necklaces for you out there. With a slightly strange expression, USA Young stared at him for a while, before. You probably need to bring out a pink diamond if you want to top this necklace's value. She muttered out softly. Unfortunately, as he was too deeply appreciating the depth of his own comment, he didn't get to hear what she said. Ahem. Um, did you say something? No, not really. While USA Young was learning how to cook for Kim SAE Jean, the man himself was training hard in the underground members only training facility below the society's headquarters. Wow, what is this? But SAE Jean wasn't alone in the facility. That was because the Knight Order that was chosen to partner up with the monster, the Raven Order, had sent a knight to aid him in his training. Mr. SAE Jean, your physical abilities are pretty good. And the knight assigned for this task, E. Hai Rin, was busy praising him. E. Hai Rin was second only to Kim Yu Rin in the looks department within the Raven Order, and thanks to her sociable personality, she was far more active than Yu Rin in the entertainment industry. And since SAE Jean's only habit was watching TV, he obviously knew who she was. Besides that, she was also one of the people who received the orc's weapon as well. If you rate me with the knight standards, where do you reckon I am? Hmm, maybe maybe a low mid-tier. I think it might be around there. The reason why the raven had sent E. Hyrin out of all the knights in their order was, of course, the famed honey trap. After all, Kim Sae Jean was a man, wasn't he? Ah. Is that so? At her words, Sae Jean felt incredibly dejected. He didn't strengthen his body via spiritualization. So, this meant that the human Kim Sae Jean's stats had reached the level of a low mid-tier knight. That was certainly enough to feel proud about, but... It's still too much for me to step forward, yet. But it was still not enough for him to fight vampires in his human form. What the, why are you so disappointed? Even this is something amazing, you know. E. Hai Rin still sufficiently praised the downtrodden Kim Sae Jean. However, instead of such a courteous encouragement, what he wanted was a proper training regime. Shall we move on to next part of the training? Is it weapon mastery next? Ah, uh, yes. Let's do that. Hurry, hurry. After determining his physical limits, it was the turn of weapons-related martial arts training. The orc special passive, the weapon mastery applied here. The skills level was so high that, now he could theoretically wield any type of weapon better than a high-level user. What should we use first Eni, Mini, Miney, Mo? E. Hyrin nimbly trotted towards the display cabinet for the weapons and picked up two long swords, of which she gave one to Sae Jean. First, a sword. It's the most popular weapon, too. Since it's so straight, it's easy to cover it in mana's aura, and it is also the easiest for the beginners to learn how to wield as well. But there are so, so many different types of swords out there. So, the swords we are going to use today is called a long sword. E. Hai Rin really talked a lot while always smiling brightly. At first, Sae Jean got slightly irritated, thinking whether her personality was really that positive all the time or not, but. Like this, swoosh, swish. How about it, can't even see an afterimage, right? The more he watched her, he couldn't help but smile as well. He sort of understood why she was more famous as an entertainer and not as a knight. Ah, uh, by any chance, have you learned how to handle a sword before? E. Hai Rin asked in a surprised voice when Sae Jean unsheathed the sword in an expert manner. No, not at all. Besides some things I got used to while hunting, I haven't received any real training. Oh so that's how it is. She took the sparring stance while slightly tensing up. Well then, should I start the skill test? Please do. By the way, you don't have to take it easy on me. When he lightly swung the sword in order to loosen up his wrist, the afterimage of the blade wavered and danced about in the air like a snake. Um you really didn't learn any swordsmanship. His appearance simply couldn't be called normal, so she quickly asked him again. No, I haven't. But I might possess some modicum of talent, you see. At his vague reply, E. Hyrin's expression became a bit worried. 
In reality, she became an upper mid-tier knight relying on her trait and abundance of mana, rather than her skills with a sword she was one of those knights commonly referred to as a trait baby. Because she was the type who enjoyed living her life, E. Hyrin didn't pay too much attention on polishing up her swordsmanship which required her to repeatedly perform the same action over and over again. Of course, her talents with the sword were still excellent enough to be on the level of a mid-tier knight, but we shouldn't use mana or traits, right? Of course. I can't utilize mana, after all. Kim Sae Jin pointed his sword at E. Hyrin. The edge of the blade gleamed sharply. Ready? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Please, see, come. Hyrin gulped down her saliva and corrected her posture. Sae Jean dashed forward without much fanfare. This would be his first time fighting a knight as a human. So, he wasn't too sure how to proceed with the fight. Instead, he chose to leave everything to his instincts. Arriving at Hyrin's position, he lowered his stance in a blink and slashed upwards. She hurriedly tilted her sword to block the attack, but realized the force behind it was nothing to laugh about. She had blocked just one hit, yet the hands gripping the sword were aching already. But there was no time to remain stunned. Sae Jean continuously slashed with his sword. Ferocious and aggressive, his swordsmanship was something that would not be found in any of the textbooks. Quang, Quang. Each time she blocked his blows, sounds similar to when bombs went off, resounded out. Hyrin just could not believe that there was no mana involved in his strikes. Eu, Yua. Hey, wait. I surrender, I surrender. Their sparring didn't last for long. She couldn't endure the immense power contained with the diagonal downward slash of Sae Jean and lost the grip on her sword. Ouch. With a sorry-looking demeanor, E. Hyrin crouched down on the floor and massaged her hands that had a slight trace of blood. Ha! Huh. I won. Sae Jean dazedly muttered out. And his words ended up poking Yi Hyrin's pride as a knight. She gritted her teeth and stood up. It's because this isn't the weapon I use usually. Hey, excuse me, Sae Jean SSI, you really didn't receive any training before. Already, the honorifics she used had changed from Sae Jean Nim to Sae Jean SSI. TL, oh boy. I deliberately avoided TLing this particular honorific scheme of Korean language, but here it is. Basically, a Nim is comparable to Sama in Jap novels, while a SSI is kinda like San. So, she stopped calling him Sae Jean Sama and started calling him Sae Jean San, which is slightly less respectful. No, I really haven't. So, should we stop the training here for today? What do you mean, stop? We still have lots of weapons to go through, you know. E. Hyrin smiled forcefully and pointed at the various weapons stored inside the display cabinet. She figured that Sae Jean only possessed some talent in wielding swords so, while puffing out hot air through her nostrils, she picked up a spear. A long sword doesn't really suit my style. Now, I shall demonstrate spear arts. Hyrin confidently declared. And then, she lost exactly seven times in a row. But what mattered the most was that the last sparring was done with her main weapon, a thin-bladed two-handed saber. Unfortunately, she still tasted defeat, and with her pride trampled on, she ran off back to her home in tears. How is the progress? I'm working hard already, so stop pestering me. Yubeksong's terse voice could be heard from the phone's receiver. No, no. I'm not pestering you. Just that, I'd like to let you know that in case you need any assistance or manpower, do not hesitate and ask me. I'm sure you've heard of this already, but I am currently establishing a mercenary compa. Don't need it. I'm hanging up. Ah, uh, wait a second. Yubeksong was really cold towards him. It was truly a mysterious thing, the way she acted. After all, she couldn't even resist him when they meet, but over the phone, she was like an untamed cat or some such. There is something else as well. So, what is it? But seeing that she didn't end the call first, there must have been some lingering aftereffects remaining. The Leakin said that, there's a suspicious hotel. This was the information given to him by Kim Yusong. But Sae Jean made it so now that it was coming from the Leakin, 
all in order to hide that man's trait. Which hotel? Not sure. It was just a hotel. Are you making fun of me right now? There was a trace of anger in Yu Beksong's voice. Kim Sae Jin ended up carrying a thin smile, while thinking that she was like an angry cat or something. I'm not joking. Are you not taking the leakin seriously now? No, that isn't it. However, he can't just say it's a hotel. Is he trying to say we must investigate every hotel in the country? I know, but still, please try your best. I want to help, but as it's still early days for my Merck company, I too lack the necessary manpower. No, that's... Fool. Yu Beksong spat out a long sigh, and unwillingly replied that she'd do it. Chapter, 72 He was back, once more, on the monster field. And Kim Sae Jin was pouring in an incredible amount of power to smash down on the head of a saber-toothed tiger with his mace. Kwa Hang. That stupendously powerful strike created a loud noise as it caved in the skull of the tiger that was supposedly harder than that of a diamond. SFX for a beastly growl. The saber-toothed tiger continued to threaten Sae Jin by swinging its claws around with its head caved in, but that was only for a brief moment. The creature began to stumble around like a drunken butterfly before collapsing on the ground. Sae Jin walked towards it, pulled the fangs out and pocketed them, before absorbing its heart. Active skill, saber-toothed tiger's energy, skill proficiency level, F. Instantly recover spent stamina and mana. However, the recovered stamina and mana will dissipate 10 minutes later and the caster will return to his original condition. As the result he got from that final bit was quite satisfactory, Sae Jean decided to head back home. But, when he turned around, the sights of two orc jaguars busy sending their sparkling gazes towards him filled up his view. Quor. Sae Jean screamed out after getting a fright of his life thanks to that grotesque scene before him. It was a simple scream, for sure. However, there was a slight issue with the monster form he was currently using. The saber-toothed tiger was too strong a predator for the ebony werewolf form to take on, so he had no choice but to assume the orc great warrior instead. Maybe that was to blame for what happened next. His scream became a powerful roar louder than a thunderclap that reverberated the entire mountainside. Guwu, guwu. The orc jaguars in front of him quickly began prostrating. And they continued to repeat that same action of bowing their heads before him. What the? Heck is this situation? Sae Jean stared at these two weird orcs for a long time. Ah. Maybe. Then a light bulb went off in his head. He came up with a theory that could definitely explain away this strange situation. Orcs possessed this characteristics of wanting to submit to the stronger orc than themselves. If viewed from that point, then Sae Jean was definitely the most powerful orc in the monster field that could easily make other orcs grovel before him. Additionally, didn't he defeat the saber-toothed tiger that was threatening the lives of these two, just now? Of course, it was the possibility of acquiring a skill that blinded him, but still. What happened was enough for these orcs to fall. For him pretty hard. I get it now, so go away. Accepting this explanation, Sae Jean gestured with his hand to send the orcs away, then tried to go on his own way. However, the two orc jaguars continued to follow Sae Jean around. And whenever he glanced back at them, their sparkling eyes never stopped gazing back. That carried on for another twenty minutes. They do look kinda pitiful. Maybe because he was in the orc form, he began to feel sorry for these two orcs one a dude, the other probably a girl following him. Judging by their armaments, they must have come from a village located around the mid-tier hunting ground but, most likely, when the earth was overturned, they ended up losing their home village. Also, in the current monster field where the monsters of all tiers were mixed up chaotically, the chances of a small group of orcs surviving for long was really low enough to say that it was a miracle these two had survived for this long. Kim Sae Jin let out a low sigh and looked up at the sky above. The sun had already buried itself deep into the creeping darkness. It couldn't be helped weren't the hours getting too late for him to look after these two orcs. He lowered his gaze towards the following orcs. A few. When he took a closer look, their faces looked rather friendly. Hell, he even thought they kind of looked adorable, too. 
not even himself knew why he thought their horrid faces looked adorable, though. They could be of some help in the future if I nurture them. Finally, S.A.E. Jean made a decision. After all, if he was in a monster form and not a human, then the thing he had the most to waste was time, anyway. Come with me. He growled lowly and led the two orcs away while searching for the location to set up a brand new orc village. He found a spot with an impressively steep cliff to the rear, which should help with the defenses, and a stream of fresh water not too far. S.A.E. Jean chose to build his village in this blessed piece of land. But before that, there was a need to perform a certain imprinting work on these orcs. Watch carefully. S.A.E. Jean made the two orcs stand before him and showed them his various forms first, the human, then the goblin, and finally, the werewolf. He deliberately left out Athony, though. You hern. Whenever S.A.E. Jean changed his forms, the orc's eyes went round in pure shock, but thanks to various skills he possessed, such as the predator, and his scent, they didn't try to attack, simply choosing to obey him. And that's how he completed the so-called imprinting work, dot. Next, while using the orc smithing technique, he began a huge scale construction work. Now that his proficiency level was at B- the job turned into a stunningly simple and efficient affair. By changing the characteristics of the soil, he made wooden fences tougher than reinforced steel rise up in specified locations. Then, on these fences, he added an attribute called damage reflection. This way, monsters trying to attack the fencing would die from their own attacks all the while failing to figure they were wounding themselves. And seven hours later, the new orcs village was completed as the morning sun began brightening up the horizon. They should be able to repopulate this place by themselves, right? S.A.E. Jean heard that, whenever orcs got excited, they would mate and produce as many as ten offsprings a month. T.L. W.T.F. Really? They are more like a bunch of roaches, then. There might be some danger of incest happening in the future, what with only two orcs starting a village, but since these creatures didn't really care for such details, there was not much he could do on that count. Somehow, everything is finished. The sweat from this unexpected labor sure felt refreshing to him. He took a long look at the two dazed orcs over there and prepared to take his leave. Oh, right. Before that. He had nearly forgotten this important step. He approached the two orcs, placed his hands on their shoulders and sent in his thought orders to them. The contents were roughly the same as the ones he gave to Muffin in the past. Humans are your friends. If you find humans in danger, help them. If they threaten your life, then fight them but don't kill them. And make sure to educate your children well. Since it would be troublesome when these orcs start fighting humans when S.A.E. Jean needed them later on down the line, he deeply embedded the guidelines of not harming humans in these orcs. Of course, vampires weren't included in that category of humans. Finishing up the insemination of those thought orders deep inside the orcs, S.A.E. Jean moved his feet to leave. However, something kept on tugging at his mind and his feet wouldn't move easily. It felt like that, by just making a village and telling them to survive all on their own, they would simply get themselves killed, probably as soon as tomorrow or some such. S.A.E. Jean ended up turning back. He spent another hour fixing up the useless weapons of the orcs up to the level of branded goods, and then, by using up his own blood, inscribed several magic tattoos on their bodies as well. Not only the tattoos that increased their physical strength and agility, but the leviathan scales as well, in order to show that these orcs were subordinates of the hero orc. Of course, instead of actual scales, the orc's skins turned slightly blue as the skill's effects were greatly curtailed during the process of imbuing. But still, since these orcs were blue in color, people might deduce correctly that they may have some relation to the hero orc. Meaning, they would attack these orcs less. Now that I've done this much for you, grow up quickly and become my aid in the future. This was his final thought order. Kim S.A.E. Jean left behind the two orcs who were on the brink of shedding tears of admiration and moved his unwilling feet. A week passed by since the day of him forming an unlikely connection with the two orcs. A day before the scheduled broadcast of the TV show USA Young filmed, The Knight's Country House, S.A.E. Jean officially opened the shop monster artifact built within the grounds of the society. T.L., the author wrote the name of the shop in English. Although the number of items displayed for sale was only eight, 
each one of them had an incredible price tag. The cheapest of them all, a hairpin, cost a cool 9 million US. As expected, no one paid attention on the day the shop opened its doors. But after the TV show aired, the explosive reaction was enough to surprise the IT department tasked to maintaining the society's home webpage. However, those people inquiring about the necklace USAE Young was wearing could only back off in utter shock after confirming the pricing. Of course, Son Chul Jun was also among these people. He thought that the necklace USAE Young wore couldn't have cost more than a few thousand dollars, or maybe even a couple of ten thousands but then, on it. The Soul of a Warrior Currently unavailable 15 billion KRWTL, that's in Korean currency. Yes, it seems like it's a lot in US dollars, it's 13. 682 million. There was this enormous price tag attached to the necklace. Initially, many people complained when these enormous prices were revealed, but when Kim Sae Jin disclosed the extraordinary effects each item possessed, they all shut their mouths real fast. Then, it was the turn of the knights and wizards to rush in. More than 100 knights and wizards came to the shop and had to receive tickets with the waiting number printed on it, all because the artifacts of the monster could only be viewed by making a reservation as well as purchasing only on site. So, how was it? After two days of storm had passed, USAE Young came to see him in the chairman's office while carrying a triumphant air. Oh my, you've arrived, SAE Young. S.A.E. Jean gently stroked her head. She really enjoyed his touches that were full of affection. You're not gonna avoid me. But you did that to Son Chul Jun, though. After seeing her enjoy his touch like a little puppy, he suddenly remembered the scene where she was learning how to cook with Son Chul Jun. It was one of the most memorable scenes in the whole show, after all. U.S.A.E. Young's indifferent attitude, which contrasted so much when she was with S.A.E. Jean, and the sorry sight of Son Chul Jun busy chasing away imaginary mosquitoes. Obviously Appa is completely different from that Ajusi Ah, right? And Appa, TL, Ajusi an old man, an uncle, etc. USAE Young hurriedly rummaged through her bag, then pulled out an envelope, which she handed over to SAE Jean. Mm. -hmm. What is it? She grinned brightly. An invitation to my coming of age ceremony. S.A.E. Jean tilted his head at her unexpected reply. Most regular people wouldn't hold one of these ceremonies, and even if they did, it would be on the days of their birth, at least that's what he'd heard of. Isn't your birthday 20th of April? U.S.A.E. Young's birthday was still a half year away. S.A.E. Jean spoke with that fact in mind, but she had this face of someone who was deeply moved. You. You knew. Oh, yeah. Kind of. Actually, it was mentioned on a TV show he watched yesterday. But he wasn't going to mention that and break the nice little atmosphere that was forming here. Besides that, there's still a half year left, so why are you giving me one so early? Ah well, that is, I've decided to do the ceremony on the 1st of January. Originally, it was scheduled for my birthday but I wanted it done earlier, so I begged my dad. Whatever, you must come, okay? USAE Young grabbed his hands with a determined expression. It was a skinship that occurred naturally, but as the time passed, her face got redder and redder. Got it. Just before her face got red enough to burst open, SAE Jean carefully extracted his hands and pocketed the invitation. Ah, right. Did you choose the new members for the society? USAE Young. Yeah. I just need to announce it. The people S.A.E. Jean had picked were only two, Kim Yusong's son and Yi Hai Rin. It wasn't his intention, but as he was only trying to pick the right type of people, the elimination rate ended up being a rather cruel 2000 to 1. Who are they? Please tell me. U.S.A.E. Young rubbed her shoulders against S.A.E. Jean's body and began flirting with him. Since it wasn't a secret to begin with, he honestly told her. Miss Yi Hai Rin the night. U.S.A.E. Young. Yeah. You also know her, right? Suddenly, USAE Young's face froze in icy expression. But when SAE Jean spoke in a tone indicating his belief of Hyrin being the right fit for the society, she did her best to force out a smile. Ah yeah. I know who she is. It's fine, I guess. She's got good abilities, so a good choice. 
she suppressed the bitter taste rising up from her chest really hard. Her mind was uneasy, but if she showed off a strange behavior in front of S.A.E. Jean, then he might see her as a small-minded person. You think so too? Unfortunately, S.A.E. Jean was smiling relaxedly, completely unaware of her real feelings. 27th of October The monster finally announced the successful applicants to its membership recruitment, and right away, the whole world seemed to boil over simultaneously. And towards the new member's direction, undivided attention of the public poured in like a hailstorm. It was fine for E. Hyrin who was used to public's attention, but for Kim Sun Ho, the son of Kim Yu Son, things were quite different. Since he retired from being a knight and changed his job to that of a mercenary, reporters went after his story like crazy in the end. He had to temporarily take residence on the night duty room of the society's headquarters which prohibited the entry of outsiders. Wow! This is so big. Mr. Chairman, please take a look. A certain afternoon on a weekend, while the media frenzy was still ongoing outside. As the group finished up training and were enjoying a meal together at the cafeteria within the HQ, E. Hyrin raised a fuss and placed her mobile phone on the dining table. Hey, Ju Ji Hyuk, you too. E. Hyrin. What is it now? Ju Ji Hyuk, who was sitting next to E. Hyrin, turned his gaze towards the projected images from the phone while his face reddened for some reason. For mid tier knights were in the middle of investigating the changes to the land, and found themselves surrounded by monsters and in real danger. But then, two blue skinned orcs jumped out of nowhere and helped the knights to defeat the monsters. And after the battle concluded, these orcs even gave the knights some drinking water and then disappeared to somewhere. So, the protagonists of this footage were those two blue orcs. Ha! Huh. Every scene he just saw was enough to almost make S.A.E. Jean spit out the food in his mouth. Wasn't that so mysterious? This footage is doing the rounds in my Raven Orders community chat rooms, saying they were the hero orcs fellow tribe mates. For now, this story's being buried under the society's member recruitment news, but soon, don't you think it's going to cause a huge stir later on? Seeing the smiling face of the totally oblivious E. Hyrin, S.A.E. Jean could just barely nod his head in agreement. Chapter, 73 If Miss Kim Yurin joins our society, then, well I may end up reviewing the case with a far more open mind. Inside the newly constructed office of the chairman of the monster, located in their central headquarters. S.A.E. Jean was having a business-related meeting with Kim Yurin. That is I'd also love to join you. But I am unable to stay as long as the duration you have put forward. I believe that it will be better to not cause an inconvenience by breaking the rule of ten years or longer. Dot. That is why I ask of your gracious understanding on this matter. Yurin came over to speak to him personally regarding two business matters this day. One was to find out the current state of things regarding the Athene doll version 2. Zero, which, under the pretext of checking out the technical capabilities of the potential buyers, still hadn't found a home yet. The other was to purchase a certain artifact now available in the society's new artifact store. The artifact in question was an obsidian bracelet called Wolf's Claws. In addition to enhancing the overall power of its wearer, this mysterious artifact had an on-off hidden function that, when activated, would transform into a gauntlet that covered the entire hand. As its name suggested, it was truly an item that morphed into the so-called Wolf's Claws. Although this artifact had a seemingly ridiculous price tag of over 17 million US, in truth, it was not as expensive as one might think since an artifact designed for combat would be rotated among the knights through a hiring system. Plus, with its already proven effects of enhancing the wearer's strength and endurance by nearly 30%, as well as the warranty period of 30 years added on top. It was not an exaggeration to say the price was on the low side if one considered the guaranteed profit made with it not to mention the protection offered by equipping this bracelet as well. In that case, I guess it can't be helped, but but please, do consider it some more. Our doors will always remain open for you. He licked his lips at this missed opportunity. S.A.E. Jean had this one more plan he wanted to carry out. And that plan was to buy a bit more land near the monster field in Kongwan province to expand the boundaries of his society and then, form a knight's order of his own which would fall under the jurisdiction of the society. Of course, this idea didn't come out of S.A.E. Jean's head but it was the planning department that suggested it instead. 
Even though the initial costs involved with the recruitment of manpower, construction of the premises and lobbying the relevant government entities would run into hundreds of millions of dollars. Not to mention another tens of millions for the annual operating budget alone, SAE Gene still wanted to pursue this idea to the fullest. Um then, is our meeting over? When Kim Yurin cautiously inquired, SAE Jean indifferently replied back. Her eye reads began to tremble. All she got in reply from him regarding the Athony doll version 2. Zero was I'll think about it. Not only she couldn't get a definite confirmation, this couldn't even be called a positive understanding between them. But still, that didn't mean she could just join his society now. Perhaps it's time for you to return. Actually, SAE Jean was aiming precisely for this moment. Even if Kim Yurin joined his society, the chance of her becoming the order master of his knight's order was slimmer than slim. But even with that, she was still the kind of knight he'd want to have working for him. I, I still have something else to say. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin hurriedly shouted out when she saw SAE Jean stand up from his seat to seemingly show her way out. He sat back down on his seat for the time being. What would you like to discuss? I've heard that the monster has recently started an entertainment company as well. Yes, that is correct. About a month ago, at the behest of the planning department, SAE Gene began pursuing a new revenue model the so-called talent management company. The planning department strongly suggested for this business venture, as the current members of the society, besides USAE Young and E. Hyrin, were already huge attention drawers themselves. On top of that, he could use the equipment provided as a bait to make other knights join the company, too. And only after a month of operation, the monster entertainment was going from strength to strength. There was no point in mentioning the two that were practically top stars to begin with USAE Young and E. Hyrin it was now at the point where the famous celebrities, after being attracted by the halo of the monster, were inquiring about signing a contract with SAE Jean's company. I, Kim Yurin, would like to sign up with your company. Oh. Is that so? Yurin made this decision with quite a difficulty, yet SAE Jean's reaction was lukewarm at best. At that moment, she briefly wondered whether her worth had become insignificant all of a sudden. By the way, you should inquire with the related department's head, instead of me, you know. Kim SAE Jean. Eh. No, that's not well, I, uh, my appearance fee is 27,000 US, per episode. Ah, uh, really? Miss S.A.E. Young's is around 23,000, actually. It's pretty close. With a sneaky smile on his face, S.A.E. Jean provoked Yurin. Is, is that right? Only a 4,000 difference uh, however, I have not done much broadcasting work, that is why. So, if you allow me to sign up, then I give you my promise that I will work extra hard and widen the gap between me and Miss S.A.E. Young. And so, she bit the bait rather beautifully. The beginning of December, with the first snow still waiting to fall. As soon as the Monsters Society ranking rose up from B to B when the success of its various business ventures were publicly acknowledged, suddenly from seemingly everywhere, several hostile attempts to keep its growth in check came forth. Petty schemes such as endlessly delaying the issuing of business permits while nitpicking over nothing. Issuing fines that ran up to millions of dollars on the grounds of not following the environmental protection laws, and even spreading false rumors of him speculating on real estate prices. Judging by the current circumstances, we strongly suspect that several large corporations and trilogy have joined hands together, but we cannot be 100% certain. Joe Hansung. And so, SAE Gene ended up creating a dedicated response team. Somehow, he had developed a personality where he could not stand back and accept defeats. Really? I understand. For now, let us wait until we can find more concrete evidence. But since getting angry was akin to admitting that he had lost, SAE Gene maintained as much level-headedness as humanly possible. But you're certain that Trilogy is involved? Yes, sir. There is evidence of one of that society's directors lobbying the related parties. It was most likely that Trilogy didn't care for one bit about their stronghold on the top spot of South Korea's society rankings being threatened by anyone. It was almost understandable as the mass media that loved to pit others for a juicy fight was already comparing the histories of both Trilogy and the monster side by side so there was that. 
But still, what that society had done was quite a dirty and cheap trick. Oh, and Mr. Chairman, should we submit our guild registration as well? Yes, of course. A guild. A law proposed half a year ago had went into effect just last week, finally establishing the concept of guilds officially in the Republic of Korea. In the layman's terms, a guild was the evolved form of a society. A society with a class higher than B was given the chance to advance to a guild, and after going through three months of complicated testing procedures and proving it can become a guild without an issue, it would be officially recognized as one. The first world countries in Western Europe, the United States as well as many other nations had already adopted this system, but Korea was only implementing it now due to several overlapping reasons. In actual truth, the monster's contribution in getting this law enacted belatedly in Korea was great. The backstory surrounding this law was like this. The Dawn Dynasty, which did not enjoy an amiable relationship with Trilogy for some reason, spent an exorbitant amount of money lobbying against the guild system. The Dawn had already found Trilogy threatening, yet with the implementation of this system, they knew their enemy's influence would only strengthen further. It was then, a new society co-founded by USA Young called the Monster entered into the fray like a new star, which meant that it would be friendly towards the Dawn's interests. And so, the Dawn decided to divert the enormous lobbying funds to support the development of the monster that would become the Dark Horse to oppose Trilogy. The disappearance of the Dawn's lobbying efforts meant that the Guild Law ended up smoothly passing with little trouble. Obviously, there was no guarantee that the monster would be able to become a Guild just because the law came into effect. First of all, Many high-ranking directors of the corporations unfriendly towards the Dawn were members of Trilogy as well, so it was likely that they would resort to even nastier and dirtier schemes from now on. And by the way, sir. There is one more item still left on the agenda. Another one? Who are our people must be getting really busy nowadays, I'm guessing. The continuing parade of reports that lasted nearly three hours so far Kim Sae Jean rubbed his head which was getting dizzy from mental fatigue. The administrative work for the society had increased by that much. The number of employees now easily exceeded three digits after he repeatedly hired new people due to the shortage of manpower. Three new departments were established, with each department now having on an average 23 employees, for times the size compared to only three months ago. The annual budget set aside just for salaries was almost 20 million, but just like he promised to himself, Kim Sae Jean was not stingy when it came to spending on people. The fact of his employees being treated well naturally spread around and so, when one of those rare opportunities to get hired by the monster came around. CVs sent in by those working in the prominent local companies as well as famous overseas corporations could be found every now and then. Ha! <laughs> it is quite all right, sir. The individually assigned sleeping quarters are better than some regular houses, so it's not much of a problem to pull an all-nighter for us. It can't be helped under the current circumstances as there are just too much work to go through, but as soon as things quieten down, please make sure to go home at the correct time, please. Yes, sir. I understand. And now, we need your decision on the technical departments. Joe Hansung continued on with his report. Appa, what are you thinking about now? SAE Jean was currently with USAE Young in a restaurant. Although the work was tough and he still felt dizzy, but he just couldn't ignore the sad light in her eyes. Ah. You were thinking of Miss Kim Yurin, right? I heard you had a meeting with her yesterday. As if her jealousy was kicking in again, USA Young's lips pouted and her eyes narrowed to a slit. That's not true at all. It's just that I'm kinda tired today. As he had spent four hours out of seven he could stay as a human purely listening to reports, reading many documents and making decisions, it was understandable he would be exhausted by now. Are you going home right away, even today? Yeah. My bad. And I'm still forever barred from going to Appa's place. That's par for the course, you know. You haven't even graduated from a high school yet, but you want to go to a house of a man who lives alone. With a deeply sulking expression, USA Young began roughly chewing on the steak. Chomp, chomp. She resembled an angry puppy for some reason, so she didn't look all that threatening to him. Ah. I just remembered. Appa, would you like to come to my graduation ceremony? Even though they had agreed to address each other informally, 
she had this strange habit of using honorifics whenever she asked him for a favor. Mm. -hmm. Isn't it usually the family members attending such things? USA Young smiled sadly at his question. He then quickly realized his mistake. If her family was going, then she'd not have the reason to invite him in the first place. My dad's too busy, my grandpa is also busy because it's the year end, my divorced mom's whereabouts are unknown, and since I'm the only child, I don't have any siblings, you see. That's why there is no one to show up, except for you, Appa. She seemed calm, but S.A.E. Jean couldn't say anything after detecting a hint of sadness hidden in her voice. Will you come? There was no need to delay his answer. As soon as he nodded his head. Thank you. U.S.A.E. Young looked into his eyes and smiled bravely. But S.A.E. Jean thought that smile looked lonely as well. That is why, he shifted his hand resting on top of the table and quietly held hers. Hell yeah. Meanwhile, she was inwardly shouting out in happiness. There was indeed someone who could come to her graduation ceremony, the butler, Park Yano. However, he would not be able to make it anymore. I'm thankful for everything you've done for me. Kim S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean and U.S.A.E. Young smiled as they looked at each other. You're really thankful. U.S.A.E. Young. It was a question with a hidden meaning. When S.A.E. Jean tilted his head in confusion, U.S.A.E. Young sneakily approached his front. And then, not even giving him a chance to say no, she ambushed him with a tight embrace. What the? It's a farewell hug. They all do in the West, you know. That's why I if you are really thankful, stay like this for a little while longer. U.S.A.E. Young leaned her head on his chest. Her fatigue and worries were all gone, just like that, and her mind became more comfortable. When she was in his arms, fully enjoying his pleasant scent with all her body nothing in this world would be able to make her feel envious. Don't just stand there Appa hug me too. She looked up at him with a gentle eyes. Her affectionate eyes and sincere voice. He wrapped his arms around her waist and pulled her in even tighter. On the following day, S.A.E. Jean secretly summoned the manager of the mercenary company, Kim Yusone. It was to discuss the deployment of 13 mercenaries and 20 intelligence operatives affiliated with his company. Of course, I'll leave the direction of our future to your discretion, Mr. Chairman. Kim yu Son smiled warmly. Currently, the Monster Mercenary Company was being inundated with all the job requests coming in. First of all, there was only one properly organized mercenary company in the entire world which just so happened to be SAE Jean so the fault of overwhelming workload laid with the inevitable obtainment of the title best in the world. Dot. Then, putting the mercenary matters to a side for now, how goes the training of the intelligence operatives? It's going well. They are training hard as we speak in techniques such as putting on disguise, moving in stealth as well as forging identity documents at the Monster Intelligence Agency's underground base constructed under your orders. Calling it the Monster Intelligence Agency sounded a bit embarrassing and all that, but SAE Jean really needed this organization right now. Are they ready to enter real combat situations? The 6 out of the 20, those whom you have identified as agents with rich golden auras are now skilled enough for that purpose. And even though it's nominally a real combat situation, it's still nothing more than searching for the right hotels, sir, so I believe it should be good to give them this opportunity. Forming his own intelligence gathering agency was without a doubt, very illegal, so he had to be extra careful. But still. Understood. Then, for the moment, have those six deployed to the field. Yes, sir. Their aim was to find the hotel where the future ruler of the vampires was hiding in. Hesitation was no longer an option. Chapter, 74 There was only one suite on the top 60th floor of the Kongwan province's most luxurious hotel, Romance of Dawn. Dot. And to stay here even for one single night, an enormous fee was required, meaning this place would forever remain out of reach for the regular folks. T.L., the author wrote the name of the hotel in actual English. But currently, this top floor had transformed into a base camp solely to serve one person. Not just the 60th floor, either the five floors below it, from 55th to 59th, as well. Hundreds of magic traps, detection spells, 
as well as numerous undeads hidden in the shadows were quietly waiting for potential visits from unwelcome intruders. Although everything looked business as usual at a casual glance, it was in a way, a perfectly constructed fortress designed to kill any who dared to intrude. Are all the preparations ready? And the master of this fortress was the possessor of the most noble bloodline, Prorani von Bathory. TL, yeah, me too shrugged shoulders. The last ascendant of the house Bathory which was reputed to be the progenitor of the vampire race, she was also seen as the most likely candidate to become the future empress of the race. On the covertly operating vampire community chat rooms, many lamented that if this Bathory girl was smart, no, if she had an ounce of desire in her to learn something new, then they may have went back home a long time ago. Yes, my lady. The preparations are almost complete. Although a few inferior races tried to delay us, starting from next week, we will be engaging in the expulsion operation right away. This expulsion was the term used for extracting monsters hidden within the portal. Is that so? Very good. Bathory smiled gloomily. Ah. But what is Elwas doing right now? They still have not made any contacts yet. TL. In the not too distant past, during the days of the mass racial extermination, the noble households were targeted the most and only two managed to preserve their bloodlines from that chaos Bathory and El Loss. Of course, the power of the El Loss household was comparably much weaker than that of the Bathory's, and not to mention, their current leader was just a little kid but still, that family wasn't some bad joke that could be safely ignored. First of all, although the Vampire Emperor was a mighty existence that ruled over all of vampires, the thing was, in order to become one, he or she didn't have to be the possessor of the strongest power or the smartest of brains. Those fools had tried to open a portal in the past, but after their efforts had gone down the drain, it looks like they are being mindful of us, we who have achieved success sooner than them, my lady. But if it's not that, then perhaps, since their lord is too young, they may have a fear of being absorbed by us, instead. Hmm. Really? They have become cowards, haven't they? How unfortunate. Why continue on living, if you're going to exist like that? Bathory's chilly question became a mysterious cold aura that embraced the male vampire's body. You you're absolutely correct, my lady. Oh, right. What about those trash? Whenever Bathory thought about those inferior bastards she referred to as trash, the fury she repressed deep down in her heart tried to break free. The abominable remnants that were closer to monsters than to vampires those vile things she'd like to exterminate even before the human race, if possible. Ah those trash have shown no signs of activity after holing themselves up within the sanctuary of late, but that only makes us more concerned, my lady. The trash, also known as Nisferatu. TL, ha. Huh. Really. Their bloodlines possessed excellent abilities but they were still categorized as monsters. And with the history of them betraying their own species in the distant past, Nisferatus were never acknowledged as the vampire's kin that shared the same ancestors. Known to be the most twisted and vile even among the vampire species, these Nisferatus suffered from inferiority complex or from victim mentality and they carried out insidious plots regardless of who their targets were. That was why the majority of vampires believed that the previous racial cleansing happened because the Nisferatus instigated humans to take actions. What supported this notion was the fact that Nisferatus didn't suffer any fallout from the cleansing while countless vampires and their noble bloodlines were killed and now. They had grown to the point where they could legitimately challenge for the position of the vampire emperor. How what are those accursed bastards scheming on now, I wonder. One of those trash as the emperor. What a nonsensical notion that was. Bathory's teeth gritted in fury. Chief Sutert seems to be cooking up some kind of a scheme, my lady, but our spies lack the capabilities to defeat those bastards. All our soldiers could find was the location of their sanctuary and the living conditions inside. Hmm. By the way, you haven't thought of any other plans besides taking them head on, have you? P. Pardon. You didn't, did you? Bathory glared at the man as if he was a pathetic fool. Hey, you. Have you ever heard of a tactic where you don't use your own strength but use another party to destroy your enemies? TL, the author used a Chinese, I guess it's Korean, two idiom called. Couldn't really think of an suitable English alternative to replace it. 
Sorry. When Bathory suddenly brought up a certain four-letter idiom, TL, see above the guy became dazed for a short time. He was thinking, just when did this empty-headed girl who had never even touched a book in her life hit her head and come up an idea like this? What is the meaning of your expression? Are you perchance courting death? No, no that's not it, my lady. This servant does not know the meaning of those words so I was thinking carefully about it, I swear. Bathory's head might be empty but she was supernaturally quick on the uptake, and the guy quickly planted his forehead on the ground to grovel before her. Is that so? In that case, fine. I shall forgive you this time, since you didn't know. She then proceeded to explain the meaning of her words as well as the historical origins of it. Of course, she got over half of it totally wrong, but the guy did not possess the necessary cojones to point that out. So, the thing is, I brought it up because I learned it after watching TV a lot lately. A Bathory watch TV? The guy looked up at her with a slightly moved expression. You know Leakin, right? The BD that goes around poking us with a stick. I heard that he has established his own mercenary company. On top of that, there's a white tiger called Ubexong busy running around here in this country, right? Ah. The guy immediately figured it out. Of course, he could see a lot of holes in this plan, but still, he somehow managed to pull off the expression of how surprised he was at this method's greatness. Instead of causing harm, wouldn't those bastards disappearing at the same time help out with our plans? Pro Rani Von Bathory. An eerie, yet pure grin drew up on Bathory's lips. This servant understands. This servant shall use a pawn to lodge a job request to Leakin for the time being. Very good. You may be dumb, but it's good that your head works fast. Bathory smiled in satisfaction and waved her hand then the man backtracked quickly and disappeared from her sight. On 29th of December, three days before the end of the year. TL, LOL, really, Sherlock. Kim S.A.E. Jean went to speak to Hazeline. A potion or a magic spell to suppress lust? Hazeline. This was his most pressing issue currently. The DN sexual desire that boiled at almost every opportunity, whether it was during training, sparring, speaking to E. Hai Rin, USA Young, or for that matter, any other women. Unfortunately, the goblin's knowledge base did not contain a recipe for such a potion. Probably it was par for the course, since monsters didn't have what one would call reason. Um I haven't heard of anything like that, either Hazeline. Hazeline took a glance at S.A.E. Jean's current appearance and then, carefully pulled her clothes in tighter. When he looked at her as if he couldn't believe what she was doing, Hazeline let out a fake cough. Cum, cum. Is it, uh, difficult to manage currently? That place down there. Yes, it's a little difficult. Oh, if that's the case, I'll search for one. Since you can find all sorts of bizarre potions out there, there might be one like that. Hazeline pulled out a mini laptop. Should I wait? Mm. Nope. You don't have to stick around if you're busy right now. This might take some time, after all. Kim S.A.E. Jean nodded his head and stood up to leave. Finally, the old year has passed and the new year begins. The noises of fireworks and bells loudly spread all around, signaling the beginning of the new year. However, quite unlike the joyous laughters of everyone else, Kim S.A.E. Jean in his ebony wolf form was going through a difficult dilemma at this very moment. The cause was a certain alert window that rose up yesterday when he finished creating yet another dark energy link. All conditions to evolve into the lycanthrope has been satisfied. It's now possible to evolve into the lycanthrope. Warning, a lycanthrope is a human but at the same time, a monster. So if the host chooses to evolve, the human form and the ebony wolf form will merge together. Other monster forms will remain the same. The time available to stay as a human will increase to a minimum of 12 hours once evolved into the lycanthrope. Depending on the numerical value of the stat, energy manipulation, the length of the time available will increase further. The ebony wolf form and the human form merging together that was the same thing as the Kim S.A.E. gene of now disappearing forever. He couldn't make such a decision half-heartedly at all. And he felt quite idiotic for believing that his evolution would solve all of his problems. What a dilemma this was turning out to be. As the time passed, 
The instincts of the orc boiled over more and more, but he couldn't evolve just to solve this issue because, he had no idea what would happen to the human Kim Sae Jin. And even if he did evolve, then the instincts of lycanthrope would become the next headache to overcome. Obviously, the best answer in this situation was to grow the human form Kim Sae Jin until he could contend with the orc great warrior form. Even that was proving problematic due to the boiling instincts of the orc lately, as his base desires threatened to go out of control whenever he moved his body. SFX for a mobile phone ringing. He got distracted from the ever-deepening worries by the sound of the phone ringing. Frowning slightly, he glared at the LCD display. USAE Young. Ah, right. Her coming of age ceremony. He only remembered it now. Ha. He sighed out grandly and answered the phone. Appa, I'm finally an adult. Really? Congrats. USAE Young's voice sounded especially bright on the phone. But with his thought process all messily tangled up, he could only find her slightly bothersome at the moment. Under the Jumgang Mountain. Six o'clock in the evening. Before attending USAE Young's coming of age ceremony, SAE Jean stopped by at the Monsters HQ when Kim Yu Son called him in hurry. That is correct. According to the anonymous tip, an underground base for vampires can be found there. It's not verified yet but an evidence with strong persuasive power was enclosed together with the tip. Mr. Chairman, shall we deploy our agents? Kim Sae Jean studied the evidence provided. It was a bunch of photographs depicting an unidentified village constructed underground. A grey city where not a single ray of sunlight would be able to enter. Does it look like the SID knows about this place? It doesn't, no. If they knew, then they might have raised a ruckus. And in truth the SID isn't going to exterminate these vampires you are well aware of this fact, I believe. Also, that is the reason why this anonymous tip provider requested us with this job and not the SID. The tool SAE Jean created and Yu Song's nose could sniff out a vampire. However, humans caught in the high-level seduction magic of vampires became pawns, not realizing that they were under the influence of such magic. Fu I understand. Let me talk to you Bexong first. And as it's dangerous, delay the deployment of our agents for now. Yes sir. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like the permission to track down this anonymous informant as well. The informant? Kim Yu Son nodded his head. USAE Young's coming of age ceremony took place within the huge mansion of the Dawn household. As expected of the Dawn, it truly was a grand banquet. It was not an exaggeration to say the true movers and shakers of Korea had all gathered here in this banquet hall leaders of the politics and financial worlds, famous knights and celebrities, etc., etc. However, USAE Young was nervously waiting for the arrival of one specific person. Hyano Appa, SAE Jean Appa hasn't arrived yet, right? Yeah. He did call to say that he might be running a bit late, but promised to be here, so don't worry. USAE Young tightly shut her mouth. The main event of the ceremony had ended already. She had placed the hair stick in her hair now, and the people were too busy building profitable personal connections without a rest. TL, as far as I can tell, putting a hair stick means a girl is now officially an adult in the Korean tradition. Not sure how accurate this is, but there you go. Definitely, without his presence here, this whole ceremony was a total waste of time for her. How do you do, Miss USA Young? The guy approaching her while carrying an oily smile was Kim Jong Hyuk, the third son of the owner of the corporation that rivaled Dawn, the Great Wisdom. TL, I thought of leaving the name in Romanist Korean as this name may never appear again, but its spelling could confuse some readers with other similarly named persons, so I changed it to English equivalent. I know it sounds weird, but bear with me on this one. He was a loser well known for his unchecked, wild behavior and his current appearance of trying to look all important and grown up seemed rather pathetic to you SAE Young. Hello. At SAE Young's terse reply, Kim Jong Hyuk's eyebrows went into a slight spasm. However, he continued on with his words, not looking perturbed at all. It seems that person is not attending your coming of age ceremony. As there were stories of him being in a special relationship with Miss SAE Young, I was really looking forward to meeting him here today. 
I even heard a rumor that you two exited a car together late at night, even. Of course, I also hear that person for some reason is refusing to go all the way. This time, it was USAE Young's face to harden. She wondered just who the heck invited this son of a bitch. She felt like blaming her dad who insisted on sending invitations to everyone out of common courtesy. You can keep your unnecessary remarks to yourself as he will come. Don't you worry. USAE Young. Humph. I'm sure that he's very busy nowadays. I mean, everyone's heard of the rumor that both his trait and his business acumen is simply extraordinary. As the monster's value continued to soar higher, the world praised SAE Jean's abilities. Of course, all he had done was to only recruit those people with overflowing potential and create an environment where these folks could fully unleash their strengths. The true reason for the monster's continued advancement was the countless employees who had become the pillars of his society. As they thoroughly displayed their sharp intuition and excellent abilities with the aid of the encouraging environment. But whether a business was successful or not, it was the chairman of the company who always came under the spotlight. That was why, before anyone knew it, SAE Jean had become the genius businessman the attention of the people of Korea was focused on. I too am well aware of that. Even if he's a bit late in coming, I'm still grateful. Oh. But you seemed rather very anxious for that. Maybe I saw it all wrong. When Kim Jong-hyuk mouthed the words of clear ridicule, S.A.E. Young clenched both of her fists and breathed out angrily. But this guy opened up his mouth again before she could calm herself down. How unfortunate. I wanted to converse with him at least once. But it looks like he may never show up. U.S.A.E. Young gritted her teeth. But it was then. The huge doors of the banquet hall suddenly swung open. Chapter, 75 through the abruptly opened gaps of the banquet hall's doors, a man made his entrance. The elegant and smooth tuxedo that perfectly wrapped around his tall and athletic physique the neat and tidy hair combed upwards to accentuate his manly countenance the sharp eyes and facial features reminding one of a wolf. After searching around the banquet hall, he found USAE Young and then he began to slowly walk up towards her. As he took step after step, getting closer and closer, her cheeks became redder and redder. S.A.E. Young. Finally stopping before her, Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled deeply as they gazed at each other. I'm sorry for being a bit late. His charming baritone voice seemed to reverberate through the banquet hall, making her to dazedly nod her head. Is everything over already? Kim S.A.E. Jean. Eh. N, no not yet. It hasn't ended yet. Even though she had known him for the past year or so, this was the very first time she saw him wear a tuxedo like this. Maybe that was the problem she just couldn't get used how cool he looked today and her eyes hurriedly lowered to the floor in bashfulness. Oh ho! So you are that famous Mr. Kim Sae Jin. After watching the two interact with much interest, Kim Jong-hyuk reached out for a handshake. I'm director Kim Jong-hyuk from the Great Wisdom Electronics. Oh. Hello, pleased to meet you. I'm Kim S.A.E. Jean. While shaking hands, S.A.E. Jean checked out this guy's disposition with the eyes of the wolf. And almost immediately, he nearly ended up taking a big step back. A powerfully turbid and dark energy was oozing out from this man, Kim Jong-hyuk. S.A.E. Jean hadn't seen the color of this dark before until now. Ha ha ha. Now that I have met you in person, you look much more handsome than in those videos and photographs. Kim Jong-hyuk yapped on and on, but S.A.E. Jean didn't want to spend another minute with this guy, if he could help it. So, he was about to ignore this Jong-hyuk person and have a chat with you S.A.E. Young, when. Uh, isn't this a pleasant surprise? Aren't you the last born son of the Great Wisdom Corporation's owner? Oh, it's good to see you again, Cabinet Minister. It's been a while. People began gathering around S.A.E. Jean. These guys used Kim Jong-hyuk as an excuse to make their approach, and to build a friendly connection with S.A.E. Jean, began paying the obligatory lip service. But maybe this was the case of birds of a feather flocking together or touching a pitch will get a man filthy, every single one gathered here had their moral compass leaning heavily towards the side of evil. Of course, none of them were as bad as Kim Jong-hyuk, but still. So, this gentleman here is that famed Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean, yes. How do you do? 
I'm the minister in charge of the home affairs. Why, yes. Hello to you too, sir. By the way, who is that next to you? S.A.E. Jean, who had become the center of attention in this crowd, inexplicably pointed at the secretary of the man who just introduced himself as a government minister. It was because this young man was too talented and good-natured to be next to this dirty B.D. Ah, his name is Kim ho Young. He's my secretary but the kid's not all that smart. He's the son of a servant who has been working for me for a long time. Under the pretext of promising him a good future, I'm taking him along with me. When the nameless government minister let out a guffaw, the rest of the crowd began laughing as well. All of it were as fake as a laugh could get. Kim Sae Jin no longer wished to stay here. He slightly turned his head and checked out Yu Sae Young's mood. She seemed to have the exact same thoughts as he did, as she nodded her head slightly. Oh. But I'm suffering from slight migraine at the moment. Maybe because I've been swarmed with work lately Kim Sae Jin. Sae Jin started feigning illness while massaging his head. Ha ha. That's all very understandable. Nowadays, there isn't any business sector the monster hasn't entered yet, after all. Even His Excellency have spoken about it as well. The Minister. When you say His Excellency, you mean. Of course, it's Mr. President, who else could it be? While they were busy yapping and laughing by themselves, S.A.E. Jean searched his inner pocket and pulled out something that gleamed under the light. It was a business card, with the words Kim S.A.E. Jean, the society chairman, the monster engraved on it. But it was no ordinary card. Made by flattening pure gold as thinly as possible, each one of these cards cost as much as six fifty. S.A.E. Jean made these not because he wanted to show off, but only after deciding to give them only to those people who might be of some help, and those who could help him out in the future. Oh ho! And what could that be? Unnamed minister. There were signs of avarice twinkling in the eyes of the minister who had caught the sight of this business card. It's a business card. Aha! So that's your card. I also saw it once in a newspaper. I heard that you don't give that to just anyone but, is that really made out of pure gold? The government minister, under the false impression that he was the recipient of the card, triumphantly straightened his back. Yes, it is pure gold. The surrounding gallery of people let out an exclamation of admiration while gazing at the business card. The minister let out a fake cough, and while tidying up the outline of his tie, he eagerly waited for the card to enter his hand. Sir, I'm envious, said Kim Jong-hyuk, humoring the unnamed minister with a fake smile. The minister reciprocated with a spirited chuckle. Ho ho ho. As expected of the most outstanding young man of his generation, you have good eyes for people. But, right next moment. Kim Sae Jin handed the card over not to the government minister, but to his secretary standing a slight distance away from the crowd. What is your name? Kim Sae Jin. Eh. Excuse me. Your name. Or do you have a business card of your own? Ah, uh, my name is Kim Ho Hyung. I, I don't have a business card. Sae Jin nodded his head and placed his gold card in this person's hand. You should give me a call later. Kim Sae Jin. After saying these words, Sae Jin left the banquet hall only after 20 minutes had passed. The minister dumbfoundedly followed the back of Sae Jin, before viciously staring at the golden business card in Kim Ho Hyung's hands. It wasn't all that difficult to read his intentions within that gaze, but Ho Hyung just quietly pocketed the card inside his suit. This this son of a mere servant is. The minister stared at his secretary with eyes that could kill. Unfortunately for him, he could not display any more of his anger in front of these many people. Sae Jin was planning to go home after he escaped the banquet hall, but he just couldn't ignore the pleading eyes of Sae Young who had followed him outside. What is it? Is there a place you want to go? Kim Sae Jin. I want to go to Appa's place. He gripped the steering wheel of his car tightly while glaring at her. What's wrong? I can't go anywhere else while wearing this dress, anyway. It'll be too embarrassing. Usae Young spoke while slightly lifting the hems of her dress. As his cheeks blushed a little at the exposure of her white skin underneath, Sae Jean checked the time remaining for his human form. Three hours, 
3 minutes and 59 seconds. However, in 3 hours, it'd be midnight and the time remaining would reset to the beginning. In other words, there was plenty of time left. I'm an adult who went through a coming-of-age ceremony now can't we just enjoy dinner together? USA Young didn't miss the opening created when he was in a dilemma, and gently wrapped her hand over his. Wow. It's so neat and tidy. Finally entering SAE Jean's home that she had dreamed about, her eyes went completely round as she took in the layout of the interior. TL. Didn't she already come to his house before to get her tats? What gives? I'm telling you this again, you are going back to your place for sleep. Got it? Ark. I got it already. I'm not Cinderella, you know when it's past the midnight, I'll leave even if you beg me not to. She took a quick glance at SAE Jean, and then sat down on the living room's couch. It's really soft and comfortable. What are you doing, Appa? Don't just stand there and take a seat right here. USAE Young vigorously patted on the empty space right next to her. SAE Jean approached her with slightly awkward steps. Ta-da! As soon as he sat down, she proudly presented the paper bag she'd been carrying since before climbing into his car. What is that? It's alcohol. SAE Jean's forehead creased in that moment, but USAE Young's smiles only grew even brighter. One hour after the drinking began suddenly. The bottle of hard liquor with the alcohol content of 57% was already quite empty. Really, Appa ISS just too much. Appa, do you know why EI I wanted that CRM New York on January 1st? USAE Young, with her face bright red, let out a grand sigh. She had drank so much, even her breath smelled thickly of alcohol now. Appa also know, right? How much I like Appa. There is s no why you don't know. No a why. Me. Appa every day sings and sighings, adult, adult. Sue, I gotta have's that adult ceremony on January 1st. It's time for you to go home. Let me drive you there. Will you just listen, till the end? Me don know why I like Appa also kayak. Kim S.A.E. Jean snatched away the glass from her hand. As if she got irritated by that, U.S.A.E. Young clenched her fist and lightly hit his chest. E.I.I. I'm not going home. Emma live here forever. It's so irritating when you pretend to not notice it, so Emma gonna live here. This time, it was Kim S.A.E. Jean's turn to let out a sigh. This couldn't go on. He needed to send her home now, so there would be no regrets later. So, he stood up first. Me, I really did everything Appa asked me for, and I helped out every time Appa asked me. You don't have any idea how much I begged my dad and grandpa, do you? Appa, without me eek. Let's go. He pulled her up by her wrist. Strangely enough, she didn't offer much resistance. And so, leaving the living room and entering the cold passageway. Appa. A weak voice came from his back. S.A.E. Jean turned around to see why. Right at that moment, U.S.A.E. Young slapped away his hand holding her wrist with all her power. And then, she wrapped her arms around his neck in order to. Groans in difficulty. She tried to kiss him. Unfortunately for her she was just too short. His 185 centimeters and her 160 centimeters. The difference of 25 centimeters couldn't be overcome even with her standing on tiptoes. DN it. It was supposed to be an unexpected counterattack. On the verge of tears, she ended up planting her lips on his neck instead. You know, right? That I like Appa a lot. That's why can you like me back? She then confessed her ardent and sincere feelings for him. Even if Appa doesn't feel the same way, it's okay. I, I can wait. The emotions contained within those wet eyes were so desperately sad and pitiful. It was Kim S.A.E. Jean's turn to act next. Already, half of his reasoning had been thrown out the window. He powerfully held the back of U.S.A.E. Young's neck and began to seek out her lips with his own. However, this action wasn't about conveying the emotions of love at all. It was rough. Very rough. So much so, the words trying to appease his lust described it perfectly. Yup hup. 
At Kim S.A.E. Jean's rough hands, hem of her dress got ripped up. U.S.A.E. Young became fearful of his sudden transformation. Appa, wait you But he continued. His tongue roughly roamed within her mouth, and his hands stroked her body with equally rough force. Before she knew it, a single tear formed on the corner of U.S.A.E. Young's eyes. She was scared. Of course, if she wanted to refuse him, then she could. Mana had this effect of removing the alcohol's influence from one system. But still what if Kim S.A.E. Jean hated her for pushing him away? That made her scared. Ah. Thanks to her tears, Kim S.A.E. Jean could somehow regain his reasoning. He saw the torn pieces of her dress on the floor, and U.S.A.E. Young who was now practically half-naked. I'm sorry. He grabbed his head and turned away from her. He found himself so dn pathetic. Even though he knew things might end up like this, he still let her into his home. But, seeing himself still blaming the instincts of the GN monsters he felt so cheap and pathetic. No, no, I'm just USAE Young. Strangely, it was USAE Young who was taken back. She dazedly stared at his back as he stood there in torment, before slowly approaching him and hugged his broad back. I'm fine. USAE Young. SAE Jean showed no reaction. I just got surprised, that's all. USAE Young. She held his waist even tighter. Then I'll go home now. We'll just talk again tomorrow. Just please remember what I said ah. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Whenever you are ready. Her arms around his waist slipped away. I really like Appa. This kind of emotion, I've never felt anything like it before in my life. She left behind the most important confession of all, and then left his house. Two days later. There are two types of warriors out there the orthodox type, and the instinctive type. The current location was the monster's training facility. Kim S.A.E. Jean was receiving a personalized training from a knight invited from the Raven Order. The orthodox types are as the word suggests they faithfully follow the prescribed guidelines of their chosen martial arts schools. There are many sects in this path, but currently, the highest rated one is the sect founded by the Raven Order master Kim Hyun Suk, Hyunseo, sect which is based on his trait. A serious sparring with a strong knight caused an unbelievable increase in the various skills proficiency percentage, so he was holding this session precisely in order to increase his human form's capabilities and overall skill levels. And the famous knights who follow this sect's teachings are Miss Kim Yurin, the highest tier knight from our order, and myself, the high tier knight Jin Yi Han. The knight who introduced himself as Jin Yi Han spoke proudly. And the so-called instinctive types are the ones that fully rely on their instincts and senses. The famous example of this type is the Order Master of the Dawn, Mr. Yu Su Hyuk. From what I hear from Miss E. Hai Rin, you also seem to fall into this category as well, Mr. Chairman. S.A.E. Jean nodded his head. Even though passive skills played a role, the basis of the battle style he had adopted was him simply swinging his weapons based on his instincts and his senses. Well, then. Let's start with a simple test of your abilities. Jean E. Han's expression turned into admiration as he traced the surface of the practice blade with his fingertips. Even though it was simply for practicing, this weapon was already on the level of a high-quality item. Is it possible for me to take one of these practice weapons home with me? Jean E. Han. Hmm. Ah, uh, yes. Do as you wish. Thank you. Jean E. Han quickly bowed his head. Well, then. Please attack with everything you have. The clashings of practice swords had become somewhat intense, but its end was quite simple in nature. SFX for strong gust of wind. Jean E. Han's last sword attack left behind razor-sharp tempest winds as it sliced S.A.E. Jean's own weapon in half. And upon receiving the impact, S.A.E. Jean ended up rolling over backwards on the floor. It was a clear demonstration of a gap in their power. As expected, a high-tier knight was something else entirely. You are quite amazing. Kim S.A.E. Jean. No, no. That's what I'd like to say about you. Jean E. Han approached S.A.E. Jean and offered his hand. Even though he was defeated here, S.A.E. Jean still felt deeply satisfied as he grabbed the offered hand and stood up. Warrior's Special Quality Proficiency Level 98. 
99%. From this sparring session alone, the proficiency had risen as much as 3% in one go, that was why. Although you can't use mana, with this level of abilities, I believe you can defeat a mid-tier knight quite easily. Do you really think so? Ji Nihon smiled. Then, that's a relief. With that little left, he'd be able to upgrade Warrior's special quality, to another level before the advent of the Red Moon. He had no clue just what kind of effect would be added, but well, surely it should prove useful to him regardless. Ah. Miss Usae Young is waiting for you over there. Jean E. Han pointed towards the entrance of the training facility and spoke. And the brightly smiling Usae Young was there, busy waving her hand over here. Two days later. From the early morning hours, urgent messages poured out from the TV news. The signs of the red moon have been detected and it's expected that in three days. It was to deliver the news of the omen of the red moon's impending manifestation being detected. The red moon. As the term suggested, the moon itself became dyed in blood red. This event that the modern science could not find the cause of, was a calamity that befell on this planet every five to six years. The moonlight, dyed in blood red color for unknown reasons, amplified the monster's aggressiveness and powers much higher compared to normal. And that was why a week before the red moon begins, a state of emergency would be declared all around the world every night, hunter and wizard would come under the respective government's command and prepare themselves to battle this event. But especially for someone like Kim Sae Jean, it was the same as the red moon exceeding far past the level of a mere calamity and straight into apocalypse. Actually, the person who reported the advent of Red Moon was Kim Sae Jean. The legendary mercenary, the Leakin, is the first person to discover the signs he reported to the Ministry of Defense after allegedly sensing very faint changes within the clear sunlight. The citizens are praising the Leakin for detecting this global calamity beforehand. With a spooky timing, the news anchor was mentioning the story of the Red Moon as well. He momentarily got confused thinking that he was looking at an alert window that said, the fame of the Leakin has risen. Whatever the case may have been, the only reason why SAE Jean could become the first person in the world to detect the Red Moon was. Warning, the eyes of the wolf has detected the signs of the Red Moon. Under the influence of the Red Moon, the time limit for the human form will decrease to only 10% of the usual time. It was thanks to this alert window. The meaning behind those words, his human time being reduced to only 10% of the usual available time he could only exist as a human for around 45 minutes per day. It was too much of a risk to stay in the human society like that. And so, SAE Jean made a decision. It'd be better to simply live and grow stronger inside the monster field of Kongwan province and at the same time, he might as well investigate the hidden base of vampires near the Junggang mountain. That was his decision. Water, canned food, potions, a tent. He shoved all the items he would need for his survival during this season of the Red Moon inside the expanding pocket. He had already left Zhou Hansung in charge, temporarily at least, of the administration of the society. And as for USAE Young, as their relationship had become complicated thanks to that day's kissing, he somehow was able to succeed in persuading her. It's done. Eu Saya. Sae Jean lifted up the expanding pocket that was packed with 300 kilograms worth of stuff, and left his home. Chapter, 76 Standing right before the monster field, Sae Jean pulled out his mobile phone for the final time for the day. Before he knew it, there were over 100 phone numbers saved in his lists of contacts. He first called Jo Han Sung, then So Yeo Jean, Ju Ji Hyuk, Yi Hai Rin, Kim Yu Son in that order to say hello and then. Hello. What do you want now? He called you Song next. Maybe because she was hassled by SAE Jean's frequent calls, there was a definite trace of a groan hidden in her voice. No, well. I just want to find out if you're well today. Yeah, I'm fine. If it wasn't for you. SAE Jean thought he heard her whisper quietly in the background there, but decided to ignore that for now. But hey, aren't you being just a bit unfair? Haven't your accomplishments been very good because of us? Like, predicting the red moon and all that. Around a week ago, SAE Jean sent the word into the SID that the Leakin had detected the signs of the red moon. 
And so, the SID performed an in-depth investigation and with the proper proof uncovered, contacted the relevant government entities. In other words, although the first one to detect the signs was the Leakin, it was the SID who had unearthed the actual evidence. From what SAE Jean heard, the government acknowledged the efforts of the SID, which in turn restored the lost trust in the organization and on top of that, they were even given performance-based bonuses as well. So, wasn't her attitude just a bit too cold? No way. You're not being a bother. On the contrary, I'm glad to talk to you. Only then, Yu Song's voice forcibly became a bit lighter. But what do you want now? Why did you call me? I told you last time that the investigation of your parents' matters is being done discreetly in order to avoid detection, didn't I? It's not about that this time what is your thoughts regarding the information we handed over to you before? He handed over the information about vampires hiding in the Jungang Mountain only to Yu Song. At the time, she promised to make a decision on it soon, but even after two weeks later, she was still keeping the result of her decision to herself only. That thing I'll let you know later. My head's gonna split in half just trying to figure it out alone. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I understand. But both Leakin and I are planning to look into this matter by ourselves later on. If the results seem certain, will you cooperate with us then? Yu Song didn't reply immediately and hesitated for a bit. Your answer. When SAE Jean egged her on, Yu Song's powerless voice came out of the receiver. Her answer was out of his expectations. Hey, by the way, like, what if I get fired? I mean, I'm already being suspected of doing something funny by myself already. No, well. When giving me this information, you told me to keep it to myself only. Did you know by doing that, I'm breaking the law? I've sworn to submit any new information regarding the affairs of this country to my superior officer, the president, you see. Her voice was trembling. I said this to you before, right? There are people in higher positions than me. That information you gave me, if it's true then it will be classified as above top secret. That means, without the permission of the president, I am not even allowed to have a say in it. Will you be fired if you move without permission? Obviously. Yu Song shouted out. Kim Sae Jin remained slightly dumbfounded for a moment, before chuckling out gently. I understand. If that's the case, then don't try to stand out too much. But if something happens and Miss Yu Song loses her job, then I'll hire you, as the new leader of the Monster Mercenary Company. And I'll pay you ten times the current annual salary. Huh. So, don't worry too much. Your reputation might suffer just a tad, but I promise to restore it to what it was once before by whatever means necessary. Even after Sae Jin finished with his words, Yu Song remained silent for a long time. And this silence continued on for another five minutes or so. And finally. Don't need it. So, that's that. I'll call you when I find new info regarding your mother. With that, she hung up. Afterwards, Sae Jin called up Yu Sae Young and Kim Yu Rin for the last time and then infiltrated into the interior of the monster field. Originally, Sae Jin planned to stay in whatever cave he could find in the monster field, but as he walked around, he suddenly got curious curious about just how much progress the orc pair of male and female he took under his wings around two months ago had made. Since he heard the news of those two hero orcs helping out the knights in a battle against monsters three days ago, he knew for sure they weren't dead yet. If that was the case, then it made more sense to stay in that village for the next ten days or so. Even if it was living amongst the monsters, there was a good chance his life would be more convenient as there would be creatures willing to serve him in that place. With that line of thought, he began wandering in the monster field for thirty minutes. Fortunately, Sae Jean didn't get lost and could find the steep cliff just over yonder. He changed the direction of his feet towards where the strong smell of the orcs was coming from. Wow! It was probably because he was currently in his orc great warrior form, but as he approached the village, the firmly shut mud gates were slowly opening up. And from the opening of the gates, he could hear a noisy commotion. At first, it sounded like cries of beasts, and then, also sounded like that of people welcoming him. He slowly walked past the mud gates. Gua Gua! 
The male orc greeted him first. The changes in its physique was easy to spot its hair was longer now, and its muscles were even more tougher as well. S.A.E. Jean patted the head of the orc which was only about a single hand span shorter than he was, and took a long look at the surroundings. There were twenty-one offsprings of the two orcs here. Now normally, an orc needed around four months in order to reach full maturity so these ones were still of smaller stature but mysteriously, they all possessed blue skins. That was because when S.A.E. Jean was tattooing the orcs, he also added another effect genetic inheritance. Dot. When he spent so much effort to strengthen the parents, it'd be no good whatsoever if the offsprings were weak and thus lacked the potential to grow stronger in the future. Very good. Nodding in satisfaction, he then moved his feet to build himself a place to dwell. And behind his broad, dependable back, a couple dozen orcs followed. They said that the red moon will rise tomorrow. Hearing the report of the subordinate knight, Kim Yurin looked up at the night sky with determined eyes. The full moon's color was still white and the sky was painted in dark navy blue. However, when that moon becomes dyed in the colors of blood, then the whole world would also be bathed in red. Understood. And the government's plan is? They have set up the first line of defense within the interior of the monster field, miss. Within the interior? Kim Yurin's brows narrowed as she tried to figure out the reason. Obviously, by setting up the defensive line within the monster field, there was the advantage of reducing the amount of area they need to, well, defend. However, if a part of that line became compromised, the risk was equally high that a situation would occur where the defense force became surrounded by the monsters flooding past the breach. Yes, ma'am. However, the position isn't too deep within the field, so it looks like you don't have to be concerned. Give me the map. Here it is. She carefully studied the map in front of her. But she found a strange place on it. On a certain corner of the defensive line, around a cliff formed by the upheaval of the earth not too long ago, there she saw big red letters area of interest written over this mysterious location. What is that all about? Kim Yurin. Oh. That is the village of the hero orc. The location was discovered about a month ago, but as we can't predict what kind of actions these orcs would take under the effect of the Red Moon, that location has been classified as an area to keep an eye out for. We can't predict that. Yes, ma'am. The tactical plan will change accordingly to whether those orcs fight with us even under the Crimson Moonlight, or lose their reasoning and revert back to being pure monsters. Kim Yurin fell into a deep thought, her fingers tracing the scabbard of her sword. What a contradictory thing to say, a monster losing its reasoning. After all, a monster didn't even have the capacity to reason, to begin with. But the monster that shattered this notion did appear not too long ago. A new type of orc, the so-called hero orc. Dot. This somewhat embarrassing nickname wasn't given to it just by the public the scientific name printed on the monster bestiary used around the world was hero orc as well. Seen as a new, separate genus of the orc family, people started calling these orcs with the moniker Hero ever since they roared out loudly and rushed in to help out the knights in danger. Also, as these branch of orcs was first discovered in the Republic of Korea, sometimes they were referred to as the Korean orcs as well. Are the higher-ups thinking of utilizing these orcs as another defensive wall if they start helping humans out just like before? Kim Yurin. Yes, ma'am. It seems that way. She wasn't 100% certain about this, but if things indeed happen like that, then those orcs would be wonderful allies to have. Kim Yurin recalled the battle prowess of the orc great warrior who fought the basilisk alongside her in the past, then nodded her head. We'll enter the monster field with our company of knights. Has the front lines been constructed yet, via cutting down and burning away the forest? Yes, ma'am. Not only the physical barricades, wizards prepared safe living areas by preparing magical barriers and watchtowers. Good. While Kim Yurin and countless other knights were tightening up their defenses in preparation for the Red Moon. The skill warrior's special quality has risen up a level. A new property, mana-friendly body, has been acquired. Through constant hunting, S.A.E. Jean finally unlocked the next stage of the warrior's special quality, skill. But that wasn't all. The new property Mana Friendly Body is reacting to the form specific skill ruler of the water of the feeble sea monster form. 
the property has been upgraded to Mana Body. TL, yes, it's really called Mana Body. The author used different Hanja words for this skill and for the Mana Friendly Body, but they literally mean the same thing. Mana Body, Skill Proficiency 0. 1%. A body that is extremely friendly towards mana. Depending on the current proficiency level, there is a probability of negating the effects of mana and or magic spells of another that comes in contact with the host's body. Depending on the current proficiency level, the host can manipulate the mana stored in the body according to the wishes of the host. Can be activated concurrently with other skills. When the proficiency level reaches 100%, a new property will be unlocked. Hmm. SAE Jean sat down on the dead body of the ogre he just killed, and began checking out this new mana body thingy. I can manipulate mana as I want to. It sure was one of the most welcoming alert windows he'd yet seen. After all, he had never received tutelage on how to use mana and also, he didn't know how to make mana move in his body, even. However, he wasn't quite sure of what to do now. For now, he stretched his arm out and clenched his fist tightly. But well, he didn't see any strange reaction, nor did he feel anything weird either. Hmm. This time, he focused his eyes on one point. He did that until his eyeballs became bloodshot, but again, nothing much happened. Kim Sae Jean sat there imitating a parrot for a while, but then figured out how to use it from an unexpected viewpoint. TL, I've no idea what the author is trying to say here with the parrot bit. It's the literal TL. Since it's said according to my wishes, does that mean man'll move if I think about it? But isn't that a bit different from what I heard before? Mana through one's wishes that wasn't the fundamental law of mana utilization the knights and wizards adhered to. They said that they moved the mana flowing in their blood vessels physically and then expel it out of their bodies. If mana can be moved around with nothing but some simple thoughts, then why would the professions of knights and wizards be seen as highly specialized and valuable? If I just think of making mana rise out of my arm, then. And from his arm, thick mana rose up. Cries of fright, orc style. Kim Sae Jean got genuinely surprised and ended up tumbling over backwards. What the hell? Sae Jean quickly shot back to his feet and shouted at the mana wavering around his arm. Controlling mana with nothing but his thoughts he'd never even heard of such a nonsense before. He swallowed his saliva down and sent in a thought towards this mana. Simple thoughts such as grow in width grow in length go lower, as well as. Turn into flames. Where a rook. On the empty air where mana was undulating, a sudden spark of fire began and started burning up. Turn into dirt. The flame burning up in the middle of the air then became brown soil and fell on the ground. Turn into snow. Pure white snowflakes began to fall slowly. Turn into a sword. The skill proficiency must be over 50% in order to activate this skill concurrently with the skill orc smithing technique. Dot. It was not possible for now, but as soon as his proficiency has increased. Wow. He could only admire this new property in days. As expected, there was a reason why this new thing was classified as property instead of skill. Chapter, 77 The defensive perimeter of the knights against the Red Moon had been completed, near the location where SAE Jean was. He found this out via the mobile phone he brought along from home. Wait a second here. Will these orcs be alright? He became worried about the influence of the Red Moon, all of a sudden. He figured that depending on which one had a higher degree of influence his skills or the Red Moon the orcs would act accordingly. However, this Red Moon was a wide-scale calamity that caused monsters to go completely wild. Could these orcs possibly withstand such disaster? Bring the remaining orcs to me. The powerful baritone voice of Kim Sae Jean the orc great warrior spread around like a wave. And then, with the exception of four agile orcs that were sent out to the Jumgang Mountain as scouts, the orcs in the village all promptly gathered where he was. Everybody ISS here, oh, great warrior. The orc in charge spoke. Sae Jean's forehead creased just a little. He was kind of regretting giving this guy the passive vocal cord reconstruction now. He only did it to make communication a bit easier, but seriously, the combination of the orc's ugly face and that short-tongued pronunciation of words was creeping the hell out of him. 
Enter. He assumed the goblin form and began inscribing magic tattoos on the orcs, one at a time. The base ingredient used was his own blood the effect imbued would be simple resistance to magic, to endure the influence of the red moon. The goblin's craftsmanship skill was now at B, and it only took just over a minute to tattoo a single orc. In total, thirty minutes would be enough to tattoo all the orcs present. After quickly finishing up the tattooing process, he shooed them out of his dwelling and resumed the training of mana body in order to increase its proficiency level. The usage of this mana body was truly endless, but unfortunately, it could only be used for fifteen minutes tops, meaning it was not really all that practical to use in the real battle. On top of that, during the human form, that time became even shorter at five minutes. If he used it for any longer than that, he would go lightheaded and promptly pass out. Rise into the air. So, SAE Jean was thinking of increasing the duration to 15 minutes while in the human form by leveling up the proficiency. However, there wasn't enough time to raise his proficiency after all. All of a sudden, a red light began descending down on the world. A heavy fog of war circulated on the defensive perimeter constructed by the countless knights and wizards. The military had already retreated far behind the front lines since they would only become a burden had they stayed. The only people left here in waiting, were the knights and wizards but even many of them were either deeply nervous or were scared of the upcoming Great War. This wasn't the first Red Moon to appear in the history but this one would certainly be far more difficult to hold back compared to in the past. During the previous Red Moons, the weak monsters appeared first, then gradually, to stronger ones but now, there was no distinction between the monsters anymore. TL in case if you're wondering why remember the great land upheaval that pretty much made the monster field unsafe. Yeah, that's why. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that they might end up having to fight high-tiered monsters such as basilisks, manticores, or even wyverns on the first day. Kim Yurin could definitely sympathize with their worries and fears. After all, even her own heart was beating in an unsettled manner for a while now. How are you feeling? Even still, she tried to calm the person next to her USA Young, who was just as tense as the other knights. Eh. Ah, uh, yes, I'm okay. From the back of USA Young's neck, exposed by her hair tied upwards, a faint outline of a pretty tattoo could be seen. Kim Yurin thought that was probably the famous magic tattoo of Kim Sae Jean. Some people criticized Sae Jean for only tattooing the members of his society, but what could they do about it? He could do as he liked, after all. The society chairman did it for me, while saying, don't die out there. Realizing that Kim Yurin was looking at the tattoos, Yusei Young's face reddened slightly, maybe out of pride or from shyness. Kim Yurin was somewhat envious of such feelings of young love. So that's how it is. Then, you should make sure not to die, right? Yep. Of course. As the two of them smiled at each other. Out of the blue, there was a commotion by the defensive perimeter. They quickly looked up at the sky. A bloody color was spreading on the previously snow-white full moon like a spilled ink. It has begun. When USA Young murmured, Kim Yurin somberly nodded her head. Kiek. It only took an instant for the darkness blocking their view to change to crimson color. The monster's maddened screams filled the mountainside. The roars of the monsters rumbled around and around until reaching up high into the sky and touching the red moon, causing the morale of the gathered defenders to plummet further. SFX for loud thumping noises. Incredible tremor akin to earthquake rushed towards them. Get ready for combat. Out from the communication crystal, a resolute shout of a man came out. It was the voice of Kim Hyun Suk, Yurin's father. She unsheathed her sword at the incoming order. And from a distance away, a monster revealed its huge, wriggling body. Its eyes blood-red, its jaw lined with teeth that were shaped like pincers and the numerous legs rubbing on the ground below, the giant centipede approached the location of the defenders. From the get-go, a difficult high-tier monster had appeared. Its massive bulk and the grotesque appearance were enough to scare the living daylights out of some junior knights here. Kim Yurin took a glance to her side. Clearly scared, USA Young's hands gripping the sword was trembling. Do not fear. Yurin gently held the girl's hand. USA Young looked at her and nodded. 
basilisks, giant centipedes, wyverns, griffins, flesh golems, etc., etc. High-ranked monsters, many of them incredibly rare and hard to encounter even once in one's lifetime, poured in like tsunami waves. And as the opponents of the week-long Red Moon's first day the knights had to face, these monsters were simply too vicious and frightening. Knights who ran away were quite a few in number. It was par for the course, really as they were lower ranked and just too young to have experienced such absurd situations before. SFX of someone sobbing. There were also many knights breaking down in tears after losing their limbs. Clearly, the defenders were in a numerical disadvantage in this battle. But regardless, Kim Yurin swung her sword. The blue sword aura became the storm winds of mana and swept away countless monsters. And from the gap between the walls of monsters she just created, Yurin spotted a lich casting magic spells far away. From the beginning, the very first target knights aimed to kill was the enemy spellcaster. As soon as she spotted the monster, she held the sword in reverse grip and stabbed the earth with it. It was the attack containing her trait, Desideratum. In that moment, a huge mana blade formed in the air just above where the lich was standing and sank into the surface of the ground. The lich, now its body divided in half, became dust particles when the belated secondary explosion took place. And so, she repeatedly fought her desperate battles, over and over again. However, the overall status of the battle was still not good the defensive line was about to collapse. It was a desperately bad situation. No matter what, the front line must never be breached. She now saw the subordinate knights battling an ogre over yonder, one of the sword aura slicing the monster's wrist. Among them was USA Young, whom reminded Yurin of her younger days for some reason. Kim Yurin summoned her strength once more and grasped her sword tightly. Right then from somewhere, a violent tremor spread out on the ground. And shortly afterwards, the powerful roar shattered the sky above. That was definitely not from a human, for sure. SFX for thunderous footsteps. The footsteps began to close in. In despair, the knights looked on towards the direction of the sound. And there was a group of orcs. It wasn't a big number. But the appearance of the leading orc was so overwhelmingly imposing, as if to imply it could do the job of a thousand men. And so, the orc great warrior that had suddenly entered the battlefield, with its lengthy hair whipping against the wind, rushed forward like a shooting star or maybe even a wild beast and swung its mace in the air. Quahang. The terrifying shock wave undulated like a stormy wave and swept across the battlefield. Judging by their red eyes, the hero orcs group was definitely under the influence of the Red Moon. However their enemies were not humans, but monsters. Whenever the orc great warrior swung his mace, the sounds of destruction akin to the Big Bang explosion shook the world and monsters' body parts were turned to mush. From the contact points of the mace, flames sometimes flared up, and other times a bitter coldness harsh enough to freeze the land rushed out. Kwang. 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 And the reason for such changes in the elements were, without a doubt, mana surrounding the mace. The orc great warrior displayed overwhelming martial prowess as it ran amok. His mace did not differentiate what monster it was. Other orcs, ogres, gnolls, spartois, etc. etc. As soon as they came in contact with the destructive swing of the weapon, all were ripped apart like the blowing dust. The perfect physique of the orc great warrior withstood almost all the physical attacks. Even if it was surrounded by hundreds of monsters, he received not one wound. And so, this creature didn't even bother to defend against enemies' attacks or try to avoid them, instead choosing to concentrate on utter destruction only. Blowing away the stomach of an ogre blocking his forward march, then freezing the headless knight Dullahan on the spot the orc even fired his own powerful sword aura towards an airborne wyvern to bring it down. The deeply impressionable sight of the great warrior battling hundreds, thousands of enemies all alone the god of war had descended on earth. The knights of this battlefield dazedly witnessed this display of martial might that was vicious but at the same time, also utterly mesmerizing. SFX for a loud roar of the orc. The orc great warrior roared out wildly, covered from head to toe in blood. In any other times, such a roar would induce fear, but right now, people found it quite reassuring instead. 
It was loud enough to instill the belief that the flow of this battle could be reversed, back into the hearts of many. Some knights also ended up roaring out as they renewed their unceasing attacks on the monsters. Among them was Kim Yurin and Usae Young as well. And so, the second round began. The moon finally hid below the horizon and the sunlight began to brighten the world. The red moon had ended, at least for today. There were many casualties. Not just those knights who had passed out from losing their body parts, but also those who had actually lost their lives. However, the knights gathered here could not express their sorrow that easily. They just couldn't, after seeing the sad and lonesome expression of the orc great warrior which was surveying the corpse of one of its own. The brave hero orcs that came to help them even under the influence of the Red Moon the initial group of thirty had now dwindled down to less than half of its original number. It was difficult to fathom the depths of sadness of the leader of these hero orcs, its chieftain, as their numbers were low to begin with. Sujayam, Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin called out to her subordinate knight, Kim Sujayam after gazing at the orc with equally sad eyes. Yes. Here. Hold on to this for a bit. She handed over her treasured sword to him and slowly approached the hero orc. SFX for light footsteps. Stepping over the dried blood on the ground, she stepped in front of the orc chieftain. Hey. Kim Yurin. Yurin carefully reached out and touched the orc's shoulder. The orc felt this very faint sense of being touched and when he turned his head to look. He took several steps back in shock. He got so surprised, he nearly ended up tumbling over backwards, even. Eh. At his reaction, Yurin's expression became somewhat wounded. What does she want now? Kim Sae Jean. Kim Sae Jean's flustered state didn't want to calm down so easily. Do you, maybe, remember me? Even still, Yurin tried to chat to him. Wondering if this woman developed a habit of trying to talk to monsters, Sae Jean continued to stare at her with genuinely confused mind. Ma'am, what are you doing? From afar back, scared shouts of knights could be heard. Although they did fight together until now, this orc just lost over half of its brethren. No one knew what might happen if it got peeved off at something she might end up doing. Thankfully, the fears of those knights were assuaged in the next instance with a nod from the orc great warrior. Ah. That is wonderful news. What a relief sir. Without realizing it, Yurin began speaking politely. It felt like to her that the orc could understand her words. I am sorry for your loss. Kim Yurin pointed at the corpse of the orc sprawled on the ground and spoke. However, the orc great warrior simply stared at her for a long time, not showing any reaction whatsoever. But, all of a sudden. The great warrior raised its hand high. Ma'am. Even a single fist strike could cause a fatal injury to Kim Yurin. The knights rushed forward in fear. But right next moment, all of them had to stop abruptly. The raised hand of the orc great warrior lightly descended on top of Yurin's head, and he proceeded to pat her hair gently. Kyum. After letting out a single fake cough out of embarrassment, the great warrior then turned around and left the battlefield. The surviving orcs started following him. Amem. Yurin chased after the back of the great warrior with her eyes. Strangely enough, there was a healthy red glow on both of her cheeks. Chapter, 78 The area where the chaos of the red moon had swept across was now filled with forlorn silence and stillness. Under the dim glow of the early morning sunlight, the wounded knights were carried off to the temporary infirmary set up towards the rear, and several knights. Fatigued from the endless combat and lacking even the energy to get to the rest area, decided to just plop down on the ground and take break right there. However, even among this scene of near-silent breaths and intermittent groans of pain, there were a few knights present whose first priority wasn't about resting up, but to tease a certain person non-stop. I've already told you many times, it's not like that. Kim Yurin. Thanks to that, the person who was probably the most tired of them all, Kim Yurin, couldn't even take a proper break and instead had to make excuses one after another. As one could imagine, the problem was with her face going red after the hero orc patted her head. The sight of her crimson cheeks and the pastor declaring the goblin is her ideal person overlapped into one and that resulted in her being seen as a pervert with a weird fetish. But it's a bit, 
you know, to say you're not I have never seen our team captain make a face like that before it's okay, Miss Yurin, you can talk to me. You know I am good at keeping secrets. E Hai Rin. Among them, even though one of her arms were heavily wounded, E Hai Rin didn't forget to be cheerful and teased Yurin more than anyone else. It was most likely because, without this kind of distraction, it'd be too difficult for Hai Rin to endure the horrors of what happened here only a few hours ago. No, I'm telling you, honestly it's not like that. It's just that. I was panicking a little because of the manly scent coming from the orc, that's all. As her chain of thought reached up to here, all of a sudden, a spark was ignited in her head. The orc scent was similar to another one she smelled somewhere else. Although the smell of blood and iron got in the way of detecting it properly, as her senses were sharply tuned, she could pick up on the unexplainable but definite similarity between the orcs and that other scent. Just that, and... Oh, no what should we do now? What's gone wrong with our team captain's preference in men? H, hey, I said, it's not like that. Ah ah. That's why Miss Yurin was not dating any Oe Yuyuf. Kim Yurin hurriedly dashed out and covered Hai Rin's mouth. And so, as she began wasting what little energy she had left on something quite useless, the questions of regarding that sense origins got naturally faded into the background. Returning to the village with the surviving dozen or so orcs, Sae Jean laid down to take a good rest. But he only needed four hours of sleep. The body of the great warrior didn't want to break any longer than that. And so, after waking up when the sun was exactly right in the middle of the sky, he searched for his mobile phone. Oh. So, there hasn't been anything strange with Muffin so far, yes? Yes, sir. With no red moonlight touching her, she didn't behave erratically or anything like that. Joe Hansung. The red moon caused frenzied and mindless state only by coming into contact with the monsters in the first place. So, rather fortunately, Muffin wasn't affected by it as she was hidden deep underground. All right. Then please continue taking care of the society's matters in the future as well. And if something big happens, resolve it in the way you see fit. Oh, and if you're planning to hire more people, please don't forget that I need to see them at least once. I understand, Mr. Chairman. Zhou Hansung enthusiastically replied. Sae Jean still had one more thing left to say, though. Have you really understood what I said? I said, in the future. The future, Mr. Hansung. I beg your pardon. What I'm saying is, not just for this week only, but from now on, you take the reins of managing the society in the future. This was something Sae Jean had been thinking about lately. As the society grew, it would become more specialized and integrated but, well, having a final decision maker who was rather ignorant of the world's business. As well as suffering from chronic shortage of time, now wouldn't that be a fatal disadvantage going forward? That was why it might be better to delegate his role to someone else altogether. No, it should be better. After all, he was already doing nothing much other than giving his approvals, anyway. Mr. Chairman, are you perhaps going off to somewhere far? No, it's not like that, just that, it's all bothersome, you see. Besides, Mr. Hansung is twice smarter than I am, anyways. Ah, uh, right. This doesn't mean I'm completely relinquishing my position at all. Mr. Joe Hansung as the acting CEO, and I'm the majority shareholder something like that type of arrangement. That, that is. It's all right. I know. It's too big a topic to talk over the phone, so let's meet up later on and hash it out. I'm hanging up now. I'm running short on time, you see. Ye, yes, sir. Even though he was still trying to recover his senses from the sudden, super-fast promotion, Joe Hansung somehow managed to reply back. Sae Jean chuckled slightly and ended the call. The time to train was here. He changed back to the orc great warrior form. The following evening. Before the horrifying memories of the previous night, when monsters ranked higher than upper mid-tier such as ogres flooded in like invading ants, had the chance to fade away, the second red moon appeared. But unlike the initial fears, this time the defenders faced waves of much weaker monsters. Perhaps, that first night must have been just an anomaly. The same thing happened the day after, 
and then on the day after that as well. The presence of outstanding knights and wizards, as well as the now familiar dependable ally hero orc, who could easily substitute for a thousand men, made enduring the Red Moon somewhat easier. Of course, during the week-long duration of the Red Moon, not all waves of monsters would be this simple to contain, but still, the participating knights were able to store up their strength this way. What's the matter? You should just ask him out on a date. E. Hyrin. And now, after the fifth night of the battle had ended. As Kim Yurin continued to stare blankly at the back of the hero orc, E. Hyrin began to tease her once more. Fuhat. Even USA Young started giggling on the side as she wiped the dried blood off her sword. But then, Yurin's sharp glares landed on her, and all S.A. Young could do at that moment was to hurriedly stare down at the ground. Be mindful of where you are. Right now, Knight E. Hyrin and I are not of the same rank. Do I look like a friend to you? My apologies, ma'am. U.S.A. Young. It seemed that humoring them until now had become a problem. When Kim Yurin hardened her face and shouted out aloud, only then E. Hyrin stopped with her teasing. I thought that, because the team captain's eyes looked so dreamy. T, this idiot is. Looked like she was stopping, but. I mean, really now. Past four days, after battles are over you've been bringing water to him. And when he's about to leave, you see him out, too. It's so like watching a shy maiden's actions with a guy she fell in love at first sight or something. At first I was teasing you, but now I'm genuinely worried about you, Captain. Please pull yourself together. E. Hyrin fired off words like machine gun rounds. And at her words, Kim Yurin made a slightly panicking face. She was only trying to figure out that smell of the orc, but now that she thought about it, her actions did look strange enough to rouse misunderstandings. Interspecies mating is not allowed, you know. Morally, legally, and even scientifically, it's definitely not allowed. E. Eek. It's not like that. I told you over and over again, it's not what you think. When E. Hyrin spoke with 100% pure worry in her voice, Kim Yurin shouted back with her face totally red. Already a week had passed since the beginning of the Red Moon that made the public worry deeply. For Korea though, the damage it received was far lower compared to other countries. While the first world nations such as the USA and the Western Europe faced unprecedented loss of life and destruction of property due to the Red Moon, in Korea, the defenders fought so well that the first offensive line hadn't even been breached yet. It was all thanks to the hero orc and the brave knights, of course. On top of that, an unknown knight revealed the part of a footage to the world, filmed in the middle of the defense against the Red Moon, which featured the hero orc's role in the battle. The orc's absolutely overwhelming martial prowess was captured in it. The video spread out to the rest of the world in an instant, and not just within the country, but even the other countries boiled over with the stories regarding the hero orc. Within the span of the Red Moon Week, the fame of the hero orc had risen up so high that practically, everyone knew who it was. Hell, some overseas nations inquired the Korean government about loaning the hero orcs out to them saying that they'd like to take a male and female pair and have them live in their nation's own respective monster fields. And so, the Red Moon continued to remain as a source of many talking points as well as great sorrow but finally, on the eighth day of the Red Moon, a very good news spread among the defenders. It's going to end the day after tomorrow. The current location was the first offensive perimeter that had become a total wasteland. After receiving a phone call, Ju Ji Hyuk shouted out in a happy expression. And that caused many wounded and suffering knights to abruptly open their eyes wide. Huh? Really? Who said that? E. Hyrin was the first to run over and ask. And before anyone knew it, even Kim Yurin and USA Young were standing behind Ju Ji Hyuk now. But other knights couldn't muster up the courage to intrude on the so called monster family, so they could only eavesdrop from a distance. It's from the chairman. He said that Leakin had informed him. The smile on Ji Hyuk's face showed no signs of disappearing. Wah. Then that's for real Asaya. E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin stretched her arms grandly. Nowadays, the Leakin's words were accepted as truth, almost on the level of worship, even. There was the contribution of catching vampires, but more importantly, 
he was the very first person in the history to detect signs of the approaching red moon a week in advance. Wait a sec. Did you say Appa had called? But for some reason, USAE Young glared at Ju Ji Hyuk with stiff face as if something was unsatisfactory. Eh. Oh, ah uh, yes. Ju Ji Hyuk. But why didn't he call me? USAE Young. She began complaining and pulled out her mobile phone. Of course, there was no call from Kim Sae Jin. Oh, he said he'd call you soon. Ju Ji Hyuk. He did. USAE Young. SFX for phone ringing. The mobile phone began ringing at the same time. USAE Young's face remained weird as she tried hard to not to show that she was expecting this call while she checked out the LCD screen. And right away, a bright smile bloomed on her lips. May I be excused for a while, please? USAE Young went towards a quiet area with no people place where she could talk unhindered with steps light and soft enough to make her float in the air. And the two women, Kim Yurin and Yi Hyrin who not only didn't have a boyfriend but didn't even have someone they liked, chased after the back of Sae Young with envious eyes. As the sky began to redden, the knights began to grasp their weapons, and wizards began channeling mana in their bodies, all getting ready for another night of battle up ahead. The preparation before the battle was top-notch. The morale was deeply boosted with the belief that if they survived tonight and the night after, this damned war would come to an end. SFX for Roars of Monsters From somewhere, the cries of monsters rang high into the sky. In the distance, the legendary monster basilisk could be seen. And there was the single-eyed ogre which was reputedly the most powerful of all ogres, a cyclops. All the monsters appearing hadn't been seen until now. This was going to be a difficult fight without a doubt. Everyone began tensing up. But none of them scattered. The belief in themselves having grown both emotionally and physically gave them much confidence, and also, there was also the powerful ally helping them out which helped them relax just a little bit more. All troops, ready your arms. Kim Yurin loudly shouted out. Mana coming out from the numerous knights and wizards present started humming in the air. Kim Sae Jin, the orc great warrior, swung his mace and then swung some more in this chaotic battlefield. From the mace overflowing with mana, Shock waves and mana infused sword auras burst out repeatedly, ripping monsters to shreds. The ground brutally split apart and fountains of blood sprayed into the air, making the red moonlight redder still. The word overwhelming suited the orc's fighting prowess, but the source of this display of irrepressible power was actually thanks to a certain wonderful cycle that started off by killing monsters in the first place. His skill predator reinforced his strength the more monsters he killed. And so, in this place overflowing with monsters, whenever he smashed one apart, Sae Jean was growing stronger. In other words, even if he couldn't kill a monster today, after going through the day's rapid growth, he'd be able to kill it the following day. It was the same for absorbing the mana stones as well. Normally, in order to absorb one, he'd have dig it out from the heart of the monsters which would garner a few curious onlookers, but now that he had this mana body, the process had become a lot simpler. He'd just have to touch the dead monster's body to send in his mana and assimilate the mana stone. And so, he absorbed all the mana stones of the countless dead monsters lining up on the ground like a glutton, even in the middle of this crazy melee. One could say that for Kim Sae Jin, this red moon was perhaps the greatest event for crazy leveling up, making him stronger today than yesterday, and stronger still tomorrow compared to today. SFX for an Orsish Roar but for now, he didn't have enough time to focus on his growth. He had spotted Kim Yurin in the distance, fighting hard against a bladed Dakibi. Maybe it was because she'd been fighting non-stop for the past four hours, the mana covering her sword was getting dimmer and dimmer by the second. The orc immediately kicked the ground and rushed towards her location. After arriving there while raising a tempest, he raised the mace up high. And then, slammed down with fierce strike, loaded with seriously ridiculous destructive power. Kwahung. The bladed Dakibi raised both of its arms to block the mace but it was simply not adequate enough. The two arms of this monster, reputedly as strong as that of adamantium, shattered like glass. SFX for a thing going splat. After losing its arms, the bladed Dakibi turned around in order to run away. 
Obviously, the orc didn't allow that to happen and he powerfully smacked the back of the monster's head with the mace. With the dull sound of destruction, the monster's head split open like a crushed tomato. Cook. Unfortunately, Kim Yurin got caught up in the shock wave of the orc's attack, and fell down on the ground. Guyu. The orc approached her and offered his hand. Kim Yurin blankly stared at the creature for a moment, before grabbing it and pulling herself up. Ah. As soon as she was up, the orc once more patted her on the head. She felt like she had reverted back to being a little kid. But it didn't all feel bad. No, it rather felt pretty good, instead. Besides from her father when she was very young, Yurin hadn't felt this sensation of being protected by a dependable man up until now. High HP. However, Kim Yurin deliberately roughly slapped away the orc's hand and let out a loud shout. Her face felt hot for some reason. It was like, she was beginning to think, how dare a lowly orc look down on humans. Just die. She loaded mana into her sword and swung it. The winds of mana spread around like the waves of the rough sea. But at that exact moment, the violent current of mana suddenly shot up from the ground. This was energy from a strange magic spell being activated. Everyone. Carrying a shocked expression, Kim Yurin quickly turned her head towards her subordinate knights. And then the ground she was standing on collapsed noisily. Chapter, 79 The invading coldness and the water drops falling on her body woke Kim Yurin up. It was pitch dark everywhere. The steam of breath escaping her lips were white. It was really cold in here. So, she tried to wrap her body with the mana barrier. However, mana in her body didn't respond. Thanks to the puzzlement and the subsequent realization of the severity of this situation woke her up from the dazed state real fast. At the same time. Kuiyu. She heard a low growl out of the blue. Surprised, she quickly turned her head around and saw the hero orc. And her heart nearly jumped out of her mouth. He was so close that if she reached out, her hand would touch him. She forcibly suppressed her wildly beating heart and tried to stand up. It seemed like she must have hit something while falling, as her knee joints ached. But figuring out where she was had higher priority than worrying about such pain for now. So, she looked around. For a cave she fell into after the ground gave in, this place sure looked man-made. And for some strange reason, she could not control her mana at all. Is this because of an isolation barrier? With a dead serious face, Yurin touched the dark wall of the cave and when her skin came in contact with the wall, a strangely cold sensation crept up all over her body. SFX for a sound someone makes while shivering in cold. She couldn't help but collapse back down while her body trembled from the invading coldness. And seeing her like this, Kim Sae Jin let out a quiet sigh. Just what the heck was this bothersome situation, when he was getting sleepy from using up so much of his own mana? But man, where is this place anyways? Only after he activated the eyes of the wolf could he check out the interior of the cave better, but still, the end could not be seen at all. There wasn't even a single beam of light in this perfect darkness. Feeling frustrated and irritated, he began pressing down on his forehead. It's an isolation barrier magic, said Kim Yurin. Since there is a high probability that simple collapsing of the ground would not harm the knights who can use mana barriers, it seems like there had been a specialized isolation enchantment placed here beforehand. But a lich cannot lay out such a multi-layered magic spell. She turned her head to look at the orc. She wasn't sure whether he could understand her words or not, but seeing that he was quietly gazing at her made her think that maybe, he could. That's because a lich lacks any form of reasoning and so it only uses destructive spells. That's why this was the handiwork of humans for sure. The orc wordlessly nodded his head. Man, this is so dn frustrating. The mouth of Kim Sae Jean the orc was itching madly right now. The proficiency for the vocal cord reconstruction had increased so nicely that now it was already at B, meaning it was not a problem to talk in this orc form. However, for an orc to talk like a human was just a bit wrong, was it not? Of course, Kim Yurin did meet a talking goblin in the past, but still. In that case should we start walking now? Only half sure of the orc understanding human speech, Kim Yurin gestured with her hand. 
Then, the orc really took the lead and began walking deeper into the cave. Ha! Huh. She stood there with her mouth hanging loose while staring at the back of the orc in a daze, before waking up from the stupor to hurriedly follow him. No matter how long they walked, the exit could not be found. And Kim Yurin's face became paler and paler as well, from the case of severe hypothermia. Seeing her shake like a leaf next to him, Sae Jean briefly fell into a dilemma. Currently, he had a coat-type armor inside his body via spiritualization. If he brought that out and handed it over to her, she wouldn't shake like that. Ha, ah. He could hear her freezing breaths. In a way, that was expected. The coldness in this cave was harsh enough to make him, an orc, feel the deathly chilliness as well. And within this bitter coldness, she couldn't use the armor made out of mana, the most important ability of a knight, the mana barrier. Ha! Yut! Tak! Kim Yurin's footsteps stopped after her feet hit a pebble on the ground. She tried desperately to hold on to her weakening consciousness, but she no longer had any more strength left to endure this bitter coldness anymore. And so, her eyes slowly began to close. As he couldn't help it, the orc took out one of the armors from within his body. A black coat-style armor that easily approached the rank of branded goods although he didn't add an attribute like controlling the body temperature on it. As he used the crimson stones as base ingredients, it should be okay since those stones could naturally create heat. Ha! Huh. Using that small window of opportunity when Yurin's eyes were closed, he instantly changed the appearance of the coat into a blanket via spiritualization. And he wrapped her with it as she tottered around uneasily on her feet, about to fall down. Ah. Uh. Ha. Huh. Almost right away, the warmth from the crimson stones permeated into Yurin's entire body. And thanks to experiencing this warmth within the bitter coldness, her legs lost strength momentarily and she ended up falling down anyway. Kyuat. Kim Yurin. Kyum. The orc stared at her with slightly disbelieving eyes, before holding her slender shoulders to pull her up to her feet. Ah. After standing up straight, she glanced down at the warm blanket covering her. She had no idea where this thing came from, but this was perfectly fine since the coldness melted away like snow. This thank you. She began to show her gratitude while still being propped up by the orc's arms but weirdly enough, both of her cheeks were dyed in deep crimson for some reason. Because of the sudden collapse of the ground, the defensive line received a damage akin to total annihilation. Several dozen knights went missing and among them was a highest tier knight who made up a considerable part of the fighting force, Kim Yurin. Just what happened here? A high tier knight affiliated with the Raven Order, Park Hyun pointed at a certain part of the ground, which had sunk into the distant bottom. After causing the earth to collapse with magic, it seems that via prepared magic circles, summoning and isolation barrier magics have been activated. That's why we can't summon them back. There is not we can do but to wait until they find a way to reverse the summoning from inside the barrier. Kim Hyun Suk, the master of the Raven Order and the commander in charge of this defensive line, spoke. Even though his own daughter had gone missing, he continued to maintain a cold and composed attitude. Then, what should be our next move, commander? Miss Kim Yu Rin, who had stepped up to the leading role, and most of her subordinates are unaccounted for, so to just evacuate like this. She has lived all her life in hardship. She'll come back alive, somehow. For now, we're retreating to the rearmost defensive line and get ready for the final day's battle. We cannot protect this first line any longer. If this defensive line was given up, then searching for the missing knights would become much more difficult. It might have been a rational decision to make, but at the same time, it was a cold one as well. But the subordinate knight couldn't say anything else. Underneath all that soil, under that isolation barrier, Kim Hyun Suk's daughter was trapped in there. In other words, this decision was made by one person who would have wanted to find the missing knights more than anyone else here. Yes, sir. Understood. At the same time, an orc and a single female knight were still walking inside this unknown cave. There are magic circles engraved all over the cave without a doubt, they confirm that this place is artificially created. And also, even though our side had many wizards, 
seeing that there aren't any measures taken to help us until now, it's likely that we were brought within this isolation barrier by a summoning type magic. Kim Yurin murmured as she carefully studied the blue colored magic circle on the wall. The orc then came to stand next to her and did the same. Yurin took a glance at the orc, before taking a couple of steps back discreetly. For an orc, he sure does resemble a human, doesn't he? Her face reddened again at this thought suddenly entering her head. The way this hero orc acted or the way his face was shaped was really quite strange. Not only did he not have the orc's trademark protruding teeth, his facial features were sharp and well-defined. Heck, even his ponytail was long and so shiny if his skin color was not blue and that somewhat flattish face was changed slightly, then he'd be a cool goo. Eu, eu, eu. She quickly shook her head, hard. She could not understand why such thoughts kept popping up in her head. So much so, she was actually beginning to question her own tastes as a human being. Kyurung. It was then. The orc that was staring at the magic circle on the wall suddenly grasped his mace real tight. Even before Yurin had the chance to get surprised at this sudden change in atmosphere, he slammed the wall hard with the mace. Kwahan. The powerful shock wave and the ear-shattering noise reverberated in the cave's interior. Kyuk. Kim Yurin covered her ears. Even then, she thought she could hear bells ringing in her head. But she knew enough not to complain. Instead, she slowly approached the spot the orc hit, and began studying it deeply. There is no change. Kung. The orc spat out a seemingly dissatisfied snort. Smiling thinly, Yurin lightly patted his arm. Let's start walking again. And as far as I can tell, the way we walked isn't the same as before, so maybe we might find answers if we continue to move forward mm. Unlike what she said just now, she could feel some kind of change. The bitter coldness of the cave seemed to have eased just a little. W, wait a minute. There is a change. A uh, Mr. Orc. Yurin ended up using a strange honorific to address the orc. He simply nodded his head. TL, Yurin has been using the speech pattern usually reserved for addressing older person, when talking to SAE Jean's orc form until now. Right. Let's get going. Two of them began moving their feet in a hurry. Kwang. Afterwards, whenever they came across a magic circle, the orc pounded on it. Normally, mana-induced effects could not be damaged with physical attacks, but with the attribute added onto his weapon, it was now possible. The isolation barrier is steadily becoming unstable. And when he destroyed about five of them, Kim Yurin shouted out in a bright voice after sensing the nearly imperceptible vibration in the isolation magic. Then the orc let out a short chuckle and lightly patted her head again. Ha, ha. She wasn't sure if this head patting thing was this orc's habit or not, but she still accepted it gladly while carrying a timid smile. Funnily enough, the one who got taken aback from her reaction was Kim Sae Jean instead. After getting surprised, he suppressed his instinctual habit and removed his hand away from her head. After each one of the magic circles were destroyed, the isolation barrier's effects disappeared one by one and when around what they thought was eight hours of time had passed by, they could finally find her fainted fellow knights. Ah! Mr. Orc! Laying down a fainted knight on the ground, Yurin hurriedly ran towards the orc to receive him. There were two more knights resting on his shoulders. It's Hyrin and Sujayam. Phew what a relief. Thank you, Mr. Orc. She let out a sigh of relief. They had divided their roles. Orc walked around the cave to find the fainted knights and brought them here, while Yurin looked after them in this safe area until they regained their consciousness. Please, carefully, carefully. Maybe because these two were quite close to her, she raised quite a fuss while receiving the two dead weights and carefully laid them down on the ground. Moan. Right on cue, the knight lying closest began to groan. Surprised, Kim Yurin quickly rushed over there. And just like the falling pieces of domino, as soon as one person woke up, people began regaining their consciousness, starting from the person they discovered first. They initially let out a sigh of relief seeing Yurin's face but then after discovering the orc. 
nearly fainted again only to sigh out in relief again after hearing her explanations on what had transpired here, and so, they had to go through quite a roller coaster of emotions. In other words, it's still unclear if we can escape or not. As we can't control mana yet, looks like we still need to destroy a few more first. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin spoke in an overtly official manner to the subordinate knight, her previously demure demeanor when interacting with the orc nowhere to be seen now. Phew. Really, I'm relieved. Who knew that we could be safe thanks to that orc BD? What? Yurin's forehead creased at the words of this subordinate. The disrespectful words Orc BD somehow got on her nerves. However, if she started picking fault with that, then that weird rumor might spread around even further. W, what's the matter, ma'am? That Orc G, guy can understand human words. We don't know what might happen so you need to watch what you say. While taking a quick glance at the Orc who was stretching his neck, she whispered very quietly. Ah yes, ma'am. The subordinate nodded, while carrying a slightly weirded out expression. Chapter, 80 With Kim Yurin and the Orc as their lead, a group of 37 knights were busy with their unplanned cave exploration for the past 24 hours or so. And as the bitter coldness decreased to chilly with the destruction of the magic circles they had come across, they encountered no other survival issues other than the slowly encroaching hunger and the onset of fatigue. Unfortunately, Strange monsters that were suspected to be a part of the defense mechanism against the sudden disabling of the isolation barrier suddenly began to appear one after the other. A three-headed dog that resembled the legendary Cerberus a strange chimera monster that had a body of an orc but a head of a deer a grotesque floating eyeball with tentacles sprouting out of it, etc., etc. Since the knights trapped within this place couldn't use mana at all for some reason, the hero orc had to step up here and well, he took care of all the threats quite easily. Even the monsters that looked strong enough to make the knights tense up, got smashed apart like potato crisps under the orc's mace. Let's take a look. Ah, there are so many scratches Kim Yurin. But still, these monsters possessed enough power to damage the leviathan scales, thus he ended up receiving quite a few scars. Whenever that happened, though, Kim Yurin pulled out an emergency potion from her waist-mounted bag and started applying on his body. And the other knights had this dumbfounded expressions as they bore witness to this heartwarming scene. H, hey, isn't that getting really serious now? Miss Yurin has never done anything like that for me until now Kim Sujayam. Among them, Kim Sujayam's body was quaking from intense jealousy. He'd jump in there and separate the two if he could just muster up some courage, but... But, he just couldn't dare to go near that orc with the massive, hulking physique, while also holding that destructive mace of his. E.I., no way. No way, but wouldn't that be interesting? And we get new things to tease her with, too. With a smiling face, E. Hyrin gazed at the back of Yurin and the orc. Ah, uh, I wish I had my phone with me so I can take some snaps of the two how regretful, I say. So regretful. Even inside this gloomy cave, E. Hyrin didn't lose her trademark active and easygoing personality. Unfortunately, even that upbeat attitude couldn't last forever. The problem was with the length of this cave it seemed endless, no matter how long they walked. In the end, the knights could no longer endure the accumulated fatigue after walking another six hours on top of the twenty-four they spent prior, and decided to set up a camp in the middle of the cave. And as soon as they stopped their forward march, the loud rumbling sounds of the knights' empty stomachs rang out in a coordinated symphony. A ah. The one thing knights hated the most was hunger. From the early ages, the rigorous training and the cultivation of mana led to these knights having powerful bodies that ended up leaving them with much higher rate of metabolism compared to normal people. It was even more severe in case of Kim Yurin. The bitter pain from the stomach acid escaping from her stomach spread throughout her body and as a result, countless large, cold drops of sweat were forming all over her. Can't these fools do anything without mana? Kim Sae Jean grumbled inwardly but still, he had to seriously think about what to do here. The leather pouch tied to his waist had one of those space-expanding magic added to it. Inside, there was enough food to last him a month, as well as numerous monster remains he got from all the hunting he did. If he pulled those out, then he might be able to stave off starvation for now. SFX for empty stomachs loudly grumbling. 
From somewhere, a loud roar exploded and shook the interior of the cave stunned by this, the orc hurriedly turned his head to the side to see what's what. Only to find Kim Yurin with her face completely painted in red and avoiding making eye contacts with him. Eu eu. Unable to endure her moaning, the orc ended up pulling out the meat of wild boar with its skin neatly removed. This vicious animal was called Trabong boar, a creature that sat in the boundary between being a monster and a regular wild beast. It was famed as a delicacy and was treated a top ingredient as a result. TL. Ha. Huh. Ah, ah. Every knight's eyes present here gleamed dangerously the moment that juicy red piece of meat emerged from his pouch. Even Kim Yurin became totally speechless, silently staring at the meat. And, a drop of drool fell from the corner of her mouth. Ah. We don't have fire. But her expression sank deeply when she suddenly realized this fact. The orc chuckled inwardly as he began laying down mana on the ground. Probably because the way he used mana was fundamentally different from that of the knights here, Sae Jean had no trouble whatsoever in converting that mana into flames. What? Not only Kim Yurin, but everyone else suddenly rushed in closer, their eyes shining brightly. The orc then laid the boar meat on the fire. SFX for oil from meat sizzling in heat TL, DN, even I'm getting hungry TLing this bit. The fatally powerful aroma and the sound effect stimulated the two senses of all the knights present here at the same time. But then, SAE Jean remembered that he didn't have any seasoning with him. Hmm, should I try that method now? And that was to pour in mana into food and change the flavor that way. He had never tried this out yet, but he was still proud of the fact that, due to the goblin's craftsmanship as well as its highly attuned taste buds, his own sense of taste had reached a certain high level as well. That's why he figured that it'd be fine to simply use mana to get the desired level of saltiness and sweetness. Kurung. Seizing the gap between the knight's attention, the orc poured mana into the meat. Although the boar's size was pretty big, as there were many mouths to feed here, each person ended up receiving six pieces of meat only. But after realizing that he could add different attributed to food as well, Sae Jean added the attributes that could give the sensation of satiety on the meat. And that caused the knights to fall down on the ground after being utterly moved by the food's taste as well as how it satisfied their hunger. In other words, the best condiment in the world that made the greatest delicacies of all was surely the empty stomach. Even Kim Yurin was immersed deeply in the lingering aftertaste of the delicious meal, her eyes firmly closed in reverence as she relived the moment when the meat melted inside her mouth. Well, now since we've eaten, why don't get some shut eye? From the back, the voice of an unknown male knight came through, and many others agreed with this idea. And so, they began to lie down on the cold floor of the cave one by one. Captain, it's fine, right? E. Hyrin inquired with a sleepy voice. All right. Since we walked for a long time, let's take a small break. Kim Yurin's eyes were half closed as she replied. And that's how all the knights fell into a slumber in an instant. But only the orc stood up from his spot. After all, the body of the great warrior didn't need a whole lot of sleep, so he appointed himself as the lookout for now. But eventually, he got bored after looking around the surroundings for about one hour and so he began studying the faces of the sleeping knights instead. Most of their faces looked uncomfortable, but even so, the deep creases on Kim Yurin's forehead especially showed no sign of easing. Seeing her uncomfortable face, a thought suddenly popped up in his mind and Sae Jean began making a naughty smile. Drifting out of her sleep, Yurin turned her body this way and that, until she felt something strange. As if she was using a pillow made out of solid metal, it was hard just beneath her head. She opened her eyes in confusion, only to see the face of the orc with his own eyes closed. Confused even more at this situation, she began surveying her surroundings, and then realized that she was using his thigh as a pillow. Eua. The shocked Kim Yurin bolted right up, causing the orc to open his eyes as well. It, it's nothing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. Kim Yurin ended up apologizing first after mistakenly believing that she used his thigh because of her usual sleeping habits. Qeu. Almost at the same time, other knights began waking up one by one. 
She hurriedly tried to calm her pounding heart and did her best to look composed as she announced the resuming of their march forward. E, everyone, stand up. We are moving. At the end of their lengthy march that lasted over one and a half day, S.A.E. Jean finally spotted what seemed to be the exit of the cave in the distance. It was still pitch dark right up until that exit, but he could definitely tell. The space there was considerably wider than compared to the rest of the cave. Unfortunately, he also sensed a wickedly evil energy in that place at the same time. It was different from monsters, but also rather different from humans as well. Instead, he smelled a familiar bloody odor. It was from vampires. S.A.E. Jean stopped his feet. When the orc's loud footsteps came to a halt, a small commotion developed towards the back. Is there something wrong? Kim Yurin asked while cautiously grabbing hold of his arm. Her move was so smooth and natural, S.A.E. Jean nearly ended up blurting something aloud. He managed to shut his mouth and activated the eyes of the wolf to the max. Right away, his view expanded greatly until it reached the exit of the cave. There indeed was a way out over yonder, but a strange old man was blocking the exit while holding a crystal ball and muttering some weird incantations. But upon closer inspection, that wasn't a real old man, but some kind of a doll that happened to look like one. And what the heck is that now? Finishing up with his surveillance, S.A.E. Jean moved his gaze towards Kim Yurin who was staring back at him. But since he had no avenue of passing on the information, all he could do now was to simply stare back at her. Uh, yes. Then, she opened her mouth slightly and tilted her head. That was too dn adorably cute. The simple orc's instincts kicked in, and he started gently stroking her cheek. And the jaws of E. Hyrin and Kim Sujayam who was witnessing this scene from right behind, dropped to the floor meanwhile, the dazed Yurin's face rapidly became dyed in red color. Kurung. Belatedly realizing what he had done, the orc quickly withdrew his hand and then pointed towards the distant exit with his mace. What? However, Kim Yurin and the other knights were way too shocked to figure out what he was trying to say. He even pretended to get peeved and growled a little, but they only seemed to get surprised and nothing else. In the end, the orc had to take the lead again. And only when the back of the orc had gotten quite small did the dazed knights hurriedly chase after him. For an orc, that guy is pretty cool, but still. I said, I know already. It's not like that. At E. Hyrin's carefully worded question, Yurin replied back tersely, just as she had done before. But, strangely enough, her wildly beating heart did not regain its calmness even after a long, long time. The knights and the single orc arrived at the wide open space that led to the exit, but none of them could express their happiness. It was because of the overbearing presence of a puppet-like doll that emanated a deeply unsettling energy from its body. Even though we can't use mana here, but as we still have our weapons, if we attack together from both sides, we might be able to do something, said E. Hyrin as she unsheathed her longsword. But the orc stopped her and took a step closer to the doll. These knights couldn't use mana at all. And the opponent this time might have been a doll, but it was also seemingly a clone of a powerful vampire. Most importantly, however the desire for battle he had been suppressing until now was reacting with burning fervor, so it was perfect that he would get to fight this thing. The orc took a single look at the knights behind him and then pointed at the exit behind the doll with the mace. And before they could express their emotions. SFX for a loud orcish roar. He dashed towards the doll while roaring out powerfully. Almost immediately, several crimson tentacles shot out from the ground below and grabbed hold of his ankles, but the orc's superhuman strength wasn't just for a show. Using nothing but his raw physical power, the orc ripped off the binding tentacles and slammed his mace against the side of the doll. Taying. Quahan. The vampire's doll was smashed away like an empty can of soda, bounced around the cave and then, powerfully drilled into the ground. The orc pointed at the exit again which was now cleared of all obstacles. Let's go. The knights began to head towards the exit one after the other, with the exception of one person Kim Yurin. Captain, what are you doing? Please hurry. Mr. Orc, let's, let's get out of here together. Yurin hurriedly grabbed the arm of the orc who was about to rush towards the vampire's doll. But before he could respond, the entirety of the cave became dyed in red. 
and from these crimson walls, several sharp-pointed tentacles rapidly shot out towards the direction of Kim Yurin and the orc. It was too late to deflect all of them. The orc quickly pulled Yurin in his arms and then activated the leviathan scales to absolute max. Unfortunately, the tentacles managed to penetrate the scales, and the painful sensation of the sharp edges cutting into his flesh crawled up his spine. Ah, uh, dn it why? Eu eu. Eu ah. The orc gazed down on Kim Yurin within his arms he found it rather pitiable and at the same time, felt grateful, at how hard she was struggling to summon up mana inside her, wanting to help him out even if it was by a little. But he judged that this stubborn woman would try to stay here until the end if he let her be, so he decided to open his mouth to her. You go. A voice more manly and burly than humanly possible resounded heavily inside the cave. SFX for the sounds of energy rising up. As Kim Yurin's face became dyed in astonishment, the vampire's clone began emitting a seriously creepy aura. The exit, very long. I stay and block that BD, until everyone, escapes. The orc spoke up to hear and activated the warrior of reversal. This wasn't even some Hollywood action film, but just what kind of rubbish situation did he find himself in? Most of all, the presence of this woman was bothering him a great deal. After all, his heart was roaring wildly inside his chest, and he felt like he might die if he didn't go crazy against that doll BD right away. So why the heck was he wasting time talking to this woman? I see, you humans can't use mana, I think because of the crystal ball. That BD, absorbed that ball into the heart just now. The orc's eyes were now dyed in crimson, and at the same time, equally red and very dense aura started rising up from its body. That's why, no mana, until that BD dead. You, no useful in this fight. Only a distraction. So, go away, quickly. The orc then grabbed the waist of Kim Yurin, who still hadn't managed to pull herself back together from the shock, and powerfully threw her towards the exit like tossing a javelin. Kayak. Kim Yurin. It seemed that the weapon mastery skill also applied in this case, as the throne Kim Yurin traced a perfect arc and scored an equally perfect goal inside the exit tunnel. Keep running that way. At the end of this sentence from the orc, the entire interior of the cave finished being painted in red.